Audiobook title, World Tree Apocalypse, A Pilot in Another World Literary Bounds per Game 01 to 33, by Razmataz. This work belongs to author Razmataz. Source Royal Road and ScribbleHub.com. Chapter 1 Pilot and Caretaker. A voice calls over the radio, screaming to overpower the roar of gunfire and engines, another man from his squadron. Suddenly, the device crackles, the needle sliding along the display as it picks up another frequency, cutting off the yelling man's voice. What exactly do you believe in? Asks someone else entirely, a woman, whose voice now comes from the dashboard mounted radio. The pilot doesn't recognize her, and he doesn't have time to worry about it. It's probably some civilian broadcast that got mixed up with the rest. He slaps the radio with his free hand as static crackles all around him. His head turned to the side as he watches trails of bullets streak through the sky. The sharp, collective hissing of the electronics is barely able to come to his ears over the mind-rattling drone of the repeating heavy machine gunfire that is raging from all sides. The plane's chassis shakes in response to his demands, as if there were a hive nesting inside the aluminum body. The sky on this cloudy day roars with thunder, despite there not being a single drop of rain to be seen. The crack of heavy autocannon projectiles. It's of enemy caliber. Screams come over the radio as the standard frequency is picked up again. None of them are assigned parachutes. The pilot looks back forward, flipping two switches in preparation for his maneuver and also doing his best to silence the screaming man's voice coming in from the broadcast. The downed man will be screaming all the way down until he hits the ground, but there's no need to make that everyone else's problem at a time like this. The pilot looks in the mirror glass at the black silhouette that is rapidly arching up his way on his trail. His squadron has been intercepted on their patrol route by an enemy ambush. The attack came suddenly from an unexpected angle that should have been guarded. The enemy has a new trick up their sleeves. It's funny, really. War has a way of making new things become old very quickly. When they were assigned these new planes, they were told they were top-of-the-line experimental aircraft. But now here the enemy is. Having up the game again with their own new tech, the metal cage around him buzzes, the bare bones, mostly stripped interior of the cockpit of the single-seated experimental airframe stresses its discontent at the way its body is being treated by the man, the pilot, in control, he tilts his head back, looking up for him as he pulls the plane upward further, flying nearly upside down, gazing at the shapes below him through the clear glass canopy of the fighter plane. Two aircraft from his own squadron are spiraling downward in a diverging circle maneuver to break apart their formation. Another one is on fire and hurtling down toward the ground, still being pursued by their hunter. The JFZ-09 Kestrel is a prototype, single propeller, long-range light fighter with a weapons emphasis toward its design of being an extremely nimble, high altitude, but poorly armored, combatant intended to push deep into the enemy's defensive locations as the tip of the spear, preemptively destroying enemy air assets and ground defenses before any supporting friendly ground units make their push. Essentially, it's a plane designed solely for suicide missions and nothing else, modified from the extremely modular JFZX chassis which fields many variants from submarine hunters to heavily armored, short-range ground support fighters. This newest version has been modified with dual 7.92x57mm flood-fed machine guns, deployable explosive cluster ordinances that are technically illegal because they are horrifically inhumane, and an internal self-destruction load that acts as the pilot's parachute replacement. The latter isn't seen as an issue in the scope of human rights issues designed to penetrate the enemy's lines from unusual angles, much has been spared to allow an extra large fuel reserve and a special prototype engine only available on this model. Every single gram, down to the cushioning of the pilot's seat, has been reduced as much as possible, giving the interior of the plane very much the appearance and sensation of being an actual coffin. Although the high explosive charges that the plane is filled with really do bring it all together into something home-like. This interior sector of the war zone was supposed to have been under watch by air detection units to keep the skies clear for his squadron on their way to the enemy lines, but nobody warned them about any incoming bogeys. It's really no wonder, though. As he cuts the sky like a knife, the pilot looks, staring at the midnight black hunter plane that has flown after him in pursuit of him, coming closer and closer like a reaching monster's claw against the backdrop of the ever-blue sky. It's a new, dual-propeller design. 
his fingers grip around the throttle as he watches the heavy auto cannon below the enemy's canopy begin to rotate in preparation. He's never seen anything like it. It must be a new enemy prototype, some sort of long range stealth interceptor. It really is fitting for the enemy to bring out such a thing on the same mission that they're on with their new planes, too. Now, the cockpit lights up vividly orange in the same instant as he slams the control stick to the right in response to the shine of hammering gunfire. His plane spinning and diverging its ascending path, as the sustained burst of .50 caliber machine gunfire on his trail cuts through the vector he was following a second ago. He'd recognize that sound anywhere. The enemy tends to field weapons with a lower rate of fire but a harder punch. The machinery howls as he rises further and further, his hands pulling back the throttle harder still at his angle, rising higher and higher. The Kestrel's engine's voice quickly becomes choked and silent as his ascent begins to fail against the whims of gravity, which begins pulling him down to the world. The lift beneath his wings is no longer enough to sustain his rise at this new vector of movement. His excessively sharp angle upward is too much to sustain for as long as he has been doing with the resources he has at hand. The engine stalls out, a sickly momentum moving into his gut as he reaches the end of his push, and the plane hangs in midair by itself for a moment, neither falling or rising. A sharp series of clacks fill the cockpit. The man shifting his legs as he flicks off a series of switches in precise order. He yanks the throttle, shifting the flaps. His plane spins and his propeller sputters as he free falls and rotates the kestrel straight downward against the drop, following the odd somersault through to the end. His vision is filled with the hued grey of the desolated world below that he's crashing towards, hidden behind the cotton clouds. The pursuing enemy hunter shoots up and past him at the same second as he blasts down next to it. The two men both sparing sideways glances toward their counterpart as they pass each other by for just a brief flash of a second. The Kestrel hurtles down, screaming as he presses toward the dogfight that his squadron is entangled in below. He aligns himself with the vector of another enemy hunter, chasing one of his guys, nestling the blackbird snugly in the middle of his hull-mounted crosshair. His index finger presses down against the heavy set trigger on his control stick the machine responding with a deeply set, rigid clack that carries up his arm. Then, there, the mechanism roars, his light fighter making its presence known as the swarming of descending fairy lights comes to his ears, together with the sounds of their biting through the metal of the enemy plane below, at over 1000 rounds per minute per gun, there's nothing else to hear inside the canopy except for the non-stop hammering eruption and the jangling of metal in the ammo canisters behind him. A streaking daisy chain of vivid fire cuts through the top of the enemy hunter below him, a pattern of hundreds of bullets blasting out of the weapons array in only a few seconds time. The black enemy fighter plane burns, its heavily peppered wing breaking off from the force of the wind raging against its butchered core, the damaged airframe unable to hold on any more against the speeds it had been moving at. Fire and smoke trail down toward the ground as it spirals in a horrifically violent circle down toward the distant grey ocean, destined to become one crater of many in the battlefield that is shifted back and forth over the same stretch of land for years now. I just mean, you know, I do not understand what exactly it is supposed to be? Asks the woman's voice from the radio again. Do you just like killing? Is that it? His hand flicks the radio, the needle sliding back to his frequency. A voice of thanks comes in from his squadron mate, whom he just saved. There's some soap opera running or something. He's got to talk to the engineers back at the hangar when this is done. Usually, military frequencies are cleanly separated from civilian broadcasts. There must be some kinks in the new plane. At the same time, he can't help but narrow his eyes in annoyance as the blooming of a parachute makes itself seen, the neutralized enemy ejecting from his crashing plane with a very functional and present parachute. Bastard. I just think that it is sad, is all says the voice over the radio, with the pilot looking at it in surprise. His confused moment is interrupted as he lurches to the side, the airframe taking a heavy hit as something shrill whines behind him. The hunter he dodged a moment ago is back on his ass, the wind whistling like a ghost as it dives after him. The pilot can't help but notice the missing chunk of his own wing hurtling through the air behind him. The enemy dodges the scrap, counterbalancing the disrupted airflow of his glide. He leans the plane to the side, spinning down at an angle. How many is it? Do you even know? Souls. 
asks the radio. The radio crackles, a familiar voice coming in, belonging to the man in the plane that he's flying straight towards. Waltz, Waltz, replies the pilot into his own radio, looking downward at the friendly airframe launching straight up toward him from below, one of his own. The Allied fighter spins upside down as he maintains his own rotation. Their two bellies coming close to sliding along one another as his fight is cut into, both kestrels firing at the same time. The pilot's kestrel shrieks, its guns blasting at the enemy who was pursuing his friendly. As his own hunter is shot at from below by the man he swapped targets with, like exchanging partners in a dance, both of the enemy hunters fall apart, spiraling downward. One enemy pilot ejects with a parachute, the other, his own target does not do so this second time, the sky is clear, that was the last of them, exhaling, the pilot pulls his throttle steady and looks down at his radio as status reports come back in, one after the other, the Kestrel pilots check in with their call signs to establish who is still alive and if the mission is still a go, out of the sides of his canopy, four Kestrels return to a wing formation that he's at the front of, are you not scared? asks the voice from the radio, his fingers flick over the switches one after the other, trying to adjust the radio to isolate and shut out the frequency finally, they're approaching the target, men's voices come over the radio as his fingers rest on it, yelling a series of commands in a frenzy, just as he was fiddling with the controls, the Kestrel pilot lifts his gaze, looking through the glass of the canopy, with which there is something very wrong, a pattern is developing over it, like interwoven honeycombs, confused, he stares until he realizes that it isn't the glass that is breaking or fracturing, but rather, the sky itself is enveloped in a webbing, the radio is full of chatter, but not about that, as nobody else seems to notice, oddly enough, instead, what the remaining men of the pilot's squadron talk about is what lies straight ahead of them, over the nearby horizon crests a full swarm of easily two dozen more enemy hunters, with another two heavy fighters in their back formation. The trail of their movements distorts and disrupts the honeycomb pattern that is etched into the air, as if everything were submerged in a dense liquid, like the world was being submerged into a dripping beehive. He must be experiencing some altitude sickness. One day, you will end up where you are going, you know that, right? asks the voice, taking a sternly disapproving tone that really grinds him the wrong way. She's talking to him personally, is this some shrink? trying to test him, some psych evaluation from the flight research team, his fist strikes against the console as he pulls the corded radio into his hands, pressing down the button and answering with a single word, good, is all that the Kestrel pilot says as he slams the radio back into the clasp and pushes the throttle of his plane forward as chatter comes from all communication channels, orders coming in from Central Air Command for his squadron to immediately pull back and regroup above their own defensive lines where he's going, he's not going anywhere, this is war, and it always has been war, war is the only place to go, war spans the world from here to the end of its most distant reaches, he was born in war, he went to school in war, and he grew up in war, he killed his first man at 15 when he was drafted, and they gave him a rifle, and by the time he was old enough to sit in a plane, he had stopped counting how many it had been, he's a natural at what he does, he's driven by it, he loves it, he reaches down, grabbing hold of a simple lever at the side of his seat, his hand resting on it as the silhouettes of his own squadron begin to diverge, the wing formation breaking apart as they all pull back to safety. His thumb presses down on the locking mechanism of the lever, releasing it. He's never disobeyed a command before, but there's no point in him following these orders and regrouping in the back line. His damaged wing is throttling his speed too much. He won't be able to outrun the enemy at the distance he would have left to go in order to return to the safe zone, they'd gun him down halfway there. So there's only one other viable option, one other direction out of the endless vectors available to a man with wings, the Kestrel's experimental 12-cylinder piston engine is outfitted with a prototype device that he was told he doesn't need to understand, he just needs to know that it works. It's some sort of overdrive mechanism that mixes the fuel with an incredibly volatile propellant for short-term, high-intensity situations. It's not enough to get him back out of here. The sprint it provides won't last that long to make a difference, but the front line is closer than the back line. He can make it to there. The pilot shuts off the radio as a stream of orders is barked his way to return to formation and to leave the engagement zone. 
The sky ahead of him suddenly shines with wildfire as a full armada of auto cannons and heavy machine guns unload his way in the very same second that he pulls the overdrive lever, cranking it up, his back and helmet slamming against the loveless, hard seat that he's strapped into. The kestrel shoots forward like a banshee escaping sunrise, straight toward the mass of enemy interceptors, the oddly structured air all around him wobbling and distorting as if he were an arrowhead rupturing through gel as he yanks the throttle, the kestrel flowing into a barrel roll as it glides through a tunnel of projectiles. The only place he is going is where he's always been, the only place that's familiar to a man with no name and only a designation as an identity. The only place of purpose that he has, that place is wherever he can be to advance their lines one day forward, wherever he can be to kill just one more of the enemy's numbers, to move the mission just an inch closer towards success. Nothing else matters, here, in the burning skies above the world that is locked into a decades-long war, flying over the ashen grave sites of some countless million screaming dead souls, he's already at home. His body and plane are cut through by hundreds of bullets at once, his hand presses down onto the self-destruction mechanism, cracking the glass housing, before the high explosive charge erupts and swallows the distorted sky, a cadre of enemy planes, and him whole in a wave of fire and shrapnel. This here, this is where he's going, if anywhere at all, his senses come to an end, and for the first time in any year of his life, there is no sound of gunfire. No roaring of engines, no screaming of voices in command or anguish, no thunderous explosions of mortar fire and artillery. For the first time ever for the man, everything is quiet, and it remains so until a single voice finally chimes in, coming to him impossibly through the filtering sound of radio static, as if he were still inside the Kestrel's cockpit. Perfect, says that woman's voice her tone changing from its prior lofty condescension and into something more appraising and motherly, you are exactly what I need. Even now, in death, the sensation of him falling never stops. Welcome, the final apocalypse has begun, a great rot has begun to spread across the world as a monster invasion unfolds over the continents, their goal is to ravage the land and destroy the world tree killing its last caretaker and breaking all hope for the goodness of life to ever thrive again. Given your aptitude and personality, you have been chosen to prevent this from happening at any cost. Failure to do so will result in the death of the world and everything in it. The rest is up to you. Good luck. Time until next invasion. Unknown. Status. Level. 01. Plane. JFZ09 Kestrel. Class. Pilot. Subclass. None. Health. 10 tenths. Soul. 15 15. EXP. 0 010. O balls. 0 0 a dryad, dash, level, 10, class, caretaker, soft bird song fills the air, together with the shrilling of many insects and the croaking of frogs, their combined songs creating the fitting soundscape to match the gentle atmosphere all around her, and she sings softly too, her voice joining the melody as she lets free the wordless song that her sister would always sing to her when she was scared. The winds of springtime softly push through the glades and the forest clearings, carrying over and onto the water of the great lake that is fed by so many rivers. The air smells of floral perfume as blossoms flower by the thousands all across the valley, and let it be known that life finds itself within a good season. The dryad turns her head, smiling and watching a fat, pleasantly buzzing bee fly toward her face. It stops and floats around her for a moment, as if wondering if she were one of the many blossoms before then flying off to find something more familiar after realizing that she is not turning her head round, she watches it go, buzzing towards the monumental thing that towers over the forest of many trees and the lake of many rivers. The world tree thriving there, in the middle of what may very well be paradise, is the single largest organism on the entire planet, a single tree whose roots can span across a continent and whose leaves and branches rest up in the sky so very high above. It takes days to walk around its base, its leaves, in the millions, fall and regrow in the amounts of drifting snowflakes in winter on any casual day, being carried off far and wide by the powerful air currents present up so high in the sky, spreading its magical essence all around the world to everywhere that the wind graces and that the leaves might land upon. The water that seeps through its roots, the pollen that swirls around its bark, 
the air that straddles its colossal mass, all of these things are blessed and touched by its nurturing power and carry the imbuing strength it gives them all across the world. It does so indiscriminately. The essence that the world tree gives off, it gives its gifts to the men of the fortresses and to the elves of the caverns, just as it gives its gifts to the orcs of the wild lands and the dwarves of the mountains. It gives these gifts to the animals of the old places of every part of the world, just the same as it gives them to the monsters of the horrible regions, where none dare to walk. Nature does not discriminate, it only provides and takes in appropriate measures. Air, water, magic, all manner of things are provided to the world as a whole by the world tree and she alone is the sole caretaker of it remaining. All of the others have left one by one, there having been a need for them in the aching reaches of the dying world that needs more healing than there are hands and souls to provide. All of them have gone to counteract the bleak tide that is slowly ebbing toward the world tree. There used to be dozens of them, caretakers. Then only a handful, then it was just the two of them, her and another sister. She isn't sure if she is imagining it. But every night is a little longer than the one that came before these days, and every dream that comes to her in her sleep is just a little darker and more frightening. Something snarls at her from the side, she turns her head, looking at the startled young bear that had been foraging through the blueberry bushes. In her daydreams, she had stumbled straight into it, after recognizing her, the animal lowers its head again and continues on as if nothing ever happened. Are you well today? asks the caretaker her hand stroking the bear's fur as she walks past it, the bear ignoring her presence now. Oh? She stops, looking down to the side and then rubbing the animal's belly, feeling it. The bear is with young. Congratulations. She says, letting her hand fall from the expecting animal and rise to the bushes. Caretaker, has used, enhanced growth. The blueberry bush that the bear is picking clean swells as the magic of her spell causes the plant to drink deeply of the rich world, pulling in vital resources and producing a swelling load of thick, dripping berries in the span of a few moments, their soft, tautly skinned bodies bursting from oozing juice. Eat well. Smiling peacefully to herself, she walks through the dense, thriving forest, the likes of which is to be found nowhere else in the world. The soil here beneath the canopy of the world tree is saturated with nutrients and deep minerals. The dirt is moist and rich. Life thrives here in abundance. Sister, calls the dryad as she reaches her goal, gently pushing aside the brambles of the forest. Sister, I've come, she says, stepping into the sunlit glade, her sister's favorite spot. In a way, it was very fortunate for it to have been here, of all places. Stopping. The caretaker stands there at the edge of the clearing and looks into it, at the heap of things laying in the open grass under the sunlight. Her sister's corpse lies there, covered in a blanket of bark from the world tree. Desiccators, native to the area in legions, have begun their work of taking the dead body and returning it to the world. Mushrooms have begun sprouting from the exterior of the bark, feeding on the corpse together with countless insects and worms that move it around up and down as if the dead body below were still breathing. This is the natural way. There is only one dryad left, she had found her sister dryad dead only a day ago, taken exactly here, where she lies now. A knife was pressed through her, made of crude, sharp metal. It seems that the monsters have finally begun to reach the edges of the territory. The Grey Trot has finally found the World Tree's garden. Kneeling down in the grass at the edge of the clearing, she stares at her sister, whom she has come to visit before the body is fully devoured and broken down by the natural order and her spirit moves on and back into the cycle of rebirth. She talks to her, telling her about such things as her feelings and the fond memories she has shared with her. It hurts, but this really is the way of life. Animals, people, and monsters, they all kill and eat one another interchangeably. It is the exchange that nature created. Come back soon, sister, says the dryad quietly lowering her head and placing a palm down to touch the ground beneath herself, far from the corpse, in which worms and mycelial roots have already begun to return the body to the world, the forest, the grass, the animals, they all take from her sister and grow in turn, she hasn't seen the culprit, but she assumes it to have been a goblin, given the weapon that she hasn't touched, it lies where it fell in the rocks by the dead trees, goblins are vicious, small monsters that are more cruel than intelligent, it did not eat her sister, so the killing was for sport. This, too, is not unheard of in nature. Large cats, birds, 
There are many animals that hunt, not for food but for the sake of it. Her hands, still touching the world, feel the energies moving through it. She listens to the whispering of the roots of the trees in the forest and to the secret hushed words and tones given in return by the mushrooms. The two creations of life often interacting with one another. She hears as they talk of the great rot. From all across the world, one root touches another. A tree near a mountain touches the roots of grasses below the peaks. The grasses spread across the tundra, where their roots touch the shrubbery of the boreal forests. Those roots connect and talk to one another, spreading out in all directions from one forest to the next, to the next, as the flowers speak to the trees, which speak to the mushrooms, and so on. A word whispered on the other end of the world makes its way through this great chain of life, resounding out in all directions. The plants never do have much to say, but when a single word makes its way across the whole of the world, it is one of significance, and for a time now, there has only been one single phrase uttered by the connected hive mind of all living things. Rot, a great rot, the great rot, has begun spreading from the other side of the world. Day by day, it consumes more and more. The march of the dead things corrupts the world and its beautiful natural places as legions of monsters roam and rampage in a way that none have ever seen before. The great cities of the people of the world fall one after the other to the horde. The meadow mice drown in lakes of blood, sickering down into the deep burrows from above. One fortress after the other, one group after the other, falls, and the monsters keep on marching. And soon, the great rampage, the great desecration, will have made its way here to the last mark of true pure, natural love and life on the world, the world tree. There is nothing that anyone can do to stop it, not her, not any of the great kings or armies of legend, no hidden fortress in the mountains can be overseen, and no ship out at distant sea can go unnoticed, everything will die, everyone population die off are also not unheard of in the natural world. Sometimes, a species comes and simply replaces another one. There is nothing that anyone can do to stop it. Lifting her gaze, tears fall from her face as she mourns her dead sister, wondering how long she has left herself, as would any animal of intelligence and soul. The sun flickers, a shadow casting down from over her head for a brief second. Confused, she covers her eyes and lifts her gaze in surprise, watching as a streak of black smoke and raging flames are cast down to the world below from the thick clouds of what feels like it ought to be a good day. A falling meteor rips through the sky from the horizon above, hurtling downward faster than she can follow. She jumps to her feet in shock, watching it and feeling the heat of its presence overhead for just a moment as it shoots above her close enough to scorch the treetops, before a loud, violent crashing comes from the lake behind her, hidden beneath the horizon-spanning shadow of the world tree. The dryad runs back the way she came toward the edge of the water fully unaware of the thing that had been skulking behind her in the dense forest as she mourned, quietly creeping closer and closer by the second. 11. Chapter 2. Goblin. A Dryad. Dash. Level. 10. Class. Caretaker. The Dryad finally makes her way out to the lake a while after the crash. Skulking at the edge of the water of the great waters, the caretaker stares out at the hissing thing that floats on the blue surface. Steam rises up into the air the water of the lake reacting to the superheated presence of whatever has crashed into it. Usually the waters of the lake are deeply selfish, swallowing and keeping whatever they take. However, this thing, it floats instead. A dragon? No, it has the size of a young drake, but it isn't something that is always alive. Even in whatever state it is in, she can tell that its body is inorganic, the lines are too straight, the mass is too rigid, and the nature of it is too unnatural. It is a creation of some kind, a construction. A dark, oozing liquid leaks out of its side like the black blood of a demon, staining the lake's surface as it begins to drift atop the water. Fire spreads from the dark grey body and out over the water as the corrupted blood burns. It does so for a while, until it then burns itself out, doing a harm to the ecosystem that she is unable to quantify. Deeply perplexed and not sure what to do. She watches the area for a moment and then touches the water of the lake with her hands. Caretaker, has used, flow adaptation. The gently ebbing current of the lake water changes, a rippling circle building on the surface where her spell collides, as if the wind were pressing down against it in a circle from above. The tide ebbs the large chest toward the shore, little by little, 
until it reaches the rocks and the crystal sand. Wading carefully into the water with bare feet, she cautiously lifts a hand and lets it hover above the thing's body for a moment, before then quickly testing it with a light slap of her fingers. She pulls back her hand, looking at it. This thing is made out of metal. The construction is pockmarked with deeply penetrating holes and scars, like the wings of an ancient beast after centuries of feuds and fights over dominion and power. Scorch marks cover it, along with a muck of ash, grease, and substances that she can't identify. There's a smell in the air that burns her nose and is highly acidic. She does not like it. The side of it is covered in paintings, all inorganic and stiff as well not markings of joy and love. Straight lines and scrolls adorn the body, more akin to the sigils and runes of warfaring tribes than something born of an artistic glow. Fish swim around her legs, slowly returning to the area. She takes this as a good sign. Fish are suspicious, if not exactly the most clever, animals. The caretaker lifts her gaze, looking at a mostly clear, cracked bauble that sits atop its wings. There are vivid streaks of blood all over the inside, glistening in the sunlight, as if the object had eaten something and this stone was its translucent belly. Hoisting herself up onto the wings, water sloshing down her body as she does so, the dryad balances herself on the floating construct and cautiously peers into it. Inside is a whole board cage, smeared with red all around, as if it had imprisoned a trapped animal that had been pierced with many spears, but there is nothing there now, it's empty. What is this thing? The dryad steps back, looking around the lake in confusion. Everything has returned to how it was, apart from one detail. Something is off, but she, fighting her overloaded senses and overwhelming thoughts, doesn't know exactly what that is. Everything seems to be as it should be, barring this oddity that she can't explain to herself. Looking back at the construct, not sure what to do with or about it, she slowly climbs back down into the water again and returns to the shore, staring at it for a time as the generous spring sun dries her body. The caretaker does not know much about the ways of humanity, having spent all of her life here, but she knows that nobody has ever told her about anything like this. Humans are clever animals, capable of making all sorts of things from carriages to complex monuments that hope to mimic the scale of the world tree. But whatever this construct here is that looks like a bird, it clearly was one of their less fortunate, if not more creative, endeavors. She can only assume that they, in their panic to avoid the great rot, had tried to learn the secrets of flight to escape it. It appears to have ended as one would expect from such unnatural foolishness. Even she knows that not even the birds in the sky can escape the foulness that is spreading. Her sister Dryads had always told her not to think so ill of the humans, that it is simply their natural state to defy nature, as with any other sentient species, but she had always found a bit of an irk whenever she heard a new story about a forest destroyed for wood and space, a rare beast hunted for trophies, or a mountain enclave mined for jewels and ore. Shaking her head, she turns around, having decided to return to her day. This strange object is a curiosity, for sure but there doesn't seem to be much else here. She has other tasks that she must attend to that take priority. She'll come back to this later, once she finds out what to do with it. Her many thoughts, carrying between this unusual situation, the unusual situation from yesterday, and her own confused emotions, come to a quick, sudden halt as she suddenly and finally realizes something, the thing that had been bothering her a moment ago. The oddity. Quietly lifting her eyes to the tree line, the dryad listens. There is no bird song anymore. There are no buzzing insects. There are no croaking frogs. There are no bees, and no grasshoppers, and no fish splashing in the body of the lake behind her. It is totally quiet. Her eyes slowly widen as she realizes what this means. The presence of a predator. Whenever danger is around, all animals fall silent so that they aren't the thing that is taken. By the time she finishes turning her head to the side, she doesn't have time to react as a heavy rock strikes against her skull. A loud, disgusting crack runs through her head as she falls down to the wet sands of the shoreline, her vision spinning as she instinctively crawls back and away in an animal terror, but something yanks on her leg, gripping her ankle and pulling her back through the wet, sand, caretaker has been struck by, goblin, you have taken, O2, damage, status applied, bleeding, O1, dazed, O1, her blurred, terrified, and confused eyes look back at the green silhouette standing over her, a goblin, 
In that delirious moment, she knows that she should lift her hands and cast some sort of spell to defend herself, but she doesn't. Her mind is stuck, frozen as it finds itself thinking instead of doing. The dryad has never fought anything before, except for the odd wrestling match with her sisters during better days. She doesn't know how to defend herself, even if she wants to. Dryads have always lived in peace beneath the world tree. There were never any monsters here. There were never any threats to her kind at all. Food is abundant. The water is clean and plentiful. Humans, elves, orcs, or any of the other common races are unable to enter beneath its eminent shadow, as their magic repels them from entering. This garden, the valley, is essentially a secluded paradise in which there has never stepped foot anything that can be considered dangerous, until now. It's so sudden, the fact that she's about to die, it just, it's so quick isn't it? Wait. She's going to die? Her new thoughts catch up with her own prior thoughts as she thinks herself into a circle, not sure why she isn't doing something else. She's frozen like a doe staring at sunrise. The dryad knows that it's an odd thought as she lies on her back, trying and failing to get up, to crawl away, as she looks at the silhouette of something man-shaped standing over her, holding a bloodied rock over its head with one gangly hand and holding her leg firmly with the other. But she was just living life a second ago and now she's. It strikes the rock against her a second time, and she screams, the sensation of the fracturing moving through her body from the top down, causing a deep nausea in her gut as she kicks and flails, trying to fight the monster off. Her blurred eyes can't keep up with the updating status windows, flashing with critical colors as she's attacked. She wonders if this is what her sister thought too, right before it happened to her, it was so fast. The last caretaker struggles as best as she can in her locked in state, losing more and more momentum and strength, as the goblin continues to bash her with the sharp rock, blood splattering everywhere, her panicked, wild efforts proving to be unfruitful against the prepared stalker and attacker, she can barely see anymore, her vision is flooded with blood, sand crunches, the goblin on top of her is casually approached from the side by another silhouette, a person. The human holds something rigid and metallic and dark against the side of the head of goblin, crystal grit crunching beneath black boots as the new figure comes to a stop. It's a human in soaked, stone grey, puffy clothes. He's covered in blood and the marks of an inferno's kiss, and his head is hidden behind a shattered mask of war with striped adornments. A single, sharp crack ruptures the air her head feeling as if it had been struck one last time by the blood-painted rock as the sound channels through her body and everything that lies deeper within. Fire escapes his hand. Thousands of birds shoot out of the forest as the sudden noise reverberates out and across the valley over and over again. The strike of a single heavenly hammer echoes across the great lake a hundred times over before the monster has finished falling over, dead, before the spray of skull fragments and inner matter has landed on the shore. A single second passes after that time-slowed moment. The battle is over, pilot, has executed, goblin plus 10 EXP. Goblin scout. A goblin scout, blurring the line between the core races of the world and monsters, goblins have firmly chosen their side as belonging to the latter group, they are notoriously clever and vicious creatures, with keen animal instincts and enough intelligence to maintain their own language, culture, and violent tribal society spread around the world, goblins prefer to live in a collective gathering of many small groups, commonly in shared cave systems and forests. This particular goblin is a scout, a lightly equipped, quick goblin who was chosen for the role because of its particularly lanky and light build. Entity, monster, rank, f, element, none, type, primitive, exp, 10, plus tilde, level up, tilde plus, pilot, has leveled up to level, 02. New ability. Munitions, regenerate sidearm passive, fully restores the munitions count of your sidearm every, 24, hours, the slain goblin falls over and off of her, splashing into the water of the lake and leaking out into it, in that same instant, the man falls over just the same, falling the other way and moving no more, dazed and terrified, the dryad crawls back now that she is free, scrambling away with several strides and fistfuls of coarse sand, until she falls down herself again, turning around to look back behind her at the two bodies lying there at the end of the generous trail of her own blood, as she finally catches her breath and her vision slowly stops spinning.
Despite the throbbing in her head, red runs down her lacerated face as she watches the chest of the human man who saved her gently rise and fall, much the same as her sister's corpse beneath the burial shroud, much the same as the ebbing water of the lake. The great tree that cuts into the sky behind the sight of him sways ever so gently in the great gale that sails across the world, its millions of leaves rustling audibly and almost sounding like the quiet hissing of rain. 9. Chapter 3, Healing. What exactly is she supposed to do here? Having tended to her own wounds, the dryad had brought the human back to a place of safety, the den, transporting him was simple enough using a sled of dead wood and old ropes. They use such things themselves now and then when carrying the heavy stones of rockfalls and such out of the way. Dryads are physically strong things, very in tune with their bodies and the natural world, with the rewards of a life outside in nature. Together with a little help from a sled, she had managed to drag the puffy man all the way back around the lake and to the den. The goblin she left where it died, just the same as it had done for her sister. This is as nature wishes. The dead stay still, the living are those who move, the bear, the insects, the fish, the desiccators, they might now eat them both, as is natural and in accordance with the laws of the world. The caretaker stares at the puffy man, whom she has hoisted onto the bedding made of old, crunched leaves of the world tree and rolls of its flaked bark, he continues to breathe, but his body is broken, cut, and pierced, his deeper gaping wounds seem to have been haphazardly filled with some sort of dispersed, soft fabric that was hastily pressed into them, like a rag forced into a sap leaking tree, but it, as well as all of his clothes, are soaked through by sticky red in the cleansing waters of the lake. It's odd, her fingers, squeezing the edge of his sleeve, run over the material, it feels cold and oddly scratchy, but the body of the material is very puffy, as if filled with a considerable amount of padding, his helmet, as cracked and fractured as his body, is set aside next to him, his skin is marked and scarred by days of sun, conflict, and fire, and his hair is the color of soot to match. He is not from this region, the men of this land have hair of oak and wood, not black like this, like her own. As for the helmet, it is not uncommon for knights to wear helmets that hide their faces and heads, but she has never seen or heard of one that is quite so. Round a door with a visor of obsidian glass. As a prey animal, she should be dead now, it's somewhat hard to think about, honestly, but it's true. Dryads are not well capable of killing or fighting. Their magic is unsuited to it, and their bodies, while strong, are often hampered by their more diminutive size and their deeply pacifistic culture. The world tree and its shadow have always been safe, the ill will of both monsters and men had never tread foot here, held at bay by the world tree's protective powers. So her species has dedicated themselves to safekeeping, protecting, and helping to nurture it. However, those days have now ended with the crisis that looms large. Many dryad also subscribe to a philosophy of true pacifism, no matter what the circumstances, believing that violence is never the way. In an ironic sense, this pacifism of theirs is perhaps deeply unnatural, and so it is a strange contrast to the holistic mannerisms of the species, as every wild animal in the world will fight desperately with tooth and claw to preserve its life. However, this is the one tenant that many have always followed. Such a societal development is only natural for a society that has had no threats or predators of any kind for generations upon generations now. In the eyes of these once guiding voices of dryad society, limited as it was, a dryad is only ever allowed to use its abilities for the sake of healing, helping, and nurturing never for violence or harm under any circumstances, they may not do so to protect anyone else, themselves, or even the world tree. Their lives are only present to act as givers to the world, this is sacred and cannot be defied. She had never delved so deeply into these matters, being too young to be concerned with the nature of politics and personal beliefs, so she is confused about what to feel. Her body aches and pains, and so does her inside because she feels like she should have kicked harder, struck harder, bitten and clawed, so that she would have fended off the goblin herself, yet, if many sisters were around to have seen her do so, she would have been shunned, even if it was in an act of defense for her life. She doesn't know what to think, this human killed the goblin that had taken her sister and was about to take her too, as such, she owes him a debt for doing something that she could perhaps never do. On the other hand, she stares down at him, not able to stop wondering if these events aren't somehow his fault, 
It seems like quite a coincidence that all of these happenings came at once, however, even in her grief-addled mind, she can't create a conspiracy that blames the deaths on him, as his arrival came the latest, so instead she relents and accepts the fact that she has no choice in the matter to come. The human helped her, so she must help him, the trees give sugar to the mushrooms, and the mushrooms give minerals to the trees the flowers give pollen to the bees, and the bees pollinate them in turn. Reciprocity. There is an exchange present in nature between those things that are aligned. Fiddling for a time, trying to figure out the many clasps and mechanisms, she undoes the puffy clothes and begins setting to work on creating a healing salve to apply to his burns and cuts. The deeper wounds she must close with the help of sticky sap to hold the skin together and magic to regenerate the lost flesh. His broken bones must be set. Pieces of sharp metal that have penetrated his flesh stick out from him like the broken fangs of the wolf and must be removed, there is a lot to do. Hours have passed, she pulls out the last piece of metal, lightly working it from side to side as she extracts it from his body. As she pulls the sharp, bent thing free, a stream of blood oozes out immediately afterward to fill the new gap, holding a folded roll of soft bark against it. She pads the wound closed and presses it firmly until the blood cakes and dries, holding the bark all by itself. Then, taking the dense herbal cream that she's made and leaning over him, she looks at his chest, staring at the many old scars. They have a form like a dozen spider's webs, arching out in many directions from central masses of contrastingly pale skin. They seem like the marks of arrows that have run through his body. Her eyes wander back up to his face. She screams the human's hands shoot up in an instant, one of them grabbing hold of her antler and roughly twisting her head, the other pulling a silver knife out from the side of his leg, the two of them roll and crash down to the floor next to the bedding, with her down on her front and him on top of her back, her head forcefully angled to the side as he pulls the sharp blade against her neck, panting for air as if he had been running for days on end. Wait, wait she calls, trying to assure him that everything is okay as she lifts her hands slowly next to her head, the metal pressing against her skin as the man frantically looks around himself, she recognizes that gaze on his face as she looks back out of the side of her eyes, it isn't the expression of someone who is present and fully there, it is the look of an animal that doesn't know where it is, like that of a fox trapped down in a collapsed burrow. There's nothing that she can say that will reach him right now in his adrenaline-fueled survival drive, but as she speaks, explaining her intentions, she realizes something. Humans don't speak the dryad language. Her mind racks itself on what to do before she dies after all today, and before she can come to a collected consensus of thoughts. She hears her sister's voice echoing around in the den, singing that soft song she always sang whenever she herself had gotten scared. Surprised, her eyes wander through the space until she realizes that it's her own voice. There's hardly a less aggressive gesture than singing, right? The hand lets go of her antlers, stopping the forced craning of her neck as the weight on her back shifts. Slowly, she slides free and looks at the man, who is slumped against the bedding looking down at himself and the bloodied, removed fabric all around him. Core soaked soft bark lies in heaps everywhere, having been used to clean the skin before she applied the ointments and medicine. He's still wild in demeanor but seems to be coming to himself. Rare herbal ointment. A potent mixture of rare herbs, the shells of dead fruit wood beetles, and the root powder of the world tree. This strong ointment can be applied to any manner of wound and combined with a magical release to prevent infections from developing in the body. Effect, when applied to any open wounds, it greatly reduces the chance of stacking status. Infection, developing and numbs the area. Weight, 200 milliliters. Value, rare sleeping medicine. Concocted from the harvested venom sacs of dead world tree spiders. This potent medicine has been distilled over and over again to reduce the deadly venom down to a strong sedative effect. Effect, when consumed, adds stacking status, exhaustion, to critical levels. Caution, this medicine is deadly in doses too large for the body to handle. Weight, 10 milliliters. Value, she almost died twice today. Looking to the side at the spilled cream, she crawls over toward it and scoops it back together as best she can on a large leaf of the world tree. The two of them stare at one another from across the small room, over the top of the outwardly held knife, as she holds it out toward him, 
gesturing in a circular motion with their free hand around her chest in an attempted explanation. She isn't sure if it works or not, as the two of them just quietly stare for a while longer. But then, the human man takes the leaf, picking up on her meaning, and follows through, sticking his fingers into the ointment rather carelessly. However, instead of applying it, he smells it and recoils, wincing once from that, and then again a second time from moving his injured body so quickly. Unsure, he looks back at her encouraging gestures and then begins to apply the medicine himself, although he makes a mess of it, sloppily applying uneven globules of the ointment, before just hammering it in with a series of slaps and smears like he was squishing berries. At this point, she can't watch anymore and approaches, taking over with a scolding tone. He seems to allow it this time as he finally leans back and closes his eyes, his rattling breath continuing as she does a much better job at it than he had. By the time she's finished going everywhere that he allows her to, she's hummed the song a few dozen times, and her hands are covered in an oily mixture of blood, ointment, and wound fluid. The dryad presses both of her palms against his chest. Caretaker, has used, cure, hard ointment, success, status, bleeding, O2. Infection, O1, burn, O3, removed, plus 16 EXP. A light presses itself between her palms and his skin. The ointment that was applied to his many severe wounds crackles and hardens, stiffening like dried leather as it seals the many exterior openings, patching him whole with something akin to skin. It will take much time to heal injuries of this nature and severity inside the body, but at least for now, he is safe from bleeding and infection. Reaching out, he takes the ointment from her hand, gesturing for her to lean over toward him. The dryad blinks, realizing that the human man wants to apply the medicine to her. No, she remarks, waving her hands, which she realizes are still shaking from earlier. The tired man says something in a language she doesn't understand and repeats his motion. She blinks, unsure. Then, not really sure why exactly, she gives in somewhat awkwardly and leans to the side toward him. Letting him dab the ointment, this time somewhat more carefully than he was before, on her bruising, broken, and cut places. She could have done it herself, so she's not sure why he wants to do this. He's in much worse shape, all things considered. After this is finished, she uses her spell on herself to harden the ointment, and the man finally gives in to his fight against wakefulness as he allows her to be give him the sleeping medicine. He immediately falls to rest, lying on the floor rather than on the bedding behind him from which he had started. The dryad does the same, collapsing instead into her sister's bed and taking in the smell imprinted into the fabric as she dreams of nostalgic days that were less complicated. 8. Chapter 4, Plain A man, dash, level, 01, class, pilot. The night passes. He doesn't know what's happening as he drifts in and out of sleep over and over again. Waking up every so often to find the girl hovering over him with a face covered in oil smeared bruises and marks. She adjusts some of his wrappings, and pushes his head back down every time he tries to get up. He's messed up pretty badly. He knows that much for sure. His mind wanders throughout the delirious mixture of his half dreams until the morning comes and he tries to rise again, only to be forced back down by his host, as was the case during the entirety of the night. His body isn't responding like he needs it to, but that's not surprising. It's in a serious recovery state. But he can't just stay here in this woman's hut, or whatever this is. He has to radio back home and establish an evacuation. Did he crash behind enemy lines? No. How could that be possible? He, his eyes stare blankly into a wall as a wooden bowl is held to his mouth and tipped lightly so that the rich broth inside of it flows past his lips. He remembers. He was in the air. He self-destructed. He heard that voice, that stranger on the radio and then, the man's glazed eyes widen as he shoots upright, inadvertently knocking the bowl out of the girl's hands. Soup spills and splashes everywhere as the wooden bowl rattles across the compacted dirt and stone floor. She fusses, fuming about something and shoving him back as she looks at the mess, barely rising to her feet before he's on his way, limping to the door of the domicile that is covered by nothing except strings of beads bracing himself on everything he can to stay upright, one hand making sure his insides stay where they ought to as he goes. Two hands pull him back, and he shoves her away, making a stopping gesture. Thanks, we're even now, says the pilot, looking at her and lifting his hand in a stopping motion. 
He looks past her at the wet floor. Sorry about the mess, he apologizes, grabbing what looks like a rag to help clean it up. She snatches the cloth from his hands and he's sure she's about to drag him back to the bed. So he quickly limps off toward the trees he sees just outside instead, well aware that he isn't wearing his uniform right now. He has to know where he is. The air outside is gently hot, stemming from a baseline of pleasantly temperate. The temperature is significantly different from the depths of the winter that he had been in during that assault on the enemy position when he was in the air. The man breaks out along a small path that leads outward, moving forward below a small canopy of greenery until he finds himself standing on the edge of a steep ledge, high above the lake that he recognizes from above. It shimmers in the daylight. The wind blows, tousling his matted hair as he stares out at the wide world beyond that he is able to view from here, seeing all the way to the distant horizon from the peak above an impossibly green valley that he finds himself atop. Down below him is an azure lake, deeply sapphire blue in its hue, and there, even visible from here, is the wreckage of the Kestrel, washed to shore by the ebbing waters. The inside of the valley is nothing but deep forests rock formations, and meadows full of many flowers in vibrant colors that he doesn't even recognize outside of him having seen them in faded books and prints. Slowly, the pilot looks back behind himself and at the fussing, fuming girl walking his way again, his brain really registering that she has antlers on her head for the first time, despite him having already held them in his hands once, as his gaze slowly starts to rise past her staring up further and further until his neck can crane upward no more. He looks at the colossus that he stands in the shadow of a tree like a mountain, it cuts up further than he can gaze, its highest boughs nearly invisible to the eye as they hide in the cover of the clouds above. His head spins, he's not sure if it's from the strange food and medicine, his grim injuries, or just the delirium of the situation. Hurrying as best as he can, the wounded pilot makes his way down the path, fighting off the stranger who keeps trying to drag him back, neither of them really having the strength to ward off the other entirely. Standing at the edge of the kestrel, panting for breath, the sweat-covered soldier stares at the plane's wreckage. It doesn't look as bad as he thought, but the plane definitely won't fly without someone to look it over. The engineers and him are going to get into the real fist fight if they run into each other after this them because he wrecked their plane, him because they made him fly in such an uncomfortable shitbox. But that's assuming that's a possibility. He climbs onto the wing, and his host practicality screams as she clutches her short, black hair, watching the deeply wounded man balance his way over the tepid water of the lake that threatens to undo all of her hard work. Her behavior reminds him of the fresh nursing staff back home, they're also always so involved. But by the time they serve a few years, they burn through and just let you walk off to die if that's what you want to do. His hands release the locking mechanism for the cockpit. The canopy opens. Looking inside at the mess he left there, through the many holes, he finds what he's looking for. Grabbing the radio, the pilot flicks it on. It should have an independent power source. Assuming everything isn't waterlogged, the canopy itself looks dry enough. Though the pilot switches through the radio's channels, squawking into it but never receiving anything back except for the sound of rainfall, static white noise, that sounds like the sound of a million rustling leaves. There's nothing on board that can help him. There's no survival rifle, no emergency ration, no field kit, nothing. The designers really meant it when they inserted the self destruction mechanism, which he doesn't quite understand the existence of right now. Lifting the chair, he looks down beneath it at the explosive charge that he is very sure he himself had detonated. He's very sure he died. And yet, here it is. The Kestrel is whole, more or less, and so is he, more or less. The only thing that isn't right is the world. The pilot slowly closes the canopy of the Kestrel, turning around to look at his fussing rescuer, standing there with arms so tightly crossed that they could choke out a brigadier general. Then he turns his gaze, looking at the swelling small green corpse that is rotting on the side of the lake. Walking down the wing, back to the sands, he thinks and then looks up at the stranger, who seems to be following him. Antlers girl. Small, green monster. Giant tree. Larger than the world's tallest mountain. Him being alive instead of very very dead. With all of this, together with the memory of the voice he heard on the radio as he died, he thinks that it's safe to say that he isn't in the enemy nation anymore, or 
anywhere he's ever heard of, for that matter. Sitting down on a rock, the pilot stares at the kestrel. He points at its destroyed body and then at himself as the annoyed girl looks at him, perhaps wondering if he's going to give in now. I'm a pilot, he explains, pretty sure that they don't even speak the same language. I crashed here. Where are we? He asks, looking around the area. Something catches his eye in the sand. Grunting, he bends down, picking up something small and shiny from the shore of the lake. She stares at him curiously, not quite understanding his words, it would seem. They really don't speak the same language. A moment later, something appears, floating in the air. A window, glassy and clear, about the size of the length of one of his arms. Pilot, has gathered. Normal brass bullet casing, 7.63 times 25 millimeters. This is the casing of the bullet he fired yesterday, when he killed the goblin. Huh? It's some kind of display, a screen. A second later, with the pieces pulling together out of his memory, he gets his idea and touches the window. Status. Level. O2. Plane. JFZ09 Kestrel. Class. Pilot. Subclass. None. Health. O314. Soul. 1919. EXP. 0020. O balls. O O O. Well, damn, says the man, rising to his feet too quickly before then wincing and keeling over in one swift movement. She catches him, grabbing his shoulders as he looks up her way, tapping on the glassy screen of the manifested window to show it to her. The antlered girl looks, her eyes widening. Artilda, she says, seemingly realizing something as he stands back upright, looking his way with an understanding smile. Pilot. Pilot. He repeats, tapping his chest and then pointing at the plane. Pilot. She repeats, nodding as he stands back upright as best as he can. She lightly strikes her own chest with a flat palm. Caretaker, says the woman with a strong accent that emphasizes the vowels and adds a strong H tone to the end of them opening a window of her own. This seems to be some kind of introduction. Status. Level. 10. Class. Caretaker. Subclass. None. Health. 2121. Soul. 5050. EXP. 93170. O oh, balls, O oh, O oh, O. Oh. Interesting. So this display seems to list their professions along with some other values that he hasn't deciphered yet. The pilot nods, looking back down at the brass casing in his hands for a moment. He then flicks it into the air toward her, walking off. The dryad yelps in surprise, catching the shiny thing before it falls, and then looks at it perplexingly for a time before her eyes open in a display of sudden shock. Caretaker takes a moment, her face turning back between him and the casing a few times, seemingly taken aback. She yells incoherently, throwing the brass far out into the water with quite a good arm. Actually, the single bullet casing that had ejected from his pistol when he killed the goblin flies far out into the lake. It splashes into the water, sinking away into the blue. Confused, he looks at her lost expression and then shrugs. He supposes that she doesn't like bullets. The pilot gets left behind as the caretaker very quickly vanishes for a while. He assumes that they're done with whatever this was now and begins making plans for how to salvage the kestrel while observing a new window he has found his way to that makes the situation more clear in one sense, even if it does raise many, many other questions. Mission. The final apocalypse has begun. A great rot has begun to spread across the world as a monster invasion unfolds over the continents. Their goal is to ravage the land and destroy the world tree, killing its last caretaker and breaking all hope for the goodness of life to ever thrive again. Given your aptitude and personality, you have been chosen to prevent this from happening at any cost. Failure to do so will result in the death of the world and everything in it. The rest is up to you. Good luck. Time until invasion. Oh seven, days. He swipes it away and returns to his planning, before the hour is over and he has used what little strength that he has available. Caretaker has come back to the lake and finally drags him away back to the den again, not speaking to him this time. He's not really sure what he did wrong. It must just be some cultural difference that he has awkwardly stepped into. A day passes. Pilot spends his time mostly fading in and out of sleep or shuffling like a zombie outside every now and then to take care of hygienic matters. In his wakeful hours, of which there are few, he finds himself thinking about the logistics of his situation. Is this the afterlife? Maybe? Another world. He's delirious enough to think it is. His wounds are vividly red and pulsating, with a fire that snakes through his body. 
his feverish dreams are filled with vipers and flames, both reaching out from the depths of the world as he flies, tearing him down toward them. Each time he wakes up, only to find caretaker changing a wound covering or reapplying an ointment, every time his heart beats, he is sure that the odd, crusty, hardened casts that the girl has sealed his injuries with are going to break off and crumble, but they never do. He's brought food, but she doesn't bother trying to feed him any more like yesterday, instead just setting the bowl down and pointing at it, saying a single word before walking off to do whatever it is she does all day, pilot. Honestly, it's better than any rations or canteen food that he's ever eaten in taste by leagues that cannot be compared, even if his body protests against the noticeable lack of gristle cheap oils, and processed industrial grain product in its nutrition as he downs another bowl of cold soup. She doesn't seem like much of a meat eater, he's noticing. Pilot watches caretaker walk out of the small domicile that is nestled beneath the massive tree that he still hasn't quite managed to wrap his head around yet. The man stares at her antlers and, perhaps not that confusingly, her doe tail as she leaves. Weird, he's definitely not anywhere near home. Shrugging. He eats and then tidies up the area to show his reciprocity, though perhaps the final result looks more like one would find in a barracks rather than a home. Another day passes. Pilot is outside by the kestrel. He has to get the plane out of the water first. If he's lucky, it'll still start in taxi when it's dried a little. Flying might be a bit of an ask, he isn't sure, but getting it upright and ready will be a big help to him because Pilot as appears to be his name now rather than simply his profession, stands there and stares at the Kestrel. Back in the old world, they were stripped of their names after enlisting and given a designation instead. In a way, this feels like that, because what, exactly? This clearly isn't home, the war that never ends isn't here, there's nothing here, he doesn't even need the plane, does he? He has some odd, undefined mission from something to save the world tree, whatever the hell that means. But is this really something that concerns him? He has no investments here. Who gives a flying fuck about the world tree? He doesn't even remember the last time he touched an actual tree. His host, caretaker, is nice though, if not a bit strange. She doesn't look like someone who deserves to die. If some obscure danger is coming this way to burn down the tree, then she's more like a civilian caught in the middle of it than a participating combatant from what he sees. As he thinks those thoughts, something itches inside of him. He doesn't need the plane. He wants the plane. This place here. This paradise, is peaceful. It's beautiful. It's serene. Honestly, he might very well have crash landed into heaven itself. If the ghost of the Pope came up and out of the woods that he had been shitting in and shook his hand right now, Pilot wouldn't blink twice about the matter. But that's what's bothering him the most. Men like himself don't go to paradise, and the thought of not having a weapon ready that he could have ready makes him uneasy, as it should. All of his years of life in the war have taught him a simple lesson. The unprepared die. He has a knife and a pistol with a few more shots worth of ammunition. That's not nearly enough for any sane man to fall asleep easily at night in a place like this. Sure, the pistol now regenerates its ammunition every day, but what is he supposed to do with that? His 7.63x25mm personal sidearm is loaded with one single 8-round standard detachable box magazine. 8 shots a day. Infinite, yes, but only limited. The Kestrel. Meanwhile, shoots 33 bullets per second, which, sadly, are currently not infinite in their supply. The thought of this being a possibility gives him the indescribable fuzzies, however, there are clearly rules at play here in this world that would allow this to happen somehow, right? If it works for the pistol, it can work for the Kestrel's dual-mounted machine guns too, right? So in the end, the two weapons can't be compared, with only a sidearm, he's practically buck naked out here. Nervously, the scarred soldier rise the chirping, colorful birds, whistling beautiful songs in the trees, the water splashes behind him as fish jump, chasing after the sunlit reflections atop the water of paradise, the petals of gossamer flowers drift gently through the air, carried by a soft, pleasant wind, the graces of an everlasting, most peaceful spring make themselves felt on his skin with the kiss of the sun's warmth, if he wants to survive and escape this nightmarish hellscape, then he needs to get the kestrel ready before he goes insane. How can anyone live in a place like this? Pilot watches the forest as the nearby birds fly, flocking into the sky and cutting through the early morning fog. 
There is no roaring line of artillery hammering the world, the ground isn't scorched grey and dead, having been sterilized by fire and poison generations ago, the air isn't caustic and acrid to breathe, there aren't as many skulls on the ground as there are rocks in a quarry. Endless fires don't spread across the horizon, filling the night with a day equivalent shine. Poison gas doesn't roll across the hills like early morning fog, maybe this really is the afterlife, maybe this place is hell. This isn't what life is supposed to be like. This place here is sick and wrong, I need ropes, says Pilot to himself, going into the nearby forest and trying to find anything usable, but finds nothing of the sort. There are all manner of plants and fungi here, the likes of which he's never seen, his survival training hasn't prepared him for this, but the girl, caretaker, has one, doesn't she? In her home, Pilot makes his way back, the antlered girl staring at him as she sits there separating the petals of many flowers into many baskets around her, he points at a rope on the wall, looking at her caretaker, says the man, nudging the rope and looking at her, she eyes him curiously and then nods, thanks, says Pilot, taking the rope and heading back to the kestrel, it's handwoven and feels ridiculously strong, caretaker is talented in making things, it seems, wrapping the rope around the airframe and then around a tree, Pilot climbs into the cockpit, wiping away crusted blood as he checks the brake to see if it's released, it is, and then deploys the landing gear, the wheels drop out of the frame, Pilot climbs out again, pulling on the rope as hard as he can, straining himself, this goes on for a while, not so successfully, as he can't really exert himself all that much with his wounds, Pilot, says an annoyed voice from the side, he looks at caretaker who has come down to the lake, she walks over, examining his construction, and then grabs the end of the rope, nodding to him, he nods back, and the two of them pull at the same time, he can only assume that she's helping so that he doesn't tear open his own wounds again, the kestrel slides onto the shore, the thick, wide wheels rolling over the wet, crystal sand as the plane slowly comes out of the water, which pours down its metal frame, leaking out of the gaps in the wings and body, pilot sighs in relief, looking at the plane, which seems to be in one whole piece, sort of, caretaker lets out some quietly curious ooze as she examines the body of the plane, feeling along it with her palms as she seems to try to understand how exactly, it has come to be, it seems very likely that she has no idea what a plane even is, some ranking officer would probably try to put him against the wall for letting a civilian look at the experimental aircraft so closely, even if it's a survival situation, and when he does make it into the air thanks to her help, he can assume that the theoretical orders from above would be to execute her and any other witnesses, before flying back to base, that's what war is, the enemy can't know about the Kestrel's abilities, but again, there is no enemy, there is no war, there is nothing here that would incline him to move down such a path, but as caretaker turns his way, looking in confusion, as she knocks on the plane, as if seemingly wondering if he could somehow possibly explain what it is somehow to her with their limited shared vocabulary, he finds his hand still idly resting on the pocket holster for his side arm as his eyes warily scan the area. The bushes rustle behind him, pilot spins around, pulling out the pistol with a quick draw and aiming it dead center at the fat, gray rabbit, which peeks out of the underbrush, staring curiously toward them with big, round eyes that match its body. He can't help but notice the sound of laughter coming from behind him all of a sudden. Pilot sighs, turning around to look at caretaker, who is clutching her stomach and clearly not bothering to hide her amusement at all only ever stopping herself as her laughter hurts her own hurting body. Caretaker stands up straight, comically mimicking his rigid posture as she copies his movements, pointing her fingers at the bushes too, before laughing again. The rabbit runs away, Pilot moves quickly, he lifts his hands a second time, aiming the pistol her way, and pulls the trigger. A single crack echoes through the air, the gunshot disrupting the day's long piece in the valley. A single body flops down to the sands, falling from the back of the plane that it had crept up unseen. Caretaker yells in surprise, running and scrambling away as a new goblin that had been sneaking up on her, oozing black blood out of its shot belly, yells and writhes in the sands, staining them with its leaking bile from the gut wound. He fucking knew it, the goblins, they're in the goddamn forest, anything that looks like this place is too good to be true. Paranoid, he scans the area for any more tango, enemy forces, 
Before moving to the screaming creature on the lake shore, Pilot walks over, holstering his pistol, and kicks the crude, stone knife on the sand away from the monster's reaching hand as he pulls out his own standard issue survival knife from his boot holster. With his foot, he rolls the small, green creature over on its back and, without a second thought, pushes the blade down cleanly through its throat and through the bones of its spine on the far end. The small monster shakes and spasms, dying instantly. The battle is over, Pilot, has killed, Goblin plus 10 EXP, he watches the monster's death rattle play out, not rising to his feet until it is fully dead, I want my plane, says the man simply to the world as he gets up. Pilots as a profession have a pretty bleak long term survival prognosis, but infantrymen, those are some grim numbers, machine guns, mines, gas, artillery and bullets of more variety and caliber than there are stars in the sky are plenty to worry about. That's not including the sepsis, trench foot, and everything else they get to deal with. Are you good? He asks, looking over at caretaker who is still in the sand she had stumbled down into. He reaches down, helping her up, which she lets him do, not replying as she stares in pale shock at the new monster. The goblin is lightly armored and has no equipment except a knife and some survival tools. This goblin, just like the last one, is a scout. Scouts are the front of the front lines, the first boots to break into enemy territory before the army follows after their blaze trail. These ugly creatures seem smart enough to make and use their own tools, clothes, and packs. If these two that he has already killed are here, that means there are more in the forest. There is likely a small scouting party the rest of the goblin army, or their tribe, or whatever hole that they might function as, is very soon to come. In seven days, if he was a betting man, Pilot picks up the small corpse, straining himself as he looks it over, making sure the 7.63 times 25 mm bullet didn't penetrate the flesh and fly into the kestrel, and then gracelessly tosses the dead thing out of the way and away from the water so that it doesn't contaminate it. Caretaker begins fussing about something again, breaking her silence, as he moves the corpse, but Pilot ignores her, needing to know something. He climbs into the cockpit, running through the ignition protocol before hitting the engine starter, taking back his prior blasphemous thoughts about the Pope from before as he says a prayer in his mind. His finger flicks the ignition switch, and there, the mechanism roars, plus tilde, plane activated. Tilda plus jagged flugs ago 9 kestrel has been activated. Abilities have been unlocked. New ability, dash, mechanics, repair damage, small, active, cost, 04, soul plus, raw material, allows the repair of any exterior, surface level damage to your plane's airframe without advanced tools or stations. Requires compatible raw or processed metal to use. New ability, dash, aviation. Check vehicle status. Active. Cost. 01. So. Allows the examination of the full status of the Kestrel and its components. Includes a manifest of damaged items and suggested repair or exchange opportunities. Vehicle status. Core airframe. Fuselage. Propulsion system. Seance drive. Wing left. Wing right. Fuel system. 04%. Cockpit. Tail section. Landing gear. Navigation systems. Radio systems. Armor. Armaments. Kurtzons under 7.92 times 57 mm machine guns, 02, explosive mass cluster ordinances, 0808, high explosive self-destruction payload, 10, chapter 5, hunt, tilde, pilot, human, pilot, caretaker stands at the base of a world tree, both of her palms lightly pressed against its surface, her head is bowed, and her eyes are closed, the sounds of nature fill the air around them, the singing of birds and the buzzing of insects, all reveling in the gifts of what ought to be a good spring. A good wind moves through the trees that grow in the shadow of the giant monument, blowing aside the strands of her short, dark hair below her antlers. Pilot sits there, watching her, as he tries to study what exactly it is that she does, the magic that she used to heal him. He has access to things like that too now, right? The Kestrel is going to be ready to fly again soon, and it will be a big help to him if he understands how to harness a tool like that when he's out there by himself. He doesn't think that he's going to find a way back to his world, to the war that never ends, or to that place where he belongs, but he knows that he doesn't feel right here. The man eyes the pleasant, 
healthy greenery all around them warily. Bountiful flowers bow their heads to the soft gale. This place is messed up, it's nothing like the world he knows. He feels like a fish out of water, like a silverfish that has left its cover of damp, grey moisture and ran out into the sunlight of an open, bright world on its tiny, skittering legs. Pilot calls caretaker gently from the side. He turns his head back to look at her, his suspicious gaze carrying over. He's just waiting for something to jump out of the trees at any second now, some goblin or something new that he hasn't seen yet. She smiles softly, lightly nodding her head to the side, gesturing for him to come over to her. The man waves her off at first, but instead she walks over to him, grabbing his wrist and pulling him along over to the wooden cliff face that makes up just the side of one single root of the monumental tree. Stopping in front of it, she lifts both of her hands, holding them out, and nudges him with her elbow. Does she want him to copy her? Pilot looks at her and then up along the tree. Pilot, she repeats. Fine. Relents Pilot, lifting his hands slowly into the air. She presses them against the tree, looking at him, warily eyeing it, not sure what she wants from him exactly. He does the same. His hands press forward until the tips of his fingers touch the rough, old bark, followed by his palms. Nothing much happens. He feels a small tingle on his arms, the hairs there standing on end as if near an electrical current, however, apart from that, no great revelation appears before him. Caretaker closes her eyes again, her hands still resting on the wood of the world tree. Pilot does the same, but not before sparing a quick glance at the woods. This doesn't really change much either, but he feels somewhat obligated now to follow through, so he stands there next to her and listens, his senses taking in what there is to take in. Birds sing. Insects buzz. The water of the lake sloshes in and out, the wind whispers as it moves through the trees, the tall grasses and flowers flow, rustling as they bow their heads to the elements, only to rise again seconds later. There's a vibration in the ground, deep, deep down in it, that carries up through the roots of the tree. Like that of a distant stampede that shakes the world carrying through a metal mast, the great tree groans quietly swaying as much as is possible for something of its size as its distant boughs are moved by the jet streams of the world. His arm tingles, and then something screams. A shrieking, ear-piercing knife of a howl cuts into his senses, the senselessly wailing voice of something both animal and wild being butchered alive. Pilot opens his eyes in surprise, his head about to explode as he lets go of the tree and clutches his skull with one hand the echo still carrying around inside of it. He looks around in shock, thinking that it was caretaker screaming. It isn't. She simply stands exactly where she is, as if nothing happened or as if she hadn't heard anything. Pilot's other hand has pulled out his pistol as he spun around, aiming it into the perfect, bountiful forest with paranoid eyes, expecting something to lunge out of it at any second. But nothing comes except for a single, fat, buzzing bee that lazily drifts through the spring breeze. What was that? He slowly lowers his arm again, looking back at Caretaker and at the world tree. Caretaker opens her eyes, looking back at him. Pilot, she says again, nodding to the tree with a curious but welcoming expression and gesturing for him to come back to experience whatever it is she wants him to see. Pilot holsters his pistol again, ignoring her as he goes down to get back to work. This place is sick. There's something very wrong about this world. He has to get off of the ground. The kestrel works, he just needs to do a few basic repairs and figure out a new fuel source, and then he can fly out of here. There's enough in her to start the plane and let her taxi for a minute, but flying is out of the question. Until then, he needs to buy himself a little time. Pilot empties out his pistol's spring-loaded magazine, letting seven bullets drop into his hand before he slides the emptied magazine back inside the weapon. It is now 2400 hours. Midnight. Sidearm ammunition restored. Pilot stares at the darkness above him. Quietly, he rolls his head, looking across the dark underground chamber at his host, who is sleeping on the other bed. She is a bit of an awkward sleeper, rearranging herself repeatedly in the middle of the night. Every time he looks her way, caretaker is laid out differently. This time, her face is pressed down into the bedding, and one of her legs is up against the wall at a strange angle. Silently. Pilot gets up, grabs his things, puts on his clothes and jacket, in which he stores his extra ammunition, and walks to the doorway. 
his pistol and knife rest against his leg as he steps out into the night, closing his jacket. It's cold at night near the water of the giant lake. Standing there at the edge of the little ledge, he looks down at the world around them and at the dense forests inside the valley. Goblins. There's a hostile force nearby, scouting the region in numbers. His eyes scan the area, looking for signs of an encampment. He's in a critical state, and the kestrel isn't ready to fly just yet. His host is an injured, unarmed civilian. Their choices are evacuation on foot, which is a death trap since he is hardly mobile. A siege situation on this hill, which is a death trap since he's only one man and any competent force will scale the hill in numbers from many angles at once. Or, option 3, a preemptive strike. He doesn't feel obligated to care because of the world tree, that damn thing makes him uneasy. There's something off about it but caretaker will get butchered if he doesn't do something about this infestation. If this is a scouting force, they will be one of many scout troops. The main numbers of the goblin force will go to where the scouts report back from, as those are easy territories to win. Those dangerous places where the scouts don't return from will be visited later, once the backlands are secure and surrounded, so he needs to make this a dangerous place. It's a postponement of a larger problem, but buying time for him to heal and for him to fix the kestrel is his best shot, if he's being warned about an invasion. It's safe to say that he needs more than the eight bullets that are in his pistol. Invasion is quite the meaty word, it implies numbers. A wisp of smoke, only ever so slight, drifts free from the fog-laden treetops in the distance. Pilot's eyes narrow on it focusing as he watches the subtle tendrils of a fire's spirit rise differently than the sinking moisture, reflecting starlight from itself. The smoke, on the other hand, absorbs the moon and starlight, with the ashen particulate being matte and dull. The back of the valley, to the east, there on this side of the lake and maybe an hour on foot. That's where Tango has set up. Pilot ties several significant landmarks on the way, a big needle tree, some rock formations, and a glade before he grabs his gear and heads into the valley, traveling light. He only intends to need a few hours, it's hard going with these wounds. Whatever medicine caretaker gave him sure kicks like shit, but damn if his body doesn't feel like it too. He's been shot before, hit with shrapnel before, and he's even crashed his plane before, several times, but he's never been busted up to this degree. This was a rough one, but even with all of that in mind, the fact that he is able to move at all is a testament to whatever healing talent the girl has, and to whatever power is held by the forces of the universe that brought him here to this place. In the old world, Pilot is sure that Caretaker would be worth a fortune for him in promotions as a prisoner if he could bring her back. The lab coats would love to know everything about her medicine and methods. Uniquely powerful ointments, salves, and things like that can turn the tide of the war if converted into an industrially produced good. Churning men out of beds in days instead of weeks could be enough to shift countless fronts. And that's before they take a saw and scalpel to her antlers and the rest of her. In times of crisis, bad men become good men in the eyes of the nation. If he ever does get back to his home, he's going to keep what happened here to himself. Pilot looks around the forest. It looks like an old growth, temperate forest. Hell. Ancient growth might be the right phrase, there are primarily deciduous trees and very few needle trees. Although he can't quite identify any of the species apart from a few pines. Pine trees were a primary focus of his survival training. They're far more useful than one would think, from the buck to the needles to the sap, everything can be used for a variety of applications. From pastes to salves to a vitamin-rich tea. He's seen such collections in caretaker's home as well. This means that he's at a mid-range latitude in the world, which, at this point, really just further confirms what he already knows, that he is nowhere near the war or his home. The mission that he was flying was in the north, far further north than anyone could have come from to be able to land at the equator in a crashing plane. He creeps through the forest, taking it slow as he moves from one tree to the next, always eyeing the darkness. Tonight is the night of a nearly full moon, a little more than three quarters of the way there. It's bright enough to see well enough to move. Confirming his direction, he looks up at the solitary needle tree, standing by itself in the middle of the forest. Good, he's on the right path. His navigation is confirmed by the presence of markings in the tall tree. Someone has carved into it with a crude knife, having written sigils in the book that he can't manage to decipher. 
but the height of the carvings fits his target's stature, goblins, the man continues, stalking the forest until he reaches the large rock formation, and then continues eastward until he sees the glade, then, a few minutes later, he finds what he's looking for, Tango, from the darkness, he watches them, trying to understand the nature of the enemy, there are a good few of them, just below a baker's dozen in number, all of them are sitting and lazing around a camp, there are no tents, but there are one or two A-frames made out of sticks and branches, but there is little effort put into them other than just stacking the broken wood together, there's a fire pit, which is the most advanced thing that he sees here, for it, two holes are dug next to each other at the base of a tree, connected underground by a small tunnel the size of an arm, the campfire is burning not on the surface of the forest, but inside of the hole closest to the tree, the other hole is empty and acts as a source of oxygen, the smoke rises up along the base of a tree, the boughs catching and dispersing it in the leaves, the glow of the fire is hidden by the hole it stems from, this is a classic setup for scouting parties on the down low who need warmth, even in his own world, these creatures, or monsters, are simple and rough in a sense, but they're apparently clever too, it would be best not to underestimate them, one of them is awake and on patrol, but given its lackadaisical meandering, it really doesn't seem too serious about its work, it seems that they don't expect there to be much of a threat here, the goblin wanders around the camp until it eventually reaches the area where he is, very mysteriously, it vanishes into the night, a hand covering its mouth, as it is yanked into the darkness, the battle is over, pilot, has killed, goblin, plus 10 exp, plus tilde, level up, tilde plus, pilot, has leveled up to level, 03, new ability, munitions, voice in the trees, passive, grants enhanced night vision abilities and a 150% damage bonus to all ambush attacks, new ability, mechanics, jury rigging, passive, allows the repurposing of monster components, drops, and equipment into usable raw materials for the repair and modification of your aircraft, pilot pulls the body back into the forest, plundering it for anything useful, and then hides the corpse in the underbrush, the dead goblin seems to be wearing some colorful beads around its arms, he takes some of those, the brighter ones, and leaves the rest, the goblin yawns, stretching and scratching itself as it rises to its feet, rousing from its slumber, it's still dark, the morning has yet to come, smacking its lips, it idly rises up and walks past its sleeping tribe mates as it goes to relieve itself against a tree, tired and sleep dazed, the monster begins to urinate, its gaze scanning the darkness and then landing on the glint of something shiny not far off, curious, it looks around to make sure that nobody else saw what it saw, and then it shakes itself dry, quietly skulking forward toward the unexpected treasure, someone lost their beads, they now lay in between a circle of trees right outside the camp, catching the moonlight beautifully, a hand covers the wandering goblin's mouth, and a knife runs across its throat, the beads are covered in black, glistening blood, but they do remain very shiny, just in a different way now, the battle is over, pilot, has killed, goblin, plus 10 exp, this goes on for hours, with pilot patiently waiting for them to stir, never scaring them awake, by then, more have died in the forest under similar circumstances, leaving five alive in the camp, but all still fast asleep, these rest are all easily finished, he just goes in, covers the softening glow of the fire pit with a large, giant leaf from the world tree that had been lying here, and makes his way from sleeping goblin to sleeping goblin, only the last one sees him coming but reacts too little, too late, unable to grab its own knife before the steel blade of his standard issue survival knife severs its carotid artery, it bleeds out in seconds, the battle is over, pilot, has killed, goblin, plus 10 exp, plus tilde, level up, tilde plus, pilot, has leveled up to level, 04, new ability, munitions, bunny thumper, toggle, during night time, allows the manifestation of a compatible, unusually potent pistol suppressor for your sidearm, this will reduce weapon noise significantly, that should be the last of them, he thinks, pilot looks down at his pistol, unholstering it and eyeing the suppressor that has been added to it by some unseen power, significantly increasing its length and shifting its balance, he's not sure how exactly, it fits into the holster just now, honestly, 
It really shouldn't have. Magic is a strange thing. Something stirs in the bushes. Pilot looks up as two goblins, long patrolmen, likely, return at an extremely inopportune moment for them. The three all exchange a rather awkward glance for a moment as they each survey the situation. Caretaker yawns, stretching herself out as she wakes in the dead of night, still early before sunrise, thirsty. Her leg has fallen asleep from being at a weird angle. Rubbing her eyes, she sits upright. A quiet thumping comes from the forest outside. Once, twice, then a third time a moment later, she blinks, listening and trying to decipher the odd noise that comes and goes quickly, dissipating into the morning mist. The rabbits must be fighting again. They like to stomp the dirt when they get feisty. Maybe there are some outside of the den. Laughing to herself at the thought, Caretaker looks over at the empty bed across from hers, shaking her head at the irresponsible human who is likely outside by the plane again. Caretaker drinks from her bowl. She can only assume that Pilot is going to come back with his wounds full of lake water soon, and she'll have to deal with it. Instead, an hour later, Pilot comes back with a small, crude sack full of colorful beads, a fist and pockets full of dirty knives and a body-covered head to toe in the dark blood of many dead monsters. The two of them stare at one another as he stands in the doorway, absolutely dripping with filth. No! scolds caretaker, grabbing a long stick from the wall and pushing him back out of the door as he tries to take a step inside, dragging in the stench of murder into her home. Only after the man is prodded, poked, and shooed all the way back down the hill like a wayward animal, all the way back down to the lake where she watches carefully as he washes himself clean away his sin, is he allowed to come back inside? Then she has to redo all of his washed off medicine and ointment once again instead of starting her chores, which she is falling further and further behind on day after day. At least he helps her keep things orderly, but still. Caretaker sighs, feeling very exhausted, it's like running after an energetic child. If all humans are like this, she's glad that she never had to deal with them before. Something dabs the side of her face and she opens her eyes, watching as he now applies the medicine to the healing laceration on her cheek. They're such troublesome creatures. 8. Chapter 6 Present Tilda, Caretaker, Dryad, Caretaker. Rain pours softly outside of the den, droplets striking against the den's forest canopy. No, says Caretaker sternly, lifting her hands and slowly pushing Pilot back. She doesn't speak as variant of the human language but she assumes her point is to be made clear by her disapproving expression and shaking head. The man is bigger and stronger than her in his peak state, but right now he's injured and easy to push around. She makes full use of that, no seems to be the only word she gets to use at the moment. He sits down on the edge of the seat that she guides him to before sighing and walking off to do her chores. Even if there is nobody else left but her, she still has to do her work. The forest must be taken care of. The grey trot is not here yet, and until it is, it is her duty to make sure that nature stays serene and in good health. Pilot waits until she goes away a second later and then rises back up to his feet. No! snaps caretaker from across the room, getting promptly ignored by him. He just won't stop, no matter what she does. Caretaker sits there, exasperated weaving together threads of bark fiber as she watches Pilot, who is not fully healed in the least, nor will he ever be if he keeps this up, slowly lower himself down in another unnatural, controlled movement that she can't quite figure out the purpose of. He has been doing things like this all day, sometimes pushing himself off of the ground with his palms while lying flat, sometimes stretching in odd ways, sometimes trying to hold his weight on a branch and then starting, but never finishing to climb up it. And now this. She's done nothing all day but run after him like a mama bear chasing her foolish cub to try and stop it from running into the river. Every time he hurts himself because he's an odd, dumb creature, it becomes her problem to fix. And she has enough of those already. His hands are outstretched straight ahead of him, his eyes forward, and his neck and back aligned straight as he drops down into a squatting position and then slowly rises back up again, exhaling. Caretaker frowns as she watches him undergo his human nonsense. She's just waiting for one of his wounds to rip open. It's only been a couple days since she first mended them. He still lets her wash them and apply the medicine, but it will take days or weeks more for him to properly heal, assuming that he will just rest silently as he ought to. But instead, 
The man holds out one leg straight ahead of himself as he then tries to squat down again, this time on just one leg. Why? Predictably, he falls over, wincing and clutching his side as a strained muscle rips through the skin that had only just begun to heal. Pilot lays on the ground, collecting himself and gritting his teeth together as she leans over him with a deep-seated annoyance in her eyes. No! scolds caretaker, glaring down at him with her hands on her hips. The dryad groans, but differently, to how he is doing, as she watches the blood leak out of his side and onto the floor. This has all been rather awkward for her since that moment by the water a few days ago. Was her behavior back then inappropriate? Pilot has saved her life twice now, both times from goblins. The great rot is approaching slowly but it doesn't matter how slowly it approaches, because even the furthest, most delicate tendrils of its presence are seemingly enough to kill her, a single goblin, a monster that the warriors of the races of man and elf laugh at. She still doesn't know what to do, what if she is attacked again and Pilot is not around, is she allowed to defend herself, like any animal would, or will this be frowned upon by the spirits of her pacifistic sisters, who are with the soil and the trees now, she doesn't want to die. She loves life, she loves living, she loves the birds, nature, the water, and the trees. Caretaker loves the feeling of the wind on her skin and the sensation the rain creates as it runs down her shoulders. When she almost died before, it terrified her, it haunts her. At night now, while she sleeps, she still feels the fear in her heart that she felt then during the attack. She had never felt anything like that before. She was so scared, so confused, and so surprised. She has night terrors now, visions of her sister's faces and mangled bodies, she can still feel the crack of the rock against her bones and head, like it was still happening, the dryad walks through the forest, kneeling down as she feels the base of an old tree as she thinks, the old thing is doing well, her eyes wander up it, one of her sisters planted this tree a long time ago, it thrives now, despite having been sickly at times in its youth, nature can be coldly cruel. It is not within a dryad's responsibility to make sure that everyone is always healthy. Sometimes in nature, things die. Wolves hunt rabbits. Owls hunt mice. Death is as natural as birth. It isn't something to be avoided, run from, or stopped. Nature is a delicate system. It must not be interfered with too often. The animals ought to be left to their own, just the same as the trees and plants ought to be but it is their duty as caretakers to make sure that a healthy balance is maintained and that the will of the world tree is followed, although it may be hard to understand sometimes. This tree with its beautiful blossoms is one such example. Her sister had been given a vision, so the story goes, to save this young sapling, and so she did, and now, generations later, here it stands as a full, strong, mature tree. Its verdant crown is laden with countless heavy bulbs that have yet to emerge into flowering blossoms this year. They are very beautiful when they come, they are actually some of the most beautiful things in the whole valley. Why did the world tree desire for this to be the way things are? Why is this one tree special when hundreds of other saplings die every day in the massive forest? She does not know. Looking back over her shoulder, caretaker stares at the human, who is by the edge of the water. He's doing something with his plane again but she doesn't quite understand it, she knows that it came from the sky, so her imagination says that he wants the construction to rise back up into it again, but is something like that really possible? As long as he isn't undergoing any more nonsense that makes her life harder than it needs to be. Soup, says caretaker, holding up the bowl of cold soup. Dryads don't use fire. All of their food is a mixture of prepared harvested berries, herbs, tubers, mushrooms, or fermented things. Soup replies Pilot, taking it from her, he has such a funny accent, but she doesn't laugh, he's learning, he must be from very far away, the humans in this region share a tongue with the dryads, Pilot says something else, speaking in his own language that she doesn't understand, she assumes it to be an expression of gratitude, you're welcome, she says, he repeats after her, trying to pick up some things, it seems, this is something they've been doing now and then, now that she's talking to him again. Well, talking, she needed some time to recover and process after the incident by the water a few days ago. It was just surprising, really, on top of everything else that happened, she supposes that it makes sense, but she had, out of all the events that would perhaps one day come to her, never considered that one to be possible, it just wasn't ever relevant for the life she lived here, 
secluded with her sister caretakers, the two of them have their meal, and then she blocks Pilot from leaving, shoving him back to the bed and repeating her rejection of his leaving until he finally gives in and goes to sleep, or at least pretends to, until she leaves. Honestly, she's never going to get rid of him at this rate. Looking back at him as she stands at the doorway, she then walks out herself into the rain. Human customs are very odd, are they not? They make no sense at all. Dryads don't have such issues, but she supposes that, in the context of what she understands of his human worldview, Pilot's actions had made sense to him. Caretaker purses her lips, staring out at the water of the lake, the wet sands compressing beneath her feet. The fact that he wasn't offended by her actions says a lot about his character, doesn't it? She did something very rude to him. After all, the dryad's eyes wander the waters of the lake as she kneels down, placing her hands into it, asking the water to give her back what she had been so careless about. Caretaker has never left the valley, she's never interacted with humans before at all. She's only ever watched from afar as her elder sisters handled any matters of diplomacy or trade near the border. She's only ever heard shared stories of their culture and ways, and one of these stories is about how they engage in the act of courtship, a very delicate matter. Animals will put on displays and show off preened feathers and muscular, healthy bodies with dances or hunts. They'll collect and give food and gifts or engage in complicated rituals that only make sense within the context of the species itself. And humans, in their towns and cities of fractured stone and dead wood, have a unique custom of their own. Humans give the person who they hope to bond with a metal circle for them to wear, metal circles that they work themselves to the bone for, sometimes for years, just to be able to achieve such a simple display of a token trinket. Days ago, immediately after they had said each other's names for the first time, Pilot had given her a metal thing that he had hid in the sands of the lake. But she, being scared and overstimulated by everything that was happening all at once, threw it straight into the water, in a fit of inexplicable terror. Surely, this is much worse than a normal, simple rejection, right? Dryads try not to hurt things, and that includes humans. She should have just given it back to him and said no, so he understood. Caretaker doesn't know anything about human culture, and even she can see that this was probably a very offensive gesture, cruel, even to throw something so valuable like this away. The man saved her life, and she saved his. It makes sense in her mind that he would come to such ideations about the two of them. The bonds of danger and blood are very strong things. They create forces of the mind and heart that defy the natural order of things. It would be best if Pilot simply healed and then left again and soon. She does not know where to. The Grey Trot is coming here, just as it has come and will come everywhere else in the world encroaching little by little on what remains, but he doesn't need to be here with her when it arrives. Her time to die will come, just as will the time of death for the great world tree. It is only natural. One cannot defy one's own mortality forever. Still, her sisters would scold her harshly for her rudeness. Frowning, caretaker takes off her robes and walks into the waters of the lake. The vast blue thing is a greedy entity, always keeping whatever it swallows, from bones to trinkets. But she hopes that this once, it will take pity on her and give back what she had cast away. At the very least, she can give it back to Pilot so that he can give it to someone else. Many hours have passed. It is night now, and the world is covered in darkness except for the glow of a full, supple moon. She swam in the lake and dived down into its depths. She has dug in the deep sands and scared many fish, but the treasure was not returned to her, defeated and exhausted from swimming for so long caretaker returns back out of the water, looking at the plane at her side. She should go back. It's been all day already. She can only assume what sort of trouble the man has been causing by himself. Perhaps this is the punishment for her rudeness. Caretaker spares a glance toward the forest before walking back along the shore. A few steps later, her foot steps on something cold and sharp, looking down in surprise. Her eyes go wide as she sees something glinting in the moonlight. It has a golden hue, like a cold, floral honey. The dryad gasps and picks the little thing up in excitement, looking at it. Could it be? Caretaker holds the cold metal in her hands, looking it over. This is it. She says excitedly, her eyes glowing a light as she stares at the metal circle. A small, hollow metal cylinder, a ring, she thinks. Having never actually seen a ring before, about one inch in length, 
From the description of a ring, she figured it would have been flatter. This thing here is more of a tube than a circle. But she's certain that this is the same item he tossed her way. This is it. Normal quality brass bullet casing, 7.63 times 25 millimeters. The hollow casing of a spent 7.63 times 25 millimeters round. Weight, 0.09 kilograms. Value, so pretty. She doesn't understand any of the information in the status window. It must be some jargon humans use to talk about their affairs of the heart. The little thing glints beautifully in the moonlight, with the grains of crystal sand and the moisture reflecting off of its sleek, shiny surface. She doesn't know much about the act of craftsmanship with metal, but she is sure that something like this is a monumental challenge to create. It's so round, so perfect, and so seamless. She would lie if she said it didn't catch her eye now that she stops to look at it in this midnight aura. It sparkles like a perfect river stone. Nature doesn't make things like this. Closing her hands around the token very tightly, she looks back at the lake, which has done her a great favor today. Thank you. Calls caretaker out to the water before running off back to the den. She can give this back to Pilot, and then she'll be free of the burden of her shameful behavior and mend the wound that she has created with her lack of clear thinking. When he leaves here, she will have a clean conscience when the time comes for her to reconnect with her sisters. No! Yells caretaker sternly and as loudly as she can, first thing as she steps inside, looking at the man who is now upside down, standing on both of his hands and pushing his body up into the air repeatedly, his legs held together above him. The blood from the wound she just fixed this morning is dripping down his torso. The den has been organized, with everything put away neatly more or less where it belongs, the wandering bugs and dragged in leaves have been returned outside, it looks like Pilot has cleaned again while she was away, which she does appreciate, it makes her life a little easier on one front, but by the time she knocks him over and fusses him back to bed, it becomes too awkward to give him the shiny thing back, instead, caretaker then silently plays with it in secret under the starlight outside letting her continued possession of the token stay between her and the mother moon for now. It's fun to look at. She'll give it back to him before he leaves. It's okay. Pilot thinks it's gone forever now anyway, right? So what's the harm? The dryad watches the metal shimmer in fascination, rolling it between her fingers as she stares with wide eyes at the precious thing. She's never had anything pretty and sleek like this. Her sisters had told her stories about jewelry before, about how humans would wear all manner of shiny, pretty gems and metals, much the same as they all wore woven bands of bark and rootwood here, sometimes adorned with amber or smooth rocks. Caretaker would be lying if she didn't say that some selfish, animal piece of her soul didn't find itself captivated by how shiny the cold thing in her hands is. So shiny, so what's just a little longer? She doesn't have long left anyway. She might as well enjoy a few odd experiences before then end, right? Caretaker focuses on the small treasure, doing her best not to look at the window that has appeared next to her. Time until invasion, less than or equal to, oh two, days, six, chapter seven, raw, pilot aims the pistol up at the thing that he sees, there is a creature that is wobbling toward the shoreline of the lake, it's a small, blue, globular being that reaches up to about his shins in height, honestly. It looks kind of like an amoeba that grew too large. Is it some kind of monster? He should kill it. Blue slime. A slime. Slimes are gelatinous, opportunistic omnivores. They will eat anything they can catch and trap within their bodies, which are made entirely of a homogeneous, highly acidic mass of dense slime, hence their name. Despite not having a brain, slimes are unexpectedly clever organisms and have a particular affinity for hunting small game. Slimes can be found all around the world in nearly any biome, as they are highly adaptable monsters. Curiously, when not on the hunt, slimes can sometimes be seen stuck in front of piles of various objects that appear to have been attempted to be consumed during failed hunts. Adventurers joke that they like to count, but this theory has never been proven, as slimes are unable to communicate in any form other than violence. The color of a slime is determined primarily by its start and affects its abilities and strength, entity, monster, rank, f, element, none, type, scavenger. Pilot's finger rests on the trigger. No. Snaps a sharp, familiar, lecturing voice from next to him. Two hands grab his arm and yank it to the side. He's starting to recognize that word, 
It seems to be caretaker's favorite one. Caretaker's arms and elbows lock around his outstretched arm, pointing it away and toward the water. No, she repeats, looking at him with a stern expression. Pilot. Pilot looks at her and then back toward the slime. The two of them watch as the little creature senses the area, touches the sands of the shore with its outstretched, wobbly mass and then drinks from the lake. The monster swells in size somewhat as it absorbs a good amount of water. A minute later, the very full slime sloshes off back into the forest. Caretaker sighs, looking back at him. No. I got it, remarks Pilot, rolling his eyes and holstering away the pistol. Caretaker lifts a finger. No, she says again, perhaps just for effect, wagging it in front of his nose. Am I a dog or something? He asks, raising an eyebrow. Not that she can understand him. The bushes rustle to the side of them, on the edge of the forest. The two of them look, a bear pokes its head out. No! yells caretaker as a second later the pistol comes out again. The dryad practically tackles him to the ground, wrestling with him as he aims it at the lumbering animal. Entirely disinterested in their scuffle, the large brown bear walks onto the shore and then passes them, drinking the water, before meandering back away into the forest. Only on its way back into the woods does it bother looking back once at them, seeing caretaker quickly waving it away. If he didn't know better, pilot would think the animal had nodded to her before leaving. Caretaker sighs in relief after the animal vanishes into the underbrush. She looks down at him. No! scolds the dryad, wagging a finger. No! 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 Why can I shoot the goblins but not the bear? He asks. How am I supposed to know what's allowed and what isn't? asks Pilot, perhaps just for himself since she doesn't understand him. Caretaker plants her hands on her hips. No, she repeats, hammering the word into his head like a driven nail. He's going to hear it in his sleep, he's sure of it. Pilot lifts his hands, surrendering. This is a lost battle. He can tell, he's a man with theoretically infinite bullets, and he's not allowed to shoot a goddamned thing. This place really is hell. He's positive. Caretaker must be some kind of demon. It explains the horns that one of his hands has grabbed onto in their fight just now. Caretaker lets out a frustrated exhalation, slapping his gripping hand away from the antler, rising to her feet and wiping the sand off of herself. Looking down at Pilot, she holds her hands out to help him up, which he accepts. The bushes rustle. Before he can even do anything, Caretaker has already locked his wrist in a vice-like grip to stop him from moving. No, says Pilot preemptively to spare her the effort, rolling his eyes as he sees that her mouth is already open to speak. The two of them turn to look at today's latest guest. A lone goblin wanders out of the forest, almost crawling on all fours as it follows some trail in the dirt. The lanky monster creeps and crawls, its sharp, beady eyes observing marks in the ground. Pilot whispers caretaker quietly, she shakes his arm. He doesn't respond, pilot. Insists the dryad with a hiss, turning to him and shaking his arm harder. He looks down at her, raising an eyebrow. No, says the man, spitefully gleeful about this change of events. If his blood could be extracted from his body in this very instant, the radiating smugness flowing inside it would burn through any tube or container trying to hold it. Pilot. Shouts caretaker her face changing to one of distress, grabbing his jacket and pointing at the goblin that now lifts its head and turns their way. She yells, hiding behind him. Instinctively triggered by her scream, the wandering goblin snarls and lunges at them, sensing an easy, if not surprising, opportunity. Well, now I just don't feel like it, says the man, who maybe is a little petty. His leg shoots out. A black combat boot kicking the lunging goblin square in the jaw and sending it falling onto its back. Pilot pulls his knife out and kills the surprised monster before it can react. The battle is over. Pilot has killed goblin plus 10 exp. Caretaker has few objections this time. Instead sticking closer to him as they walk to the kestrel. It's an hour later. Something strikes against the back of his head. Standing on the kestrel's damaged left wing, Pilot ignores it looking down at his plunder from the killed goblin scouts, normal quality goblin beads made of a mixture of ceramics, ornate stonework, and wood. These simple, generationally passed down beads are handcrafted charms that tell a story of many lives that have been lived. Upon the birth of a new member of a family, one bead is added that shares the color at the first object that the infant chooses. 
they are precious family heirlooms within goblin society. Weight, 0.2 kilograms. Value, 01 noble. Low quality goblin knife. A crude, roughly bladed goblin knife. It is made out of a single, jagged piece of metal with animal hide and wood wrapped around its base for a grip. Goblin knives, are made out of scraps of anything they can steal during their raids and are unwieldy, blunt, and dangerous to everyone around them. Effect. Chance of applying stacking status, poisoned, on hit, weight, 0.4 kilograms, durability, 06 over 10, value, 030 balls, pilot breaks the items down into their separate components, creating a heap of colorful beads, scrap metal, and leather, something hits the side of his head again, but he doesn't really know what to do with them, he can repair his plane with raw materials, allegedly, but, the man turns to look at caretaker, who is sitting on the crystal sands of the lake below, watching him and eating a handful of berries that she's gathered in the forest, noticing him staring at her, she tilts her head and then looks around the area for a second before looking back his way, she used magic to heal him, right? So how does this work? Pilot lifts his hands against the plane, like she had done when healing his wounds, like she had shown him when she had him touch the world tree the other day, clearly noticing his unsure movements caretaker nods affirmingly, lifting her own hands to copy the movement more stiffly and sure, closing her eyes. He looks back at the plane, another berry hits him in the back of the head. Pilot snaps back around, looking at caretaker, who is vacantly staring up toward the sky and away from him, chewing a mouthful of berries while pretending to have done nothing at all. Focusing on the task at hand instead, pilot turns back toward the plane and does what she did about what she showed him by the world tree the other day, he closes his eyes, thinking about what he intends to have happen, something moves through his body, something simple and low frequency, like the sensation one gets when standing near an electronic relay, like that feeling he got when he stood next to the world tree, there is a subtle pulse that moves through him, but nothing more intense than that, pilot, has used, repair damage, small, repaired external damage, kestrel status, flight where the pilot opens his eyes, watching as the exterior of the kestrel slowly pulls itself back together, not like regrowing skin but more like a closing spider's web, pulled taut by an unseen weaver, threads of metal span out from the edges of the holes one after the other, slowly pulling the damaged areas closed as if a seamstress were sewing them shut with fresh patches. It's working, he knows he should believe his eyes at this point, but honestly, Watching the metal close itself and the glow leave his hands is so unnatural to him that he can't help but find himself surprised. So much so at this unexpected success that he finds himself pumping his fist and spinning around. It were pilots plutters, clutching his neck, as something that was destined for the back of his head flies straight into his open mouth. He awkwardly chokes, hitting his fist against his chest as he finally spits out the berry. He can't help but overhear the roaring laughter coming from down on the ground. Caretaker is howling, pointing at him, and clutching her stomach, her floating hand slapping the sand a few times as she struggles to breathe, clearly having the time of her life. He jumps down off of the wing. Caretaker lets out a surprised scream, the formed tears splashing from her eyes as she frantically scrambles over in the sand, and then runs away pelting him with berries from a distance as he chases after her. In good shape, he'd catch her easily, but his torn wounds see to it that he suffers a horrible fate and then eventually finds himself panting for breath as she escapes. Having gotten away with it, he's not sure what's up with her, but she's been acting different toward him lately. Pilot returns toward the kestrel, the exterior is fixed, now he just has to check the guts, but they look promising. If he finds a fuel source, He's set to fly, maybe even tonight. On his way back, he stops after seeing a black spot on the ground. Bending down, Pilot picks up the smushed berry, rolling it in his hands as he gets a strange idea. A very strange idea, nonsensical, almost. He's not quite sure where it comes from, but the hairs on his arms stand on end as if lightly electrified, and he hears the rustle of millions of leaves up above his head. Somehow, the kestrel's radio is hissing when he returns to the machine, as if it had been turned on by itself, there is a static white noise buzzing from it, caretaker watches him from a distance, not sure if it is safe to return yet, she was leaning toward yes, 
but that was until Pilot came back from the forest after vanishing into it for a time. Now she's landed on a pretty firm no. The man has two dead goblins laid over his shoulders that he has retrieved from the deep woods. He killed more of them? Moving dead bodies is very bad. One should never move corpses. They should rest where they drop, being moved only by the elements or scavengers. This is what nature wants. Even monsters like goblins, who took her sister from her, are to be held under that law. Pilot drops the bodies gracelessly down to the sands like old rocks and then climbs into the plane, fiddling with its metal interior that is exposed to the world like revealed organs. He touches the inside of the machine, and it roars to life screaming. She doesn't like the noise of it at all. Caretaker watches as Pilot stands there for a moment, holding his hand over the metal interior of the plane's guts, like someone testing the heat to the well sun rock. A second later, the man comes back down with something in his hands, his knife. He digs a small, compacted hole in the wet sand away from the water, then he kicks a dead goblin over, remorselessly slits its wrists from top to bottom, and holds the dead monster upside down by its ankles, letting the dried, coagulated blood slowly ooze out and drip to the freshly dug hole. He repeats the process with the other one, and a puddle of old blood forms. Caretaker, her mouth covered in shock, watches in quiet horror, glad that she didn't go back after all. What is this? Witchcraft? Necromancy? This is forbidden by every law of nature. Pilot stands there in the midst of his grim ritual, looking down at the black pool he's created, and then takes a piece of goblin fabric and holds it to the exposed metal of the roaring machine next to him. The rag immediately catches fire from the heat of the exposed metal guts, and he drops the burning thing into the pool of fermented monster blood. Fire explodes to life, the crystal sands of the shore carrying the orange shine off far and wide over its surface as if the blaze were spreading beneath the ground like a burning growth on a body. The dryad lowers herself down further, hiding, as the machine, the flames, and the man all stand united together by the grimness of the black sacrament that he has created. This is bad, very bad. This is wicked behavior, wrong, unnatural. The fire, the machine, the look on Pilot's face as he watches the blaze consume what it can and then slowly starve to death. She doesn't like this at all. His face and eyes look nothing like the goblins had looked when it was trying to kill her. That monster had a gaze that was full of cruel intent. It was the look of a mean beast overpowering something weaker than it and enjoying the act of the kill. But this, this expression on Pilot, it's just, blankly, soullessly, purposeful. It doesn't have the look of something born in the natural world. It frightens her. Low quality fermented monster blood. The black blood of a monster is full of latent magical energies. It is extremely poisonous. However, this blood has begun to rot and coagulate within a process of off-gas releasing fermentation. This has made it dangerously unstable to work with and unsuited for alchemical purposes, given its combustible nature. Class knowledge, this liquid can be used as an alternative, but dangerous and quickly burning fuel source for aircraft weight 0.01 milliliters value oh 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 balls if he had a cigarette he'd smoke it right now pilot looks back at the kestrel which has now used the very last of its remaining old world fuel reserves for these few moments of heat generation to start his fire the plane shuts itself down caretaker doesn't have any fires anywhere that's why all her food is cold and raw so he had to make his own for a moment to test his new theory Monster blood can be his fuel source. If he hunts monsters, he can let them rot in the sun for a day or two and then use their blood to fuel the plane. Goblins are pretty small, runty things, and the blood burned fast and hot, but they're what he has now. Maybe he can find something bigger and with more potent blood deeper inside the forest. But for now, he knows where to find a good few dead goblins where this lot came from. A whole little collection. In fact, there should be enough rotting blood between the majority of them to fill the Kestrel's tank. Of course, there's a risk that the plane will just explode with him in it, given the unstable nature of this new alternative fuel source, but that was a risk he had in the Kestrel to begin with. From the moment he was assigned to fly this prototype design into a hot combat zone, Pilot looks up at the sky. It looks clear. Good weather. Good wind. The Kestrel is ready. A few colorful. Soft butterflies lazily drift past his face in a warm, 
pleasant breeze. Pilots hand grips his pistol in its holster tightly all the while as he watches them with paranoid eyes as if they were little, meandering demons, just waiting for him to drop his guard. He needs to get back up where he belongs. He's going to get into the air again, now for the first time here in this world. Being down here on the ground in this place is making him twitchy. It's time to fly. 6. Chapter 8. Fly. Pilot. Dash. Level. 04. Human. Something has changed. Invasion. Objectives. Protect the world tree and its last living caretaker from being destroyed by the waves of the encroaching monsters. If either die, the world will be doomed to end. Everything will perish. First invasion. The Goblin Horde. Enemy arrival from. North. Crawling out of the root caves and the dark forests of the world, the goblin legions of the world's many factions have all united under the banner of a single, horrific entity, the Goblin King. Marching under his grim banner, they now move toward the world tree, determined to gruesomely cut both it and its keeper down with ten thousand sharp, bitter knives, just as they have done inside every village and keep along the way. Base arrival time, 24 hours. Unorganized army plus, oh four, hours. Banner of the Goblin King, twelve, hours. Dead Scouts, plus, twenty-four, hours. Total time until invasion, forty, hours. Goblin King, X-1, Goblin Advisor, X-4, Goblin Warrior, X-499, Goblin Scout, X-63, Goblin Caster, X-50, Goblin Archer, X-200, Goblin Auxiliary, X-100, R. Hell, he has to go. Pilot looks at the doorway of the underground den, covered by a long curtain of many beaded strands, staring at it for a second. He hasn't seen caretaker since yesterday by the lake, but there are signs of her having been here in her home and having done her morning work. The man turns back, grabs his things, and goes to walk out of the den. The kestrel is ready to fly, and he's ready to get out of here and into the air. There are things that he has to check before the invasion starts. He has to know what he's up against here. He needs a lay of the land for one, and two, he needs to test the plane to make sure the Kestrel won't shit out on him when the Goblin King, whatever the hell that is, is making his move. Looking back behind himself, Pilot takes his jacket off and leaves it on Caretaker's bed as his only way to communicate that he'll be back soon. It's not like he can write her a note as he exits the underground home. He gazes up and sees that the sky above is webbed with a honeycomb pattern that slowly comes into focus, just like had happened in his own world. Caretaker, dash, level, 10. Dryad Caretaker sits on the grass of the glade, staring out ahead of herself. The soft bark wrappings that had been laid over the body of her sister now lie flat against the soil. Everything that was beneath it, from the flesh to the bones, has been desiccated, returned to the forest and the world from whence it came. The corpse is gone, and so, now so has also left the spirit of her sister. It is returned back to the natural cycle. Perhaps one day they will meet again. Maybe in the next life, they will be fish who chance upon another in the great streams or birds who fly in the same direction for a fated minute. Neither of them ever knowing the truth of who the other once was to them other than a strange inclination to look their way for an inexplicable second. Turning her head to the side, caretaker looks at the status window that has appeared next to her, which warns of the invasion. The Grey Trot has finally arrived. Goblins will be here within two sunrises, and they'll kill her and destroy the world tree, and that will be that. The time has come for her to somehow make Pilot leave before this danger arrives and takes him too. She has done everything that she can for his wounds and they have had time to heal and mend enough that he will survive alone. Pilot seems like a capable, strong individual, but even a trained fighter like him can't compete against numbers on this scale. The Grey Trot isn't just a handful of goblins in the forests, it's a full swarm of claws and teeth in uncountable numbers. If the rot is spreading from the north, Pilot can take any other direction and go there instead. What happens then is up to him to figure out. It is not a dryad's responsibility to do any more than she has already done. Their shared debt is repaid, they are on even footing. They are just two animals who happen to coincide for a time at the same place. Nothing more, right? This is for the best. Caretaker rises to her feet as the wind blows over the damp fabric, showing only a stain on the moist grass below. Her gaze lowers itself down, looking at the beautiful thing, the ring, that she has been idly playing with all of this time. Up above her head, 
the sky, visually cut apart and bisected by prismatic lines as if it were melding into an insect's hive, growls with growing thunder. The dryad looks, lifting her eyes to follow the sound that she has heard before, as she watches in quietly shocked amazement as the plane, the crashed thing in which Pilot had arrived with, soars overhead like a spooked bird, escaping the forest. It flies, it really flies. Her breath finds itself stuck in her throat. She had, of course, imagined that it would, not quite understanding how it does so to begin with, but to really see it do so. Caretaker's eyes follow it in wild wonder as it cuts through the sky, not quite understanding it despite seeing it happen right in front of her. How? How is something so deeply unnatural possible? A mixture of excitement and wild curiosity comes burning like fire in her chest as she does relent that maybe humans can do some amazing things now and then, but then it slowly dampens as she watches the silhouette rise on higher as it continues to fly past the tree line and then simply vanish beyond it, flying toward the horizon alone as would a sparrow without a flock. Quietly amidst the forest, caretaker stands there by herself as the wind blows and the roaring of the metal thing fades from her ears, leaving only the sounds of birds, bugs, and grass and she understands. He just left. Pilot, not that she knew that he wasn't going to. This was always the idea, wasn't it? She was literally just trying to come up with a scheme herself to chase him away. Caretaker looks down at the thing in her hands, the little metal token that she had found by the water. There's something weird inside her. She doesn't like it. Of course, he had to go. But nobody ever says goodbye, she mutters to herself and she flicks the small, metal ring through the air with her thumb, just as he had done by the lake. It flies, with nobody there to catch it, landing in the shadow of a damp grave. Caretaker returns to go home alone, looking around and finding no trace of the man other than his jacket, which she supposes he just forgot. It is as if he had never been. A part of the dryad quietly thinks that maybe he left in on purpose for her. But why would he have done that? Pilot, dash. Level 04. Human. What exactly do you believe in? The Kestrel's 12 cylinder piston engine hammers itself to life as he pulls on the throttle of the plane, rising higher and higher into the air. It was easy enough to taxi along the shoreline thanks to the extra wide tires of the plane and the thick grit of the lake shore. He cleared the tree line easily. That was the question he was asked when all of this started with that voice on the radio. Pilot looks out of the canopy as he rises higher into the air, down at the evergreen forest below, and toward the great titan that is the world tree. Even now, as he rises further into the sky and the forest becomes a blur, the colossal tree is still a growing mass that he hasn't come close to reaching the peak of. He doesn't know who that voice belonged to or who asked him that question. He doesn't know what force brought him to this world. He only knows that whatever it was, it had intended for him to fight against this apocalypse. Why it chose him, he doesn't know. Why exactly this other, this cosmic power, god, or whatever else it might be, expects him to be invested in or care about this situation to a greater extent. He doesn't know either. In his old life, in the old world, the enemy was his only driving force. They always have been. He gave his life to fight them, and he would give it another hundred times over if it meant killing just one more of them. But this place, this world, this war here, in theory, none of it is his to be concerned with. In theory, he has no investment here. Save the world tree. Save its caretaker. The first he doesn't really give a damn about. He doesn't care for trees to begin with and the world tree just weirds him out. But if the worst comes, he'll throw caretaker over his shoulder and cram her into the kestrel with him, and they'll fly until the fuel runs dry. He owes her that much, but retreat will only be an option if it really comes down to it. He'll handle the invasion first, somehow, and if he can't, then the kestrel will fly for a good while, even with two people somehow crammed into its tight cockpit. Pilot pulls the throttle diverting the plane toward the south. Its tank is full, the fuel gauge is moving steadily, and the monster blood fueling the plane is burning quickly, but even at this rate, he has a good amount of air time left before he is to bring her down and find new things to drain like some sort of weird vampire. And so he flies, leaving the valley. He has to see what he's up against here before it arrives. The plane cuts up through the sky, never up into the clouds, but higher above as he looks down at the world below. It looks so foreign compared to what he knows. There's grass everywhere and greenery. It flows out in all directions like an ocean beneath him. 
there are villages dotting the landscape, and he even sees a few larger cities and settlements, none of them modern or within the standards of what he knows. Old timber-framed structures and houses, mixed together with stonework buildings, give the place the appearance of belonging more to the ancient ages of his world than to the modern society that he knew. Great caravans of people are on the move migrating by the thousands as they look for a place of shelter from the storm to come. Plumes of smoke come from hundreds of different burning piles. Then he flies further, there come waters and rivers, hills and mountains, forests and groves, and the world stretches on until the grass stops flowing in greenery. Instead, it turns yellow, there are fewer trees, fewer cities, fewer signs of life. He flies further, the kestrel offering no sign of discontent as it feels the wind around itself once again, the yellow turns brown, and the brown turns grey. Pilot looks out of the canopy down at the world below, which now resembles a volcanic ashland more than anything else, there is nothing here except smouldering dead rock. He would think that this is simply a biome like any other, but as he flies onward, he notices that it does not end. The ashland carries on and on and on for as far as he can see from up above the world. The fuel gauge drops slower, but still, the ashland goes on forever toward the distant horizon. There are no fires, no green, no blue, no anything. There is only the endless grey of a place that has been sucked completely dry of moisture and life, of a world that is burnt to its deepest core, so much so that perhaps even the microbial organisms inside of it has been cauterized. It never ends. Is this what's happening to the world? Pilot takes the kestrel down further, coming closer to taxi and for a landing on what looks like a long, flat strip of barren rock. A few oddities line the edges, the ground is bumpy, with many stones scattered all around the area. The tires hit the rock, and he rolls to a stop, the brakes slowing the machine, dust kicking up behind him. After his momentum stops and he kills the engine, he opens the canopy and looks outside, smelling the air. It smells of nothing, perhaps of ozone at best, there is no scent of any kind that is discernible, and it feels deeply sterile to breathe. Pilot climbs out of the cockpit, looking around at the wasteland, as he walks towards some random collection of rubble, his black boots kick up a fine, smooth dust that resembles the ash below a campfire. There are no monsters, no people, no living things of any kind. Life as a concept does not exist here, is this what the apocalypse causes? The thing that he's meant to prevent? It isn't just a killing, it's an extermination. The man, not really sure what he's doing here in the middle of nowhere, rummages around the area. He knocks something over, realizing that it was an old, wooden beam that had been scorched and burned black. Kneeling down, Pilot looks at the mess buried beneath it, human bones. His eyes then wander in all directions around him as he scans the landscape, the rocks, and the bumps, they're all bones. There are no rocks, there are just thousands and thousands and thousands of them, strewn and picked apart, burnt to blackness by fire and then trampled to dust by the marching of an endless legion of boots and claws. Something drops out of his jacket. Having been stuck in the material, the single, old blueberry that somebody had thrown at him falls down into the ash, rolling toward a skull. Pilot looks at it before turning back to look at the kestrel. What exactly does he believe in? Nothing. The answer is nothing. He doesn't believe in much anything except air superiority. Believing is a luxury for people who don't live like he lives. Believing is for people who don't do what he does. That act isn't something that is meant for him and his ilk. The men with hands that have been blackened by gunpowder and blood so thickly that they look like gloves that can never be removed. People who believe are the civilians behind the back lines. The souls who don't live in the war that never ends. He doesn't believe in things. He does them. He does terrible, gruesome, horrific things, and he does them as a protector of his nation, so that those people who do believe can continue on doing so. That's the official line. According to the thinking of rehearsed military doctrine, Pilot rises to his feet amidst the grey, ashen deadlands, lowers the scarf and takes off his helmet. He takes in a deep, long breath, smelling the smell of home, the desolation all but makes him nostalgic if not for the deafening quiet that is so deeply alien to him still, he misses the sound of artillery. The real truth is that this is just what he does and what he likes doing. He isn't some noble protector of ideals. He doesn't have a heart that is willing to strike its last beat in the pursuit of some grand concept or faith, like the protection of the innocent or the defense of abstract values of good.
he just likes killing the enemy, it's what he does. He isn't someone who can sit around in a big hole below a giant tree all day, collecting berries and weaving together beads on strings. He likes killing people, he likes downing planes, he likes slicing the throats of goblins. This is his ideal state of being, this is his element, where he thrives, and an animal outside of its element, an animal that neglects its natural instincts for too long will simply cease to be, won't it? Pilot returns to the plane and inspects the mounted weapons on the kestrel, checking how long he has left to prepare for the good day's work that needs to be done by someone. And as it turns out, there appears to be nobody else around except him to do it, what a happy coincidence. He doesn't care about the world tree in the least, why would he, but what he does truly care about, if there has to be anything at all for him to name, is returning to the world and to the element that he belongs to, war, the animal that he is needs to go back to its domain, or it will die. But he can't go back home, can he? He can't go back to the conflict that never rests. Pilot examines the ammunition canisters for the Kestrel's twin machine guns. Looking in at the heap of 792 times 57 mm bullets, glistening like the gold of a dragon's hoard, and then around himself at the ash. So if he can't go back to that familiar place, then he'll just have to make this world look exactly like his old one instead. It's close as is, but, currently, these wastelands are missing a little screaming at the moment. They're too quiet. Everything in this world is always too quiet, he slams the hatches shut, climbing back in and turning the kestrel around, rising up into the air and now flying due north, his finger already having pushed down on the trigger just a tiny little bit in anticipation as he returns back, the kestrel having proved herself to be ready enough for his standards. The world as a whole needs to be louder, it needs to roar. Armaments Kurtzen's under 7.92 times 57 mm machine guns, 02, 3500, 3500, rounds, explosive mass cluster ordinances, 0808, high explosive self destruction payload, invasion imminent. The city, due north of the world tree, dash, the joke is that they aren't even the invasion target this time. The dark elf shield maiden sits there on the walls, her hands folded as she stares blankly into the distance. Her hair and clothes below wildly in a strong gale, her legs dangle freely over the edge, very high above the ground, her palms rest on the battlements, people are running around everywhere, some preparing the caravans for evacuation, others preparing for the siege to come. When this crisis all started, people who tried to run, who tried to flee from their cities instead of defending them in the militias and guards, were usually harshly punished to make an example of them, but then one city fell, and then another, and then another. By the time the winter had ended, half of the continent was gone and now, people have stopped caring, everyone is too drained, too tired, the people in power no longer have any power, as anarchy holds the crown of the land, those old nobles, and royals, ever since the winter, nobody has heard from them again. Now, it's everybody for themselves. Those who think they can manage to group together to defend this city here successfully this time do so. Those who don't run, the real issue is through that there is simply nowhere left to run anymore for them. There are no cities left as far as she knows, north of the world tree. This here is the last one. The exhausted dark elf turns her head, looking back behind herself over the thousands of people running through the streets who plan to try to evacuate to the very last sanctuary there is, the world tree's domain, her red, tired eyes, which reveal her endless nightmares that steal her sleep, stare at the impossible giant, sitting in the reachable south, escaping to there sounds like a good plan, in theory, the invasion has the world tree as its target, but given that it will start north of the world tree, that means this city is directly in its path. The city will be attacked by the invasion first as they trample their way south to the world tree. But the problem is that nobody is able to enter the world tree's garden, except its caretakers, the dryads. Any people who have ever tried have been repelled outward by its magical barriers, barring one or two odd examples of old history. As for the other cities down further to the south, there are rumors that they've begun killing refugees who are trying to get in slaughtering entire caravans of men and women and burning the bodies before the invasions could make use of them as undead. That means this place here is it, the last stop on the ride for them. The dark elf looks around herself. She doesn't even know what this place is called, 
This isn't her city, the last city wasn't her city either or the one before that. She's been on the move for a while, running, fighting, escaping, and surviving. Just, just mindlessly surviving. Noxious fumes rise into the air as the surviving children work with alchemical mixtures, readying explosives and poisons for the invasion to come. All around her run soldiers, with armor adorned with hundreds of different banners, the remnants of so many different houses and legions who have now come together as the last people trying to maintain control. They're mustering the defense of this last, final siege. As for herself, she's let go of it all. There is nothing to left to control so there is no need to try to establish any. All she has left are her nightly prayers to the god of the old faith to save her and them. An answer has yet to come, but she still prays. She feels like the only one who does any more. Even the priests and the priestesses who she runs across, fewer in number with every passing night, no longer have many good words to say about their patron deities. The members of the Holy Church, which may or may not exist anymore as an organization, have long since discarded their faith rituals, and hopes. She's unsure herself these days too, honestly. Tired as she is, exhausted as she is, and beaten down as she is, the dark elf reaches to her neck, playing with a blackbird's feather that is on a string, the symbol of her piety and of her god, wondering if today is the day she'll rip it off and throw it in the mud by itself, or if she's just going to finish jumping now that she's started. Then they can both land down there together. She looks down at the very distant ground below her that her legs are hanging above, it'll do the job. In this world, there's nothing left to believe in anymore. Nobody here can stop what's happening. Nobody here can do anything about it. There is no hero, there is no intervention. Nobody is coming to save them, not in this world or in the heavens above it, from which the invasions appear to arrive to begin with. Tomorrow, everyone here, including herself, will finally be dead and she'll finally be able to sleep for the first time in what feels like a year. Or she could just drop off the wall now, this very second, like she was planning to do, and save herself the trouble. She's so tired. The wind continues to blow. Something lightly snaps. The old string of the necklace breaks, the feather having been pulled on too hard by the windstorm, and she watches as the feather of a blackbird sails away into the distance without her. Bastard. She mutters, watching it go knowing that it means that fate has just told her that she has to just put on her big girl pants and die tomorrow like everyone else instead of today. Her tired eyes follow the feather as it goes, rising high into the sky toward the setting sun, where no mortal could ever conceivably dare to follow it. 7. Chapter 9, Invasion The city, due north of the world tree, dash. The invasion has begun, running under the reddening sky. Storb the dark elf sprints past groups of soldiers. What remains of her grime encrusted, scorched scale armor rattles above the layers of ragged fabric that she's wearing as she moves along the wall. Her eyes trained toward the sky as she bounds across past the palisades. A battered, burned, and scarred kite shield is attached to her arm. Its exterior is just as matted with filth and ash as she is. Get those carriages moving. She yells cupping her hand by her mouth and shouting down at the procession slowly meandering into activity below her. The invasion is beginning, the sky is deformed, corrupted, and twisted as if it had been pinched by a witch's finger, as if such a ghastly creature had pressed her threaded needle through it again and again, creating the honeycomb webbing that stretches from one horizon to the other. It looks as if the entire world had been caught in a net, and there, not far to the north, it has been pulled taut. The honeycomb pattern, evenly spaced everywhere else, compresses in a singular spot to the north of the city's walls, the invasions having finally caught up with them here too. Everywhere across the world, one by one, cities and domains are falling by the day as these invasions appear all over the continents. Several humans run past her, carrying massive arrows for the burlesque teeth that sit atop the city's towers. As the cities of the orcs begin to fall. The survivors moved toward the lands of the elves. As the cities of the elves began to fall, the survivors moved to the lands of the dwarves and the fairies, and as those began to burn and crumble under the pressure of endless swarms of monsters, and this cycle of plight and escape continued over and over again. Those who have survived until now are a full hodgepodge of all races and all professions. Adventurers, who formerly made their way through life by fighting monsters in the dungeons of the world and the wilds now fight alongside shoemakers and professional armies.
just the same as bakers and scribes. Only butchers and smiths find work in their old trades. The strong manning the walls are given makeshift pikes, and the weak are given crossbows, working in teams of two to reload them together, or handfuls of volatile glass flasks filled with explosive concoctions. The rare children still alive wear masks to shield their faces from the noxious fumes as they work with their bare hands, combining deadly alchemical mixtures under the guidance of those masters of the art who remain alive in old pots that have been scavenged. They sit in widely spaced rows so that they can still be watched, but if any of them cause a volatile reaction while brewing, the others next to them won't die from the toxic gas. But nobody is truly spared from the war in these times, the primary food of those who live past each wave is the meat of the monsters they have killed, indifferent to the fact that their own brothers and sisters lie within the bellies of these same beasts that they're eating. In times before this, eating monster meat was a firm social taboo, but the world is ending, everything is touched by death. Storb looks back toward the south, toward the great world tree that sits there, visible as a titanic mountain before looking back to the north. Many caravans are escaping the city already, heading toward the sealed valley, toward the domain of the world tree. It is impossible to enter, being blocked off by ancient, powerful magics that keep everyone unwanted out of its shadow, but there's nowhere else left to go. Everything else around here is ash. This city here, immediately to the north of the great tree, is the only piece of civilization left on this side of the continent as far as she knows so their choices are limited, stay here and fight, or try and make a break for it to the world tree in the vain hopes that they'll be allowed to enter its sanctuary, but the world tree is the target of the invasion anyway, so it hardly matters, you can choose to die here in the city or out there in the wilds, but you don't get to not die. Horns blow signals around her as she stops, having climbed to the top of a gatehouse. Storb, the dark elf shields, Ain a close combatant specialized in the use of shields primarily, and once practitioner of the old faith, stares intently toward the north, watching as the bloodied heavens ripple, moving unnaturally as if it were disturbed water, as if they were all upside down above the ocean and an unseen predator was swimming just beneath the surface. I hate goblins, says a man next to her, his hands holding onto the burnt rock of the tower that has already seen many attacks against it. Horrible little monsters. Storb looks at him and then back at the corruption. Be glad that it's just goblins, she says, knowing that she doesn't need to expand on it. A black line, a pillar of what looks like pure, total emptiness, blasts out toward the sky, connecting heaven and the world below and bringing to them the collective scream of countless things of tooth and claw that begin to crawl out of the distant horizon shambling and squirming like a swarm, like a plague that cannot decide between devouring itself and them. This black thing is what they call a thread, it is the spawning point, the corrupted bridge that summons in countless monsters to their world from some place darker and older. It can only be severed by destroying the invasion's leader, goblins, long, lanky, disgusting creatures that stride on any number of limbs between two and four scream charging toward the city walls as they emerge from the corruption. Behind them all moves one significant figure, carried atop a throne that is held aloft by his wretches, the Goblin King, Goblin King, the Goblin King, a powerful, more intelligent, and uniquely strong goblin that towers over his ilk. The Goblin King is a rare, mutated goblin that was born under the rare light of the Goblin Sky God. It ate its way out of its womb instead of being born, devouring its mother and any others in its litter as its first act in the world. Taken in by the wisest of goblin society, the Goblin King has been raised to become a cruel and cunning beast beyond compare. All goblins across the world, with their thousands of different tribes and banners, unite now under his shadow to create one great horde that loyally obeys his commands. Strangely, this seems to make them more intelligent and dangerous than they would usually be. Effect, while a goblin king lives, all goblins in the world gain plus 10 levels and a significant boost to all stats. Entity, monster, rank, SSS, element, none, type, of lord. Storb's eyes, red from not having slept for more than a chance hour here and there for the last few forevers, stare at the approaching threat. Is that it? Asks the man next to her. I mean, a thousand is a lot, but... I was at the river city, remarks the archer next to them, turning her head, there were ten thousand in just the first wave, goblins? asks the pikeman, the archer shakes her head, 
narrowing her eyes as she stares at a glint in the distance. No. She explains, her eyes staring vacantly off into the distance. Undead. After a moment, the haunted elf leans forward, focusing back on the movements of the enemy. What are they up to? The goblin horde has split itself. A few scouts and many others are still charging forward toward them. However, the goblin king and the goblin casters have all stayed in the back. Loose. Comes a cry from the walls, and a salvo of massive arrows, each the size of a man, fired from the burlesty, hurtle through the air and cut down a chunk of the invasion force. However, the mangled bodies of the dead are simply trampled over by the swarm behind them, coming closer and closer to the range of the archers, crossbowmen, and magical casters who are still alive. This is too easy. Storb watches uneasily as the goblins charge right into their firing lines. She's been in many invasions already, some of which they've won, most of which they've lost. She's escaped from so many places already. She knows how this works. Which is why she knows that something is up. This invasion is too small and too simple. One thousand goblins? Even with a boss monster amongst them, the defenses of this city can handle that. And that's even after considering the wounded, elderly, sick, and the orphaned children who are working in its defense. Something glows in the distance, the hundreds of casters surrounding the Goblin King have worked together to create a grand, combined spell. The air around them lights up with a purple aura. The same purple glow that then washes over the heads of the defenders from above. Slowly, Storb lifts her gaze, staring at the rips that come into existence above the city's towers and walls, not just over her head but everywhere. Above the houses, above the shops, above the monuments, and everywhere else there is to be, form wobbling, quivering tears in the fabric of reality. Portals. Invasion modification. Clan summoning. Following the beckoning of the Goblin King, the Goblin clans from around the world begin to join in together with his final assault. Plus 1,000 goblins of random varieties have been added to the enemy pool. This spell will repeat once a minute for as long as channeling is uninterrupted. Look out! Yell Storb too late, lifting her shield as the man with the pike next to her is landed on from above. A loud, sickening thud ringing out as his skull caves cleanly in halfway as the falling goblin's axe strikes down on it. The monster clinging to his neck and shoulder. A spray of blood, bone chips, and brain matter gush out in an instant all around the area. His mouth moves, like he was trying to talk, but nothing comes out of it except a strange series of incoherent noises. Storb, has used, shield bash. Storb jumps forward, holding her shield in front of herself slamming right into the man before he can even fall over dead himself. He and the goblin both fly over the walls, the monster screaming as it plummets with its victim. More screams come from next to her. Storb turns, looking at the elf archer, who is cracking her bow over the head of a goblin. Another one lunges at her from the side, its knife stabbing her in the gut several times before the Storb manages to run over and tears it off throwing it into the abyss before she flattens the other one against the wall, crushing it with her shield. Its legs and arms flail out as she presses the metal against the body, breaking it into a paste with a second bash. The gravely wounded archer tumbles down, an obscene amount of blood leaking out of her almost eviscerated gut that she's holding onto. All around the city, monsters land on rooftops and towers, jumping down and into the middle of it all, cutting through everyone in surprise. Having reached the soft core of what remains of civilization without much effort at all. Soldiers panic, fighting off the monsters that rain down onto the walls and battlements together with them. Others trying to break down and out of formation to help those down inside the city who are being slaughtered. The plans and strategies developed all shatter in that single second as Storb watches more and more monsters pour out of the sky above their heads. The first assault wave being entirely ignored now and beginning to scale the walls. Now that the defenders are looking inward, Storb presses down on the archer's gut, holding the soaked fabric against it as she undoes the elf's belt, lifts it a few inches higher around her belly, and fastens it tight to keep the cloth in place. Hold on. She says, it's okay, grunts the tired archer, her eyes staring blankly and almost indifferently in what must be excruciating pain. Let me die, asks the elf, her vacant gaze looking up to the dim sky. I want it to stow. Storb hoists her up over her shoulders, the elf letting out a scream in pain as the wound compresses at an odd angle. All around the city, anarchy has broken loose, 
everything is fucked. The dark elf Shlzane watches her surroundings as she runs as fast as she can with a body on her shoulders, heading toward the caravan down below that is moving through the streets toward the south, guardsmen trying their best to keep it safe as people evacuate, twisting and pushing through dozens of skirmishes that could be turned to the favor of her side if she intervened. Instead, she jumps down the steps and out of the battlements, running toward the carriages. Blood runs down her back, soaking through her armor. Fuck this. She should have just jumped yesterday like she wanted to. The carriages are already moving at full speed, and the evacuation is happening now in a full-on panic. Coachmen whip their reins. The beasts pulling the carts along screaming as fire burns around them, magic explodes. They stampede, trampling and crushing everything in their way, indifferent if this is person or monster. Storb lovelessly tosses the gravely wounded elf inside of the first cart that she can reach, grabbing a hold of it herself as the rider whips his animal again. The large, bipedal bird, an anchor, screaming as it runs down the street and pursues the other hundreds of carriages escaping the fallen city. An explosion rings out to the side as a volatile alchemical mixture is knocked over. The fireball blasts through the street to their side, the people, the goblins, the houses, and everything else there simply vanishing as the immediate blaze rises toward the sky. The shockwave breaks every window in the area, glass rains down from all directions like falling snow, the shards glinting as they catch the firelight. Invasion modification, clan summoning, following the beckoning of the goblin king, the goblin clans from around the world begin to join in together with his final assault. Plus 1000, goblins, have been added to the enemy pool. This spell will repeat once a minute for as long as channeling is uninterrupted. The procession, those carriages that make it to the gates and aren't destroyed, diverted, ambushed, or stuck on piles of smoldering corpses and rubble, moves through and toward the south. Hundreds of panicked people flee for their lives. All around the carriages, people run on foot, trying to grab onto whatever they can. Bones crunch in the wheels, brothers trample one another, and all around them swarm thousands of cutting cruel monsters that hunt the survivors through and out of the city. Storb hangs on the back of the cart as they hurtle down the road, her matted hair blowing in the wind as she watches behind herself as the city, the last city that she knows of, burns. Fires rise to the sky, reaching it as if creating a separate black thread of their own. It happened so quickly, and there, atop the gatehouse to the south, stands a single, prominent figure that watches them try to escape his drooling hordes hunting after them. The Goblin King, looking toward the south, toward the tree that they ride toward, she can't help but feel like they're moving straight into a dead end. Nobody is allowed to enter into its territory, not even now in these times of crisis. They'll be sitting there out in the open, with the goblins nipping at their heels. A whistling cuts the air. Storb dives down, falling into the cart between a few other people as a crossbow bolt thuds into the wood next to where her head was. Pilot, dash, level, 04. Human, the Kestrel's propeller cuts the air, the cylinders of the engine pumping violently as it screams a mechanical cry. The repaired frame of the plane holds strong, with no noticeable differences from how it felt to fly prior to being pseudo-destroyed. It looks like the repair skill really worked well. Pilot glances to his side, looking at a status window that has appeared, manifested within the glass canopy of the plane itself. Invasion progression. All world tree invasions will follow a predetermined route to reach their goal. Routes can have branching paths, but standard enemy encroaching forces will always follow these pathways. Depending on the invasion direction and state of the valley, these pathways can differ. Objectives. Defeat the Goblin King to end the wave. Failure criteria. Destruction of the World Tree. Death of its caretaker. Optional objectives. Save the escaping civilians. Looking back ahead of himself, Pilot begins to drop altitude as he flies through the red, webbed sky, the plane's right wing almost cutting through the honeycomb pattern as he begins to divert at an angle, passing by the World Tree at a distance. The clouds above seem to swirl unnaturally. Due north is an anomaly. A black, Solidly opaque pillar connects the sky and the ground. As he flies toward the target, the radio crackles with idle static, sounding like the noise of millions of rustling leaves all together at once. Caretaker, dash, level, 10. Dryad Caretaker runs, hurrying to the northern passage, a determined look on her face as she moves, 
hurrying down the forest path at a pace that is significantly faster than that of a normal human's as she bounds down through the familiar woodlands toward the northern valley. Pilot is gone, which is good. He doesn't need to die here, but she's going to do her past sisters and the spirit of the world tree watching her proud. When she was attacked by that first goblin by the lake, she wasn't prepared. She wasn't ready. She's never had to fight before, but she's been watching Pilot, studying his calmness and quietness. As confusingly contrastingly cold as the man's black heart can be at times, there is a lesson to be learned even from him. An animal needs to kill other animals now and then. Wild things will always fight and kill if it comes down to a matter of their lives. The old drags may have made their laws of total pacifism in times of peace, but those days are gone now. She's sheltered, but she's not naive. The era of peace has ended. This is the era of tooth and claw, and those who deny this are those who have already and will yet die. Pilot showed her this, if nothing else. She's grateful for that. Climbing up a hill at the edge of the northern valley, caretaker looks to the horizon outside of the garden. She's going to make her sisters proud. In the distance, next to the black smear of spiders' venom that connects the sky and the world, burns the great city of the men of the land. A great stampede surges toward the world tree's garden, toward her. No, caretaker has sharp eyes that are clear and strong and she sees the people of the valley running for their lives, and not far behind them is the maraud of goblins, the vanguard of the great rot. But they're not going to make it, the black swarm behind them is gaining on them fast, the overladen carts, too full of desperate souls, are too heavy for the terrified animals pulling them behind themselves, the beasts are coming to a state between the adrenaline of a life or death situation and total exhaustion. It won't last. Caretaker looks down at her hand, magic crackling around it. If they make it here, she can help them. Somehow, right? No, they don't need to make it here. They're just humans. They're foolish, selfish, cruel things that just do whatever they want and then just leave. Caretaker looks back at them and then jumps down, running forward along the path, hurrying due north, the wind blowing at her back as she rushes onward, outward. But despite that, they don't need to make it here. She's going to make it to them. She doesn't know what she'll do exactly when she gets there, but, she's going to do something. Dryads are protectors of nature, and, while they are not responsible for the safeguarding of every single life there is, they are responsible for maintaining a balance within the world to some extent, and she has decided that a world without humans, a world with nothing but monsters, is entirely out of sync with what life should be. It is against the ways of dried society to go out of your way to help or interact with humans, elves, or any of the sort. But, as far as she sees it, it is her responsibility as a caretaker to protect these humans, just the same as she would protect a rare bird or a precious snake. They are a natural thing, an animal like any other, yet, dryad society is dead, and she is alive, the last dryad, and she is only alive because a human, a strange, confusing, and cruel as he was in his ways, went out of his way to save her. As caretaker jumps down the hill, her hair and robes billowing in the air as she falls, the distant roar catches her ears, the dryad's eyes widen as she lands and runs, the girl craning her neck to look up toward the cinder-colored sky above her head and at the silhouette of a kingly blackbird that moves through it, flying straight toward the hellscape ahead, and something feels weird as she sees it. Pilot yells caretaker as loud as she can, cupping her hands by her mouth as she shouts toward the sky, lifting her hands and holding them together as she follows after the plane. He came back, he actually came back, pilot came back, the dryad makes up her mind, deciding, and then knowing, this is how, this is how she helps, this is how she'll restore balance to the world, she wants to help, she wants to fight, but she's not a predator, however, he is. She doesn't need to be able to kill. Because he will. She doesn't know how, but he will. Somehow, that's what he does. The spell presses out of her hands, launching toward the soaring man up so high above, the voice of his mount making its intent clear to the world like that of a territorial dragon. Caretaker, has used, wind's grace, the air around pilot's plane changes, the density of it altering itself and the plane shoots onward faster than before, ten thousand and then some falling leaves of the world tree flying after him in the gale he leaves behind him as trail, the forest around her arcing, the many trees rustling as his past disturbs them, birds flying up into the sky in numbers innumerable, 
as if chasing after his silhouette. And there, the mechanism roars, Storb, dash, level, 59, dark elf, the hell is that? screams the coachman, the anchor pulling the carriage sharing in the same cry as a black silhouette shoots over their heads. The dark elf, her hands pressed down on the wounded archer's gut that she's been trying to compress this whole time, lifts her head, looking up to the sky together with everyone else in the carriage as the sky around them shakes. The screams of everyone present there overpowered by the roar that shakes the world, the sound of it. The intensity of it rattling the wood of the rolling carriages, rattling the bones of her body as it soars over them. The red sky flashes orange, as if the gods of lightning and thunder were fighting to contain the maw of the beast. But their hands prove too weak, as a blade of the same severity strikes toward the ground below, connecting both the dead heavens and the dying world with the iron-linked chain of fairy lights. Pilot, Dash Level, 04, human. The twin machine guns blaze, the kestrel shaking as he unloads into the masses of targets. Tango, who are in poor form today, the goblins have no formation, no cover, no anti-air, no trenches, nothing. They're just running over an open field like a bunch of suicide commandos. Pilot's hand rattles, the throttle shaking his arm violently as he holds down the metal trigger, his eyes coldly staring through the visor through the rigidly fixed crosshair of the descending plane that swoops toward the enemy ground forces. The ammo canisters mounted behind him jingle like the chimes of the church's choir, the kestrel's fixed weapons glowing hot as, in the span of a single five-second burst, nearly two hundred bullets have torn through the masses of countless bodies, carving a clear line straight through them like a sea split in the middle. Pilot pulls back on the air brake, the flaps of the plane pulling out and disrupting the aerodynamics of the frame as he yanks on the throttle, making a sharp turn as he returns for another pass, pulling down on the trigger again. The kestrel responds, shrieking at his touch with a banshee's wail as a few hundred bodies are cut down at once. Arms, legs, and everything that is contained therein between fly liberally as the visceral knife cuts through the mess of flesh and fangs. Goblins scream, running around in a panic breaking from their chase as they dive down, hiding wherever they can, scattering, demoralized and confused. Pilot turns his head, looking out of the canopy, looking past the evacuating people of the city, who have a clear lead now again on their escape, toward a single figure escaping the horizon to meet them, caretaker. He pulls the throttle toward the right, diverting away from the mass of chasing goblins as a gale carries a streak of flower petals and ash past his canopy. The kestrel slices through both, as he speeds toward the north. The city ahead of him lies in ruin, fires raging and consuming everything that is left inside of it, which is nothing more than rubble and monsters now. The kestrel howls as he flies through the smoke, firing several salvos into the spawning swarms of goblins, leaking out of the gate toward the south. The canopy glows purple. Instinctively, he yanks on the controls, the kestrel shifting sideways flying with its left wing toward the ground and its right wing reaching toward the sky. Projectiles blast through the air, streaking, deformed lights of what he can only identify as being magical energy launch into the air, grazing the back of the kestrel. In his mirror, he can see the plane's spine smoldering somewhat as one of the cuts across the exterior hull for a brief second. Below, thousands of arrows fly from bows, coming nowhere close to reaching him. There are more goblins here with the archers, robed, and in their midst sits what he can only assume is the primary objective. Even in the mirror and over this distance, the frame and silhouette of the monster are easily visible. He towers over his ilk, a massively clawed finger pointing up toward the sky as he flies past them. In his mirror, the lights return. Pilot looks as dozens of purple, needle-like projectiles, glowing with a vivid aura chase after him with unnatural precision. Seek munitions are projectiles that can independently follow a moving target. The theoretical development of this concept was beyond top secret in his old world, even for his squadron that was outfitted with wildly experimental aircraft. The subject was only something that was whispered about in odd rumors and more than often laughed off as being nonsense. The technology just wasn't there to allow for this in anything but the deepest, most moist fantasies of the cloaks and daggers in the boardrooms. Nobody ever fielded one, as far as he knows, but he supposes the rules are different here in this world. Very different, flying lower. 
The kestrel glides through the smoke of countless houses, the wind around him unnaturally distorted and allowing perfect mobility as he presses through the black smoke, indigo lights blaring around him as the spells collide, arching down his way as he sails over the tops of the old rooftops, preparing himself for an evasive maneuver as he eyes a landmark that is just ahead. Now, he yanks the air brake into action, demanding just as much of the throttle in the same second. The airframe careens around in a sharp turn and angle, the grumbling facade of a cathedral's bell tower in flames only an arm's length from his canopy glass as the plane wraps around it, flying a horizontal loop back around to the other side, the monument behind him explodes, the projectile spells erupting as they strike into the cathedral he had used as a barrier, causing the whole thing to collapse as he circles back toward his target, his hand already down on the trigger, the curtains under machine guns cutting through a street full of swarming bodies, rushing to escape as he flies back toward the gatehouse. Archers and spellcasters stand there, already waiting for his return pass, their weapons readied, and the next wave of incantations ready to be fired his way. The Goblin King is standing there behind them, roaring orders to his guard as he picks up a broken frame of the gate himself, arching his back as they expect him to fly another straight pass directly their way. Goblins are clever and quick on the uptake, they've seen his weapons, and they've already begun to adapt and learn in only these few moments. The archers have dropped their bows, stealing crossbows from the nearby dead. Direct anti-air fire is a game of chance. Flak is one thing, as its explosive nature makes it easier to down aircraft by killing the pilot, but single, solitary projectiles flying into the sky from the ground are entirely another story entirely. Is it possible to hit a plane? Yes, of course, especially if you have a lot of bullets instead of just one or two, and especially at this altitude and distance, but it's not guaranteed. Pilot rests his hand on the throttle, his other grabbing the air brake. However, like all games of chance, there's a way to rig it, and in war, anyone who plays fair, anyone who fails to adapt and stay flexible, is already dead, even if their bullet hasn't found them yet. A hundred spells fly his way, the ruby knight ahead of him shining as it coalesces with violet as if he were suddenly flying into a field of stars. Arrows, covered in burning grease, fire his way from looted crossbows together with the barrage of spells. Immediately, he pulls back on the throttle, the kestrel sharply lurching and rising straight up into the air at a desperate, raised angle, almost perfectly perpendicular to the ground, the motor suffocating as it begins to choke against its fight against gravity, as he shows his belly to the enemy and shows them a new trick they can try to remember for next time. Pilot's hand reaches to the side, to a switch, the radio crackling with static as his plane begins to stall, its momentum coming to an end, and in that very same second, as his momentum presses forward with one last, final nudge, he releases his explosive ordinances, the Kestrel's loaded explosive cluster munitions deploy and fly onward together with the momentum given to them by the plane's upward lurch, the barrage of enemy fire flying past his tail, the spells not having time to bend back his way yet, the eight bombs fly free from the Kestrel, soaring through the air and releasing their internal payloads of 21 hexogen laden nose fuse submunitions each as they do so. A piece of his rear horizontal stabilizer breaks as a massive log rips through it. Pilot stares toward the sky that is straight above him for a moment as the plane stalls, and then, as that second ends, thunder cracks out aloud as the ordinances, having opened themselves up during descent and released nearly 200 small explosive charges each begin to pepper the ground, sending shrapnel out in all directions as the gatehouse and the walls around it are broken down into rubble and dust by the hammering of a thousand and then some strikes, and the same can be said for the bodies atop it, which are gruesomely blown apart. Pilot catches his descent, the Kestrel's engine returning to life again as he diverts, letting the unnatural wind catch his wings again as he drops, his eyes watching the fire rise his expression never shifting to a smile or anything else as the smoldering cracks of his creation eke through the world, the indiscriminate char of ash of bodies and wood flying past his canopy as he soars over the impact site that was once the proud throne of the Goblin King. Confused goblins stand all around the city, the tide of their bodies having abruptly come to a stop, the portals in the sky all begin to flicker and wane, vanishing one after the other, the spells in the air falter and fade away and then, 
Without a leader, weakened without his presence and his dominating control of all goblins, the remaining monsters immediately turn feral and descend down onto each other. Thousands of goblins run rampant, their cohesive push toward the world tree coming to a stop as they fall into animal madness, cutting and tearing at each other as members of a thousand different goblin clans suddenly find themselves vying for an empty seat of power. With his damaged plane, Pilot flies a few more circles in the outlands, strafing the hunters and taking out as many of them as he can, until the trigger no longer responds, the Kestrel's belly of munitions having been emptied out entirely, his finger clicks down on it again and again, but each time the machine responds with nothing more than a hollow jangle. It's beautiful. Fires burn everywhere, with ash rising in the air. Pilot looks out of the side of the canopy as the black thick thread that connects the world to the sky begins to ripple and waver as if someone had struck the chord of a harp, then, as if fraying, one second after the next, it begins to tear apart until it severs violently as if it had been pulled too taut, and what looks like the black, crude, oily substance that had made it up splashes out everywhere in all directions as the construct crumbles within itself like a collapsing pillar of water, it washes out over the landscape one great wave of the substance flowing in all directions until it all comes to a stop, creating a brackish, swampy mire where it comes to rest, much of it quenching the inferno of the city's walls, drowning thousands of goblins in the flood of black water. This place looks like war, he loves it, he wants more of this. This is what he was made for, this is his element, this is where he belongs. Just to be sure, he pulls the trigger again, but his ammunition remains depleted. Pilot returns his gaze forward, flying toward the world tree, as hundreds of windows, mostly experience point gains, appear all around his vision. Invasion defeated. The invasion is over. Wave 1 has been repelled. The Goblin King has been slain by Pilot. Time remaining until next invasion 23 days, 2359 hours. The battle is over. Goblin King, X1, Goblin Advisor, X4, Goblin Warrior, X401, Goblin Scout, X16, Goblin Caster, X84, Goblin Archer, X130, plus 29,405 EXP, plus Tilda, Level Up, Tilda Plus. Pilot, has leveled up to level, 30. You have, 27, new abilities. As he flies, the damaged plane hangs in the air much better than he expects it to. Pilot looks at the damage in the mirrors, realizing that it is similar to the damage he carried before he made his final assault back on the old world, but unlike then, when he was flying alone toward that enemy armada, there is a new wind under his wings that holds him up in the air, and the Kestrel, despite its fresh scars, glides smoothly toward the distant, green horizon that awaits him. As he sails over the caravans that sit at the edge of the grasslands, slowly entering into the forest, he sees an ocean of faces looking his way from below. If he had to guess, that's probably because of the trail of smoke, his wing is smoldering, after all, the man pulls the air brakes, deploying his landing gear as he slows down and drops further, beginning to taxi on the long, even strip of land next to the lake, the kestrel rolls, crunching thick, coarse sand and then slowly comes to a stop. Pilot sits there quietly, leaning back against his impressively uncomfortable seat as he stares through the canopy, his hand resting on the radio as he pulls out the receiver, holding it to his visor, his finger already holding down the button to talk, his head is turned toward the world tree, and he is looking at it as he sits there. Bastard, is the only thing that he says into the radio before hooking the receiver back in and opens the canopy, climbing out of the kestrel and onto the wing. In response to his message, the radio silently hisses, white noise static ringing out like the sound of millions of rustling leaves. He can't prove it, but he's certain that the voice on the radio he had heard when he died, the force behind the strange strange influences and synchronicities that he's noticed now and then. These were Dash, Pilot, yells a voice from the distance as he climbs down the Kestrel's battered and burned wing. He looks behind himself, his boots crunching into the sand, as caretaker runs his way, shouting and waving her arms. Pilot, he blinks, watching her run. Damn, she's faz. Pilot, yells caretaker as she crashes into him. Having not slowed down a single bit, the dryad tackles him, and the two of them fall to the ground and roll onto the crystal sands of the lake shore. 
He thinks that his mended rib, still bruised, breaks a little again as she lands on him, her elbows pressing against it. The wind shakes the boughs of the world tree, and Pilot can only continue to glare toward the giants, even as caretaker, very unusually for her normal demeanor, laughs and holds him next to the shimmering waters of the lake, talking some sort of nonsense in her language that he can't understand. The goddamn tree is the one who set him up, bastard. The tree was the voice on the radio he heard before he died. It's responsible for all of this. He wouldn't even be surprised if it somehow arranged the enemy ambush in his old life itself too. He can't prove it. He can't prove any of it. And this all sounds insane, but he's sure. Pilot. Cries caretaker again as he turns his head back away. Her face is gone, being now buried in his shirt, which he feels becoming wet as she sobs. Did he miss something? What's up with her? The man slowly lowers his hand onto her back. Caretaker, he replies, letting his palm rest against her as she howls, her fingers gripping the fabric of his shirt tightly. He supposes that she got scared about the goblins or something. Maybe he should teach her how to shoot a gun later. That might help. 9. Chapter 10. Recover. Caretaker. Dash. Level. 10. Dryad. Hammers and saws are at work. Rough shelters are being built and the carriages are being unloaded with the bodies of those who didn't didn't make it. Caretaker does her best not to scream every time someone hacks an axe into a tree or takes a saw to a sapling. She has been running around for hours now, ever since she found Pilot again by the lake after he landed. Now Caretaker is healing everyone from the city who she can manage to get to, but there is so much damage to so many bodies and so many grievous wounds that even her abilities have trouble keeping pace. Even with the other healers present amongst the survivors, they are stretched thin, and all the stored medicine and ointment she had been giving to Pilot is now empty. The dryad holds her hands against the stomach of a maimed elf, which is beginning to fester with rot around the crust and is still oozing blood. Her skin is pale, verging toward an almost unnatural blue. Caretaker has used cure hard ointment, plus 16 exp, plus tilde, level up, tilde plus, caretaker, has leveled up to level, 11, new ability, gardener, root manipulation, active, allows you to manipulate the roots of plants and trees to use as snares for enemies, or as bindings to secure objects, the spell glows around her hands, the wound beginning to seal the maimed elf's body shut, with exhausted, confused, and perhaps somewhat horrified eyes, Caretaker looks around herself at her changing world. There are hundreds of survivors, maybe a thousand or more. There have never been so many people in the shadow of the world tree at once. The evacuated people of the human city have come to the world tree's garden. Humans, elves, orcs, fairies, dwarves, and vilt, half animal, half human mixes, collect. Many work on gathering wood by chopping the trees with their axes, foraging too greedily and stripping the bushes bare, leaving none for the animals and starting fires around which they huddle. They're destroying everything, but the world tree let them in. If it had wanted to keep these people out of its sanctuary, it could have easily done so, but it had chosen to let them all enter the garden, enter into its forests, and the northern edge of the valley, where they now collect and gather themselves. This is very bad, isn't it? This goes against everything she was taught and raised to accept as normal. Humans were only very, very rarely allowed to enter the garden now and then, but never like this. Someone grabs her wrist, and she looks down, looking at the rasping elf who is holding onto her arm. Stay still, instructs caretaker, looking into her eyes. You must not move. The elf opens her mouth, speaking too lightly to be heard. Caretaker leans over, listening to her hearing only a single word, don't. She gasps, her chest rattling. Caretaker's eyes go wide as she feels the hand again and realizes that she isn't holding onto her. She's trying to pull Caretaker away to stop her from mending her wounds further. Excuse me, calls someone from the side. Caretaker looks as an Aussish man bows himself down, prostrating himself fully next to her. Esteemed Caretaker, my son needs your help, please. He begs, even if they're logging burning, and ravaging the area to survive. These people of the city have great respect for the world tree and, as such, for its caretakers too, who live in their heads as something akin to regional deities. The truth is that she's not that powerful compared to her sisters. She was one of the youngest and least experienced in all matters of life. But after what happened before, after Pilot saved them all, 
and after the people here have begun speaking of the great black bird that roosts in the world tree, the mythology around this place has become solidified in their hearts, they revere and fear her in a way that she feels she will need a lot of time to adjust to, entirely after the fact of them being here at all. Of course, replies caretaker, rising to her feet. I will do what I can, she promises, deeply exhausted, her full contingent of soul points having almost been spent, limiting the magic that she has available, but first, help me get her to the side, she instructs, grabbing the elf beneath the arms as the orc runs over, taking her legs. After what happened before, that thought repeats in her head as she looks back over her shoulder toward the lake in the distance, toward which the northern river of the valley runs. It's a little embarrassing now how she ran to him, pilot, she charged straight toward him, before helping any of these people on their arrival. Even if she was already here when they entered the garden, wounded and in dire need of her help. Instead, she turned straight back around and sprinted to the lake. They've never hugged before, and she just blazed right in, crying and throwing herself at him. But she was so overwhelmed and confused about the fact that he came back. Caretaker was sure that he had left for good and that she was about to die. But he not only came back for her. He also saved both the people here and the world tree too. It was just so much to finally have someone come back after they left. For someone to do so much. She had no idea that he was this strong. But why, even? Why would he? Pilot has no firm connection to this place or anything here. There is a thought that she has about this, but she does not think it, letting it rest in the back of her mind where it can safely stay for a quieter time. She knows that he does strange, wicked things, wrong things, like blood alchemy, but can he really be a bad person if he does so much good too? Can he really be wrong if the world tree has allowed him to come here twice now? He had even tried to come with her back here to the survivors after that, which she assumed was to help the wounded but she rejected him with several firm statements that consisted only of increasingly firm rejections of a single word until he gave up dash no. He'll cause too much of a spectacle if he shows up here and now, the black dragon riding knight with a strange helmet. These people are abuzz enough as is without seeing the man who rode what they've give a wide variety of names, the plane. She'll introduce him to them more formally soon, when the dead are buried, and the hurt are healed, but really? Caretaker just wanted to escape from him again for a few hours after making a fool of herself. Everything is so confusing these days. Left feels like right and right feels like left. Storb, dash, level, 59. Dark Elf. Storb looks around herself at the place they've come to, wandering aimlessly in a near mindless daze as her vacant eyes drift around to the left and to the right, looking but never observing. Screams and fire fill her head her heart still thrashing in her chest as she tries to process everything that happened, the city, the goblins, there, the thing, the dragon, there, reaching instinctively for her neck, where a talisman had hung until only yesterday, she finds that her fingers grab nothing but air instead of the feather necklace. Behind her are people, unloading the dead and wounded from the carts, establishing themselves immediately under the guidance of the surviving soldiers and what looks like a dryad of the world tree but she's just hambling, not so much in thought but rather in delirium brought on by full overstimulation of her thoughts and senses, months and months of adrenaline, mud, ash, and smoke have been completely overwritten in her sight, her smell, and her touch as she finds herself inside of a place that is almost mind-numbingly green, healthy, and alive, it wasn't the escape, the anarchy, or the death that felt like it fried her brain, it was the sudden stop of it, the instant contrast from nightmare to paradise. They all saw him, the man who ended the crisis alone. She read the status window when the Goblin King died. She saw him fly over their heads, just like everyone else did, but still, everything feels so unreal. She feels disassociated from her body. Are they safe? Is this place safe? Is she? Is she safe? Her mind asks these questions as she stumbles out of the clearing, standing on the side of the great, massive lake. Something down below catches her eyes. Impossibly, perhaps ludicrously, a single black, tattered feather sticks out of the thick, wet sand of the shore. Having been carried there by a gale that no one would ever believe if she told them about it, it is the one and the same feather of a black bird that she had let fall from the walls of the city and watched get blown away the token of her belief in the powers of the old faith.
The wind comes again now and blows it away anew, carrying it across the waters of the lake toward the world tree before she can grab it. As it flies, Storb realizes her mistake, staring with deeply tired eyes. It wasn't a feather, she just imagined that for a moment. Her exhausted mind is playing tricks on her. It was simply an old leaf, as she watches it fly, her vision follows it past the world tree and to the opposite shore of the lake. There sits the massive black bird that they all had seen swoop from the heavens to save them from the goblin swarm. Standing on its wing, she sees a man whose name she had read from the status window that everyone here had seen after his victory alone over the invasion. Pilot, mutters the dark elf, Storb, staring out over the distant waters for a time. Pilot, dash, level, 30. Human pilot quietly stands there next to the freshly repaired kestrel, his helmet on his head as he was testing out his new ability to repair his helmet's visor, as it has been cracked and broken since his rebirth. He's still not technically sure if he died or not. In his mass of level ups from the completed invasion, he got the ability to allow this, and funnily enough, the sparkling, crystal sand of the lake sure works as a replacement for damaged glass. It worked, and his helmet is in one piece again. He'll use this ability to maintain his sidearm and clothes too, if he can. New ability, dash, mechanics, repair equipment, small, active, cost, O2, soul plus, raw material, allows the repair of any personal equipment relating to your class. Down next to him stands what he assumes is a child. Having come out of the northern valley and the forest to the lake, it's one of the civilians from the destroyed city. The little stranger is covered in many layers of sharply edged, dirty, brown fabric covered in marks of soot and ash. It looks like the corners of dozens of cut open burlap sacks piled over one another and draping downward. Obscuring their face is a crude wooden mask that is covered in acid and fire burns. Strapped around their body is a much too large leather belt covered in empty, cracked glass vials and bottles. The two of them stare at one another, sharp eyes staring through the holes in the wooden mask, as he tries to figure out what it wants. The last time he saw a child was, well, back when he was one himself. It feels a little odd for him, it's like he's looking at a fake person. What makes it more troubling, though, is that this one is just, standing there, staring and watching. It's not running around the plane in excitement and curiosity like Caretaker did when she first saw it. No. It's just staring at him and doing nothing else. The two of them stand there across from one another without speaking for a time. Then, after a full minute of nothing but strange silence, it turns around and runs away back into the forest, leaving him standing there and scratching his head. Weird. Looking toward the north, Pilot watches the plumes of smoke begin to rise into the sky, as the survivors begin to build fires in their camps. Caretaker probably won't be happy about it. He's never spoken to her about it, obviously, but given the fact that he has never seen as much as a single spark being lit here, he feels like it is safe to assume that she and her kind don't like fire, especially within their forest. His eyes wander back toward the world tree as the fresh plumes of smoke barely even come close to its base, dissipating long before they even come near to the giant's lofty boughs. Hope you choke on it, he says, taking off his pilot's helmet and heading back. The kestrel is repaired and, even better, reloaded. His theory about the ammunition ability was right. He's gotten so many new abilities from the invasion that it's a little overwhelming. New ability. Munitions. Regenerate primary weapons systems. Passive. Fully restores the munitions count of your plane's primary weapon every 24 hours. Although that does leave him lacking in the secondary munitions, his dropped ordinances but having the machine guns ready to go is enough to set his heart at ease, especially since he can just come and plunder the ammunition canisters every night to create a stockpile before it regenerates. In the meantime, there's more that he can do. Caretaker is still working hard and probably will be for a while, so he has time to prepare something. He found something very interesting the other day and this might just be the perfect opportunity. New ability, survival, food identification, simple. Passive allows you to identify edible and poisonous plants, berries, and fruits in the wild. He's getting used to the taste, honestly. Cold food has been a staple more often than not for his life, so that wasn't too strange from him to adapt to. 
but the stark difference in ingredients has for sure been something requiring adaptation for him in this new world, especially their natural, raw state of the food. Pilot stares down at the table full of berries, bowls of cold water, leaves, and herbs that he has collected and turned into a variety of pastes with a mortar and bessel made out of old wood. Taking careful dabs of them one after the other, he begins mixing them in together, stirring them into the bowls with cold water, little by little, as he had watched caretaker do many times. This is his attempt at recreating the cold soup that she always makes. 1. Because he's starving, and 2. Because today's fight isn't over yet just because Tango is dead. Today's fight isn't over until tomorrow's begins and when tomorrow begins, full stomachs will allow clear heads. Such is life within the war that never ends. The dangling beads rustle as someone steps inside, staring down at the ground and then looking his way. Pilot, says caretaker, doing the awkward half-hand wave thing with their fingers that people do when they aren't sure if they should be greeting you now or not. Her eyes leave him and then look down curiously at the bowl that he slides across the old wood that acts as a table. Soup, he explains, saying the first of the five words that he knows in her language. She looks at it and then at him in surprise before staring back at it again, walking over. He's not sure if he should be offended or not as she tentatively lifts the presented bowl up, examining it closely, as if she were a member of a bomb disposal unit. Caretaker holds his creation to her nose, cautiously sniffing it, before taking a tender sip. Ooh! She says in abject surprise, her eyes going as wide as they seemingly can as she tastes it. Caretaker hurries toward the table curiously eyeing everything on it as if studying his work, or perhaps looking for poison. He's not sure, you're welcome, caretaker, says Pilot, combing the last three of four words that he knows of the language, causing her to let out a second impressed exhalation, setting the bowl down and lightly clapping her hands together as he prepares a second bowl for himself. Judging by her curious examination of everything as she bounces around the table, seemingly much more energetic than when she had entered the den. He feels like he did good. Perhaps he even exceeded any expectations that were set for him, if any at all existed. Pilot looks out of the side of his eyes at the suddenly energetic girl, her doe's tail bobbing around in excitement as she tries, but fails to uncover his secret. He's never seen that happen before to this degree. On the table are nothing but the usual plants and pastes that she herself knows. She's seemingly thrilled about someone making her food for a change, but even more so, because it tastes great. Unusually great. But that is because he is a dishonest man. A wicked man. He isn't a man who plays fair. He's a man who wins. A man without scruples or morals who will do whatever it takes to beat the enemy. He is a man who found a growth of salt rock in the stone formations down in a small tunnel on the other side of the world tree and used some of that pure salt in the cold soup, adding in very generous amounts that he is more familiar with from the industrial slop he had subsisted on back home. He still has the lump of hard crystal salt in his pocket, there's a whole vein of it down there in the tunnels, it looks like they were mostly untouched. He can only assume that caretaker and the rest of her ilk, who seem to be missing, presumed dead, neglected mining as much as they did any just about everything else. A survival training tidbit that he picked up once in some old manual on hunting, wild deer love salt lick, they go crazy for it. Caretaker, the dryad, the girl with features of a doe, looks his way, her eyes wide as he holds out a spoon, pouring a little more into her bowl instead of his own. Given her old expression, he may as well be a war hero, gotta keep that morale up. Nine. Chapter 11. Imprint. Pilot, dash, level, 30. Human. High in the air, Pilot swipes through some of his new abilities from the invasion. New ability, aviation, lay of the land. Passive, creates a top-down, system-generated map of the region everywhere you have flown. You may access this map at any time. New ability. Aviation, incendiary fuel dump, active, allows a controlled release of a portion of the Kestrel's fuel toward the ground through a superheated release valve, causing it to ignite. New ability, mechanics, upgrade component, passive, affords you the knowledge to modify and exchange the loadout of the Kestrel with alternative weapons, plating, and pieces that you manufacture or acquire, looking back out of the canopy as he circles the garden. 
he eyes the ground for any stragglers from the invasion. Most of the goblins died either in the invasion because of him or because they murdered each other themselves afterward. But many others scattered, fleeing into the ashlands and the ruins of the city. He now patrols the skies like a hawk over a field full of scampering mice, picking them out and off one burrow at a time. Plus, at the same time, he can generate a map of the area, which will come in handy for future planning. There will be more invasions to come, and next time, there will be no city in their way. If they come from the north, they'll be heading directly for the world tree, but he isn't alone in defending it now. The people there, if healed, equipped, and trained properly, might be useful in its defense. If they have a real map, a detailed one, that'll be all the more helpful to coordinate. Something moves down on the ground. Pilot hits the new switch that has appeared on the Kestrel's dashboard, watching his fuel gauge drop as several liters gustle out at once and catch fire as the heavy, oily globules splash down to the ground below, splattering fire all over a goblin's nest. Dozens of screaming monsters run around in his mirror as he pulls up, the green things flailing and spreading the blaze further by themselves in their panic as they burn alive, covered in flaming sludge. Beautiful. The battle is over, pilot, has immolated, goblin survivor, x14, plus 126 cxp, plus tilde, level up, tilde plus. Pilot, has leveled up to level, 31. New ability, dash, munitions, incendiary ammunition, toggle, cost, 05. So, minute by activating a superheating, fuel applying augmentation to the Kestrel's curtains under machine guns, all fired projectiles can be coated with monster blood and ignited on release. This augmented ammunition applies status, burning, to all struck targets, caretaker, dash, level, 11, dryad, caretaker slept like the dead last night, after the exertion of the invasion and everything that happened, after eating so well and so much. She actually fell asleep at the table itself. But despite that, she feels like she has gone to the spirit world and returned. Caretaker continues her work today with the people of the city having a more somber task now than healing the sick and hurt. The dryad stares at the many dead, lying together in unnatural rows, their bodies covered not with shrouds or fabric, as the humans would usually do, but rather with the soft bark of the world tree that she brought them, in the shadow of which they now sleep. But her distaste for the bodies having been moved from where they died is softened by the mourning and wailing present around her in the grove. She did not pester them about their ways, like she did with Pilot. She cannot help them with this ceremony, as it is foreign and unknown to her. In fact, there seem to be so many more acts and practices than just one. Caretaker watches as a man places two metal discs over the eyes of his daughter, holding his hand over her face. Then the dryad turns her head watching as a boy carries a sprig with berries still attached to it, resting it on his brother's lips. Others pray, following the tenets of the religious faiths they practice, and many simply howl like wolves, their cries filling the air. The wind blows, the sun shines, the day is good, peaceful, and gentle. It reminds her of when she was freshly mourning her sister. In the distance, she watches Pilot flight toward the horizon before then lowering her gaze to the crawling soil that has begun to take the bodies into it, returning them to the good dirt from which all life comes. Pilot, dash, level, 31, human. It is later that day. Are those bees? Pilot stands at the base of the world tree, looking up at the large, Matt yellow cluster above his head that is clinging to a groove and the bark of the titan. What looks like a hive of some sort is nested there, quiet now. He assumes bees are day active creatures. A thick, golden syrup runs down the wood toward the grass. World tree bee, a bee. What differentiates this bee from any other bee is that it lives and feeds on the world tree. Charged by the world tree's deeply potent magical energies, these bees have become incredibly toxic and highly territorial far more so than any other kind. Led by a single queen per hive, these bees live in giga colonies of hundreds of thousands of female worker bees each, with several thousand male drones. When aggressive, these bees will swarm by the thousands, giving little warning to anything they perceive to be a threat. An attacking bee will penetrate its target with its stinger, ripping the protrusion free from its own body and dying in order to leave its weapon lodged inside the victim. While stuck, the disconnected stinger will continue to gradually pump out a potent venom for hours. Given their diets, these bees are naturally resistant to magical spells and effects, 
Entity, Insect, Rank, D, Element, None, Type, Swarmer, EXP, O, 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 Rare World Tree Honey, Produced by an unusually strong species of bee that is capable of reaching remarkable altitudes during flight in order to reach the boughs of the world tree, this thick, deeply amber honey is laden with significantly potent magical properties and can be used for a wide variety of applications if properly handled. Extreme caution must be taken, as the sting of the world tree bees that produce this honey, as well as the consumption of such honey, is capable of inflicting a variety of severe psychoactive and physical effects such as horrific visual and auditory hallucinations, aphrodisial stimulations, painful swelling, deep nausea, or all of the above. In large amounts, both the honey and the stings of the bees may lead to potentially fatal symptoms such as organ failure or severe cerebral and spinal damage caused by overwhelming blood toxicity. Weight, value, 450 obols, 100 milliliters. Holding a salt crystal in his hands, Pilot looks at the hive. Well, if he ever needs toxic honey or killer bees, he knows where to go. The man shakes his head throwing and catching the salt rock as he walks back through the forest, caretaker, dash, level, 11, dryad, it is night time, there is a chill in the air as the noticeable wind, coming in short bursts now and then, carries the icy air from the lake all around the valley, caretaker sits outside of the den on the ledge, staring down over the vast waters of the many rivers below, it sits there as a beautiful sapphire, unblemished and pure, as its water satiates the thick roots of the world tree. Starfall shimmers upon the body of the grand mirror, giving back to the heavens the scraps of light they let fall to the world below from their bountiful tables, covered in endless portions of glowing, ethereal lauras, the likes of which can be seen here and now, streaking through the sky. She sits there, her legs pulled in and her arms wrapped around them, as she stares up toward the night through which streaks a dancing serpent of greens and yellows, the souls of the dead being taken in an unusually grand spectacle that she can only assume is a gift of the world tree, bestowing its mercy upon those who remain, those who are no less than they were before, connections are very important, everything changes, life is always changing, even if the days blend together so quickly, each new one is completely unlike the one that came before it, however, the thing that maintains a chain of stability in life between these days are the connections one has with others, the connections that she had with her sisters, the connections that these people had with their kin, lovers, and family, are what made the days make sense. So what does a person do when they are alone and without such a thing? How can they possibly stop the days from melting, from becoming impossible to distinguish, without anyone else to talk to about them with or to share them with? How does a communal animal survive in the wild by itself? It doesn't, does it? Prey animals often rely on each other to survive. Predators are the ones who are more likely to be able to thrive alone. Boot scrunch as someone walks behind her, coming out of the den. Pilot caretaker doesn't turn her head, knowing that it couldn't be anyone else. Plus, she's starting to recognize the sound of his gait. It's so heavy and deliberate. Caretaker, he says. Pilot, replies caretaker. Wondering if he's going to sit down with her and watch the spirits of the dead leave the world. It sounds weird, but she'd love to tell him about her sisters. Maybe she just wants to talk about them with someone she trusts, even if they can't understand her. It'd be a little like talking to a rock, but enjoyable in a way. Something heavy and warm wraps over her shoulders, and she looks, seeing his jacket on her. It's much too big. Surprised at his gesture, caretaker looks his way wondering in shocked embarrassment if this is his return for her abrupt hug yesterday, but instead of sitting down there and watching the treasure sky that has captivated the eyes of everyone in the valley, he simply strides past her and down toward the cold forest without his jacket, heading somewhere with intent and purpose, like he always seems to be doing. Watching him fade into the night alone, caretaker pulls the jacket closed around herself, looking up at the lights above, the shimmering grass rustling around her, and the hairs on her neck standing on end. There's magic in the air, literally, it's coming from the world tree, it feels sad to be alone on a night like this, even if she can feel his residual warmth of him around her. Caretaker, realizing how confused she is by her life all of a sudden, pulls up the jacket and hides her face in it so that she can scream and have it muffle her voice, the inside of the heavy thing smells strongly of him. This does not help. 
What's his hurry? There's so much time left before the next invasion arrives. Pilot, dash, level, 31. Human. There's almost no goddamned time left before the next invasion arrives. It's almost here. There are just over 20 days to prepare for a full-on siege of monsters against a fortificationless forest full of big-eyed rabbits and traumatized people with gangrene, wet boots, no organization, and no morale. A good 10% of them are children for crying out loud. And God knows what confused elements of this terrible hellscape world have caused an aurora borealis to form along the equator region of the planet. Pilot glares up at the shimmering night above him in disgust knowing that flying in it would absolutely wreak havoc with the Kestrel's radio and electronics. He hates it here. The soldier from the war that never ends marches for a while past the beautiful, azure lake, staring at the Kestrel that needs more fuel. He may have burned a few too many goblins alive earlier. He has a plan for that. He needs a net. Caretaker has a rope, and there are more ropes in the many unused, empty domiciles around the roots of the world tree that he's found. They can tie them together to make a net that can be affixed to the Kestrel. He'll fly out into the Ashlands and gather as many dead goblins as he can before they go to waste. The man bends down, drawing in the sand. He needs to have a pit made here, a mass grave. He needs to collect hundreds, no, thousands, of mangled, tattered goblin corpses to drop in that hole, where they can be compressed and juiced dry of their foul, fermenting guts that he needs so he can gather the goo as fuel. Then he needs explosive ordinances. His machine guns are full, but he wants bombs. He needs them. He's been watching the people of the city from a distance. The surviving children already work with chemicals, wearing masks and thick layers of clothes to shield themselves from the toxic, volatile ingredients. One of them was by his plane watching him the other day. He can make use of them. He'll find a mixture of reactive ingredients and get them started on making explosive charges as soon as he can manage to span the communication barrier for this. Back where he found salt by the world tree, there was a passage that went deeper. Maybe a mine for raw materials can be established there. The salt mine is also good for more than food and preservation. With a little luck, they'll have exactly what they need to make a special surprise for the next invaders. The adults of the city can work there in the tunnels. Pilot stops for a moment, wondering if any of this is ethical. He strikes a line through the sand. Okay, no. He'll have the adults work on bomb making, the children can go into the mines. The night is quiet as Pilot blankly stares at his diagram. It feels like both of these options are terrible, but what the hell are they supposed to do? This is a last ditch, all hands on deck survival situation. There's hardly room for anyone to not do anything here if they want to make it. Maybe. Maybe he can get Caretaker to show the children how to make medicine and ointments, how to gather food and prepare it. She seems overwhelmed by the amount of work she has to do alone. That might be an idea. That would be a big help, and, as an added bonus, he wouldn't become a war criminal. Pilot nods. They need sulfur, charcoal, and potassium nitrate for the production of classic gunpowder. But he can use the collected gunpowder from his harvested bullets to make some explosives too. It would be wise to not forget that this world works by its own rules though. The monster blood is already volatile enough to work as fuel for the Kestrel. It can work for this purpose too. Then they need a wall in the northern. No, on all of the entrances to the valley. Just because the first invasion came from the north doesn't mean they all will. Hell. They might come from several directions at once next time. Given the size of the valley, they need to establish outposts, traps, and systems of communication and defense. They need a logistics network, supplies, retreat positions. The man draws his ideas into the sand, letting the water of the lake wash them away when he's finished. Caretaker can handle the logistics of how the people of the city are supposed to settle in here. He'll handle how they survive. Pilot dusts his hands and unloads the Kestrel's ammunition canisters, setting them to the side in the forest and carrying a smaller one back with him as he returns. With his new ability, like with his pistol, the plane reloads itself every night at midnight so he can harvest his two unspent ammunition canisters this way and store them for a rainy day. He's sure that he's going to need a lot of it in the very near future. He stashes them in the forest near the Kestrel. Normal quality. Ammunition canister 7.92 by 57, a steel, rectangular canister of ammunition that is loaded full of 1,000 
7.92 by 57 rounds. Weight, 13.84 kilograms. Value, you can never have too many bullets. Rising up the hill back toward the den, he stops, staring at the round, mouse gray mass that is sitting where he left the dryad a little while ago, out of which stick two antlers. Caretaker? he asks, raising an eyebrow. She screams in surprise, her legs and head immediately popping out of the large, now closed, jacket that she had fully bowled herself up inside of as she jumps to her feet, wobbling, unable to balance herself in her panic since her arms are still trapped inside, the dryad stumbles, almost falling toward the ledge of the hill over the lake where she was sitting. Pilot runs over and catches her before she tumbles down the edge. 8. Chapter 12, Fume. Pilot, dash, level, 31. Human, something steps slightly on the twigs behind him. Pilot, walking in the forest further away from the lake, turns his head to look behind himself at the stranger there, his pistol already pointed directly at them as he instinctively spins around. It's just a masked child, one of the people of the city, it's the same strange one from before who was standing next to his plane and staring at him back then after the invasion, he assumes so. At least the wooden mask is the same, being essentially nothing but small pieces of scrap nailed together into a faceplate with roughly broken in eye holes that they're wearing. Once again, it's just starting at him quietly. Pilot lowers his pistol, puts it back away, and looks around the evergreen forest, as birds of paradise sing above their heads. The goblins are dead, it should be fine for some unattended child to just wander around this hellscape at least until the next invasion begins to show its signs. He turns away, walking off to continue his survey, he needs to get a good look at the other entrances, the northern entrance to the valley is blocked off by a series of thick, strong, rocky walls and unscalable cliffs, it can be easily defended, a single wall across it, some barbed wire, a few land mines, and a non-stop barrage of artillery will be enough to deter any push there, if he had anything like that but he doesn't, the sound of light footsteps comes after him as he walks, thinking, the southern region next to the World Tree Valley is still in good shape, when he flew his plane there during its maiden flight, he saw that there were still significant villages and cities down to the south before the Ashlands started, from what he's seen, the east is like this as well, although it features a deep basin where the land slopes downward into itself, it is extremely rocky and rough terrain, to the west, there is just nothing, the world becomes flat and featureless, he flew for an hour toward the west, mapping the region, and there was just nothing at all, not a single tree, house, or anything, it was just a flat grassland forever and ever more, perhaps there is something in that direction eventually, but for now, it means that anyone who approaches from that angle will be coming over a long, featureless plane, that makes them easy to pick off with machine gun emplacements and sharpshooters if he had any, so attacks from the south will likely hit the other survivors first before they get to them, like the last invasion had done with the goblin city, this is good, maybe he can fight off any invasions with the kestrel before they even get close to the valley, if they begin from there, attacks from the north will come from the ruined city, if he had to guess, and they will have no choice but to attack his theoretical wall inside the valley, that makes it easy to set up a kill funnel, Attacks from the west have no choice but to come from the middle of nowhere, making them easy to spot but allowing them to disperse well, which will make it hard for him to strafe them with the kestrel however. Attacks from the east will require the enemy fighting uphill and crossing a rough landscape to get to them, that can be taken advantage of, there are some good terrain advantages here outside of the valley. The defense of the inner valley itself is another subject entirely. The terrain in here is extremely hilly and densely vegetated with many rivers and crossings. Now all he needs are some weapons. The city people have some crossbows. That's a good start, but they're limited in their rate of fire. He has an idea about that. He just needs to draw it down for someone who looks like a craftsman. As he walks, something catches his eye down to the side. A cluster of large, purple, and white mushrooms is growing out of the base of a tree, rare Agrestus snout, a rare, small mushroom that commonly grows in large clusters around the bases of trees that are rooted in particularly rocky soil. Agrestus snout acts as a self-destructive parasite, draining its already depleted host of as much water as it can until both die, 
the mushroom reaches its sporing phase unusually fast in order to continue propagating itself before its brief life comes to an end. It consists of an umbernate cap and a particularly thin, strongly woody, and stiff stem. The top of the cap is dotted with a constellation of white, bioluminescent points. Below the mushroom cap hang widely attached, adnate gills. Caution, highly poisonous. Do not consume. Weight, 0.1 kilograms. Value, 45 obols. Graham Pilot stares at the window for a time, thinking, as he gets another idea. His hand touches the salt crystal that he still has in his pocket. The pieces come together surprisingly well. He can hear the world tree rustling in the distance as the ideas move through his head. It's a good thing they have fire now in the valley, because he knows just what he needs to make with what he has. All he needs is some kind of vessel for it, jars, flasks, anything like that. Pilot turns his head, looking at the stranger, who is wearing a belt covered in glass bottles. His anxiety about their preparedness against the next invasion lessens significantly as he thinks about what is to come. Nature really is full of bounty. He rips one of the mushrooms out, taking it with him as he continues to survey the land, and then heads back to the world tree. Eventually, his tagalong wanders off and vanishes. Caretaker screams, swatting at his hands with a stick. The man dodges as she swings it again, thwacking his palms with it as he walks inside holding the poison mushroom. Pilot, no! yells caretaker, pointing at it, no! She shouts. Pilot grabs onto the stick as she tries to hit his hand again, yanking it a little too hard and causing the unprepared dryad to stumble forward toward him. Caretaker lets go, flailing her arms to maintain her balance as she falls over. He catches her with his free hand, the stick dropping to the ground. Caretaker looks up at him. Pilot poison. I know, I know, he replies, setting her back on her feet and taking note of the word. Caretaker points at the mushroom before grabbing her own throat and making a dramatic scene out of pretend choking. Exactly, says Pilot, tapping the side of his head. She frowns. He can only assume that she thinks he's going to use it for today's soup. But he's not. The mushroom is going to be what helps somewhat compensate for his critical lack of ammunition. There are three weapons projects he has running through his head now for the defense of the valley. The one involving the salt, the one involving the crossbows, and the one involving the mushroom. It's going to be a busy few days, and he still needs to find a lot of materials and tools. It's impossible to get anything like that here in the valley, but where he can find what he needs is in the ruins to the north. Pilot grabs his jacket, stuffing the mushroom in his pocket. He has a city to loot. The Kestrel lands outside of the destroyed city, the man climbing out and heading into the ruins climbing over the well-collapsed gatehouse, his pistol at his side, looking around at the swampy, brackish mess that is a mixture of collapsed trouble, sinking ground, and a few piles of smolder that somehow still keep on burning days later, Pilot walks into the mess and looks around himself, bones, picked clean, float in a swampy mixture of noxious water that he cautiously steps over, vapors and steam rise into the air from everywhere around him, the city reeks of death and poison. Something disturbs the silence, and its movements are quickly followed by the crack of gunfire. A goblin that had climbed out of a broken wall nearby clutches its chest as it falls down off of the ruins it was climbing on. It lands, splashing into the thick, coagulated water. The monster screams and flails, bubbling as it struggles to stay afloat, the dense, oily mixture almost swallowing its entire body as if it hadn't fallen into an ankle-high puddle but rather, an ocean. In his head, Pilot knows the street should be just below the water, but his eyes are telling him the goblin's entire body has been submerged as if the pooled liquid were much, much deeper than ought to be possible. It's as if the dark floodwaters, made up of the mass of the black thread that had connected the world to the sky during the invasion, had somehow burned the streets and soil away below and created deep pockets and ravines. The goblin struggles and flails, unable to swim, as some unseen force drags it under the impossibly deep sludge. If he didn't know better, Pilot would have sworn that something ripped black hooks into its eyes before it sank. It's best to avoid the water, then. Pilot sets to his task, finding what he was looking for in what was once likely some sort of alchemist's laboratory. It is later that day. Pilot has returned to the valley. In theory, he knows what he's doing here. Pilot stares at the heap of metal links, glassware, and tubing that is laid out before him on the shore of the beautiful lake. 
the world tree rustles in the distance. High quality alchemical equipment, a series of intricate glass tubes and piping that are able to be connected to one another via metal locking mechanisms. The rare crystal glass it is made of is able to withstand extreme temperatures, pressure, and chemical fluctuations, making it ideal for alchemical purposes such as potion brewing. Weight, 11.30 kg. Value, 900 obols. In practice, however, he has absolutely no idea what he's doing. He's a pilot and a former infantryman. RK Alchemical Laboratory setups are somewhat out of his league. It's not like he wants to run an experiment. He just wants to get something hot. It's not like caretaker owns any pots or pans, and her wooden bowls are hardly good enough for this kind of work. It needs to get very hot. The bushes rustle in the forest. Pilot turns, looking past the wing of the kestrel at the masked face that peeks out of the underbrush. It's that weird child again. The two of them stare at one another, as always. This time, however, as the stranger comes out slowly they look at the setup that he's brought back with him, then back to him, the two of them standing apart from one another and just quietly observing the other. Strange kid, but if he had to guess. Pilot reaches into his jacket, pulling out the salt crystal, and then nods to the equipment. Poison, he says, repeating the one new word he learned from caretaker today, perhaps imperfectly but good enough. Observing him for a moment longer, the silent child then simply goes to the glassware and begins assembling it. Clearly knowing what they're doing, the many layers of fabric on their body are covered in burns, soot, and grime hint to the fact that they have been working in the field of alchemy for a while. Pilot meanwhile, opens the Kestrel's internal compartment, revealing the engine that he intends to turn on to use as a heating element if this pans out. A few hundred degrees shouldn't be a problem for the plane. He'll need a more refined way to do this if this initial test works than using the Kestrel. He'll need to have some kind of industrial cooker developed for the amounts he intends to produce. He needs an entire war machine established here in the valley, really. But for now, this will do. Caretaker, dash, level, 11. Dryad Caretaker watches from a distance, her arms full with the basket she has, which is brimming with collected berries, herbs, and fruits. The dryad stares from the hill, somewhat taken aback, as Pilot seems to be getting along with a child from the city, of all things. She's not sure what they're doing, but it looks like he's helping it with its chores from this far away. She is not sure why she's so surprised by this at this point. Honestly, Pilot can be ruthless, but he's not a bad person. It's just the contrast of his cold image with what her eyes are telling her is going on, really. The dryad tilts her head, watching them work on some project together. Caretaker thinks it's rather cute. Actually, she supposes that as long as the man isn't getting into even more nonsense like he always seems to do, then everything is fine. Only the world tree knows what the foolish human was thinking about with that deadly mushroom this morning. She looks back over her shoulder one more time, watching as the two of them construct something together. It's actually really sweet to see him like that. She didn't know that he had such a tender side. Caretaker smiles, turning back to go home. Every time she underestimates Pilot, he comes right back somehow and surprises her. It's going to become a problem at this rate. Pilot, dash, level, 31. Human hours have passed. Night has nearly fallen. Pilot's cold face and the grooves of a wooden mask down next to him are illuminated by the Kestrel's auxiliary orange wing lighting, glowing like the shine of dying fire. The plane roars, its cylinders thrashing as the engine produces incredible amounts of heat as it burns through monster blood by the liter. The constructed alchemical glassware set is built atop its open engine compartment on a small platform made out of charred wood, the contents bubbling wildly as they boil. The contained chloride salts that he harvested liquefy, releasing an off-gas that rises into a separate glass container before sinking back down again into a third. The two silent figures stand watching as something hisses inside the alchemical glass where as pressure is released by a pressure valve, and the last glass bauble begins to fill with a strange, yellow fog, like smoke, like the vapors of war. Pilot nods, looking down at his helper, who silently stares back his way, having never said a single word this entire time. After the glassware was set up, he tried to shoo the civilian away before it got dangerous, paying them for their help with some of the fruit caretaker had given him. 
but the weird kid only ever walked back a few steps before walking right back over while he was working on everything himself. For whatever reason, they just seem intent on watching him do literally anything and everything. The two of them look back at the new creation, the status window appearing with the great world tree behind it, the giant sitting across the waters of the peaceful lake that will know the touch of war one day, if he has his way. Okay, so maybe there was one child involved war crime under his command, but it was under adult supervision and nobody actually got hurt. So it hardly counts, right? It's really more of a war misdemeanor than a war crime. When you think about it, yeah, it's fine. His eyes stare into the yellow gas. It's perfect. This is just what he needs to escalate this new war to a level those goddamned monsters will never see coming. They want to march to the world tree? Then he'll give them something to march right through. Chlorine gas. Chlorine gas is an off-yellow, diatomic gas that is a member of the halogen group of elements. It has a strong, pungent odor and is extremely toxic. It can be used in many industrial processes, including the production of solvents and pesticides and water purification as a weapon. It is incredibly dangerous, causing gruesome, lingering, and essentially guaranteed deaths to anything that becomes trapped in it. Danger, extremely toxic. Weight, value, 6. Chapter 13, Meat. Pilot, dash, level, 31. Human pilot looks at caretaker, who is standing there with crossed arms. Her eyes are closed, and her lips are tightly pursed. She seems to have understood his plan, which he has just presented, but is very unfond of it, as he can clearly see. However, he needs her to be on board with this. Without caretaker, it won't work, as he can't communicate what needs to be done to the people of the city. The project is too large to manage with this sort of communication barrier. The dryad opens her eyes again looking down at the map of the valley he's displaying on his system window and at the line he's drawn across the northern entrance to the valley. A wall, the northern valley entrance is a tight pass with steep, rocky cliff faces on either side of it. The only way in or out is through that narrow entryway, which makes it an ideal point of defense. A simple wall will already go a long way toward fortifying it, but walls require materials, wood, stone, and metal. All of this has to be sourced from somewhere. There is the possibility of looting the destroyed city, but it won't be easy to carry the raw materials needed all the way back, even with the Kestrel. Their best bet is to establish a resource harvesting operation here, within the valley itself. There is enough wood to create anything they need, let alone stone that can be quarried. If they go deep enough somehow, there is likely even metal somewhere. The summary of the matter is that he needs caretaker to approve the plan for the defense of the valley. In a manner of speaking, the property is hers. After all, she stands there, her lips so tightly pursed that her face looks like it doesn't have a mouth at all. Caretaker looks back at Pilot after a moment of thought and sighs. The dryad nods in affirmation. Then lifting a single finger, he recognizes the gesture as being one implying a condition. Soup, says Caretaker, her finger landing on his chest. As she looks him in the eyes, it seems that the cost of the defense of the world tree and the lives of everyone in the valley is his having to make dinner tonight. Fair enough. Pilot nods back. Storb, dash, level, 59. Dark Elf. She slept for days. She's done nothing but sleep. Sometimes, she'll get up and go to the river and drink her fill of its waters, or dive in to clean herself. And once she went into the forest to find some berries, of which there are here in immense measure, but other than that, she just slept. The dark elf sits there, watching the world go by, as she leans back against a tree. Is any of this even real? Vacantly, she stares past the moving people toward the world tree in the center of the valley. Hey, says Storb, turning her head and waving lightly at the first person who walks past. They look her way. Is this real? The man shrugs and keeps walking, the confused expression present on his face much the same as her own compared to what life has been like for so long. This new way of living just feels fake. Storb doesn't even know how long it has been anymore. Since this all began, it feels like it was years ago. And since then, she's done nothing but travel from place to place, always running, fighting, escaping, and surviving. She's killed more monsters and people than she can picture in her mind at once. Even now, after their arrival in the valley, as she's sitting here on this perfect grass, beneath the perfect sun, having slept, eaten, 
drank, and washed herself to a standard that is impossibly high for the age they now live in. She's still wearing her armor. Her shield is at her side, ready. She knows the invasion isn't going to happen for another few weeks. But, muttering comes from the side. Storb looks from her resting place, which she still isn't convinced isn't her grave that she is watching paradise from. As the people begin to look and talk amongst themselves, she rises to her feet. Is that him? Look. Whispers someone next to her as a crowd forms. People poking their heads out of carriages that act as homes, or from the crude shelters they've made of wood. The weather in the valley is so perfectly, comfortably temperately warm that most haven't bothered yet with shelter construction yet, as they are still in a sort of be ready to run survival mode. At night, it can get very cold near the lake, but the fires do enough to allow them to stay warm. They've all seen him before, sometimes from a distance now and then. The strange man who does not speak their language, people gathering water have seen him tending to the black dragon that sleeps by the waters. Others have seen him spending time with the sacred caretaker of the world tree. Nobody has ever approached him out of fear, however, people stop their work, looking his way as he arrives, along with the dryad. He looks nothing like any of the humans from the region here. His hair is different, his eyes are different, and his clothes are different. The way he holds himself is different. The rigidity and firmness of his posture as he moves reminds her more of a story of a royal guard than that of a soldier or guardsman. This is the man who killed the Goblin King, the man who tamed a black dragon, and the man who stopped an entire invasion entirely by himself. Nobody has ever done that. Every invasion that has been destroyed so far has been through sacrifices by the thousands. Countless lives dying to earn a few weeks of horrifyingly silent days for those who remain. No great champion of any legion has ever come close to doing so. How ridiculously strong is he then? For this to be possible, he has to be dash. Everyone all around the area is talking and whispering as the caretaker and him approach. He's like one of those old heroes, says somebody finishing Storb's thought from a second ago, so handsome, right? Talk of all manners begins to move around the crowd, pilot, dash, level, 31, human. Pilot stands there as caretaker speaks, looking around the area, his hand resting on his pistol's grip as he eyes the excited crowd, looking at caretaker's face as she talks, he can see that she's restraining herself about something as she lifts her voice over the murmuring crowd, but he can't identify what. They seem uneasy. People are dangerous, especially in this number and in this state. He's not sure what their mentality is like, but war has a way of making people act. Twitchy, his eyes scan the crowd, watching them carefully as they begin to gather in number more and more by the minute while caretaker talks, all of them gathering in the grove. Bees pollinate flowers as the sun shines vividly above their heads. The Azure River babbles behind them, singing a calm song. Birds fly and the trees rustle in the soft wind, the setting, like their faces watching him instead of caretaker, make him uneasy. Sure, these people are survivors and on their side, but who knows what could set any of them off. Civilians escaping a war zone can go rogue fast. He's heard of it happening. They're not interested in the mission or the cause. Sometimes they're not even interested in survival. Wild, nonsensical feelings can start to grow under the red blossoms of artillery fire. Asset protection was never a detail he was involved in, but as he stands here, within a crowd of several hundred people who are encircling them, he realizes that it might have to be. Caretaker is mission critical. She is just as important to protect as the world tree itself is. Even if there aren't any monsters here right now, it only takes one person with a broken mind to go after her with a sharp rock or an unsecured crossbow, and this'll all be over. If anyone blames her for anything, maybe because they weren't allowed to escape to here sooner, maybe because they connect her with their problems, maybe because she couldn't heal someone important to them, if they blame her for anything at all, it doesn't have to make sense, then there's going to be a problem. There needs to be a chain of command to keep the civilians under control, he can't do all of this alone, the valley is too big and there are just too many. Pilot looks around the crowd, seeing several people in what appear to be uniforms, soldiers and guardsmen, if he had to guess, he can use them, they're trained and ready to handle things like law enforcement, patrols, and, if it comes to it, martial punishments, but he'll need to find a way to recruit them into the service, the people look around themselves as caretaker finishes her speech, 
of which he didn't understand a word, only recognizing a few here and there, before looking back and talking amongst each other. A few men and women stepped forward from the crowd toward caretaker, pilot's hand gripping his holstered sidearm, but then they stop and lower their heads. Behind them, several more come out in turn, and then more. By the time everything is said and done, the majority of the crowd seems to have signed up for whatever caretaker has asked of them. Pilot, says caretaker, looking his way. She holds her palms together and then pulls them apart, making the shape of a box in the air. Map, he catches her meaning picking up something new, as he opens his system map, the leaders of survivors, however they have chosen these amongst themselves, if at all, listen intently while caretaker points out several areas on the display, given the many oohs and ahs and curious faces looking at the status window, pilot gets the feeling that this sort of map of the landscape is very unusual for them to see, and so, the wall begins its first stages of construction. As the surviving carpenters and masons begin to make plans, and the northern valley slowly receives its first line of defense, pilot eyes the forest, now there are only three entrances left, he has no idea where the invasion will come from, so they need to secure them all as fast as possible, starting with the west and the east after the north is ready, the south is a problem that can be delayed as there are still more cities down in that direction that will act as buffers, people keep mumbling all the while and for some reason, they keep looking at him instead of the map, his hand doesn't leave his sidearm for quite some time, pilot shows his plans to a man whom he has identified as a craftsman of some kind, given his tools and confidence as he was repairing a crossbow, he drew them on some of the soft bark that caretaker uses for bandages, using a crude ink made from ash and plant pigments, extracted from a concentration of the berries caretaker loves to eat and also throw at the back of his head, the bulky man with his hair tied back into a tail on the back of his head strokes his beard as he studies the plan, nodding slowly, crossbows were a revolutionary invention for their time, they changed the nature of warfare, advancing it one step closer to the incarnation of it that he himself knows and loves, military doctrines, defensive strategies, everything changed overnight as the weapon propagated, its powerful potential impact caused severe depredation of the concept of plate armor, which was given its death knell by the advent of gunpowder. Reaching up to 300 feet per second, a crossbow's fired bolt is deadly, and more so because that speed directly transfers into the power of the shot. Plus, while a man with a compound or a curve bow needs to be trained extensively to truly master his craft, the crossbow offers a much lower point of entry in terms of achieving acceptable accuracy. However, crossbows have many disadvantages over bows, such as a lower rate of fire and the fact that their weight can be significantly heavier compared to a simple bow. As for range, there are similarities, but generally the crossbow wins in this department against weaker bows but falls short when faced off against a true longbow in terms of distance. In terms of a civil defense weapon, it's excellent. Low training requirements, low proficiency requirements, cheap to produce, precise, deadly, if only the issue wasn't the slow rate of fire, but there is a balance that can be achieved here. The Chuko knew the repeating crossbow using a simple gravity-fed autoloader system and a repeating crank mechanism to fire. This weapon is a modified version of the crossbow from ancient history that sacrifices range and power for a massively increased rate of fire. For defenders on the wall and cliffs with a height advantage, it will be a very acceptable weapon to defend the valley with in combination with normal crossbowmen. Norman quality, schematic, Chuko knew. The depicted design of a repeating crossbow, the Chuko knew is a small, handheld, repeating crossbow capable of achieving a state of rapid fire, it sacrifices strength of impact, range, and accuracy for speed and a gravity-fed auto-loading magazine. Given its lack of penetrative power, its bolts are typically dipped in poison to enhance their killing potential. Weight, 0.14 kg. Value, after a moment. The smith nods, taking the plans and saying something to him. Caretaker steps in and handles the talking. Pilot looks around the valley. This thing is a start, but it's not enough firepower. However, he finds himself in a dilemma. He has real munitions. 2007. 92.57 mm rounds a day from the Kestrel. That's 40,000 rounds in 20 days. If he can get the craftsmen to produce some crude rifles, 
they could use those for the defense of the valley. He is certainly capable of drawing up a schematic for some primitive guns, but the machining and tooling, not to mention the steel that they'd need to make anything better than smooth bore rifles, just doesn't feel like it's in the time frame they have right now. Trying to rush them into production now with no tools anywhere, no real workshops, no mine, nothing, would be a waste of time and limited resources. Rifles are a long term project, maybe before the next next invasion. But who would he trust enough here to actually arm with a rifle at the end of the day? The soldiers? It's a risk. Until he has some sort of order established here, he doesn't need to give anyone a better weapon than what they have now already lest he lose control of the situation and they all go feral for some reason. They all seem to respect caretaker a great deal, but he can't rely on her social position here being enough to hold the civilian's behavior in check during a crisis, especially as the invasion looms nearer. Monarchs had been executed all the time, after all, out of the corner of his eye, he sees a group of uniformed soldiers watching them and talking amongst themselves. Besides, these people are already volatile and on edge as is. The repeating crossbow is something that they can wrap their heads around. He doesn't need them to get overly excited because someone broke their teeth with the kickback of a 7. 92.57 mm single shot rifle. The issue of trust aside, that's all before he gets into the issue of their limited manpower. May have begun working on the fortifications of the valley and on their own shelters but he still needs to organize miners, alchemists, fletchers, and everything else. Pilot stares out of the side of his head as a human woman with a wide-brimmed, pointed witch's hat strolls by toward what looks like a small collection of crude bedding around a fireplace. She bends over, drops her load of wood into it, and then holds her hands out in front of the fire. Valina, has used, minor blaze magic, what else can it do? It's a weapon he hasn't learned enough about yet. It's an entire combat doctrine that he has been neglecting, essentially, he needs to take a day and have the people here show them what they can really do with their abilities. Being able to project fire out into an enemy swarm is invaluable, but also dangerous, it brings him back to the rifle conundrum, how does magic stack up against good old brass? Maybe there's no point in worrying about arming these people if they're already stacked up and loaded to begin with. The dead wood bursts into flame and the woman sets to work on preparing something over it. Feeling herself being watched, she turns around to look back their way, but by then, Pilot has already started looking somewhere else as he studies the people here. His eyes scan the crowd, and while he's still a novelty, many people have returned to their days, but the thing is, the term people seems to vary wildly here. Caretaker is, of course, a bit of an odd one out because of her horns, however, there are what he can only describe as elves, orcs, fairies, and dwarves, to put it quite simply, there seems to be a significant biological variety among the species of people here, he's not sure how far and advanced the differentiation between them is, other than some obvious things such as proportions and shape. As lightly as he can, Pilot snaps his fingers at his side, next to his pocket, the sound is barely audible. But as he watches the people of the camps, he sees that several long ears twitch and several sharper faces turn his way, but nobody else does. Both varieties of elves seem to have a keen sense of hearing. The big ears are for more than show, that's confirmed, they'll make good lookouts and forward reckon. Idly, he looks back around, something hovering right in front of his face. As he turns his head back, a group of several fairies have approached him. They're small in size, the largest one is about the size of the span between his elbow and the tips of his fingers. Caretaker and the smith turn to look as the fairies hover in front of him, talking amongst themselves and giggling. A moment later, he finds several hands having grabbed his wrist as they try to pull him away toward the forest. Caretaker lets out a loud series of shouts, swatting at them and running over. The fairies scream and shoot off, flying into the forest and the trees staring down at them from above. Pilot takes note. Fairies are fast and seem to be somewhat chaotic and energetic in their personality traits. Plus, they can fly. The thought of potentially arming them with tiny rifles brings him great joy, but given their diminutive stature, they'll have to use a lower caliber of weapon. Still, it's worth thinking about. Hell, they could even just drop hand grenades from above. Flight is a powerful weapon. One of the most powerful. The orcs and dwarves are both unusually strong, 
many of them carrying entire logs or rocks of significant weight on their shoulders as they walk, creating resource piles for their shelters or the wall to come. Good men for logistics and field engineering, and the humans are humans, as he knows them from his own time, other than the fact that some of them seem to be affine with magic, using it from their day-to-day -day tasks. Off to the side, sitting in a large group, are the children amongst the survivors, who are keeping themselves busy with work of varying kinds or just sitting in the sun and playing. His strange acquaintance isn't among them, at least not in the obscuring outfit he knows them in. However, none of them stare his way in obsessive silence, so he can only assume that this particular child is out in the forest somewhere. Someone else approaches him now. Pilot looks at the human man, one of the soldiers from the nearby cluster, who is walking his way, directly. Something is off about the situation. His gait is too stiff. He's walking too straight. He's already making firm eye contact with him, not caretaker. The men in the distance, instead of talking amongst themselves, now stand there quietly, looking through sideways glances their way. He stops in front of them, caretaker and the smith, who can't seem to manage to discuss the work that needs to be done in peace. Look over again. Pilot's hand rests on his pistol. The soldier stretches out an arm holding out a hand to shake, and says something, a greeting, no, this approach is too off, it stinks, pilot holds out his right hand, grasping the man's sweaty palm that grips down incorrectly on him, the other man employing a hook grip around pilot's wrist instead of his hand, a second later, a loose, uncoordinated fist flies toward pilot's face as the man tries to sucker punch him, new ability, survival, close quarters combat, basic, passive, you have gained an innate level of control over the basics of close quarters combat against unarmed opponents, already on the move, pilot pulls to the left, the other man's fist flying over his shoulder, pilot's free hand presses itself down below the stranger's outstretched elbow and he presses upward together with the momentum of the aggressor's missed punch, causing the attacker to stumble and then ultimately fall face forward onto the ground over the black boot that drips him. The arm twists, and the man lies flat on the ground with pilot above him, holding out his extended arm by the wrist and elbow, leveraging his movements. Pilot! Yells caretaker in concern, running over to him a second time now. Cheering comes from the distance, and pilot looks up at the group of soldiers, who are howling as they watch. Then he looks down at the young man below him, who is wincing in pain. This wasn't an actual threat, it was just some dumb hazing by some bored infantryman. Pilot lets go of the soldier, slowly rising back up to his feet and looking around the area, looking at the many eyes staring his way in a variety of ways. He's never liked being around civilians, they and their odd ways give him the creeps. He feels like an animal at the zoo. Someone whistles from the side and a large, flat-brimmed witch hat is thrown his way from the nearby camp, landing at his feet. After that it was all finished, and after finally examining the northern valley and marking out the areas to be constructed, pilot and caretaker began heading back and away from the survivors many hours later. The night has fallen. But for some reason, as they started meandering back toward the world tree, the dryad grabbed hold of his right elbow with both of her hands holding on to it, and looking back behind them toward the settlement as they walk with an expression that is unusually distant and cold for her face. Caretaker glares into the northern forest that they leave behind instead of watching where they're going, as if challenging anything to come out after them. But nobody does. Pilot shrugs to himself as she clings to his arm. Something either grumbles or growls, and he's not sure if it came from her stomach or her throat. He just assumes that caretaker is pretty hungry after a long day of work and has low blood sugar, so she's having a hard time. He'll get started on making food as soon as they get back. A deal is a deal, after all. 8. Chapter 14, Feel. Caretaker, dash, level, 11. Dryad. She's a strange, weird thing, isn't she? Caretaker crawls through the forest on her hands and knees trying to find what she's looking for beneath the poorly moonlit sky, with only the weak light of the stars to help her search. She should have gone during the day, but Pilot was asleep when she left, so it felt like a good time. Now she's out here in the forest like a confused squirrel, crawling around and searching for a lost acorn. The dew-laden, wet grass tickles her knees and palms, 
soaking the edges of her robe. Caretaker looks around herself, sitting back upright on her knees for a moment, her shins and the top of her feet against the ground. Turning her head, Caretaker looks around the grove, wondering how much a person can really change in a time as short as this has been. How long has Pilot been here? A few weeks, maybe? It really must be the stress of this whole situation that is accelerating things. The dryad sighs, not sure if she really understands anything about life or living at all. Of course, she and her sisters hugged all the time. Every day, numerous times. It was just how it was, but she understands that this is a quirk of their own culture. Humans are much more distant from each other, only ever doing so now and then unless they share a familial bond or special moment. Pilot didn't get weird after she hugged him. In fact, if anything, the distant man has become nicer and even more helpful. How is he so good at cooking her recipe? She'll never understand it, but it looks like she didn't break anything. She grabbed his arm yesterday because she got jealous after listening to the survivors from the city talk about him, but she doesn't know why she did that. Caretaker, her hands grabbing her antlers, lets out a frustrated pseudo scream as she groans at the same time unable to formulate her vexations into any sound that is more coherent than that. Why does she keep doing weird, embarrassing things? She's sure if her sisters were here, they'd be teasing her non-stop about it, pursing her lips and howling unshly about everything that life is. Caretaker turns her head as something catches her eye, glinting in the vague starlight. There it is, her eyes go wide in surprise at her luck. The dryad crawls over toward the shiny, metal thing that she had cast away a second time, just before the goblin invasion, when she thought that pilot had abandoned her in the valley, which, despite being exactly what she had wanted to happen, still made her perplexingly sad. Caretaker smiles, looking down at the metal ring, and she understands her fortune in being given back after casting it away not only once but twice now. Normal quality brass bullet casing, 7.63 times 25 mm. The hollow casing of a spent 7.63 times 25 mm round. Weight, 0.09 kg. Value, the shiny, small, sleek metal thing reflects the night from above, a small, growing fern having held it up aloft and out of the grass. Thank you, says caretaker taking the ring from the fern that has lightly wrapped one of its growing extremities around it for taking care of this for me. She softly smiles, looking down at the thing that she lets rest in her cupped hands. She's such an idiot. She'll give this back to Pilot now, like she had planned to do from the start. She'll do it right now, first thing when she gets back. Even if she has to wake him up, it doesn't matter. She has to before she loses it a third time. It's only the right thing to do. Now that there are so many people here from the city, so many other humans, maybe Pilot can even find someone of his own species to choose and present this to. Caretaker closes her fingers around it, rising to her feet and staring at her closed hands as the wind moves the endless leaves of the forest around her. Yes, she's going to march straight back right now to the den and wake him up and give the ring back to him. It's the right thing to do. She owes him that much. Pilot, dash. Level, 31. Human, it's 0300 hours, 3 in the morning. Pilot inhales as he lowers himself from his pull-up, exhaling a second later as he lifts himself back up again. His injuries from the crash have healed considerably well. Caretaker's food, medicine, and magic really worked in ways that would boggle the minds of every military doctor he's ever met. Sweat runs down his body as he continues with his workout. He's been out of it for a few weeks now, but he needs to stay in shape. The enemy is training today, and so must he. He inhales, lowering himself back down from the branch for a few more reps. On his next one, as he lowers himself down again, Pilot finds himself looking at Caretaker, who has appeared from up the path to the World Tree Den. The man hangs there from the branch, looking at the dryad, who freezes on the spot as they make eye contact, her face turning pale with eyes as large as can be. Good morning, says Pilot, using the phrase that he's learned over these many weeks as he rises, doing another pull-up. Caretaker, wind grazes his body, and as he lowers himself down from that repetition again, she's gone. The beads in the doorway next to him rattle, someone having sprinted through them as fast as possible. He looks at them clacking and waving around as they come to a rest, wondering what's up with her. It must be too early in the morning for caretaker to want to talk. Fair enough. Some people are just like that. 
It's not like coffee exists here. Pilot returns to his morning routine. When the day begins, he has another new concept to develop. He'll need to meet some of the people from the city for that, though. Caretaker, dash, level, 11. Dryad. Caretaker muffles her mouth, screaming into the pine needle filled pillow that she presses against her face. What was that? Pressing her back against the wall, Caretaker slides down against it. Not sure what just happened out there. She froze. She went up the hill, marching full of grit and determination, her hand clenching the ring so tightly that it pressed a mark into her skin, and then, her eyes, paranoid, stare at the darkness as she slowly sniffs her pillow, looking at it as she pulls it back away from her face, she realizes that it isn't her pillow at all, it's pilot's jacket. Caretaker jumps up, screaming for real this time as she throws the jacket across the room in surprise, it strikes the wall landing on the bed that he now uses, it was once hers, but he's taken it over since his arrival, and she has been sleeping in her sister's old bed, caretaker holds her head, pulling on her antlers a little in stress, as she comes to a very sudden realization that dawned on her as she felt the terror in her core, looking into his eyes just now, this is bad, this is very bad, 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 Rabbits do not like hawks. Fish do not like bears. Deer do not like wolves. It is deeply unnatural, deeply wrong, and deeply wicked. Pilot is kind, and strong, and brave, and caretaker stops herself before she ambles on too far. But this is wrong. A dryad cannot like a human. They just can't. Sure, they can know each other and be friends, but that's as far as it goes. She may be naive about the world. Having never left the garden or talked to much anyone who wasn't one of her sisters before all of this started, but even she is aware of the many different feelings possessed by the animals of the world, of which she is one and the same. She has to do something about this. This has to stop. Caretaker sets the ring down on the table with a firm clack, staring at it as she stands there with her hands on her hips. She's just going to leave it here. Right here. She's going to leave it right here on the table so that when Pilot comes inside, he'll see it and take it back, and that will be that she won't have to face him and he can go try his nonsensical courtship ritual with more luck somewhere else, there's sure to be a nice human girl for him around somewhere among the people of the northern city, they had certainly expressed enough interest yesterday, caretaker nods firmly, this is exactly what she's going to do, she's made up her mind, she's going going to put an end to this before it becomes an issue, there is enough chaos in the world as is, the natural order does not need to be upset any further. The beads rattle as Pilot steps inside through the doorway. Caretaker immediately screams like a banshee, wildly diving over the table and knocking everything over. She rolls, flopping gracelessly over and onto the floor on the other side, her hands clutching something small and metal tightly against her stomach, hiding it, as she looks his way in fear. Looking deeply puzzled, Pilot quietly stands there in the doorway, staring at her as she lays there on the ground, awkwardly laughing as empty wooden bowls clatter around her. Caretaker gets up, secretly slipping the ring into her robe as she dusts herself off, rejecting his offer of help as he walks inside toward her. The man grabs his shirt, puts it on, and then looks back her way with a confused look one last time as he leaves. Caretaker waves, bye bye, she says, awkwardly waving to him. Bye repeats Pilot, as he goes for the day to do his work. She hears him muttering the word to himself a few times as he goes, memorizing it. The dryad stares, making sure that he's gone, before letting her hand rest on the ring in her pocket, which seems like it will simply stay in there for a little while longer, at least until she's had a chance to calm down and understand what's going on. There's no need to complicate the situation any more than it is already, right? Pilot has so much on his mind with the defense of the valley. Maybe it's for the best that she keeps this for now, so that he doesn't get distracted by such unimportant things. She should just keep this for now and give it back to him. When this has all settled down, it's better this way, not only for him, but for all of them. Yes, that's what she'll do. It just makes sense. Pilot, dash, level, 31. Human pilot heads toward the shore, opening one of the respawned munitions canisters for the kestrel that he has stored next to the plane. Inside is a purple mushroom and a mountain of rounds. Very useful in their own way, but he is an idea. Obviously, the defenders are limited in number and far outgunned by the enemy's numbers. 
but they have the defensive advantage here in the valley. That strength needs to be played to and fully abused, the chlorine gas will go a long way toward that, especially in the east, where it can roll downhill. The repeating crossbows will add to their defensive advantage nicely as well. But for the other flanks, he needs a little more security. Pilot picks up the round, pulling it free from the belt as he examines it and the mushroom. Traps are the decisive way to counter an enemy assault with minimal effort. And there is a simple tool that is stronger than any wall, barrier, or fortification. Landmines. Pilot throws everything back inside the box, slamming the metal lid of the canister back shut as he picks it up and heads toward the encampment of survivors at the northern end of the valley. He's going to find some kind of smith or metal worker and try to communicate what he needs from them somehow, maybe that man from yesterday, he seemed competent. Ideally, he would take caretaker and try to explain the concept to her as best he could with drawings and visuals, so that she could translate for him, but she seems a bit weird today. Maybe it's the salt he found? He should probably lighten up on it a bit when he cooks tonight, they do say that deer go wild for it but he's not really sure how well that translates to a creature like her, apparently, a little goes a very long way, though. As he walks in the early morning, far before sunrise, the man notices someone trailing him. Turning his head, he looks at a familiar Jess Tault, the obscured, mask-wearing child who is walking toward him from the side of the forest, it's his helper from the night they made chlorine gas. From what he saw yesterday, the other children don't seem to wear their alchemical safety outfits anymore, but this one here is apparently a bit odd, the kid is a shy creature, Pilot assumes. That's not too unusual, though, from his experience back in the old world, people who work in the labs are always a bit off, it takes a special kind of mind to do the work they do. Good morning, greets Pilot, not really sure what the child is doing this far from the settlement, out in the forest, before four in the morning. The small person stops a few steps next to him, staring quietly for a time as always, then, after a moment more of that, they fumble with the too large belt around their chest and pull out a holstered bottle, a corked, slightly cracked glass flask full of a bubbling, purple liquid, excellent quality dire poison, concocted from an intense extract of Agrestis snout mushrooms. This extremely potent poison will numb any extremities to the point of uselessness until the victim recovers, in stronger doses, irreparable damage will be caused to an organism's central nervous system. To apply, contact must be made with the bloodstream or mucous membranes of the target, raw consumption will have notably reduced efficacy, this poison is heat sensitive and will degrade rapidly in warmer temperatures. Excellent quality, plus 50% potency. Weight. 150 milliliters value 1375 obols pilot stares at the flask and then reaches out taking it after the stranger nods to him he looks at the poison and then down at his ammunition container in which he has stored an unprocessed mushroom of the same kind he had wanted to have exactly something like this poison right here made today to dip the repeating crossbow ammunition in but it looks like this kid was somehow a step ahead of him. Talk about taking the initiative, if the rest of the survivors have this kind of work ethic, they'll be set for the coming invasion. Pilot nods, looking back at them. I owe you one, he says, taking the vial and storing it in the ammunition container. Thanks. He's never had anyone make him poison before. This promises to be an excellent day. What's your name? Asks Pilot. No response. The stranger just stares at him through the slits of their wooden face shield, accepting it for being whatever it is. Pilot continues on toward the settlement in the north, the other follows him for a while, but then dips away into the forest again before they arrive. The guardsmen and soldiers are up and about and seem somewhat nervous for some reason, but they seem very welcoming of him and his arrival today, so it doesn't seem to be because of him. Any trouble that might have been perceived to be real yesterday seems to have been resolved by his proving himself to them through the act of physical dominance. From what he gathers, it seems that someone from the settlement was attacked by some kind of animal in the night. Days remaining until invasion. 18. 6. Chapter 15. Develop. Pilot. Dash. Level. 31. Human. After the goblin invasion, he had acquired a mass of abilities. One of these was a quaint little upgrade to the Kestrel's internals. New ability, survival, emergency provisions. Passive, the Kestrel has been outfitted with emergency rations, 24 hours. 
Flare Gun, Single. Survival Rifle, 7. 63.25 mm. Of course, a parachute isn't in the cards, but he doesn't intend to need one, but still, it's really about the principal. Pilot finishes plundering the Kestrel for the day, taking everything with him as he heads back. He's been storing the rations in a small heap, but he hasn't been interested enough to open them yet. Honestly, he's really starting to like the food here. There's something personal about it that he can't quite place, but it's just good. It's satisfying in a way that the processed industrial meals he's lived his life on never really met. In a way, he's starting to enjoy the act of eating rather than just the sensation of not being hungry. He's not sure he could inflict this stuff on caretaker either, honestly. Maybe there's some sugary drink powder or instant coffee or something that can be salvaged, but he can do without a mechanically separated protein block for now. He does make a note to see if there's any candy or something that he can repay the masked child with. As for the flare gun, it might be a wash, he's not sure, but the rifle is useful, it could be great to hunt small game with, however, that feels like it will be a whole thing. He's going to venture out on a limb and assume that if he comes back with a dead rabbit, caretaker will probably take deep offense to it. She seems to eat strictly vegetarian food, not even fish. Although the people of the settlement have begun hunting, he's seen them with boughs in the forest. Pilot hopes it doesn't cause any tensions. But for now, he has bigger problems to solve. Namely, the invasion that is going to be here in about two weeks' time. Pilot's plan finally worked, but it was a long few nights getting the details down and the items produced. Days until invasion, 15. In theory. It's very simple to make a pressure fuse fired bomb, something that ignites a reaction when it is compressed. Take three metal tubes, with each being slightly larger than the other so that they can slide over and into each other, one large, one medium, and one small. In the largest tube, place a spring into the top below what is known as the pressure cap. At the bottom of this spring is a metal disc with a needle head facing downward, the striker. When something steps onto this large tube, which is at the top when the whole object is buried, the weight of the enemy presses the spring down. This causes the striker to drop, making contact with a percussion cap, which is placed in a medium-sized metal tube of the construction. The percussion cap reacts exactly as would a round in a gun, being struck by the hammer of the firearm. The reaction of this component activates a detonator, which is placed in the smallest, lowest tube together with the remainder of the explosive payload. This setup isn't typically used outside, rather, this improvised booby trap device is commonly used in the defense of dense urban areas, as it is easily placed below floorboards and rubble. That is because the nature of the sliding three pipes system makes the device vulnerable to the elements. Burying it like a typical landmine would result in water, dirt, and all manner of debris either gumming up the spring or wetting the fuse or payload rendering the whole thing inert and worthless, unless he finds a way to coat them and prevent leakage. However, these crude devices are very simple to make, they are so simple, in fact, that he can use the metal workers of the survivors to help him create them. Some springs, like they would make for the axles of carriages, some small, very thin pipes, and the payload itself, which can be supplied via a mixture of gunpowder from his daily contingent of bullets. However, even with his bullets, that isn't enough to cover the area he wants to cover. Minefields can contain thousands of mines. That's where the purple mushrooms and chlorine gas come in. While some mines can simply explode, taking off the feet and legs of any assailants. Others can fire off a 7.92 by 57 round straight upward, and others still can be filled with a noxious payload, containing a spray of toxic, natural gases produced by the deadly sporing mushrooms he's harvested or with a vial of chlorine gas. This will help offset the resource burden. He might get 2,000 free 7.92 by 57 bullets a day, but that's not enough. It's just simply not enough. He needs more. One single round of the ammunition contains just below 3 grams of smokeless, explosive powder. For a significant impact to be achieved, it will take a significant number of harvested rounds just to make one single mine potent enough to be worth the effort, and that's not including the ammunition harvested for the other firing elements of the mines. On the plus side, the brass from the harvested bullets can be melted down and used for the other components. In essence, it's a trade. A mine can be made from the bullets alone, 
but only for a significant number of them per minute. Pilot stands there with his hands behind his back as he looks out over the lake. The obvious solution would be to teach the smiths to make primitive firearms, some type of weapon that can withstand firing the somewhat significantly sized 7.92 by 57 rounds. However, the problem arises that he just doesn't trust the people here. A sense of order and societal hierarchy of any kind are lacking. It goes back to his fear about one of them going rogue and trying to hurt caretaker. This threat will be severely escalated if they're armed with functional rifles rather than a few broken crossbows. Sure, they have magic, but he hasn't really vetted the combat efficiency of that just yet. Still another thing for the endless to-do list. When he's established a ladder of trust, he'll get them started on making rifles. The wall is being built in the north, he can see it coming into fruition from up here on the World Trees Hill. More chlorine gas needs to be produced. The mines need to be made weather resilient and able to be buried. Caretaker needs a protective detail for when he's up in the air and not near her. Then, defensive fortifications and outposts on the other entrances, as well as outposts and relay stations all across the valley. They need to establish a logistics network between all four entrances and roads, as well as backup fortifications in case the valley is breached. And all of this in 15 days, with limited resources, with untrustworthy and scared natives under his command, and in preparation for the hot arrival of a tango with unknown capabilities. The last wave was goblins. They were fairly human in their patterns and movements. But what if the next enemy isn't? What if it's something that burrows? What if they're monsters that fly? As Pilot stands there, racking his brain, he can't help but feel like he's been promoted to the rank of field general. If this is what their lives are like all the time, he's glad he never made it that far in the old world. All of this logistics and planning is a real headache. He just wants to point his guns in a general direction and then remove said direction with overwhelming firepower. What a mess. Laughter comes from the distance. Looking down, he stares at the forest's edge, where caretaker walks by with a basket full of herbs and plants, a group of children running after her like a swarm of bees chasing their queen. They're helping her collect materials for salves and ointments. The grim expressions and faces from only a few days ago are now gone as they laugh and play, chasing after the dryad who is trying to scold them into working diligently. It doesn't seem to work, amongst them. He doesn't see his friend and helper. Pilot looks down at the mine in his hand. That's it. He knows what to do. Storb, dash, level, 59. Dark Elf, what do you think it is? Asks a woman with a wide-brimmed hat as she stands on the other side of the lake. A dragon? No, it doesn't ever move by itself, replies the Dark Elf next to her. Storb, the Dark Elf, the two of them are out by the water, staring across the lake at the thing that flies. Of course, as curious as the people of the city are about the caretaker of the world tree and the mysterious knight named Pilot, they are just as curious about the black, rigid steed that sits across the waters of the lake. It's some kind of weapon, maybe? She guesses. Some enchanted thing. I don't know. The dried keeper of the world tree had explicitly forbidden anyone from going near it without permission under the punishment of banishment from the valley. An enchantment to make something fly? asks the human, you mean, like, witchcraft? She asks, lowering her voice. I don't think the dryad would consort with an actual witch. She shakes her head. Even in times like this? asks Storb. The human woman shrugs. I don't judge, but I just wouldn't expect it. She replies, shaking out a stained, ash-covered robe that she was washing in the water. Hey, do you think that the caretaker and him, you know? She asks her fingers starting to burn with fire as she begins to dry her clothes with magic. The dark elf, turns her head, looking at her. I really doubt it, she replies. The dark elf shakes her head, but I don't judge, she says, stealing the line. If not, I will, replies the sorceress, matter-of-factly. Hell, maybe even if, take a cold swim, home wrecker, replies Storb dryly, rising back up to her feet and turning her head causing the sorceress next to her to laugh, the fire in her hands growing a little brighter. Storb thinks she sees somebody familiar for a moment in the distance, an elf, the elf who she saved from the burning city in the north and brought here to be healed. That archer had been healed personally by the caretaker. However, as Storb's eyes come to a standstill, 
she finds that there is actually nothing there other than the trees in the moonlight, it must be the stress getting to her, pilot, dash, level, 31, human, it is much later, pilot sits at home, an unusually satisfied look on his swelling face as he sits at the table, the deadly explosive ordinance sitting in front of him in his red, dotted hands. It's mesmerizing, the colors, the shape, the sense of pride he is looking at the bomb that is ready to go off at the slightest touch against its spring is palpable. He's never felt anything like this before, but his mind tells him that this feeling in his chest, this must be what being a father feels like. A deep heat radiates through his body from top to bottom, he has created beauty. Small, pressure-fused explosive booby trap, a cylindrical trap device, made of a series of brass tubes and caps, that is activated when pressure is applied to the top plate, activating an explosive payload contained within. This device has a small explosive radius but will apply horrific wounds to whatever is unfortunate enough to set it off. In order to prevent leakage into the components during extensive periods of being buried in the soil, the exterior has been coated and sealed with a mixture of beeswax and a fire-hardened, ashy paste. Configurations, explosive, filled with gunpowder, this mine will explode on activation, creating a small radius of shrapnel around the victim, projectile, loaded to fire a single 7.92 by 57 round upward on activation. Toxic, filled with a glass vial of chlorine gas and gunpowder, this will blast upward on activation creating a toxic field best deployed in clusters to provide a large radius poison filled with mushroom spores from a deadly fungus this will fire up into the air releasing a cloud of poison spores in the immediate area weight 1.37 kilograms value it's perfect now he just needs a few thousand more or so god he's going to sleep like a king tonight he might even take the mind to bed with him the beads rattle as caretaker comes back inside the den, sighing after what must have been a long day, judging by the sound of it. Pilot turns his head, looking at her, and she stares, the two of them staying there quietly for a moment. Caretaker snaps in an instant, yelling something incomprehensible in a shocked tone, clutching her face and hair as she drops everything she has in a panic, running over to look at him, before scrambling through the den to find all manner of things. The thing is, he may look a bit rough right now, honestly, but that's because he found the solution to his problem of the mines not being waterproof, beeswax, and a lot of it. The world tree bees that he found the other day, however, were not so willing to let him just take it, but they lost the war, they fought a good fight, they were a respectable enemy. Pilot had figured he was being clever by using smoke to pacify them as he had learned in survival training but it would seem that the bees that live on the bark of the world tree are a bit tougher than most and don't let this bother them much, no matter. Caretaker drops a load of salves and tools onto the table as she quickly wrenches Pilot's face and arms to the side, pulling out one hooked barb after the other that is still stuck in him with careful extractions, the dryad fusses, mumbling all sorts of nonsense that he can't understand a lick of as she then grabs a hold of his head craning his neck to the side like a hungry vampire to get at the toxin injecting barbs there. Wait. Pilot eyes the small needles she's setting down on the slightly spinning table one after the other, feeling a little dizzy. Actually, the venom flooding his body begins to get to him. The colors of the room blur and move, melting together. He turns his head, looking back at caretaker and her eyes, which she has eight of now swaying in a circle like those of a dancing spider as she yanks something else out of his body, adding it to the heap. Maybe he can weaponize the bees? He's not sure if that's his rational thoughts talking or the significant amount of deeply potent poison that is now running through his veins. It seems like a good idea, though. New ability, aviation, payload drop active modifies the rear of the Kestrel's fuselage, allowing you to open a small ramp from which various payloads can be released, including but not limited to supplies, bombs, or mines. 8. Chapter 16. Quiver. Pilot, dash, level, 31. Human. Berry, says caretaker, holding out her palm toward him. She's sitting down on the sand of the lake's shoreline with crossed legs. Berry, replies pilot, looking over her way. Caretaker nods. He turns back to the kestrel, instinctively, he ducks. The berry hits the side of his plane, having flown over his head, 
It leaves a blue splat mark on the sun-warmed metal. Pilot shoots back around, looking at Caretaker, who is humming and looking around herself on the shoreline innocently. Ah! She leans over somewhat awkwardly, stretching without getting up to pick up something that is a little further away from her. Leaning back, the dryad points at the small, grey thing in her hand, looking back up at him. Stone, stone, replies Pilot, standing back up and wondering for a moment if she's going to throw it at him next, but she doesn't. Pilot wipes the kestrel off with a rag, looking back at her as he taps the airframe. Kestrel, R? asks the dryad, tilting her head and blinking in confusion. She lifts a hand, pointing at it. Plain? she asks. Pilot nods his head in affirmation. Plain? He confirms, but then he points at himself. Pilot. Then he points at her. Caretaker. Finally, he points back at the plane again. Kestrel. Artilda. She says in a tone of realization, hitting her fist into her open palm. Now that she has connected the plane with the concept of names. Kestrel, repeats Caretaker, smiling cheerfully as they play this little game of theirs. He's been picking up pieces of the language for weeks now, but sharing one or two tidbits of his own. The two of them have established a sort of chaotic form of communication that is made up of a variety of hand signals, drawings, gestures, and the occasional few words that he knows. But he's picked up a lot of her language now, but not nearly enough. Being able to communicate with the survivors is vital if he wants to coordinate a real defense of the valley. He needs to learn as much as he can as fast as he can. Out of the barrage of skills and perks he got during the end of the invasion, there was nothing like this available. It seems that his pilot class is fully and solely focused on pure combat efficiency, some mechanics, with a little bare-bones survival knowledge here and there. Caretaker rises up to her feet, dusting herself off and then walking next to him. She looks at the kestrel from up close. Pilot? She asks, pulling on his shirt with one hand and pointing up to the canopy with the other. He assumes she wants to see the inside. Pilot nods, throwing the rag onto the side of the wing before climbing up himself. Bending down he holds his hands out and hoists Caretaker up. She looks around the area from up top the wing as he lets go of her and opens the canopy. Ooh, says Caretaker, grabbing hold of the edge of the canopy and looking inside of the repaired, and very blood-free cockpit of the airplane. Pilot watches as she wraps her shoulders over it and tries to climb inside, her feet slipping on the smooth metal as she tries to clamber up. He grabs her legs, hoisting her further and caretaker lets out a surprised yelp, halfway crawling inside successfully and halfway flopping in like a fish falling onto the shoreline. She slides into the hard, bare-bones seat looking around herself in confusion at all the instruments and switches. Pilot watches her try to lean and settle back in, wiggling as one would do on a new chair. The discomfort on her face is clear and impossible to hide as her hands grip down below it, holding on as she adjusts herself to the hard, uncomfortable thing. Tell me about it, remarks Pilot dryly, watching her. She sits there, fumbling around, knocking on the interior and pulling on the throttle a few times. She looks back at him questioningly and then, after a minute more of touching everything, gets up again and looks around, trying to figure out how to climb out now that her curiosity has been satisfied. Pilot watches her, before then looking up toward the sky. He needs to fly around the area and scout the valley's exits one more time. Plus he wants to get a better overview of the cities to the south, to see how long he can count on them surviving an invasion if one comes from there. He assumes that as soon as any indications come that they'll collapse, more refugees will come from them to the valley. It's going to be an interesting situation. He'll need to have the ones from the north integrated by then. There's always so much to plan and keep in mind. It's not his area of expertise at all. He just wants to fly and shoot things. Picking up the rag, he tosses it to the side. Caretaker, says Pilot, grabbing the edge of the cockpit and jumping in pretty easily sliding down past her and into the seat as she's half climbed out, one leg already over the edge and ready to get back out of the plane somehow? Huh? she asks, looking as Pilot sits down on the seat. Wanna fly? he asks, realizing he was speaking in his own language. Bird, says the man in hers, pointing up to the sky. Huh? repeats Caretaker, blinking and staring at his finger that is pointing upward and then back at him. She points back at herself, unchly. He nods, she immediately waves him off very nervously, 
waving her hands in front of herself as she continues to climb out of the kestrel, but as he shrugs and begins to put on his helmet, reaching up to grab the canopy's grip a moment later, caretaker turns back and looks at him again, slowly pointing to herself again a second time. Pilot nods, staring at her through the visor. The Kestrel is a single-seater, ultralight fighter plane. It's extremely weight-conscious, and if any of those Black Lab engineers heard of him strapping in the weight of an extra body somewhere to it, they would chase after him with burning clipboards and sharpened pens. But this is just a reconnaissance flight, and, more importantly, this is his chance to test the viability of the Kestrel as a method of evacuation if the world tree falls and he needs to extract the primary asset, caretaker, that is, assuming she wants to go now. Slowly, caretaker climbs back in, pulling her leg back over the metal as she tightly stands in the small gap between him and the controls, looking around, still clearly very unsure as she finally nods back to him. Still, dash, level, 21, elf, 19. That's exactly the number of books that she managed to save from the city. It almost cost the elf librarian, still, her life to escape to a nearby carriage with all of these on her back while the goblins were breaking into the library from all sides during the invasion. 19. That may as well be the total number of books remaining in the whole entire world. Their treasures, the day goes on as the survivors of the city work toiling to create a small settlement of sorts as they finally begin to unload the burdens and cargo, perhaps believing that they may be able to stay here instead of running again and again. Most of them weren't from the city, but she was. She graduated from the Magic Academy with excellent grades and no friends and immediately began working in the library. That was when the invasions began. When it all started, the library was overrun. People were looking for books that offered any hint to the nature of the crisis, with scholars coming from across the nation to plunder every single library anywhere that could be found in search of answers as cities fell one after the other. Together, the invasions burned and drowned more than just the people there, but also the great reserves of knowledge that had been meant to be passed on to the future. Then, as it became clear to them that the answer to the crisis could not be found in a book, people stopped coming, and soon work dried up. She still went to the library every day, shuffling quietly through the hundreds of shelves with nobody else but the ghosts of lost doves and the archive mice to accompany her. She made meticulous plans, lists, and a detailed summary of how the library was to be unloaded and its wares transported and preserved in the event of a failed invasion of the city. A full stack of paper and instructions and all that meant nothing at all when the first goblin broke in through the window ripping at her hair and face before she somehow fought it off and ran, grabbing everything she could on the way as everything around her began to burn. Still feebly holds on to her staff, looking down at the nineteen books she has, secured in nothing more than some fabric shawls. They're just random books. There's some somewhat obscene fiction. A few random assorted tomes on fully obscure topics such as the behavior of spiders in relation to the cycle of the moon. A dungeon cookbook for new adventurers and that's about it. All of the great tomes of magic and knowledge, all of the stories of ancient heroes and champions, and all the magnificent history of the world are just gone. Her mutilated ears are hidden behind strands of messy, shoulder-length hair, and she wears a hood over her head despite the warmth of the day to hide them. She's alive now. These nineteen books are still here, and so the concept of such a thing as a book remains within the world. There's a possibility a chance, that they can maybe, possibly restore this industry to its full glory, they have to. Still pulls on her hood, looking around the survivors camp as people work and walk around beneath the green canopy, she needs the books to escape again, she hates it here, without the library and without her books, she has to live in this place. The elf turns her head, looking at a flock of singing birds nesting in the verdant trees. Clouds fill the lazy sky inside of which the sun shines brightly. Somewhere by the water, children are playing and splashing around while a few women sing together a song of the old times. Her eyes wander over the people, who she's been forced to commune with. This place is literally hell. No different than the now destroyed city. Everywhere that isn't inside of her own mind is somewhere she simply does not want to be. Caretaker. Dash. Level. 11. Dryad. She's actually going to die. This is it. This is the end. It's all over now. They have not left the ground, in fact, 
The plane has not even yet sprung to life. Caretaker finds herself sitting inside the kestrel. Her legs pull together so tightly that her knees ache, both of them hanging down in between pilot's legs. Her hands are bunched into two tight fists on top of her thighs, her fingers compressing so tightly that her nails leave marks on her palms. Staring at the dead metal in front of herself, not daring to make any sort of eye contact or movement out of pure awkward shame, caretaker sits there on pilot's lap like a child about to be told a story by an elder. Her head resting next to is at a bit of an angle so as to one, not obscure his vision, and two, not block the bubble above their heads from closing with her antlers. It's really limited her maneuverability. He pulls her back firmly against his chest with one hand pressed against her front as he pulls a large collection of black harnesses with the other, stretching them out to clasp them tightly down over her body. They hold her firmly against him and they hold him firmly against the seat. This is so embarrassing and strange. She wants to die. She's never going to live this down. What was she thinking? She should have known better. After everything she was just thinking about the other day and now she agrees to this of all things. She can just hear her sisters in her head, teasing her about it, lecturing her. Why would she want to fly? It's so deeply unnatural and wrong for a dryad to be anywhere near the air. She's supposed to be down in the forest, by the lake in the grasses and the meadows, the skies for the birds, and the butterflies. What's even worse is that pilot basically forced her to wear his jacket too. She's not really sure why. Cold sweat runs down her face. Pilot's hand lets go of caretaker as the straps are secured and he reaches past her, touching a few metal protrusions. She watches as he flicks several small metal twigs, each resounding with a heavy clicking sound, like that of a person striking two rocks together with their hands. She should get out. She should just get up and let this all be a weird mistake that was made. Caretaker thinks about it, her doubts getting to her quickly enough, as something starts to rumble around them. She can hear it, the plane. It starts to shake, to vibrate, to roar. The metal around them rattles, like a cage being shaken that she's trapped inside of. A smell permeates the little nest they're in, a smell of fire and smoke. Pilot, says caretaker, deciding that this was a very bad idea. She turns her head, looking at him, but he's wearing his helmet and can't really see her face which is right next to his. They lurch, the plane starting to move, sliding unnaturally across the ground. Caretaker turns her head, looking at the window as the kestrel angles itself somewhat more forward, with its nose down as it begins to gain speed, first at a walking pace, and then at that of a run as they move over the shore of the lake. The metal shakes. Everything rattles and jostles and bumps around as the world around her becomes a quicker and quicker blur. Pilot yells caretaker, grabbing hold of him in pure animal terror. Her sweaty fingers digging past her sides and into his legs as the plane quakes and vibrates. They're moving too fast. She can't tell what's going on. Her senses becoming overwhelmed by the flurry of colors all around them. Living things aren't supposed to move this fast. They go faster still as the plane starts to bounce a little, then leap, and then it begins to rise into the air, soaring over the treetops at the edge of the lake, and caretaker screams for her life, pressing herself back and clawing into him with her nails for dear life as they rise into the air. Pilot screams caretaker, entirely in vain as they begin to rise toward the sky. The kestrel is simply far too loud. He can't hear her over the sound of the plane's voice and the chorus of a million leaves rustling, which comes from all around them, together with her terrified screaming of his name one last time as they shoot upwards and toward the clouds and the endless blue above. 6. Chapter 17, Saw. Caretaker, Dash, Level, 11, Dryad. Caretaker's heart drops from her chest into her stomach as Pilot moves his arm the plane turning at an angle that makes her feel like she's about to fall straight out of it and toward the impossibly far ground below them. Only the tight straps around them hold her in place against him as they tilt at an absolutely nauseating angle. She's screamed herself out now, her terrified eyes staring down and to the left at the world that is below them, now visible through the window. It's all so small. The valley in which she spent her entire life looks like she could just pinch it together with a single finger from up here, the trees, the rocks, and even the great lake of many rivers all just look like little splotches, only the world tree remains as a monument of significance, 
and she finds her eyes drawn to it as she sees its verdant crown for the first time from an angle that isn't from below. It's so massive, so large and thick that it looks like a floating ocean of grass up high in the sky. Her breath finds itself stuck in her lungs as she presses her face against the window as close as she can staring at the tree. And then Pilot turns the plane, and flies the other way. The sound in here is so deafeningly loud that she can barely hear her own thoughts. The kestrel screams like the spirit of a raging banshee, never giving a single moment of quiet, and Pilot says just as little as they rise higher still. She understands why she was given the heavy jacket now. Caretaker assumed that up in the sky, it would simply have to be warmer. One is getting closer to the sun, after all, right? However, it seems to be the entirely opposite case. The higher they go, the colder it gets. The metal interior of the kestrel is confusingly burning hot in some places and frigidly icy in others, both within the reach of her touch. However, the cold seems to win out in the end, and as much as the thing screams, roars, and howls, it does so at the end of the day with the voice of a beast freezing in winter's depths. The world goes on forever and ever, as the plane evens back out, caretaker looks ahead of herself through the spinning blades at the nose of the thing to the rounding horizon that sits off as far in the distance as she can see, but no matter how much they chase after the slowly setting sun, it never seems to get any closer. Pulling against the straps, she looks into the reflective surface mounted on the sides of the bubble, seeing the world tree become smaller and smaller by the minute as they move. An impossibility for her mind. She takes a while to process what exactly is happening, until she finally realizes that it's because they're leaving the area. The world tree is becoming smaller because she's far away from it. For the first time in her life, She's left the valley. She's never even stepped foot out of the valley before. She's never seen anything except the world tree or its garden. Thoughts of her embarrassment at the situation are lost as her senses are simply overwhelmed by so many other developments and happenings. The two of them fly. She's not quite sure where to or why, but Pilot passes over many things that she eyes with great curiosity trying to figure out what they could be. She identifies what look like settlements, constructions, and cities, just like the one in the north, but in other places. There are people moving around and animals, all of them nothing more than pinprick dots until pilot flies lower, shooting close enough over a collection of trees and groves of a variety she's never seen before so that she feels like she could reach out and touch them. Flocks of birds rise up out of the forest disturbed by the noise and the speed, trying and failing to fly in their trail. But then it stops, they fly further and the colors of the world fade and become gray and desolate, dead. Pilot turns the plane as they fly along the edge of the dead lands below them, in which nothing stirs except ash and dust. These, too, stretch on forever. In fact, there seems to be more of this emptiness than the greenery and flourishing land they've passed. They fly for a long time. It feels like ours. Pilot seems to be mapping out the area, judging by his open map status window. Caretaker looks at it, leaning back against him, realizing that since she has his jacket on, his only source of warmth is the pressing of her back against his chest. Reaching up, she grabs the sides of his arms, letting her warm palms rest there for a time. This grayness that has consumed everything is the result of the great rot, the death coming for the world as a whole. It isn't just the killing of a species of humans and dryads. It's the full, total eradication of everything that lives. From the smallest blade of grass to the largest dragon. Even the monsters that destroyed those distant regions in their invasions seem to have died out as well, like a parasite that stole too much from its host. In a way, she still had a quiet hope inside of herself that many of her sisters who had left the garden would still be out of there somewhere. But the more caretaker looks at the absolute desolation, the more and more this wish suffocates in her chest as she realizes that she really is the last dryad. None of them are coming back. There is nowhere left to come back from. Between the firmament of heaven and the world itself, there is nothing left anywhere at all except for a single garden in which she lives as the last caretaker of the world tree. As far as the horizon stretches on and as far as her imagination allows her to view it, there is simply nothing at all except total, absolute desolation. No matter what, they can't let this happen to the valley or to the world tree, they have to protect it, everything that's left, from becoming what this place has become. Life is so precious and rare, 
It can't be allowed to become lost to the swallowing emptiness. Caretaker moves her hands over pilot's arms, which are holding onto the large rod that controls the plane. Her warm palms rest on his skin as she imbues some of the warmth that she has back into him. He, like the world that they fly over, is as quiet and as cold as the endless dead that fill it. Care Taylor closes her eyes, resting her head against him as she contemplates and then, lost in her thoughts and the cooling of her adrenaline, falls asleep. Pilot, Dash, Level, 31, Human. New Ability, Aviation, Auroral Radar, Toggle. By sending out repeating pulses of electrically charged ambient magic in all directions, the Kestrel is able to locate nearby magical disturbances that interrupt these frequencies. The disturbances are painted onto the radar. Pilot activates the radar he unlocked from the Goblin invasion, glancing down at the device that some unseen force had mounted into his plane while he wasn't around. On the lower right-hand side, at an angle from the dashboard, is a small glass screen encased in metal. Inside is a glowing display, like one of his status windows. It continually scans the area with a sharp, rotating line. Occasionally, a blip will appear and then vanish now and then in the area behind them, but nothing appears anywhere else. He shifts his head somewhat, looking out of the sides of his eyes at Caretaker, who is sitting there in his jacket. The Kestrel seems to be responding well to the additional weight. The handling isn't too unusual for what he would expect in this situation, but it's hardly a high-intensity flight at the moment. His co-pilot smells like flowers. It's hard not to notice. Given that her antlers are scratching against the side of his helmet, it's a strange contrast to the smell of burning and fire that usually fills the inside of the plane. She seems to have fallen asleep and has her arms crossed over the straps and the jacket closed beneath them. Pilot looks back ahead, adjusting the kestrel to fight against the winds that come from across the endless ashlands. With nothing left anywhere to stop or slow them, the global gales are extremely powerful and make flying fairly treacherous in many of these regions, and ash carries up high into the air, like sandstorms. New Ability, Aviation, Ambient Mega Mechanical Functionality Passive, the Kestrel has been upgraded with filters for all of its external intakes. Fine particulates such as ash, sand, or smoke will no longer risk an internal mechanical seizure. Additionally, the internal components are able to maintain functionality in high-pressure storm systems and chaotic high magic zones. Due to the improved ceiling, engine noise has been mildly reduced within the cockpit. A blip moves on the radar screen. Pilot looks down, holding onto the throttle with both hands and caretaker between them, as he eyes the point that is steadily moving their way. Then, after it, several more come. Tango Pilot gets ready to unlock the weapons systems, his hand already on the switch, but then he stops himself. No. There can't be enemy aircraft here. The old enemy isn't here, and the new enemy hasn't quite mastered the engineering wonder of flight just yet. It'll take a while until the goblins crack that code. Pilot ties the mirrors as he flies diverting course from his reconnaissance route, pulling up higher to a more favorable altitude, and pulling the air brakes to slow down and observe. The blips keep moving their way, and soon enough, he sees what it is in his mirror. Pilot looks out of the canopy at the unexpected sight. Pilot mumbles caretaker in her sleep, rolling her head and resting sideways against him. Next to the kestrel, rising up into the air, is some kind of creature, a monster. It has the shape of a bird that had begun becoming a human but hadn't quite finished the process after achieving about half of it. Harpy. A harpy. Harpies are an amalgamation of birds and humans. Known for their particular cleverness, these hunters of the sky fly and travel in flocks, using the global jet streams to move across the world from one roosting spot to the next. Harpies, being opportunistic predators, will often eat anything that they catch from rabbits to goblins. Harpies are incredibly intelligent, forming complex, primitive societies with assigned matriarchal leaders and hierarchies. Their nests are complicated constructs, often built in extremely perilous positions such as on the cliffs of mountains or on the sides of large towers. It seems that harpies are able to understand the common language, however, there has never been a documented case of them speaking it. Why this is so is unknown. Outside of dungeons, or in the defense of their nests. They are not aggressive toward humans and have sometimes engaged in trade in the distant cohabitation of regions. There is no overarching harpy culture, 
and each flock seems to have its own rules, including how they choose their leader, among other things. The leadership of a harpy flock is determined by any number of criteria, such as merit, strength, bloodline, or simply which of them is the largest. Entity, monster, rank, sea, element, wind, type, primitive, exp, 45. The yellow feathered harpy soars through the air, keeping up with the kestrel at an impressive speed. Even if he is breaking, pilot and the monster look at each other as they fly, and he gets ready to engage, his finger already resting on the trigger and his hand loosening from the air brake as seven other harpies of many colors rise up behind them. The yellow harpy soars forward, with her wings outstretched wide as she glides, looking his way, and then she confusingly wobbles from side to side, tilting her angle of flight back and forth. In the mirror, Pilot watches as the other harpies follow the same movement as they fly, rolling slightly from side to side in the air, and as they do so, many eyes turn his way from all around him. The eight harpies watch, but not all of them through the canopy. Others are just looking at the plane itself. Interesting. Nonverbal communication is a tool used often by pilots in the air, especially when a radio is damaged. However, sometimes these events happen with tango as well. Hand gestures from cockpits, subtle movements of the plane in mimicry. Such things can be used to communicate much like the language of one's own body. Pilot releases his finger from the trigger and rolls the plane slightly, tilting its wings downward and upward from left to right a few times at a slight angle. Caretaker's head rolls around on his chest as she mumbles. The yellow harpy nods to him and then diverges course, dropping and turning sharply to the west. All around him fall shadows from many colorful bodies. He watches as the flock of harpies pulls together like a squadron in a narrow head formation as they collect and then fly straight toward the world tree's tall boughs. He considers pursuing them for a moment, not quite sure just yet, but then he looks down at Caretaker, who is still asleep and mumbling, and lets the kestrel glide quietly onward along its route instead. They're not a priority right now, Caretaker, dash, level, 11, dryad. Hours later, they land. The kestrel rolling to a stop at the side of the lake. Caretaker sits there, awake again, her body struggling to adjust to the sudden lack of movement and pressure against it and to the immediate, sudden quietness of the world as the kestrel comes to rest. Her head chimes. The sound of a chirping bird trapped in her skull fills her senses. It's so silent all of a sudden as the plane becomes still and pilot reaches up, opening the bubble above their heads, not sure if she's feeling delirious or not. Caretaker sits there, looking around as Pilot undoes the straps around her and then pats her on the shoulder. Caretaker, she turns her head, looking at him as he takes off his strange helmet, sets it to the side, and looks her way. Why is he staring at her? Caretaker blinks and then sharply jumps up to her feet, realizing that she's supposed to get up now. Laughing awkwardly, she grabs the edge of the metal to her side, climbing over it to get back down onto the wing moving a little too quickly to escape the awkwardness that has blossomed to full breadth out of nothing in the span of a few seconds, caretaker catches her leg on the rim of the canopy, letting out a sharp yell as she falls down, landing in the sand of the shore below, caretaker, calls pilot from above, and a second later he's jumped down, landing next to her, helping her get up, and seeing if she's fine. She is, except for the fact that she simply does not know if she can avoid turning into pure sludge anymore because of the unfathomable embarrassment that is running through her now. Someone runs from the side of the forest, calling loudly and waving their arms. It's a guardsman from the settlement. He arrives, panting and sweating, telling an urgent story to caretaker, whose expression grows deeper and deeper in shock. They're dead, yells the man, gasping for air. They're all dead. You have to come. Hurry. The wall, he says, turning to run back toward the north. The dryad grabs Pilot's arm and yanks him after her as they run to the northern settlement, where something terrible seems to have happened. The kestrel's propeller slowly stops spinning as they leave. Somewhere, high up in the world tree, strange birds begin building an odd nest out of many beautiful things, entirely oblivious to what is going on below them. 5. Chapter 18 Rise. Pilot, dash, level. 31. Human. Night has fallen. A deep, rolling fog fills the valley. Caretaker and pilot hurry after the man, who leads them back to the settlement in the north. The moonlight falls between the fully laden branches of the endless forests of the world tree's garden, 
the giant's full boughs shaking and rustling in the night winds of the heavens above. However, the comforting sound that would bring peace of mind during the warm days now feels more distant and cold as the black sky hangs heavy over their heads. Within the canopy of the night hang ten thousand stars, shining down from above like the pinprick eyes of countless spiders, and behind them, deeper recessed into the endless blackness, sit ten thousand more in wait. The cold air of the lake bites, and the wind howls as they move, as some unnatural bleakness comes to take hold of the valley some force that feels entirely foreign to this good place. He doesn't know what's going on, but it looks like a serious matter. The three of them hurry, entering the buzzing settlement and then passing it to the construction site, where the northern wall is being erected between the cliffs of the valley entrance. Panting, caretaker and the man catch their breath as they arrive at the scene. Pilot steps past them, studying the area. It's a mess. Bodies lay strewn over stacks of logs or the heaps of stones used for the construction of the northern wall. The entrails of the gutted dead hang out of their eviscerated torsos. Several others are scattered over the ground, as if they had tried to run to or from whatever had happened here, neither effort having been successful. These corpses are also mangled, torn and ripped open wide. Pilot leans down, rolling a dead elf over onto his back. The dead man's upper torso turns over, responding to the roll. His legs remain facing downward to the left of him. A wet squelching comes as the meat separates and rips. His glassy, milky dead eyes stare wide open in horror toward the sky. Coagulating blood and viscera leak out of him. What the hell happened here? Pilot studies the corpse, looking it over. The elf looks like he got blown to hell by artillery. He's been absolutely ravaged. There are no stab wounds, no sharp cuts. No penetrations from any projectile, no burn marks, or any signs of blunt trauma, but what there are, and a lot of, are tears, bites, and rips. Unsure, Pilot looks around the area, his eyes landing on Caretaker, who is standing on the edge of the fog. These people weren't just murdered, they were eaten, but it doesn't look like it was done by something coordinated and hungry, like a predatory animal in search of food. Given the many wounds and the many victims, but all of the remaining bodies, it looks more like the result of a dog that got loose in a hen house. Whatever it was, it followed its instincts and killed everything that ran because its mind told it to do so, not because it was here to fulfill a desire for sustenance. That's his best guess, at least. But who really knows in this world? There's something else inside the valley here with them. Pilot rises back to his feet. He should have been more cautious in his planning. He was counting on there being peace until the next invasion. But why would there be? There were goblin scouts in the valley before the first invasion arrived, too. Just because an invasion isn't happening, doesn't mean there isn't danger present everywhere. This was his error. There is only about a week left until the invasion. The wall is unfinished. And they have a major setback now. This is a big problem. Someone screams from the side. Pilot snaps to the side, looking at caretaker who is yelling already getting ready to run her way to protect her from some unseen danger. But she's pointing at him and not to anywhere else in the dense fog. Pilot, yells the dryad, in a shrill, terrified voice. Something yanks on his boot. Pilot looks down at the dead, mangled elf, clutching onto his boot. The corpse's milky eyes slowly shift his way, beginning to glow with an unnatural yellow shine. The mouth opens as it groans, strands of coagulating spit and mucus connecting its jaws. Pilot stumbles back, the dead elf's upper half loosely schlocks free from his lower, with his spine sliding out and dangling behind him like a tail as he crawls after Pilot, still holding onto his boot with one hand and clawing into the dirt with the other as it tries to grab and bite him. Pilot instinctively stomps down, his heavy, black boot cracking the undead's head, and then he stomps a few more times breaking in its skull fully. All around the area, the corpses begin to move. The dead workers rise onto their feet, groaning and ambling as they begin to prey on the surprised living. Confused guardsmen and people scream, running off and around, trying to gather themselves. Mourning family members are pulled to the ground by the corpses they were hovering over seconds ago. Pilot pulls out his pistol, aiming it to the side. New ability. Munitions. Incendiary sidearm munitions. Toggle. Allows you to toggle your sidearm to fire incendiary rounds. You may continue to do so until toggled off at the cost of 01 soul point per shot in addition to the consumption of the full round casing. The pistol cracks out. 27. 
63.25 mm bullets flying through the midnight air, leaving behind a trail of fairy light as they strike into two desperately hungry bodies, one moving through a monster's spinal cord, sending it flopping to the ground, and the other hitting a dead orc who was trying to eat his wife in the back of the head. A glowing hole begins to smolder. Fire catches on the corpses, smoldering away at them. Caretaker yells Pilot, making his way to the dryad as the undead begin to move, targeting her specifically. This wasn't just a random monster attack, this was bait. It's an ambush. Undead, an undead. Undead are the violent, reanimated corpses of the deceased. They are mindless, viciously savage monsters that have no greater purpose in their base states than the consumption of the living, slain or otherwise. Depending on their level of decomposition and the power of the magical force that has revived them, undead can vary significantly in their speed, strength, and aggression. Undead are seldom found alone and will typically come in great numbers. Being bitten by the undead will inflict severe toxic effects. Entity, Monster, Rank, D, Element none type husk exp 13 pilot lifts his gun aiming at one of them bearing down her way firing and neutralizing the first one he aims to the side as another one comes from the forest lunging at her from the bushes the zombie is sent flying before he can shoot tumbling over as something charges straight at it from the escaping crowd a dark elf woman with a kite shield presses out of the row of guards grabbing caretaker's arm and pulling her away with her as pilot continues to fire into the undead, who keep on growing in number. More and more of them come out of the forest. The pistol clicks empty. Pilot unloads the magazine, sliding in the fresh one from his pockets. Given that he gets a free one every day and he has very little to shoot at the moment, he has quite a collection of them. But at 8 rounds per magazine, it's a tedious time with this many targets especially since they seem pretty stable on their feet. Severing the spine near the neck area or damaging the head seems to work fine, but anything else doesn't. He aims to the side, shooting into a group of undead coming out of the forest, but not doing nearly enough against their numbers. The incendiary munitions burn away at them, tagging the undead and making them easily visible in the night for the others, who don't share his keen night vision abilities. Where the hell are all of these coming from? Someone says something next to him. Pilot looks, recognizing the human woman with the wide-brimmed witch's hat from the other day, who was starting a campfire when he first came to meet everyone here. She lifts her hands, holding her palms out toward the undead swarm encroaching on them. Violina, used, mass incinerate. The midnight fog recoils, and the heavy, looming trees all around them, laden with dew throw back and hiss like recoiled vipers as the heat from the spells cooks the air all around them. A blast wave of heat shoots out in all directions as a dragon's breath of fire. A single, long, sustained stream of it like that from a flamethrower projects out of her hands and into the mass of walking dead creatures. Steam rises into the air as the moisture all around them evaporates from the incredible heat that Pilot has to judge. In the instant as being more than enough to get the job done. As he's shielded his face with his forearm, magic seems to have quite the kick. Pilot watches from behind his arm as the woman laughs an unnatural laugh that he's seen before, staring with wide eyes as the silhouettes within the fire keep approaching, keep walking, and keep ambling as their rotting flesh burns alive, feeling no pain as they continue to move through the blaze. But then, a few moments later, the intense heat burns through the sinews of their bodies, through the crystals and the fats and the marrows of their bones which boil inside of them until they crack and pop and the limbs explode from the inside out, while their skin blisters, peels, and turns to ash. A dozen dead things fall down into a heap of nothing, and she continues to blast her spell out into the world around them, doing nothing but laughing in excitement the entire time as she makes the night itself disappear into ash. The bushes next to their right rustle. More undead suddenly swarm out from the side right next to her. Reacting quickly with his free hand, Pilot grabs the witch with an arm lock around her stomach from behind, rotating her and yanking her away from clawing hands of the undead as she adjusts her aim without complaint. Her floppy hat pressing against his face as she simply diverts the endless stream of fire to the new swarm that had tried to ambush her. Her boots leave a trail in the mud as Pilot drags her back aiming and firing his pistol in a separate direction. He runs empty, letting the magazine drop into the mud as he hammers the pistol down against his pocket, forcing a fresh one in so that he can keep shooting. 
the undead next to the witch melt apart into sludge and dash within an arm's reach of her, as they fail to catch up to them, the dead burn, the forest burns, and the air burns, superheating and wavering like a mirage, the illusion of the sun rising all around them comes, as the night is repelled by the screaming of the inferno and the witch does nothing but laugh with eyes that never blink, he's seen this before, you don't get to choose shit in the military. The brass always decides what you do and who you are. There's next to nothing close to free will and desire in the war that never ends. Except for a few rare cases, one of these is in the ranks of the infantryman, in the position of being the man with the flamethrower. This is one of the very few, very rare volunteer positions in the ranks, and that's because you have to have more than a screw loose to take the job. That screw has to be full on missing and everything that's remained secured together with cheap tape, military issue socks, and caffeinated chewing gum. Flamethrower troops are, quite literally, insane, and if they're not, they become that way fast. While all members of the service either become numb through experience or shell shock eventually, the members of the flamethrower divisions become something entirely different, they become monsters. Killing a man with a knife is one thing. Killing a man with a gun is another. Poison gas, landmines, artillery, sure. All of these things happen. It's war. People die. But standing ten feet from a man and burning him alive? Walking alone into a bunker and turning a full squad of screaming men into flailing ghouls? Donning full hazard gear, strapping a tank of explosive fuel onto yourself, and holding an impossibly blistering the hot metal hose in your hands while you stroll through knee-high mud right into an enemy trench, spraying it down with fire like you were hosing down an old barn, lighting up the entire battlefield, and making yourself the most valuable and visible target in a full kilometer, killing the enemy by watching their blackened silhouettes dance left and right like fireflies behind the sunrise, as you march from foxhole to foxhole, turning your nozzle from side to side with complete, total, utter indifference. The only people who take this job are the ones who absolutely, devoutly dream at night of doing exactly that. The position is for those who do not only exist within the war that never ends, but for those who find that it is their passion, their love, the act of utter desecration and total erasure of the enemy through fire, not only as combatants, but as things that had existed, is a state of blissful ecstasy for them. Flames spray out all around them, bodies falling left and right as they can't sustain their undead state against the incredible heat. Pilot lets her go, shooting to the side as another few come out of the woods and emptying his next magazine. Caretaker is holding her hands out his way, preparing a spell. The dark elf with the shield is protecting the dryad, along with some other soldiers. Pilot turns, looking as another undead lurches out of a bush behind him. The roots of the bush shoot out of the wet soil wrapping themselves around the monster's ankles, breaking them, and causing it to stumble and fall over short of reaching him. He aims his pistol down, killing the restrained zombie, and all the while, as the night around him glows, the smell of burning corpses, clouds of ash, and the screams of the dying fill the air, it makes him nostalgic, and the woman next to him just laughs and laughs, clearly in her element, it isn't a laugh like she heard a good joke, it's a laugh of a person who is fully overstimulated, their organism responding with almost nonsensical behavior, choosing to laugh as it simply has no other mechanism to cope with what's happening. She's feeling something that her body simply doesn't know what to do with, she's snapped, and probably a long time ago. Fire has a way of doing that, it burns everything, from flesh to that which lies within. The forest all around them is flush with wildfire, the bubbling fat of what must be a hundred bodies or so crackling in the night like campfires full of wet wood as everything slowly becomes quiet again and the last scream fades away. The battle is over, pilot, has kill, undead, x35 plus 455 exp, plus tilde, level up, tilde plus, pilot, has leveled up to level, 32, new ability. Survival. Primary asset. Tracking. Passive. By synchronizing your system map with the ambient magics of the world tree, allows you to observe the exact, live positions of all designated assets within the garden. Pilot looks at the firecaster, who is panting heavily, holding her hands out in front of herself, her twitchy eyes scanning the area, just waiting for an excuse to do even more. Pilot lowers his open palm over the wrists slowly pushing her hands back down to disarm her before she fires the wrong way. Thank you, he says, 
using the words he learned from caretaker as she looks his way, her eyes lit up like the fires all around them. She doesn't reply, simply panting and staring his way excitedly as he walks off, looking at caretaker to see if she's alright. She is. Pilot thanks the dark elf with the shield too, nodding to her, all of them looking back at the construction site which is burning down low, all of the collective materials charring and burning. The dryad steps forward, lifting her hands into the air. Caretaker used, regional manipulation, fog density, the fog all around them at the edge of the forest changes, flowing slowly toward them as it comes to movement, from all around the area, more and more moist air comes in, the fog growing thicker and thicker until he can barely see any more, until the air is so wet with moisture that it's nearly impossible to breathe. Fires hiss all around them as they drown out water running down the trees and their bodies as their clothes soak up the extreme moisture, then, after a moment more, caretaker sends it all back away, leaving them there to survey the damage, there are many dead, the northern walls construction site has been significantly damaged, but it isn't unsolvable, the issue rises with the dead workers, who are perhaps the most valuable resource here, he and caretaker help with the wounded and the hurt as best as can be done before they head back to the den. Plus Tilda, level up. Tilda plus. Caretaker, has leveled up to level, 12. New ability, Mender. Mycelial skin. Active, the air all around the valley is full of spores from hundreds of thousands of mushrooms. This ability allows you to harness some of these, enhancing their growth on and within an open wound. The colorless mycelial network will dominate the region fending off foreign infectious agents and sealing the injury with a fungal body, preventing infection and enhancing the body's natural healing ability. At this point, the dryad seems to realize that she still has his jacket on, ever since the plane, but he waves her off, letting her keep it for now, as they step inside the beaded doorway that he looks at, the entrance to the den needs to be replaced. They need a full security door at least, ideally with armed guards and there are no escape routes down here, are there? It's a dead end, as Pilot sits there on his bed, staring across the room as he makes plans for a full, multi-level, concrete command bunker below the world tree, he tries not to make any noise as caretaker stands awkwardly between the table and her own bed, humming to herself, he turns his head, looking at caretaker who is staring down at an uncomfortable angle toward the doorway. He recognizes the song she's humming from his first night here. She's nervous about something. If the next invasion is going to feature undead, his chlorine gas, his poison arrows, and many of the landmine configurations won't work. But, on the plus side, he's gotten to observe some raw magic on the battlefield, and it has proved very potent. He's going to make full use of that. The battlefield always changes, the enemy always develops new weapons and tactics just the same as one's own side does. This back and forth is the nature of the beast. The enemy surprised him today, just like back then, when he encountered that experimental enemy plane during the Kestrel's maiden flight. So he's just going to have to surprise them next time. Caretaker, says Pilot, the dryad looking his way from where she stands, he scoots to the foot of his bed, patting the spot next to him, it's better if they trade beds and she takes this one from now on it's further away from the door, until he gets those beads replaced with an actual barrier, this is for the best, she looks at him, fumbling with the sleeves of the jacket, and then, with awkward, shuffling steps, sits down next to him, looking down at the floor with her hands clenched between her knees, she can go to sleep, he'll keep watch by the door for a while, pilot rises up to his feet but gets stopped by a hand that grabs his shirt, he looks down at caretaker, who doesn't say anything, but she lets go of him and scoots in against the wall, lying down and staring at it with her back to him, huddled up in the big jacket, Pilot sits back down again on the edge of the bed, looking away from her and staring at the door, his hand resting on his pistol as he observes the darkness outside, he supposes that he can keep watch from here too, 3, chapter 19, build, tilde, Pilot, level, 32, human, it is early in the morning. Rain pours from the grey sky, the roll of thunder carrying across the valley. Pilot stands there next to caretaker as she holds out her hands, water running down her hair and robes as she works with her magic, manipulating the roots of the forest the same way she had done to snare the zombie attacking him last night. Charred. Blacklog's roll, 
pushed along the ground by a rolling network of roots that rise up, pulling and pressing against them one after the other toward the rubble as they rebuild the northern wall. Workers from the survivors stack them up, planting them firmly into the soil and tightly compacting them with soil as they establish a barrier. Piloted the idea this morning after thinking about caretaker's magic. It took a little coaxing to try and convey the idea to her, let alone to bring her back to the scene of last night's attack, but she seems to understand the seriousness of their situation and is putting in a great deal of effort. He watches as she strains herself, focusing intently as the magic from her hands forces more and more raw material to move toward the fortification. At the same time, other spells of hers cause the deep roots of the garden to weave and pull themselves tightly around the establishing wall bracing it firm and covering it in layer after layer of toxic ivy and thorny brambles, this will help deter living attackers, at the same time, groups return from the northern city with carriages full of scrap metal and bricks, others dig in the mud outside of the wall, creating pits with a mixture of shovels and magic, the dirt collapsing in around their ankles as the soggy mush and rain flood the holes as they work, they're meant to serve as forward trenches and when abandoned, as pitfalls for the enemy tides. Several crews are working behind the wall, establishing raised firing positions on the cliffs, and hills inside the valley. Priests and priestesses cast magical barriers above the workers. Large, flat, prismatic sheets of what look like glass hover unnaturally in the air, acting as roofs to shield against the heavy rain. Pilot was expecting a state of severe demoralization after yesterday's slaughter, but it seems that he has misjudged the tenacity of these people here after all. It seems that last night's attack woke a lot of them up, snapping them out of their dreamlike daisies after the end of the first invasion. Now, all around the forest, a process of what he can only describe as militant industrialization has begun. Hammers ring out as metal workers craft to his specifications, making mines and crossbows. Wheels churn and creak as carts move back and forth from the city by the hour, carrying loads of plundered supplies to all four entrances of the valley, creating stockpiles to increase the pace of construction on the other four walls. Fletchers make arrows by the hundreds and carpenters are at work creating a large water wheel on the river here in the north to allow for the development of societal boons such as a mill or an auto hammer. The mixed bunches of soldiers and guardsmen of the city are running drills and training together so that they form a more cohesive, functional whole. Most interesting for him is the use of magic on full display today. Pilot stands there, watching it all unfold. Caretaker, the priests, the craftsmen who seem able in some cases to almost instantly produce specific items, with a little magic and the right materials, and the soldiers. The man turns his head, looking at the two people who he's selected to tail caretaker, the dark elf with the shield who saved the dryad last night, and the pyromaniac which, they seem like a good balance to each other, offering a good mixture of offense and defense, and, most importantly, they've proven themselves to be able to come through in a crisis situation. They still seem a little confused about it, though, but that'll sort itself out with time. Pilot pats caretaker on the shoulder, nodding his head to gesture that he's leaving, I'm going. She nods back to him, returning to her work as the northern wall explodes in progress by the hour. Good luck today, pilot, the undead are a problem, his weapons development program has been heading in an entirely useless. In essence, both the chlorine gas and the poison chew gonas on which he spent days of his time are entirely worthless for this particular invasion. Zombies don't care about poison or toxic gas, they need to be burned with overwhelming heat, have their spines or brains damaged, or simply be destroyed fully. On the plus side, they seem like a predictable tango force, they're not intelligent and seem to go directly from A to Z in direct, straight lines. They don't field ranged weapons or magic. From what he's seen, a force of nothing but close combatants can be kept at range and picked off, however, the fact that they don't feel pain or fear is a large detriment to classic warfare tactics. Even the goblins scrambled when they saw the kestrel swooping over their heads, but the undead won't do that, he's fairly sure. Pilot holds his hands out, demonstrating the functionality of a mine with one that contains no payload inside of it, as the soldiers watch. They're on the eastern edge of the valley. The terrain here slopes sharply downhill, meaning any enemy forces will need to fight uphill to reach them over extremely rocky terrain coming up from a deep basin. It's a killing pit, essentially. Mines in a place like this, 
which has few passages and a lot of potential for rock falls, would be a nightmare for a conventional force. One must be careful with these mines, as they don't have much of pressure safety. Anything that is heavy enough to set off the spring can cause it to explode. A good rock that falls the right way is enough to do this. The soldiers seem to understand the idea of the weapon, helping him bury them. The cart behind him is full, with several hundred pieces that the craftsmen of the city made overnight. It's not nearly enough, but it's a great start. The eastern wall begins loose construction, with only a few workers beginning here, while the majority remain in the north, finishing that barrier first. The wall here offers a significant height advantage, while the one in the north looks out over relatively flat terrain. The one in the east looks down into the cauldron below it. For the design, Pilot draws up a unique concept, one with a wax-sealed metal floodgate and a metal basin behind it inside the wall that he intends to fill with either dense chlorine gas or highly flammable monster blood that can be released, depending on the need. Looking downhill, he watches as carriages roll in one after the other. The people unloading hundreds of rotting goblin corpses and throwing them down into the cauldron, letting them roll down the hill. Others are down below in the basin, their faces covered with scarves as they spread the dead bodies wide around the pit. Thick, old blood leaks out and permeates the soil there, turning it mushy and soft. The cauldron acts not only as a great place to extract fuel from the dead monsters, but it will also make an excellent trap itself. Thunder cracks roaring across the sky. Pilot stands on the western edge of the valley, looking out over the terrain. Outside of the valley, there is simply nothing but flat lands to the west in all directions. There are no features, no trees, and no flowers. There's only rolling grass and perfect, even land for as far as his eyes can see. The valley itself here is surrounded by steep rock faces, and the only entrance through here is a single, canyon-like passageway that runs in a sharp zigzag pattern for three bends. It's an excellent kill funnel, in contrast to the open mesa out there on its outer edge. Even better, it's literally the ideal place for a textbook ambush from the defenders. Not that the undead would be phased much by that, but he does happen to have something that will phase them very, very much. Pilot looks down at the sealed satchel he has in his hands, covered in wax paper, as rain runs down his body. It is the self-destructive charge from the Kestrel, one of them at least. There are several more on the plane. If he can wire this to explode at the right time, the whole western valley will collapse in on itself, not only sealing the entrance but ideally burying thousands of Tango's forces and forcing the rest to divert over a longer route to the other entrances. Normal quality hexogen bomb, a plastic explosive hexogen bomb, stored within a sealed protective barrier. This explosive is highly stable and will not detonate unless triggered by a shockwave, such as from the result of a strike detonator or another explosion. The explosive material rapidly releases a series of oxide and compressed gases, resulting in a catastrophic eruption in the immediate area. Weight, 8.00 kilograms. Value, this might be the easiest flank to defend. He'll just get rid of the whole flank to begin with. Pepper in a few machine gun nests and a few mortars, and he'll be golden. Pilot sighs, dreaming longingly of such a day to come as the thunder roars above his head, making him nostalgic for the sounds of war. The valley has been far too quiet lately, barring last night's incident. The southern entrance, it's the most problematic of them all. Not only is the opening significantly wider than any of the other ways into the valley, but there is no strong foliage, and the terrain is unfavorable for the defenders. Any primitive walls they build here would only be able to stand firmly in a few positions, leaving gaps open everywhere because of the messy, uneven terrain. Plus, like the north, the south features a river. However, it is significantly wider here, if they come across a tango that can swim or, God help him, use boats, this will be a problem. They'll move straight to the lake, bypassing all of their defenses. The only advantage the south currently fields is the fact that there are still cities remaining down below the valley in this direction, which will likely act as buffers for any invasions. If he can manage to keep these buffer zones alive, helping the cities there survive with the Kestrel. It will be for the benefit of them all. Plus they might be useful for trade. It would be best if they survived outside of the valley. The valley doesn't need more survivors until the first band has stabilized. Otherwise, Anarchy might take over this place soon enough. Pilot turns his head, watching as a team of fairies fly around, 
marking the construction zones for a series of towers instead of walls, from which fire can be fired down from. Given the limited space, it makes the most sense to funnel the enemy here from tower to tower rather than trying to keep them out entirely. Plus, in an ideal world, it would allow a route of trade with the south, but he's not sure how viable that is just yet. The rain never stops. Caretaker, dash, level, 12, dryad. She worked so hard all day. She's never worked this hard before ever. Plus, it was weird for her with the people around her all day. She's not used to this level of social stimulation anymore. It's nice to talk to people again, but the people of the city talk about all manner of things that she just doesn't understand, and it's difficult sometimes to connect in any meaningful way past pleasantries. At least with Pilot, she doesn't have that because they can't really talk at all at length. Night has fallen. Pilot, says caretaker, it's done. Pilot looks, staring as people gather around, staring at the northern wall that has, after weeks of work, finally been completed. Fortified logs span the edge of the valley between the cliff faces from one side to the other. The barrier is held together with stonework, bricks, and compacted dirt, along with thousands and thousands of roots from the dense forest's vegetation, which climb up along the wood, pressing firmly into and against it. There are platforms to stand on behind the wall, and poison ivy and thorny brambles grow on the other side, which is pockmarked with holes and pits. Pilot always works so hard and diligently to help her and everyone else. She wanted to do the same because it's her duty to foster life as a caretaker, and she just honestly feels like the man has been doing a better job of it so far than she has. The defenses will all fully stand before the invasion comes. The trenches will be dug, mines will be planted, ammunition canisters will be filled and their weapons loaded. The enemy has some tricks up their sleeves but they've underestimated the efficiency of one of the most powerful weapons on the battlefield. Morale, good work today, caretaker, replies Pilot, staring at the wall and then down at her, his hands in his pockets, it's perfect. Caretaker looks up at him, and smiles a tired smile, blinking as he looks at her expression. Pilot holds out his elbow and looks back toward the wall. Caretaker grabs his arm with both of her hands, leaning her head against him, and closing her eyes in exhaustion. It's been a long day, but today, the valley and she herself feel a lot safer than they did just yesterday. Days until invasion. 06, 4, Chapter 20, Finish. Caretaker, Dash, Level, 12, Dryad. Caretaker sits by the lake, staring out over the water. Frogs sing their night songs, sharing the moonlit darkness together with the shrilling crickets that fill the forest. The surface of the lake is aglow as fireflies dance across the reflective blue waters in clusters. The sound of metal moving against metal joins the night, and caretaker turns her head, looking at the source. Pilot is up on the kestrel, working on the plane. He's been working like a frenzied squirrel before the break of winter. Metaphorically packing away nuts day and night without rest. Something croaks. Caretaker turns her head, looking at a frog that sits on a rock by the lake. Pilot calls the dryad, getting his attention. He looks over, watching her as she points at the small, chubby animals. This is a frog. It's a frog, repeats Pilot, getting back to work, muttering the word to himself to memorize it in her language. He's been picking up things pretty quickly lately, which, in a strange way, makes her nervous. So far, she's been kept safe from the situation by the sheer merit of them not really being able to talk about anything with such a deeper context. But what happens when he can speak and communicate clearly? Will they need to talk about anything personal? A terrifying thought. Caretaker sits by the lake, waiting for him to finish his work, before the two of them head back. Days until invasion. Oh five. It is the next morning. She's not sure if Pilot has slept yet. He came back with her to the den last night, but he seemed to be up at the table until sunrise, drawing plans, sketches, and maps. Caretaker watches as he waves around a group of soldiers from the city, who seem to have garnered a lot of respect for him ever since the night with the undead. The dryad sighs, thinking about yet another time she had to be saved by pilot. She realizes that she's sort of made it his job to do so herself, but, still. The northern wall is complete. Today the eastern wall is being made, the fortifications allowing a view down into the basin below the valley in that direction. She's going to have to work hard today if they want to finish it. People of the city run around, 
harvesting the forest for materials and plundering its bounty. In a way, it still makes her sick to her stomach to watch it happen, but she knows that it's necessary. People run around, creating stockpiles of weapons and loading them up with ammunition, explosive potions, and all manner of provisions based on pilots' specifications. The whole group of survivors seems to have fallen in line, doing whatever he suggests with his crude phrasing and cryptic translations for her to pass on. He's really proved himself to them now, in a more personal way than just his initial victory over the first invasion. Your Grace, says a voice from the side. Caretaker looks at the dark elf, Storb, who has been assigned to follow her pretty much all day as one of two guards. It's a little exhausting not being able to escape from other people within her own valley anymore. But she knows it's for the best. We should get started. Sorry, replies Caretaker, shaking her head. I got distracted says the dryad. Another voice comes from next to her. An elbow nudges her from the side. Were you thinking about pilot too? Asks the firecaster with the wide witch's hat. Violina, turning her head to watch as the soldiers salute pilot and then set to work, foisting large stones that have been plundered from the ruined city into place. Caretaker purses her lips, looking at the human woman speaking to her. He seems like a man who appreciates fire, she says, sighing. Caretaker holds down the urge to get into an argument, almost feeling like she's talking to one of her nonsensical sisters for a moment. He is, she remarks, ignoring the first question. Come on, we have a wall to build. It is later that same day, the sun has set. The eastern wall and all the preparations for its mechanisms have been created. It's done. Fully exhausted, Caretaker lays on her back on the sands of the lake listening to the sounds of the night around her. Night birds sing their melodies, fish splash in the lake, chasing after rays of moonlight, metal ratchets into metal as Pilot twists against something on the kestrel. Pilot, says caretaker, closing her eyes and pointing upwards. Sky, the sky, repeats Pilot after her, continuing his work. It's dark. She's so tired. Caretaker's arm flops down next to her in the sand, but she has to do her best. The people of the city, Pilot, and the world as a whole need her to do her best. Almost falling asleep then and there on the lake shore, she finds herself woken up after Pilot finishes his work, before the two of them walk back home with her dragging herself along, hanging on to his arm. Days until invasion, 04. It is the next day. Caretaker asks the world tree for help. She's so tired. Even if she slept last night, she's never used so much magic before and so often and fully as in these last few days. Pilot was up all night again drawing plans and sketches for this place. The western entrance to the valley needs to be prepared, but she doesn't quite understand the nature of the task. Pilot wants a few crude barriers here, but the further fortifications for the entrance to the valley are to be inside the World Tree Valley itself rather than in the Western Canyon Passage way. She feels like that would be easier to defend that narrow space, but she's just going to trust in Pilot's plan. He seems to have some idea about it already. Your Grace, where's he from? asks Storb, the dark elf, standing next to her as they watch Pilot work. Weird features, right? Caretaker looks at her before looking back at Pilot. The sky, replies the dryad. Huh? asks Storb. Caretaker shrugs. The sky, repeats the dryad, knowing of no better way to describe it. In truth, she has no idea where Pilot could be from. Meteors come from the sky, says the witchy woman, Violina sitting on a rock and eating some fruit. Caretaker isn't really sure what exactly to say to that. The human woman seems a bit odd in the head. People are here with shovels, nearly a hundred of them, as they begin digging mounds of dirt, creating two small hills on the inside of the valley, near the entrance of the valley. Pilot has her solidify these with root work. The children of the city have learned well from her, running in and out with baskets full of berries, fruits, and water for the workers. Pilot. Meanwhile, goes into the valley's canyon with a team of several scouts, carrying several sizable rectangles with him as he goes, wrapped in beeswax-lined fabric. When they come back, covered in dirt and the marks of digging, the rectangles are gone. The work finishes. The western valley is loosely barricaded. Two new hills stand erected at the edge of the inner entrance, atop of which two fortified houses have been built, for lack of a better term. She's not really sure what they are. But Pilot seems pleased with their construction. The people call them fallback firing positions. She's so tired, 
It is night once again. Caretaker crawls together into a ball, lying on the shore of the lake, sighing to herself as she rests. Her body is exhausted, and her mind is drained. Every piece of her feels like the empty, dry insides of a tree that died last season but was somehow still standing tall and proud. An owl hoots in the forest nearby, with many mice scampering as it calls out. Somewhere, a rabbit thumps angrily with its foot. Pilot, groans caretaker. Tired, she says, thinking of her new word for the day. Go to bed, caretaker, replies the man. Caretaker's eyes shoot back wide open. Eh? She says, sitting upright and looking his way as he continues his work. He just said the first real statement to her directly ever, didn't he? Pilot finishes his work and, very slowly, escorts her back home. However, she stumbles from her overexertion on the way, landing in the sand of the lake. Caretaker lies there on the shore, playfully pretending to be dead because of her sheer exhaustion. Rather than saying anything or helping her to her feet, Pilot's hands simply find her body. And the next thing caretaker knows, she has been picked up and hoisted into the air. Pilot carries her back home, and she, rather than assuring him that she's fine to walk, follows her panicking, nonsensical, on the spot instincts and simply continues to pretend to be dead, hanging there limply exactly as her mind tells her to do, until the man drops her down into her bed and then walks off to make more plans instead of sleeping. Caretaker lays there and stares blankly at the wall for most of the night, mortified, not because she fell down or because Pilot had carried her, but because she is not able to explain why she just did that awkward pretending to be dead thing just now. She was hanging in his arms like a soggy leaf the whole way back, it's so embarrassing. She wants to die. Why is she so weird? Her wide eyes bore into the world tree's roots. Days until invasion. Oh three, it is the next day. The forest is as full of weapons as it is of acorns and seeds. The entire valley is nearly secure. Only the south remains, which is today's task. She isn't sure if she'll survive another day of this, honestly. But what choice is there? The north has been secured with the wall, pitfalls, and many fortifications from the city. In the east, a wall has been built over the cauldron with some sort of metal mechanism to release the contents inside of it. Hundreds of pilots' minds lay strewn around the rock climb up to the fortification. The children have been harshly warned about going anywhere near any of the valley's exits. The cauldron itself is full of what must be a thousand rotting goblin carcasses at least. The west has been trapped with some sort of powerful weapon. As far as she can understand it, with a duo of fortified, uphill positions in case anything gets through the tight canyon and into the valley. And today, the south will have its turn. Caretaker looks at pilot's sketches, together with the soldiers. It looks like a series of archers' towers connected with suspended bridges, with several weaving walls below on the ground that act as a pathway rather than a total blockage of anyone trying to get in. The river is to be closed up with a grate made out of scrap metal from the ruined city. Her task is going to be to keep the water of the river steady as they work there in the water, as well as fortify their constructions with her magic. Do you think he likes explosives? Asks Violina, the fire sorceress. Caretaker looks at her as the human woman plays with an alchemical bottle with one hand, her other hand holding her cheek. I want to give this to him. Get a grip says Storb, watching the fire caster swirl around the yellow, glowing concoction. He's clearly some kind of knight. He probably likes swords and shields, she remarks. Vilina frowns, looking back at Storb and then at the dark elf's shield, raising an eyebrow. The witchy woman swipes a strand of her hair out of her face. I have a grip, a perfect grip, she replies, her eyes blankly staring at her counterpart. You wouldn't believe how well I can grip things, Storb says the sorceress, her fingertips igniting with cinders. Storb yells, immediately snatching the explosive potion from Violina's burning hands before the glass heats up and the concoction ignites. Watch it! Snaps the dark elf. Are you trying to get us killed? I just want him to restrain me again, sighs Violina, ignoring her. Nobody has ever held me while I burned things before. She explains, wrapping her arms around herself, her fingertips burning holes into the back of her own clothes. Please, do us a favor and dive into the lake, would you? Asks Storb. We're here to do a job. Smoke rises from the burning fabric of Violina's robe as she stands there with her eyes closed. I just wish that he'd throw me down onto my knees and then, caretaker stands there, listening in silent, 
bashful confusion and then working for a while in a vague daze, until the day comes to an end and the defenses of the South stand proudly erected. Is that really how it works? It seems unnatural. It is night time once again. The day is over. The construction in the South was successfully completed through great effort and toil. Caretaker lays on her back, staring up at the night with 10,000 stars staring back down her way as she rests on pilot's jacket. If she didn't know better, she'd say that the stars do so almost judgingly. A lone cricket chirps idly behind her in the forest's underbrush, its simple song accompanying her thoughts that are stuck on Violina's excellent storytelling skills, which are perhaps, very unfortunately, some of the best she's ever heard. Caretaker doesn't think she can move a limb in her body anymore. She's just collapsed here in the sand. Limp. If Pilot tries to carry her away tonight, she's just going to wiggle herself from side to side and burrow down beneath the shore. She'll hide like a worm beneath the dirt until he goes away. Hopefully, a crow won't eat her. Or maybe it would be better if it did. What an odd thought, mutters Caretaker to herself, listening as Pilot finishes his work. She rolls her head to the side and looks over his way, noticing the deeply tired face that looks back at her from above as he approaches. She's exhausted and has slept every night since this began, but Pilot has been awake for days now, organizing everything and working on the valley's defense. The man sits down on the sand next to her and then, to her surprise, joins her. He falls down onto his back, the two of them just staring up at the sky in deeply exhausted silence. Stars says caretaker after a moment, pointing up at them. They're stars, got it, replies Pilot, picking up more and more by the day. Ever since the people of the city got here, he's been rapidly learning to speak the language, far quicker than when it was just the two of them. Cricket, Pilot, remarks caretaker, as the lone insect continues to shrill behind them. His head rolls her way. Sensing that she doesn't know what he's referring to, she mimics the noise of the bug in the forest nearby. A Mimics caretaker. R. Remarks pilot, letting his head roll back forward to look at the sky. A cricket. We had those two. They lay like that side by side for a while, the waters of the lake slowly ebbing in and out, with the forest making its usual noises. After a while, caretaker rolls her head back his way, and sees that he's fallen asleep there on the sands of the shore, sleeping for the first time in days. She looks back up at the sky, a cold sweat on her head despite the coolness of the night. Caretaker slowly scoots over, following her previously developed worm strategy to an extent as she moves a little closer to Pilot, not close enough so that she could be considered weird or strange if he were to wake up right now, but close enough that the side of her leg touches the side of his leg and the side of her arm touches the side of his arm, both causing an unexplainable buzz in her. It gets cold by the lake after all, and he needs the sleep, especially before the coming invasion. It would be a shame to wake him now, she knows that if she does, he'll jump right back into his work until he collapses. So this is for the best. She's just going to have to let him rest here and now, and she'll have to stay here too. Her giving him some of her own warmth is only natural and fair. She has his jacket, after all. Caretaker stares at the sky, rolling her head to the side once to look at him before quickly looking back up again faster than before. Her eyes terrified. What is she doing? She scoots a little, tiny bit closer until the back of her palm, which is pressed tightly against her own leg, makes contact with him. And then the dryad, exhausted too, sleeps below the canopy of the night despite the strange fear that she can't explain and the pressure in her chest that is unusual and very uncomfortable. From nearby, there is a hissing noise from the inside of the Kestrel's cockpit. The radio needle slides back and forth, as the sound of white noise comes over the signal. Days until invasion. 022. Chapter 21. Begin. Pilot. Dash. Level. 32. Human. Aim. Calls a voice from the platform as several dozen men lift their crossbows. Loose. Barks the commander. And the soldiers release their weapons sending a volley of projectiles out into the targets, while half reloads, the other half fires, both teams taking turns to keep a constant stream of fire going until they run out of ammunition and the enemy has theoretically approached their defenses now. Switch. He yells, the crossbowmen falling back as a row of soldiers with the shorter range repeating crossbows rotate forward, activating the lever mechanism to fire a volley of arrows each. 
two dozen smaller bolts flying per man out into the field, with noticeably less power than the larger crossbows but enough to do some considerable harm at a closer range. Wall, barks the commander, and the row of priests and priestesses on standby lift their hands, creating an array of magical barriers that are linked together, separating the reloading soldiers from the enemy. Arc your shots, barks the commander, the repeating crossbowmen aiming above the barriers. Loose. Several dozen bolts fly above the wall, landing downward at an angle as they rain onto the targets from above. Pilot watches with his hands behind his back as they drill through their combat exercises. It's good that they're practicing organizational tactics, and a combined arms doctrine with magic and crossbowmen is certainly interesting. But how will this fare against a moving, massive swarm of the undead? The Chuko knew are their best rate of fire weapons, but they lack the punch to pierce a zombie's skull or spine, and the poison is worthless against the undead. His eyes scan the field training area, where the survivors of the northern city are all working under the command of the soldiers, practicing rudimentary orders and formations. The only ones excused are the injured, the children who are collecting food and water, or the craftsmen who are preparing everything that remains to be done. Pilot's hand rests on his pistol, his fingers tapping the gun's exterior one after the other as he thinks. Caretaker's asset protection detail, the shield maiden and the fire sorceress, walk by, trailing after the dryad, who is working with the formations of healers and support casters. Magic is going to be a big part of the upcoming defense, which is fine and good, but he needs something with a little more oomph to put his nervous mind at ease. As if feeling him staring, the pyromaniac sorceress stops and looks his way and he gets his idea. Pilot waves her over, she, almost too quickly and eagerly, splits from the group and heads his way alone at first in a dash, however, as soon as caretaker notices, the dryad awkwardly stumbles after the woman who is supposed to be following her, the dark elf is just tagging along, watching the area carefully. Pilot examines at her equipment as she arrives, looking at him excitedly. It's perfect, this is just what they need. Good quality explosive potion, an extremely volatile concoction that tends to violently explode. Vials of this potion are commonly used as weapons against monsters. Weight, 125 milliliters. Value, 80 obols. While dipping an arrowhead into the potion isn't enough to achieve a worthwhile effect, filling somewhat elongated, hollow arrowheads with the substance is enough to certainly provide an interesting benefit. Normal quality explosive bolt, an explosive, miniature crossbow bolt meant to be fired out of a handheld repeating crossbow. It explodes on impact, the fragile head splintering in all directions. Weight, 0.17 kilograms. Value, working with a craftsman to make this was kind of hard with the sorceress bearing down on him the entire time, practically breathing into his ear, but the project has worked out well. It's perfect. The weak's bolts mixed in with a weak explosion ought to be enough to break through rotting flesh and crack open skulls, especially if fired from a high vantage point. The only issue now is mass producing these and transporting them around the valley. This takes the highest priority out of everything, and he tries his best to convey as much to a very sweaty caretaker. Pilot and the people of the valley spend the rest of the day preparing for the attack to come imminently. But, as far as he can tell, they're as prepared as they can be given the circumstances. Once this is over and they have a little time, they can work out some better fortifications, some weapon emplacements, more and stronger mines, anti-air guns, artillery emplacements, a few machine gun nests, and ideally some logistics and patrols between the valley and the remaining cities. Tonight and one day remain until the official beginning of the second invasion. Less than 40 hours, it's good says caretaker, smiling as she presses her hands together, holding them next to her cheek. Thank you, pilot. He looks up over the table and over their dinner, which he has been preparing lately as one of his self-assigned chores, like tidying, or bringing fresh water up in large, lidded buckets from the lake every morning. You're welcome. Good work today, he replies. Ooh. Caretaker claps her fingers together lightly, impressed at his speaking too, apparently. She looks around the table picking up a wooden bowl. Pilot, what color is this? She asks. It's brown, replies Pilot. The dryad lets out a pleased hum as she sets the empty bowl upside down onto the table, running her palm over its bottom surface. What shape does this have? It's sir. Pilot stops, 
correcting himself before finishing the word, round. Caretaker crosses her arms, nodding with a satisfied smile below her closed eyes. What are our names? I'm Pilot, and you're Caretaker, replies Pilot, finishing his food a little slower than her. She's wolfed hers down once again. He's gotten down the basics of the language, not mastered it, but he's learned a few things for sure. Caretaker taps her head, looking at him. What's my favorite color? Pilot stops and stares at her blankly, not sure if he caught that question right. Her favorite color? Is he supposed to know what that is? Is that mission critical information? He understood the question, didn't he? It's not that he isn't interested, but, the man turns his head slowly looking around the underground den below the world tree, which is full of all manner of colors, all of which range from exotic brown greens to the most subtle and delicate green browns imaginable. His head looks the other way, looking at the beds and the walls and the few tapestries here and there, and then back to her. In a way, the colors down here in the den are actually a lot like a barracks. Now that he thinks about it, they were also the same drab colors, apart from a little unpainted steel here and there. Green? Guesses Pilot, feeling that he has a 50% chance of being right. Sometimes you just have to take a risky shot. Caretaker nods, pleased. How did you know? She asks. He thinks. This small talk is her way of training him further in the language. He supposes. It's just an extension of what they've been doing the whole time. He assumes he guessed her favorite correctly then, but what is this line of questioning supposed to be? How did he know? She holds her hands in a ball together in front of her lower face, turning her head to the side. Her eyes remain looking straight his way. Pilot back stares at her, slowly blinking. What's with her? He could just tell her that he guessed just now, but honestly, he doesn't know the right words for that explanation. So he looks for something plausible enough around them to be a real answer. Your eyes replies Pilot, tapping below his eye. It's not illogical to assume that someone's favorite color could be the color of their own eyes, right? Caretaker's face locks and she stares like a blinded deer for a moment, before she then immediately jumps up, stiff like a board. Excuse me, says the dryad, I need to get some water. She yells, far too loudly, as she quickly runs to the door. Her antlers get tangled in the beads and she fusses for a moment before freeing herself and vanishing outside. Pilot watches her go, the beads rattling as she runs, and then shrugs, testing his soup again. Maybe he still oversalted it if she's that thirsty. Caretaker, dash, level, 12. Dryad. Caretaker stands with her back against a tree outside, having run down the hill a little to the ledge, where she pants and tries to catch her breath. What was that? Her face burns painfully and vividly red as she looks out over the lake sweat beating on her forehead and her heart thrashing in her chest. The conversation from just now at the table firmly locked within her mind's eye. What's your favorite color? She had asked him. Green, he replied. Why is that? She asked. Because of your eyes, he replied. Caretaker pulls her robes up to her mouth, muffling her scream. Her bright green eyes wide open, and boring deep holes into the ground. It's too much. She knows that she's been weird lately about the whole situation between him and her, but Pilot hasn't said a single word to her about anything romantic ever since his failed courtship attempt by the lake back when they first met, when she threw away his ring. Really? It's only been her the entire time who has been acting like a msuk elk, right? But now, he just drops that kind of statement on her, entirely out of nowhere? The dryad looks around herself feeling all sorts of strange, confusing things as her eyes wander back up toward the Mother Moon, hidden behind the boughs of the World Tree. Tonight, the moon is full, fat, and yellow. She glows as if dripping with sweet honey. The large, yellow moon is an omen of change to come in the world and of drastic shifts. It is the night on which hunters prowl and on which the men of the cities harvest their crops and fields, a night in which witches brew strange potions and lovers are said to find no sleep. Caretaker gets ready to scream again, this time out into the air like a howling beast lost in the deep forest. However, something appears next to her, a status window. The invasion has begun. Second invasion, the undead mass. Enemy arrival from, north, east, west, all around the world. There are littered more corpses than stars in the night sky, left to decay and rot, unburied and unhonored by their kin who fled in terror, only to meet the same fates further down the road. Howling ghosts fill the air, 
finding no peace as they cannot enter the spirit world and are unable to move on. Instead, they return to their broken, foul carcasses, reanimating them, unaware that they will be trapped inside flesh that they no longer control. The Dead March, led by a frayed, horrific thing known only as the Prime Hand 2. Base arrival time, 24 hours. Proper burials, plus, 12 hours. Respected the Dead, plus, 12 hours. Hunter's Moon, 08 hours. Infiltrator, 01, 20 hours. Infiltrator, 02, 20 hours. Total time until invasion, 00 hours. Prime Hand 2, X1, 5X, Undead, X10,000. Invasion modification, Hunter's Moon. The Hunter's Moon fuels the raging of the souls of the dead, significantly increasing their aggression and tenacity but also their susceptibility. All undead gain plus 15 levels. All successful undead attack supply stacking status. Rot. All undead take 25% more elemental damage from all sources. The perfect night sky breaks, seems running through it like the surface of a frozen lake, cracking open in an instant. One by one, the threads appear, cobwebbing the sky as the honeycomb pattern that isn't due for another 40 hours at least shows up now. Immediately, before caretaker can move, the orange night drowns in red, the sky wobbling and shaking as, from high on the hill on which the world tree sits, three black threads force themselves down toward the world, like needles pushed downward from the heavens above, causing a great quake to move through the entire valley. The world tree shakes, thousands and thousands of disturbed leaves falling from the sky. Some things howl in such great numbers that it is as if the night itself has gained a voice and mourns the world it covers. Caretaker. Yells a voice from behind her. Pilot runs up to her, grabs her shoulder with one hand and nods to her. Go to the people, stay with them, he instructs. An instant later, she feels something pressed into her hand. Confused and disoriented, she watches him run down to the lake and then looks back at her hand, looking at Pilot's personal weapon that he's left with her, the pistol. Horns sound out around the valley, signaling fire lighting in all directions, and she snaps out of it, slipping the odd thing into her robe before she hurries, running as fast as she can toward the defenses. She couldn't do much last time except help Pilot, but this time, she has to do more. From her vantage point, she sees clusters of shining lights in the distance outside of the valley. Given their color of yellow, one could mistake them for being great wildfires that have come to consume the world. However, this is not the case. The yellow shine that now newly illuminates the night belongs to the eyes of 10,000 undead, the first wave of the second invasion, which begins now. 3. Chapter 22 Incursion Pilot Dash Level 32. Human. One switch after the other clicks into place. The engine of the Kestrel singing to life as it wakes from its rest. The twelve cylinders pump with thrashing motions as the blood of countless dead monsters begins to flow through the machine, pushed through its internals by the firing of the blackened metal heart. The man stares through the dark visor of his helmet, his hand pushing down against the throttle as he releases the brakes with the other. The plane begins to move, pushing forward under nightfall the wheels carrying over the moonlight reflecting on the sands of the lake as Pilot slowly rises into the air. Out of the side of the canopy, he sees Caretaker running down the lake shore, heading to the settlement. With two fingers against his visor, he throws her a small salute, the dryad holding her hands out toward him and casting a spell as he flies. An unnatural wind pressing up beneath his wings as the kestrel rolls, flying faster and smoother than ever as it rises up toward the orange harvest moon, carried not just by the gale and the currents but by greys. Pilot pulls up the information on his target as he clears the forest, using an ability for advanced monster information received after his defeat of the Goblin King. New Ability survival. Advanced monster identification. Passive. An innate level of expertise against the creatures of the wild allows you to know things about unique monsters and animals, such as weaknesses, quirks, and other hidden traits. Prime Hand 2. A Prime Hand 2. A demon is born from the soul of a person or creature that has been corrupted, frayed, and tortured far enough to lose all semblance to its original form. Demons vary in their strength depending on their levels of rage from simple malicious entities to powerful, generation-ending demon kings. A hand too is a demon that never quite finished leaving either the spirit or the physical world, 
Finding itself trapped within a state of humanity and demonic corruption at the same time, its soul stagnating and festering with rot as it finds itself unable to move in either direction. Eventually, this process is broken as the rot becomes too strong and eats its way out of the spirit world and into the physical. Han Tu comes in many variants. A prime member of this species of rare demon is the most powerful version of a Han Tu that uses its connection to the spirit world to maintain control over the spirits of the dead and any bodies that they might have once possessed, using them to fulfill its goals. Advanced, Han Tu are intelligent, clever, yet fully warped and mind broken undead that far surpass any of their counterparts. They may employ advanced reasoning, tactics, and logic in order to achieve their goals. Hantu are able to disguise the stench and rot of their deaths in order to remain among the living or hide within swarms of undead undetected. They will begin enacting their plans and schemes long before striking, going into meticulous detail before their hour comes. Hantu are obsessive about their goal, viciously going after their desired intent with cruelty and indifference, but not impatience. Weakness, a Hantu is not a purely singular physical being, as such. Destroying its body will only delay it. In order to truly destroy a Hantu, its roaming spiritual form must be put to rest as well. Entity, Demon, Rank, SSS, Element, None, Type, Manipulator. He rises toward the west, flying out past the trunk of the world tree, looking around the valley from above. All around, fires have been lit as signaling tools. Flames move dancing around as people streak toward the defenses, holding torches and spells aloft to illuminate the night. On three spans of the horizon, inky, massive black columns of an indistinct matter stand erected between the sky and the world like the needles of a machine, trying to pull two pieces of fabric together. And from all of them, he can see a swarm beginning to move toward the world tree valley. Thousands and thousands of ambling, shuffling bodies set to motion, they're glowing yellow eyes illuminating their silhouettes, together with the honey glow of the moon. The eastern wall, dash. People scream and shout, orders being barked left and right as boots splash through the mud just as often as they stamp against wood as the defenders rise up to the palisades of the eastern wall. Shallon does the same, climbing with his crossbow on his back up the ladders to the defenses, rising up and then pushing past the rows of people on the wall's wide platforms to look down and out over the distance. Below the east is a deep basin, and on the other side spawns a swarm of undead, thousands strong in number. The young human man looks around himself. There are maybe two hundred people designated for the east. Of these, about seventy-five are on the wall, the rest are running logistics transporting ammunition up to the firing lines, preparing further fortifications, making the last few landmines that can be stashed away, or filling up the metal basin they've prepared with buckets full of sloshing black liquid one load after the other. Formation. Yells a voice in the night. The eastern commander calling everyone to get into place. Draw your weapons. Shallon pulls his crossbow from his back. Aim. Hold. Orders the voice, calling out over the bright and vivid night. The enemy is still well out of range, and everyone watches tensely, waiting as the swarm moves. Thousands of feet shuffle, drag, and lurch their way. Greedy hands are already outstretched, pressing through the air and toward the wall that is still so far away, as if they couldn't wait to grab everyone on it. And then the night erupts. Fire cracks on the horizon, the swarm blasting apart with massive holes in its front as the undead weight of the many begins to press down on the landmines. One after the other, explosions ring out. Limbs and chunks of rotting flesh flying through the air like rising birds. The heavy, thundering cracks of spontaneous fire echoing out around the valley as sections of the enemy are simply removed. Those that fall are crushed, swarmed and trampled over by the legions behind them. Never seen a goddamn thing like it, mutters the man next to him. Shallon looks at him and then back at the undead that begin to descend down into the basin below the wall, which they must then traverse and then climb back up on their side again. Who do you think that man is? He asks. Pilot, he must be some foreign mercenary, replies Shallon, shaking his head. Some king's engineer from the east or something. The ice wizard next to them speaks. No way, replies the young man. We all saw how he roughed up Zen Harley, she explains, when he tried to punch him in the camp, that dumbass. She shakes her head. He has to be some kind of S-tier adventurer. The woman looks back at the approaching undead, his equipment, his moves. 
It reeks of the old dungeons. Marksman Shalin barks the commander from next to him. AIM. The undead march, crushing everything in their path as they move down the valley, including the hundreds and hundreds of rotting, fermenting goblin corpses that have been dutifully collected over these last few weeks and thrown into the basin. Their bodies attract flies and worms, their black blood seeping and oozing into the land, pooling their ingrate splotches. Shallon lifts his crossbow. That is not what I have heard in my circles, replies a priestess, standing to his right and holding out her hands over his crossbow bolt, her fingers glowing. Shallon looks at her out of the sides of his eyes and then back out forward into the night over the sights of his weapon as he arcs it upward. And what have you heard, sister? asks Shallon as her enchantment sparks a flame around his arrowhead. An old god has returned to us now that all others have left, she explains, the fire illuminating her features. The demon of heaven, the black bird, has come back to the world. Steady, orders the commander, as Shallon holds his crossbow ready, the undead drawing closer and closer as they reach the middle of the basin. And he is its avatar, says the priestess. Marksman Shallon, loose barks the voice from behind his shoulder. Shallon lets loose his bolt, the metal twanging loudly in the air like the strike of a cathedral bell, as a single, burning light tarks through the sky like a meteor, carrying its radiant shine throughout the night. Two hundred pairs of eyes stop and watch as the single shot flies and then falls, aiming not at the heart of the encroaching legion but at the ground ahead of them, which erupts violently into wildfire as soon as it makes contact. The black Blood-soaked soil of the cauldron below the wall catches light from the single spark of enchanted fire, and the fermented goblin blood that has been spread throughout the entire basin bursts into towering flames that rise toward the air. Thousands of undead march, compressing wet, soaked soil beneath their feet. Black goo squishing out through their toes as the fire roars their way. Shallon feels a hand slapping his back as seventy-five people watch from the wall as the undead legion of some thousands in numbers walk into the horrific fires, entirely undeterred by the pain of the burning, their skin peels and blisters, falling off, their flesh melts and oozes, the rotting marrow in their bones boiling and cooking until their limbs explode from the inside out from the pressure of it. They watch as, in the cauldron below, thousands of human shapes dance and burn vanishing into nothing more than black silhouettes. You know, sister, says Shallon, not taking his eyes off the horrific sight. If he is a demon, I think you need to switch teams, explains the soldier, looking back at the priestess, who is clutching her hands in prayer. Caretaker, dash, level, twelve, dryad, your grace, yells a voice from ahead, a hand grabs hers, the dark elf Storb, whom Pilot has made her guard, hoisting her up onto a large, bipedal bird, an anchor. The humans use these proud animals as beasts of burden and toil to pull their carriages and carry them into war. We'll bring you to safety, says the dark elf. Another anchor rides in, with the fire sorceress atop it. Bring me to the wall, orders caretaker with clear intent in her eyes. But your grace, it's not. Starts Storb. Caretaker holds a hand against the body of the animal, holding them both, and her other arm holds on to the dark elf. Please. The dryad wasn't talking to Storb. The anchor, its large, feathered head turned to look back at caretaker, clicks with its curved beak and then sprints off toward the northern wall. The other rider follows after them as they cut through the night, which is bound to be both very long and very short. Above their heads, the sky roars with thunder as the kestrel opens fire. 4. Chapter 23. Escalate. Jimerian. Dash. Level. 16. Dwarf. Slow down yells the dwarf who was once a baker, running down the valley entrance in the west together with a few others. Keep up! yells the elf priest ahead of her, turning his head back as he runs, his long legs striking against the ground like those of a gangly spider. T. Marion narrows her eyes as she hurries. She has a strong dislike of elves. They're just too long. Their arms are too long, their necks are too long and their legs are too long. They're just the exact opposite of what a person's proper proportions should be like. The night above them is filled with the howling of endless dead things, of war, and of machinery that hammers in the sky above them, pulling out the moon's orange hue into the dark patches of the sky as the dragon circling the valley descends down with breaths of fire. Jimerian scales a manufactured hill, climbing up after the others as they stand on the secure points inside the western edge of the valley, overlooking the entrance. 
There is one hill on either side of the valley's entrance that they have made, on top of which are firing positions. This creates a further funnel that any intruders need to walk through after exiting the tight ravine, where they will head straight toward a third, ground level nest that has been outfitted with a single plundered ballista from the city, one of many taken from the ruins. Demarion looks back behind herself, back at the entire valley that they just ran across like thieves in the night, before looking back ahead of themselves. Others are already here, preparing the defense. The western border is only lightly defended compared to the other entrances to the valley. There are only a good fifty men here, which isn't nearly enough as far as she can tell. Even with the enemy needing to go through a tight funneling canyon, this is suicide. The woman catches her breath, wiping the sweat off of her brow as she watches silhouettes run over the cliffs ahead of them, firing crossbow bolts out into the darkness beyond the valley. The forward defenders are already at work, not used to running this much, she says, standing back upright. I should be baking bread and cake, not standing out here with this thing in my hands, explains Timarian, lifting up the Chuko new and looking at it. The priest, observing the situation for a time, looks back down at her. You can bake during the day, he explains, but at night, the gods now ask you to go to war. The dwarven woman rolls her eyes and taps her head. Very poetic, dangly ears, she replies, but if I want to have any bread ready by sunrise, I need to start now in the middle of the night. Baking takes time. Tell you what, remarks an orc next to them, resting his crossbow against the bricks used as cover here and aiming it down to the valley entrance. I'll skip having bread tomorrow if we don't get eaten alive tonight he says, shaking his head. Timarian plants her hands on her hips, glaring at him. My bread's the best in the valley. You won't be saying that come sunrise. I think you're the only baker left alive, miss, remarks the priest, waving as someone on the defense waves to him, signaling something. Another archer quips in from the side. I'm glad everyone has their priorities in check here, replies the human man with a longbow. Not like there are a few thousand undead about to come through that goddamned hole in the rocks there, he remarks, pulling out an arrow from his quiver. You'll find, my child, starts the elven priest, looking his way and then back at the entrance. All of the defenders on the top of the ravine ahead of them are pulling back, a few of them firing down into the winding gulch at unseen enemies that they can't spot from here. Everyone atop the cliffs runs, retreating to the interior defensive positions except for one person who remains there, that the gods have a way of bringing things together that seem nonsensical to those who don't know of their ways. The orc crossbowman cranks his weapon, loading a bolt in and aiming it at the gulch entrance as dozens of people run off of the cliffs above the western canyon, climbing down ropes and ladders as they spring to the defensive fortifications. You know something I don't, father? he asks, because, as far as I can see, the gods put us here to get eaten alive in about two minutes time, people run around, manning the fortifications, with the single ballista down below turning and aiming toward the valley entrance as crossbowmen aim toward the gulch's opening, the cliffs are empty, except for one single person who remains standing atop them, seen only as a night washed silhouette, while an endless wash of groaning and ambling can be heard coming through the canyon. I admit, I had misplaced my faith too, replies the elf. The defenders ready their weapons as the person atop the canyon lifts a hand, pointing something up to the sky. But now I have found it again, he says. The night erupts with ruby fire. The forty-nine people on the defenses look away from the gulch as what can only be the queen of fireflies shoots up toward the sky from the cliffs. A hissing fireball lighting the night above them with a crimson glow that paints itself over the landscape washing it in the color of the blood, of which none will be shed tonight in the west of the valley. A signal flare, fired from Pilot's pistol. The 50th defender finally runs away too, sprinting and leaping back across from cliff to cliff as the lazy fireball drifts through the sky, coming to a halt as it almost seems to hover for a while. As they had been instructed to do on this signal, everyone covers their ears. Pilot, dash, level, 32. Human, the kestrel shakes. The pressure from the massive shock wave blowing out over and across the valley into the sky. Pilot looks out of the canopy, staring at the massive fireball that erupts in the west as multiple of the Kestrel's exogen bombs, its harvested self-destruction charges, explode at once from a chain reaction triggered by a triggered landmine. 
They had been planted inside the gulch that leads into the valley from the west. Fire and rubble hurtle into the air as the plane stabilizes again under his control. The man watches through his black visor as the night itself is washed away by hellfire. The entrance to the west fully collapses under the demolitions, with the canyon caving in on both sides with massive rock slides that tumble down, crushing hundreds of the undead that weren't vaporized immediately by the blasts. Gritty smoke rises into the night like a growing tree as stones fly through the air, a few of them pelting the kestrel's wings by chance. He diverts toward the north, spraying down the fields with machine gun fire as he turns. The 7.92 by 57 incendiary bullets ripping gracelessly through meat and bone alike. The incendiary ammunition ignites the undead and conflagrates those that keep walking. The fire spreading from one to the next. There are so goddamn many of them, though. The kestrel chimes behind his back. The ammunition canisters are shot empty already. New ability, dash. Aviation, airborne resupply. Active, cost, five soul. Allows the Kestrel can be resupplied with any stored, compatible ammunition without needing to manually reload the plane, as long as these are located within the World Tree's shadow. Pilot activates the ability he gained after the last invasion, testing it out for the first time. Behind him, he hears the jangling of metal as canisters ratchet into place. The Kestrel automatically supplies itself with some of the ammunition he has stored on the ground in his private stockpile. It's a good thing he has a few weeks worth of bullets. He's going to need them. Killing Tango's forces isn't efficient. He needs to find the hand too. But unlike with the Goblin King, there isn't a clearly defined target here. Something that's easily discernible. The undead mass is one huge mess of bodies. The target could be anywhere, any one of them. His eyes scan the ground and then the radar as he makes a pass ahead of the northern wall, unloading a series of cluster munitions that fall toward the ground as he soars eastward, flying his round round the valley. The defenses seem to be holding, but this is just the first wave. The bombs whistle down toward the ground, caretaker, dash, level, 12, dryad. The world beyond the walls erupts. Caretaker shields her face from the light and the noise, as on the other side of the surviving caster's magically erected barriers outside of the wall itself, everything explodes and vanishes into smoke and the roar of a monster with no body. Thunder cracks out in a hundred places at once as dead, rotting bodies that move on their own are torn apart and simply erased from existence as pilot passes them by, diverging toward the east. Yes, yes. Screams a voice in her ears. Caretaker grabs hold of the fire sorceress, pulling her back down from the wall that she's climbed up onto. Violina throws a fireball out into the chaos, laughing as it explodes and burning corpses fly through the air, many still moving as they do so. Don't endanger yourself, scolds Caretaker, shoving the woman to her other bodyguard, Storb, who catches her and turns her back toward the enemy. The northern wall, having the least favorable terrain for a defense, has the strongest defensive measures in place. The majority of the defenders are here. The west is sealed, as evidenced by the significant plume of smoke that rises behind the world tree. The east is under control, as is apparent because of the orange sunrise coming from that end of the valley as a great blaze continues to burn. Only here in the north do they lack any special defenses other than the wall, but they're making up for it in raw manpower. Hundreds of people run back and forth carrying arrows and bolts to the archers and crossbowmen on the walls, metal twangs with loud siren screams as the salvaged ballistae, plundered from the northern ruins, fire off one after the other from raised platforms into the mass, sending massive, flaming arrows the size of men skewering through dozens of bodies each with every shot. Load explosive munitions, barks a voice as a commander walks along the wall, the undead moving closer. Switch. The crossbowmen pull back a row up atop the walls, the others with pilots repeating weapon design stepping forward to the front of the battlements as the crossbowmen resupply their quivers. Caretaker lifts her hands, she's not a fighter, but that doesn't mean she's worthless here. She has powers of healing, but she also has powers over the valley and its ways. Pilots repeating crossbow design is amazing, but it lacks the range that normal crossbows have, but she can help that. She can help him by helping them. Aim! Yells the commander. A few hundred men lift their weapons, aiming toward the night that crawls. Thousands of yellow, swarming things moving their way across the mud in ash like wingless fireflies. The air stinks of them. 
of their foul malignancy that dares to come close to her precious home. Caretaker, has used, winds grace, gale, at her behest, a powerful wind comes from behind the backs of the defenders, pushing toward the north and against the enemy. Loose the hundred and some repeating crossbowmen fire their salvos of twelve small, explosive bolts each, the wind carrying them further and faster than they ought to have been, the night is peppered by explosions, a thousand small bolts, laden with dangerously volatile alchemical mixtures, explode against the bodies of hundreds of the dead, blasting out chunks of them and tearing off their legs, limbs, and heads as they vanish behind a new screen of smoke, switch, barks the commander as the firing rows switch back out, the crossbowmen preparing as those with two gonus reload again, receiving fresh deliveries from down below the wall by the feverish logistics teams. They might just have a chance. Caretaker watches the dead fall as the wind of her spell dissipates, the world returning to its new standard of a deafening screen that does not overpower the sound that she hears in her ears. Sister? asks a voice from behind her, cutting through the chaos with unusual clarity. Caretaker looks behind herself in surprise, looking around the area, but not seeing anything that sounded like, no, her eyes scan the defenders, working meticulously. Sister? calls the voice again, its whispering overpowering the groans of the dead and the striking of metal against metal. Caretaker sees her standing on the edge of the forest behind the defensive line. A dryad is there, one just like herself, her sister, whom she had buried just before Pilot arrived in the valley for the first time. Sister, it's me, says the creature, speaking in a normal voice that should be impossible to hear at this distance over this array of rupturing screams and harrowing rattles. It's like she's standing right next to her, but in reality, the other dryad is barely a pinprick in the distance. Sister, mutters caretaker, surprised and confused at what she's seeing, the other waves her over. Hurry, says the other dryad, there's a problem. The world tree wants me to show it to you, says the woman in the distance, waving to her and then vanishing into the forest. Caretaker looks around herself in confusion. What is this, the world tree? Her sister? That's impossible. Her sister has moved on and left. Her body is gone, and her spirit has returned to the great cycle. There is nothing of her except memories now. But, she looks at the giant tree, sitting awash in the light of the fires growing all around its valley. Its powers are many and untold in nature. The dryad turns to her bodyguards, grabbing them both. There's a problem, says caretaker, grabbing them and a few others from the wall to follow her. Hurry, come on yells the dryad as they run into the forest, the defense firing on behind them into the encroaching mass. 4. Chapter 24, Desecrate. Pilot, Dash, Level, 32. Human pilot soars over the eastern wall, the kestrel slicing through the burning smoke of the cauldron in which thousands and thousands of zombies burn, their festering corpses falling down and simply adding to the blaze as the blood inside of them is already pre-fermented and rotted. Fire is an almost hazardously effective weapon against the undead, he flies a pass over the basin, watching as the entire undead wave stumbles and falls its way into the hole, crawling through the fires that they keep feeding themselves, the flames gorge themselves on rotting flesh and sinew, the monster blood inside the hundreds of undead causing them to rupture and explode. He's seen a lot of things in his life and considers himself to be more or less coldly indifferent to anything the battlefield has left to show him, but Pilot would be lying if he said he didn't look twice at the horde of some thousand people literally walking into a wildfire on their own volition. It looks like this is all still from the first blaze, too. The stored monster blood inside the eastern wall's floodgate sealed container, which can be released downhill for a second wave of fuel, doesn't seem to have been opened yet. That's good. This is only the first wave of three, after all. The east is secure, it seems. The west is also secure, with the canyon blocked off from the rockfall caused by the blast of the hexogen bombs. The zombies have no choice but to diverse to the other entrance, north and south both of which are prepared for any stragglers. Pilot pulls the throttle of the Kestrel, activating the air brake as he makes a sharp turn, flying over the heads of the defenders as he soars over the valley, looking on his radar and activating his map. There's still no sign of Tango, though, where the hell is it? His eyes look to his map of the valley and to the marked positions on it. There are icons mapping the active positions of the defenders moving around the valley and, 
most importantly, caretaker and her bodyguards. There in the forest, Pilot launches the Kestrel to its side, rolling it so that his left wing points down and his right toward the sky as he flies over the general area where Caretaker and her people are. This is the deep forest, he doesn't have a clear view. Watching in his mirror for a moment as he flies past, Pilot turns his gaze back to the map, watching them continue to move. They're heading somewhere, but where? Pilot looks at the map and then turns, flying a pass around the world tree's massive trunk. Caretaker, dash, level, 12, Dryad. Caretaker looks around herself, staring at the familiar forest that she knows inside and out, having spent her entire life running through it. Even in the dark of midnight, on a starless night, she's sure she could find her way through it from one end to the other. The Dryad looks past its many trunks and low-hanging boughs as her eyes scan the area, lit by the glow of haunting orange moonlight. Your Grace, says Storb, the Dark Elf walking next to her and keeping her shield ready. We shouldn't be wandering off alone, she says, watching the area. Let's go back to a secure area. The valley is supposed to be a safe place, replies caretaker, looking around the forest. It's totally not, though, replies Violina, the fire sorceress, lighting up the area with a burning spell in her hands. We all saw the infiltrator thing, right? She asks. We have two scampering rats inside of our walls, explains the woman, eyeing the darkness, you are correct, replies caretaker, walking forward and carefully observing the area, there is something else inside the valley with us, the dryad looks at her guards and the few crossbowmen, everyone on the walls is doing their best to keep the valley safe, she explains, we must not allow something to creep and crawl around behind us and destroy everything we've worked for, caretaker looks back out into the forest, clenching her fist, how dare it, she's sheltered, naive, a little weak, and maybe a little emotionally not ready for what life is throwing at her, but she isn't stupid, her sister and all of her sisters are dead and gone, she or any of them are never coming back in a form that she can recognize, that's not the world they live in, that means that something is in her valley, in her home and most sacred place, masquerading around in the skin of one of her most beloved memories, how dare it, she seldom gets mad at things, seldom gets angry, but caretaker finds herself clenching her fists, her nails digging into her palms, pilot has worked so hard for them, all of the people of the city have worked so hard, she's worked so hard, she's not going to let this, creature dance around inside of this hollow sanctuary, it's trying to lure us into the forest, she explains, walking on, I think it managed, remarks Storb, holding her shield ready as she walks at caretaker's side, looks that way to me, replies Violina, caretaker stops, holding her hands out to grab the two of them, the handful of commandeered crossbowmen following behind them aim their weapons, this is my forest, replies caretaker, narrowing her eyes as they find themselves standing before a silhouette in the distance, slowly turning their way, it looks like it has antlers on its head, but then it doesn't, it's as if they were slowly melting away, caretaker holds her hands out toward it, caretaker, has used, roots and air, roots from the many trees and bushes all around the entity in the distance, snap forward, lashing out and grabbing hold of it from all sides, the eight of them look, cautiously stepping forward as they approach the court intruder, you, mutters caretaker, recognizing the other as they all come closer, the fire of Violina's spell illuminating the night, a sick, crooked face looks back her way from the darkness, the neck of the other, below the head, snapping at a disgusting, wrong angle as her head turns too far for what the body would naturally allow, caretaker looks at the elven woman, her chest and torso mangled by old, festering scars, her tired, exhausted face looking back at them, I wanted you to let me die, says the elf, but in the voice of caretaker's sister, why wouldn't you just let me die? Storb jumps in front of caretaker, holding her shield ready, this elf is the one and the same that she had rescued from the burning city in the north, the one who had been stabbed by the goblins and asked to be left behind, the same one who caretaker had healed and set aside after after she was brought to the valley, the tired elf's head cracks as it rotates around, almost upside down like an owl's, her skin below her jaw stretches and rips, the tendons in her neck pull taut and become exposed, fraying as they snap, even after everything I went through, says the elf, whose legs and arms are held outward by the many roots, she cracks her own outstretched arms forward, 
her own elbows breaking as her elbows bends opposite as to how they should, her wrists ripping off, sending blood flying across the forest as she simply tears her arms off from her own ensnared hands with inhuman strength, her released torso flopping down to the ground, her ankles breaking from the bind still holding them as she falls at a sick angle, her face landing in the dirt, slowly, she lifts it, her features contorting and shifting, her broken nose changing and flattening, and hard, long growths pressing out of her head as her face takes the shape of a broken, mangled dryad. Why didn't you let me die? asks the voice of caretaker's sister as the thing that is only masquerading as a body then breaks its own legs, pulling itself free, and flopping around on the wet soil with no hands or feet, its dismembered, backward joints flopping around as it rotates like a spider with its back toward the ground and its arms and legs outstretched and supporting itself, it looks at them with its head having already been turned cleanly around prior to allow it to be right side up now in this jest hold, sis whispers the creature, ah, screams Violina, holding her hands out, a stream of raging fire blasting out of her fingers and enveloping the mutilated, wrong creature before it can finish speaking, she continues to burn it, the monster clicking and screaming in an unnatural voice as the fire consumes it, its long, spider-like appendages flail and flop around as the fire consumes it. What the fuck? Violina, has used, incinerate. They watch as she burns the monster, the incredibly intense heat of her spell causing a draft of hot air to push back against them. After a full minute of scorching the forest, cratering a singular spot in it with a constant stream of fire, the sorceress slows down letting her magic fade out and the night fall quiet, all that remains is a blackened, ashy corpse of a thing that was an eight people in the dark forest, fires burning ahead of them, Violina, says caretaker, not taking her eyes off of the unnatural monstrosity, visions of pilot flash past her mind's eye as she stares, the woman looks at her, burn her again, orders the dryad, narrowing her eyes, thinking not about what she would do, but about what he would do, Violina, has used, incinerate. The night erupts anew with flames. Caretaker stands there, staring unblinkingly as she watches the corpse burn, the antlers atop its head charring and grumbling into ash and she comes to understand something fundamental that she has been learning more and more by the day ever since this all began. Seeing it with her own eyes helps confirm her theory. This, this grotesque brutality is what nature really is. This is the true law of the wild. It's kill or be killed eat or be eaten. Caretaker imprints the vision of the horrifyingly charred pretender falling apart into dust in her memory, making sure not to miss a single flake of falling ash. This is the real world that everyone else, that all of these people of the city, and pilot, have been living in for so long. As a dryad, she's supposed to be in touch with what the world is, with what nature is, but her people, her kind have lived for so long within the overprotective, sheltering boughs of the world tree that they have fully lost track of reality, the dryads, herself, her sisters, all don't understand a single thing about nature, they only understand what it means to live in a blissful, fake place, a pretend world in which nothing terrible, disgusting, or filthy happens, even she, after almost being killed by a goblin, retreated back into that safe, comfortable world. Pilot is strong and can protect her, his being around made it easy for her to do that. Her entire species, of which she is now the last, suffers from delusions. The spell stops, the eight of them stand there, watching as the charred body smoulders and crumbles, but not fully. The skeletal remains of a thing that might have once had flesh move, its skull turns toward them, speaking through its blackened teeth many of which have ruptured from the heat and fallen out with no more nerves or flesh to bind them. I want to die, says the elf's voice, coming from the mess. I want to die. I want to die. I want to die. Burn her again, orders caretaker. Violina obliges, her hands erupting with fire. The undead elf screams, her howls filling the night. Violina, has used, incinerate. This is her role as a caretaker of the world tree, as a dryad of the valley as an animal that is a part of a pack. She can't live in that old fantasy anymore, she has to live in the real world that Pilot lives in, every day, if she wants to exist with him eye to eye, she can't live in her fake world and only ever glance carefully over into his caretaker watches, learning what she knows she has to learn if she wants to be useful for these people here, useful for him. She needs to learn what it means to be a person, a beast of the woods, 
and not just a pacified, house pet of a creature, the dryad watches the screaming thing burn, not being fully alive but also never quite dying either, she can only assume that this is one of the enemy's infiltrators, pilot, dash, level, 32, human, pilot jumps out of the kestrel, the survival rifle slung over his shoulder, his boots cracking down into the sands of the lake, the propeller continues to spin as it idles out as he runs out into the forest. Something is wrong. Caretaker and her guards shouldn't be in the woods. Her guards were given orders to keep her near the core defenses, always where there were the most people around. What is she doing out here? The man runs, hurrying through the forest, as explosions carry out across the valley as more and more mines erupt in the distance and as more explosive shots blast into the undead hordes. The first wave is slowing down now they've almost beaten it, but that just means the second one will be here soon, this was only the first 10,000 of many more to come, pilot hurries, following his map toward caretaker's location, the rifle in his hands as he moves through the dark forest, his keen night vision helping him make his way through as he follows a clear trail, a bunch of people seem to have trampled their way through here, the smaller prints he recognizes as caretakers, his eyes rise up, pilot looking ahead of himself as he slows down, his pace shifting into a cautious walk as the stock of the rifle rises to rest against his shoulder as he finds another person here with him in the forest. Pilot looks down along the sight of the survival rifle, aiming it at the center mass of the target, a heavily obscured, small figure turns their head to look his way, the crude, white wooden mask on their face reflects off the bounding moonlight, his friend and helper the child who helped him make the chlorine gas and the mushroom poison, both weapons that were entirely useless against this invasion, it was a significant delay in their defensive development, both investments of his and the people's time having caused great damage to their time resources in establishing a defense, nobody could have known that the second invasion would be undead after all, they seemed like personally reasonable processes to engage in. Nobody except for a forward scout from that wave, an inconspicuous saboteur. Pilot's finger rests sideways and lengthwise above the trigger as the two of them stare each other down. This child is one of the infiltrators. You shouldn't have come down from the sky, says an almost accusing voice that he hasn't heard speak before. The eyes behind the mask looking at him in resigned desperation. Pilot cautiously steps forward maintaining the rifle's position as his eyes scan the area to make sure it's clear, before retraining his gaze on the spy, it's decided that it prefers you over her. The glowing potions on their belt rattle, the shine reflecting off of the many broken flasks secure there as well, pilot looks at them, the knight staying quiet for a moment as he collects his words, me? he asks, I'm not the invasion goal, the child looks at him, putting its hands to its mask, covering their mouth as if to stop themselves from vomiting, no, they say in a frustrated voice, letting out a spluttering sound, spit and bile dribbles down from the inside of the mask, it doesn't care about that, they explain, their shaking hands pulling off the dripping mask as if against their own will, dropping it, and revealing the heavily burned and scarred face of a human girl, heavily marked and scored by the touches of fire, chemical gas, and poison, but she doesn't make eye contact, she stares instead down at the ground as she slaps her hands against her own mouth, and then lowers her arms again a second later, holding them unnaturally stiff at her sides as if forced to do so by some other power, it wants a strong body. It's silent for a moment, she looks back up at him, a foamy dribble running down her face as the rigid body shakes and twitches, kill, me, before, a gunshot cuts the night coming from the nearby distance. Pilot turns his head immediately toward the sound, recognizing it as coming from his pistol that he had given caretaker. The girl's head arcs back, her body falling to the ground on her back and spasming as something begins to crawl out of her mouth. Pilot watches, thinking it's some kind of worm at first, until another one comes out and then another, fingers, a boneless, squishy, vividly red hand grabs hold of the girl's cheek from inside of her throat. Another presses itself out next to it and holds the other side of her face. Her eyes roll back into her head as she goes into some manner of seizure, as the gestalt inside of her begins to free itself, an elongated, tube-like head slides out of her throat as the hands push up, with an elongated, human torso below, all of it having no bones or rigidity, 
it squishes and compresses, expanding as it unnaturally crawls out of her face, pulling out its hips and then its legs like a man crawling out of a too small hole he had fallen into. The thing is covered in slimy mucus from head to toe, its body resembling that of a worm pretending to be a human, its true form being easily three times the size of the girl. Pilot can only imagine how it sat together, compressed inside her frame like some sort of sick, overfed parasite. What he can only assume is the prime hand who looks down at him, lowering its tube-like head that has only a single eye at the very top of it so that it can look out of the mouths of the people it possesses, and lunges with a wet, echoing scream that chitters and rattles like the skittering feet of ten thousand spiders. The crack of the survival rifle's firing strikes out to meet the still-traveling echo of the pistol shot ringing in his ears as the boss monster of the invasion hurtles toward him. 4. Chapter 25, Become, Pilot, Dash, Level, 32, Human, Second Wave Begun, Spawning, Undead, X-10,000, The small caliber fire cuts through the flesh of the encroaching thing that is launching itself toward him, the single 7.63 by 25 round of the survival rifle, designed to hunt small game, hardly has enough mass and energy to offer significant stopping power against the charging monster. The impact site, consisting solely of a boneless, almost gelatinous mass of flesh, ripples outwardly, wobbling like bloated, wet pustule. Pilot pulls the trigger is pulled four more times, four more incendiary shots piercing through the creature's body before it reaches him, the fire burning and singing its skin and meat from the inside out. The bullets fly cleanly through, striking into the trees of the forest around them, the fire catching on their bark and leaves. Pilot only has a second's time to let gravity drop the stock of the rifle down as a whip-like, fleshy arm strikes toward him, cracking against the gun that he shields his body with. A significantly forceful impact sends him stumbling back. The boneless arm strikes around the rifle after making contact with it and hits him in the side causing the man to lose his footing, only barely catching himself as the slimy monstrosity lunges again immediately. Instinctively, Pilot's hands grab the bent rifle by the barrel, swinging it out at a wide arc at the creature's long, tubular head that moves forward at the same time as both of its arms, trying to grapple him with all of its gelatinous, soft body at once. The stock of the weapon cracks, and flesh bursts, as he strikes against the meaty, worm-like protrusion and knocks it sideways. In that second, the monster's entire upper body distorts and swings that way from the momentum of the impact as a ripple moves through it. Pilot's hands let go of the battered rifle, instinctively reaching down for his sidearm. His hands grab nothing. Shit. He knows that he gave his pistol to caretaker, but his muscle memory betrayed him. A long, fleshy hand shoots back forward grabbing Pilot's arm and tightening around it as the monster turns to look at him, its long, wormy neck shooting toward his face. In that second, Pilot's other hand has already pulled out his survival knife, and he plunges it through the creature's wrist from the bottom, cutting sideways with one pull, the blade moving cleanly through the meat and sinew as a second later his black combat brute kicks into the side of the creature's leg, he expects it to buckle, but it has no knee, the appendage just shifts somewhat bending unnaturally in the middle. In that same movement, Pilot drops down, ducking and rolling between its legs as the large monster's other hand and its head fly over his face, intending to grab for his neck, only missing by a hair's breadth. The knife cuts in through the sides of a boneless leg, the half-flayed hand that is still trying to hold onto him ripping off and flopping down to the forest grass beneath the monster as Pilot pulls the arm down through with him, using the momentum of his drop to escape. The man quickly rises to his feet behind the monster and turns around, holding the dirtied knife ready in a fighting stance, preparing himself for another bout. The unmasked girl lies behind him. The fighting slows for a moment as the gelatinous creature very slowly, in contrast to its prior assault, lowers its long, wormy head to look down at its own severed hand and then continues lowering its torso downward until it is bent over fully forward at the waist, almost perfectly perpendicular to its own legs. Its long, cylindrical head looks down through its knees and behind itself at Pilot with its one, singular, glowing yellow eye. Pilot watches as the elongated, tubular head with the eye on top opens at its end. All around the edges of the single eye, which appears to be on a central stalk, the edges around it pull open in a perfect circle to reveal many rows of sharp, triangular teeth. 
with its feet facing forward and its torso, head, and arms looking back at him from down between its own legs. It screams and runs at him, caretaker, dash, level, 12, dryad, caretaker holds the pistol in her shaking hands exactly like she's seen pilot hold it, the tremor is still felt within her body, it was so loud and thorough as it moved through her from head to toe, pilot, yells caretaker back out into the forest, the dryad having heard the crack of his rifle from nearby, she grits her teeth, hissing as she looks ahead of herself, I want to die, says a dreary voice, the undead elf, her body, distorted, warped, and broken, continues to change as it further reveals itself as the unnatural horror that it is, her broken, burnt corpse lies there on the forest floor within a circle of ash, twitching and spasming and never fully vanishing from the world, her head has lifted itself up to look at caretaker, and then it has lifted itself up some more, and then some more, the elf's spine pulls free from her upper back, more and more vertebra appearing every second as she rises up like a snake slithering out of the hole that was between her shoulders, until eventually the neck is longer than the body it comes out of. Attached to its end is a somber, sorrowful face that regrows again and again, hiding the marks of fire. Now, it looks at her, the single burning hole in the middle of its skull regenerating and sealing itself back closed, the embers in its center dying out. Pilot's pistol had released fire from itself like from the hands of a witch, I want to die, I told you, I told you, says the elf, tears streaming down her face from her burnt out eyes, I told you, yells the undead, the head lashing out toward her, brittle hair trailing behind it, the undead monstrosity is flung to the side as a kite shield bashes into its face, knocking it off course and sending it flying into a tree, I want to die, your grace, calls Storb, standing in front of caretaker, get out of here, yells the dark elf, hissing as she looks down at her boot, the elf's broken, charred corpse has begun extending its arms and legs out exactly the same as its neck, unnatural growths of bone sprout out, pressing free from the flesh one after the other, like crusted splinters bursting out of an old wound, Storb cracks down with the shield, slamming its sharpened edge through the wrist of the hand holding her, go, shouts Storb, Violina, I won't leave you here, screams caretaker, casting a spell with her free hand to try and bind the monster on it, yells Violina, a fireball already flying through the air toward the somber face that slowly begins to return to them, its features vanish as the undead elf opens her mouth, her freshly regenerated eyes melting from her features as crossbow bolts fly through the air toward anything and everything as the monster's legs and free arm begin to push its unchanged torso off of the ground, raising it high like a three-legged spider. The body rises, the burning, smoldering face regenerating as it begins to look at them. This is your fault, I told you to let me die, says the elf, her face shooting far too quickly to stop towards Storb, who is still half kneeling down, stopping an inch from her face. I told you to let me die. Storb's terrified eyes look up, staring at the hollow sockets inches from her. This is your fault whispers the undead elf, there's a disgusting cracking noise as Storb tumbles, flying across the forest and slamming unnaturally into a tree as a long, whipping appendage strikes out, Storb, yells Violina as the undead turns its head, looking at caretaker, this is your fault, says the undead, looking at her, caretaker pulls the trigger again, pilot, dash, level, 32, human, gunfire cries from the east, pilot weaves, ducking under a swiping arm and grabbing at the joint, ignoring his instinct to throw the creature over his shoulder, as it has no stiff limbs to manipulate, and instead cutting through the flesh, his knife presses in through the elbow area, ripping sideways out toward the wrist at an angle, another hand grabs his jacket, the long, wormy head with one eye screaming, flailing, and flopping around as it presses towards his mouth, close enough for him to smell as it tries to enter his body. Pilot's free hand grabs the tubular neck, squeezing down on it. The monster screams, a circular row of teeth like a lamprey gnashing as it tries to latch onto him, deciding to make a hole of its own to crawl in through if it can't reach his face. The knife stabs into the neck as it pulls back, the man losing his blade as it gets stuck in the flesh as the creature stumbles and screams, writhing in the night. He dives, grabbing his rifle and rolling aiming as he inserts a fresh magazine from his pockets. Pilot, has used, equipment repair, 
he pulls the trigger, emptying the rifle out immediately with five shots toward the monster's chest. The incendiary rounds flying through its mass and into the forest that has already started burning. He drops the magazine, pulls out another one, inserts it, and fires again, putting five more burning holes into the creature that just doesn't seem to stop. Its mutilated body, missing a hand, its other arm severed down lengthwise and flopping as it moves on a cut leg, the knife pressed into its neck, it all gets ignored as it screams and drops down again charging at him on all fours like an attacking, rapid dog that isn't aware of its own pain in its frenzy. He inserts a fresh magazine, firing another five shots in quick succession, the bullets flying through the monster from top to base, piercing all the way through and not bothering it in the least. The mass of flesh ripples and quivers as it runs as the burning projectiles press through them, leaving clearly cauterized tunnels in its body. It's not running to him. Pilot looks to the side, diving at the same time as it. As it leaps toward the body of the unmasked person that it hopes to possess once again in order to recollect itself. Caretaker, dash, level, 12, dryad. The man screams violently, his guttural cries filling the night as he kicks and flails, his hands gripping the elongated hand that has a hold of his chest, as the other hand of the undead has his legs in its grasp both of which have been pulled apart up in the air. His entrails flop out of him, sloshing toward the ground in a steaming pile of slop and bile as he cries like an animal, making sounds that the night in the valley has never heard before as the monster's face looks at him and then turns back toward the others as crossbow bolts and fire continue to fly at it. Roots and vines bind the creature, but it only breaks one after the other as it simply moves on, ignoring them as much as it ignores the flames. I told you to let me says the undead, dropping what's left of the man as she turns back to caretaker, who is channeling her magic into trying to restrain the monster, but she just isn't strong enough, nothing she does is strong enough, hey, yells Violina as the creature grabs onto a tree with one limb, wrapping it around the trunk like a rope, and simply unroots the entire thing with one unfathomably strong tug. Die says the undead simply. The monster swings its arm out, the uprooted tree plowing through Violina and the crossbowmen, causing them to vanish under a cudgel of bark. Green and red sprays everywhere as the forest smeared with gore. Everything in Caretaker tells her to run, her animal instincts tell her to run, the voices of everyone who have now fallen silent tell her to run, the thrashing of her heart screams at her to run, but instead, she stands there, her hands still held out, the emptied pistol down on the ground. She's going to die. She's never going to see Pilot again before she can. A fist cracks into her face. Caretaker stumbles back, falling onto the ground and clutching her nose as a wet crack runs through her skull, reverberating as blood runs down her face. Run, idiot! yells Storb, barely standing there as a living thing and holding her shield out as the undead cracks into it, sending her flying a second time her broken body tumbling over itself. Caretaker screams, holding her hands out and casting another spell. She's not going to run. She's not going to be somewhere else when people die, like she was with her sister. She won't. She won't just be somewhere else in the forest while people are mutilated when she could have stopped it. The spell blasts out of her hands, wildfire and debris crashing against the monster that moves toward her anew, pelting its indifferent somber face as it slowly slides toward her through the air. Caretaker has used, wild gale. I want to die, moans the elf as she's pelted, the gristle and fat of her body continuously burning and regenerating anew. Pilot, dash, level, 32. Human pilot lies on his back, the masked child beneath him, as his hands hold the flailing, slobbering thing away from them. His knees are thrust into its soft stomach as it lashes, indifferent to its wounds as it fights to get back into a place where it can't be so easily hurt. Soft, powerful limbs whip and slash at him, striking against his body with crushing force. Glass crunches beneath his back, the flasks on the stranger's too large belt breaking beneath their weight crushing down on her. The monster is silhouetted by the massive, yellow moon that glows with vivid light. Its long neck is stretched downward flopping and flailing as it tries to force itself into a mouth. Pilot forces its head to the side, yanking out his stuck knife from it and slicing down toward its chest cavity. Feeling below himself with his free hand, he yanks a bottle from the belt attached to the body that crushing into the damp soil and shoves it into the fleshy gap. 
the yellow shine of the explosive potion intermingles with the light of the haunting knight as he kicks his legs as hard as he can and sends the monster flying off of himself a little further back. In that same instant, Pilot reaches to the side, grabbing the survival rifle and sliding in his last magazine as he aims. The goddamn thing's too close, the explosive potion's radius is too large for the small distance, he's fucked, something moves below him, unable to stir because of his weight pressing down on her body. She's still alive, then his body will shield her from the explosion, at least if he survives this. He's going to take a long leak all over the world tree. What exactly does he believe in? That question comes to him once more, the question that was posed to him when this all began, when the world tree spoke to him in the other world over the Kestrel's radio. He believes in the only thing that matters to a man like him. Killing, says Pilot the Knight, finally giving the tree itself his answer, looking not down his sights but at the silhouette of the Titan on the horizon as he pulls the trigger as the monster lunges anew toward them. It is the natural order, it is all he knows, it is his sole purpose as an animal to remove everything that is a threat, a single crack more fills the night, a single bullet hurtling forward as so many things move at once, the blazing projectile flying dead into center mass, into the glowing explosive potion inside of the monster's chest. The forest glade erupts with an explosion, a fireball cascading clear of the forest canopy. Caretaker, dash, level, 12, dryad, the world roars, a pulse of wild magic streams through the night, the forest shaking and bowing its crown, trees crack and break as a forceful wind comes from pilot's direction, with her free hand, caretaker holds her palm against the elf's rotting face, pressing against it as a vivid green light shines out, leaves flying around the glade, caretaker, has used, heal, why, asks the undead, the other half of the hand too, as its skull cracks open once more, a festering glow taking hold inside of it. Why didn't you just let me die? Caretaker's other hand is wrapped around the elongated spinal cord, and the elf's face is inches from hers, which suddenly stops speaking, moving, and twitching. The expression on her sorrowful face changes, twitching for only a second before changing. I protect life, replies Caretaker. All of it, that is her duty. That is her purpose as a caretaker and dryad of the valley. She heals, she nurtures, she guards. I didn't want it, says the elf. A black grime leaks out of her eyes. I know, is all that caretaker can reply with. Having no stronger words than those. The elf falls apart, the elongated limbs, the torso, the neck, and the skull touching caretaker's hands all turn into dust as the fire that has consumed the body a hundred times over finally wins out. It's over. Caretaker steps back, looking around herself and gasping for air as the tension begins to exit her chest. Her eyes registering everything as it slowly comes into focus as the monster begins to die off. She looks at the smears, at the organs, at the viscera, the shit, the bile, the blood, the ripped out arms, and the crushed knees and legs. She looks at the fractured teeth lying in the grass and collecting moonlight and the ripped out half of a jawbone of a man who had it stolen from him while he was still alive. She watches as the worms and the bugs and the roots and everything else in the valley come and eat and gorge, and she keels over and vomits profusely. And then the bugs come for that too. Caretaker crawls through the filth, rising back to her feet, retching a few more times as she stumbles and moves. She knows that she can't stop now, she can hear them. The wounded, the mangled, they need help, she needs to help them. She needs to find Pilot, the night isn't over yet. Invasion defeated. The invasion is over. Wave 2 has been repelled, the Prime Hand 2, has been slain by, Pilot, and, Caretaker. Time remaining until next invasion, 23 days, 2359 hours. The battle is over. Prime Hand 2, X1, Undead, X16484, plus 61073 EXP, plus Tilda, level up, Tilda plus. Caretaker, has leveled up to level, 36, it's not going to be over for a long time, in fact, it feels like it might not truly ever end, 3, Chapter 26, Hold, Caretaker, Dash, Level, 36, Dryad. Gossamer blossoms float through the sky, carried by soft winds, together with many flush streaks of yellow pollen that gently weave and float, 
The wind is almost dancing beneath the rays of the warm sun as the cold air above the lake and the heat of the good day intermingle and create naturally chaotic drafts around the valley. The trees shake and rustle their boughs and leaves, the titanous world tree sitting there as the almost midday sun floats behind it. The valley is in a state of beauty. Birds preen themselves on the high branches, watching as children play and run along the shore of the lake, out of which fish jump and leap, splashing as they try to catch the sunspots on the water's surface. The grown people of the valley once again find themselves in a dreamlike state, wandering and moving through the day, looking at each other with vague, few glances as if unsure if the others were real. The first defense of the valley was a success. The first wave was a slaughter, with the undead having no chance to come near the initial defenses. The second wave came close. The east was secure from it as the floodgate inside the wall was opened, releasing a new bath of fuel into the cauldron below it, which continued the blaze and secured the flank. The north, however, was almost overrun. With the western valley sealed, the monsters were undiluted and concentrated in two groups on that one flank almost breaking it down. The arrows, the bolts, the potions, everything was fired and spent, every last single rock that could be thrown was thrown, and every concoction that could be drunk to let a few casters throw a few more spells was consumed, there was absolutely nothing left, the fortified wall held, but only barely. On the exterior defenses, not a single person died, the same cannot be said for the interior. There, many things died. A near dozen men who she stole from the wall and led to their graves. Storb and Violina are alive, but they're not in good shape. It's not certain that they'll survive. Even with all of her advanced healing spells and medicine, the body of an organism can only withstand so much crushing and breaking before it simply reaches an irreparable state. Caretaker yelps in surprise, shaking her hand out as she pinches her finger in the sharp metal of the open hatch. The dryad sticks the side of her finger into her mouth, sucking on it and tasting a hint of blood as she looks at the kestrel. Shaking out her hand, she rolls her shoulders and reaches inside the large machine with both hands, grabbing hold of a heavy, green metal rectangle by the handle on its side. Caretaker puts her back into it, sliding out the heavy ammunition canister for the plane, one of them, at least, she barely manages to hold onto it as it drops, despite both of her hands grasping it. The locked box that is too heavy for her to carry falls into the sands of the lake shore, its contents jangling. She wipes the sweat from her brow, grabbing one handle with both hands and straining herself to pull it onto the little wooden sled she has. Caretaker hoists the rope over her shoulder and begins pulling it away from the shore and toward the forest, where all of the other boxes like this one are stored. Once she's finished. She returns back for the second one, harvesting that too. Caretakers trains herself, holding pilot's knife, as she presses it deep into the carcass. Then, after a moment of struggle, she pulls the knife out and rolls the corpse down into the cauldron. It is unnatural for bodies to be moved after their deaths. It is wrong for a dryad to engage in this sort of behavior. Caretaker looks at the undead corpses nearby, moving on to the next one, with an expressionless face. She stabs the knife into it, black, oozing monster blood leaking out over her fingers, spraying onto her dress as she pulls the blade out again, then, pursing her lips and pressing as hard as she can, she rolls the next corpse down into the cauldron, watching it flop and tumble downhill as it joins the many others in the festering pit and pile of ash and sludge. After a few more, she grabs a bucket and climbs down into the hole herself, walking carefully past any marked landmines as she scoops up as much of the ooze as she can, shoveling some of the corpse slop into her container with her forearm, as she quietly rises to her feet and begins to trudge back uphill, carrying it with both of her arms, struggling and slipping as she fights her way back up, to bring this to the kestrel. Caretaker sits with crossed legs out on the ledge, looking out from atop the hill on which the world tree sits. The valley is full of movement, with smoke and fire rising from the camps of the survivors as they live their days, as they rest, grow, and prosper. She looks back down at the fettered, mouse grey jacket on her lap and continues to work, mending it as best she can with a needle of bone and threads of spun, soft world tree bark. It's shredded, the material is frayed and covered in burns, tears, scratches, and ash. Dark splotches of blood and fire cover it inside and out. There's hardly much left to sew together. The dryad looks at it, not really sure what she's doing, 
Honestly, the fabric work, the spinning, and all that were done by her elder sisters, she only knows what she knows from watching them work. Caretaker pricks herself with a needle, hissing through her teeth as she continues to dry. Caretaker mixes the salves in a bowl, taking a second to close her eyes, the exhaustion getting to her for a moment. The invasion was only last night, she hasn't slept at all. How could she? She doesn't really know what exactly happened that night. While she was fighting the Hantu's spiritual manifestation, Pilot seems to have been dealing with the other half, of which there was no sign when she finally found him, surrounded by a nest of cinders and blood, with some masked child there sitting over him, who ran away as soon as she approached. The dryad shakes her head, jolting awake as she continues her work, grinding everything into a paste before rising to her feet and walking over to the bed looking down at Pilot, who is there, resting. Sitting down on the side of the bed, she reaches over and gently peels off the bandages and begins dabbing the fresh medicine onto his wounds. When they first met, when she pulled him back to the den from his plane, Pilot was a mess. He had cuts, broken bones, and burns. But this time, it might be worse. She's not sure. Or maybe she's just paying more attention now than before. Back when he was only just some oddity that landed in her lake. Caretaker closes her eyes, the night flashing in front of her face again and again, the visions of the monster, of the dead, of the dismemberment and gore, and the sheer brutality of it. Her hands are still shaking, even now. They won't stop, the dryad looks down, lifting her fingers off of him, which were carelessly smearing the medicine around outside of the burns. She's been doing his work all day just because. She needs to do something. She needs to keep busy. She doesn't want to just sit here and think about it all. It's just too much. She's not ready to deal with it just yet. Caretaker reaches back into the bowl with her shaking hand, grabbing too large a globule, and then drops the bowl, fussing to herself as it clatters across the room, making a mess all across the floor. She ignores it because she knows that if she focuses on it right now, she's going to explode. She's just going to jump up and scream and kick everything, pick things up, and throw them. She's going to hit the walls, tear the tapestries, snap, bark, and scream like an angry animal. She just feels it inside of her, but she's too tired. Everything twisted, angry, scared, and confused that she's feeling about herself and about life is simply suffocated by a deep heavy exhaustion that has come from the long since settled adrenaline and her lack of sleep. Caretaker pulls herself together, sitting straight and pulling her shoulders back. She'll be fine. The dryad returns to her work with what she has, looking back at him as she applies the salve to his face, her arm stopping as his hand shoots up and grabs her wrist. Pilot! shouts Caretaker in surprise. Pilot opens his eyes, looking at her and then around the room slowly resting his head back down as she forces it there with her free hand. Caretaker, winces the man, looking at her as she tightly purses her lips. The two of them stare at one another for a while. We need to stop meeting this way, remarks Pilot, letting go of her wrist and closing his eyes. The dryad's hand slaps against his chest, resting there as the globule of medicinal self sticks between her palm and his body. Then stop causing me trouble. She yells already knowing that it is unfair to say as she says it, but everything in her hurts in ways she doesn't understand or know what to do with, and so instead, she sits there and feels like she's doing a good job at not crying until she sees the medicine diluting and the supple redness on his skin where her fingers are. Sorry, is all that Pilot says, which makes her angry because she wanted to say it. His left hand grabs the side of her stomach, and his right grabs her hand on his chest and he just pulls her whole body down and holds her against him, possibly in an attempt to restrain her or possibly in what someone might call a particularly militant hug. Caretaker lays there over him, the medicine smearing between them as his hands rub her back, lying there and crying herself empty. She closes her eyes tightly, burying her embarrassment in the blanket. Eventually, despite not being aware of it happening, she falls to sleep there, at whatever awkward, weird angle she is at as two palms rest on her back and keep her there for a time long enough so that whatever darkness she slips into is total and absolute, free of any dreams, nightmares, or otherwise. Pilot, dash, level, 59, human, plus tilde, level up, tilde plus. Pilot, has leveled up to level, 59, you have, 27, new abilities. New ability, 
aviation, high altitude training. Passive Given your body's conditioning to extreme exertion in high altitude environments, you have become hyper efficient at blood pressure regulation, capillary flow, and protein synthesis in situations of duress. All negative physical status effects have a reduced efficacy of 25%. All negative physical status effects heal 50% quicker. New ability, dash, aviation, explosive munitions, toggle, cost, 08, so, minute. By coating the inside of the barrels of the Kestrel's curtains under machine guns, all fired projectiles can be covered with a volatile, superheated monster blood coating on release. This augmented ammunition explodes violently on impact inflicting severe trauma on anything within the explosion radius. This ammunition is extremely effective against armored targets. New ability. Munitions. Dothamper. Passive. During nighttime, allows you to manifest an unusually potent silencer on your survival rifle, in addition to a vision-enhancing optic sight. Pilot lays there, rubbing caretaker's back as he stares toward the ceiling and the single root of the world tree above, feeling the pain running all throughout his body. She looks like she's a little shell-shocked from whatever happened in her part of the forest. He's seen this happen before, back when he was an infantryman. Some people just crack after periods of pressure, to varying degrees. It's to be expected when you're sitting in a muddy hole being bombed with planes flying over your head and tanks rolling over your friends. Some crack and become volatile, some just become quiet. The man silently lifts his head, looking at her as she lays there on his chest. Her antlers coming dangerously close to poking out his eyes. Her hair is covered in ash and soot. Pilot lays his head back down. He survived. God only knows how. But here he is. All sorts of things feel broken inside of him, and his outside feels like a peeled orange. There's tinnitus in his ears. The skin on his forearms feels like it isn't quite there anymore. Outside of the den, he can hear crickets chirping and singing their night song coming together with the sparse calls of a few various nightbirds. Now that the cracking of gunfire and the ringing of explosions have come to an end all around the valley, they survived, but the next invasion is already on its way, and the coming attacks will only continue to get stronger and the monsters more cunning and clever, they need to up the ante, this one was messy, he can't risk this sort of development happening a second time, he needs more men, more structure, more landmines, bombs, chlorine gas, and more guns. But first, he needs to get some sleep. Pilot closes his eyes, moving one hand to the back of her head and leaving the other on her back, and falls asleep as his body crashes back down to its recovery state. Sometime during the night, caretaker crawls up the rest of the way off of the side of the bed, over him, and squishes herself between him and the wall. He only notices it, waking for a brief moment because of the light whistling of her breath below his ear as she rests her head on his shoulder. The constant whistling reminds him of the sound of falling artillery. Pilot returns to sleep, dreaming of his favorite place to be, the place that this world is starting to resemble a little more every day thanks to his and her efforts, the war that never ends. 2. Chapter 27, Arrive. Shtil, Dash, Level, 23. Elf, Hammers and Saws are at work and the people of the valley are laughing and talking amongst themselves now that the night has come and gone. The dawn of the new day brings with it a washing light that removes all of the stains and scourges of the nightmares that have come before, as, for the first time in a long time, a rekindling sense of hope returns to the hearts of the many. Like flocking birds returning to their old roosts from winter, tender and excited voices come from near the trees of the valley as the survivors talk, live, and do the unthinkable plan for the future. Discussions of such concepts as next week, next month, and so on have become things that simply have not happened ever since the invasions began. And as a result of this, the people are doing something that she absolutely despises. They're planning a festival and a celebration. Till the elf librarian sits there in the shadow of a tree, reading a book on the subject of breeding and keeping a very specific species of fish that may or may not no longer exist. It's not that she's particularly interested in the subject, it's just that she loves reading, and of the dozen or so books that survived the destruction of the city, she's read this one the least often. During the invasion, she was helping with logistics, but she wasn't too useful. She's not really the biggest, strongest, or fastest person, 
Her stature is diminutive, and her personality is essentially the same. She's just glad that's all over with so she can get back to her reading. While it was certainly an interesting night, she's more than content to not be a part of any night or day. She just wants to live in her stories. Chapter 4 The Seasonal Migration Patterns of Orange Scaled Sea Drifters, mutters Shtil, reading to herself and raising her own voice as all of a sudden the people of the valley erupt into cheers and a few claps. Her mind tells her that this means that somebody arrived, likely that pilot man or the dryad, both of whom have been scarce since the invasion. She lifts the book up higher, practically burying her nose in the center of it as she smells the paper, and reads on for a while as people talk and work and make quite the fuss. So annoying. Still hates people, they're so loud, noisy, and bothersome. She doesn't mind when they're around, as long as they're quiet and somewhat further away, acting as a sort of ambient visual noise that fills the world. But when they start talking, asking questions, and touching her books, that's when they get on her nerves. She'd consider going deeper into the forest to read alone there, but she doesn't want to take her books too far away from shelter, lest it start raining while she's an hour away from the nearest roof. So here she is, on the outskirts of the settlement, but not really a way away from it. This is about as good as it will get until society somehow manages to reform and rebuild a library, ideally without her having to get involved to make them do so. She's never been good with people. But really? That's just because people have never been good with her. She and them are just incompatible beings, really. Sea drifters will follow the currents westward, never swimming but always being carried by the tide, she mutters, picturing the image of a wide, flat, finless fish in her head that simply floats through the ocean like a bright sphere of sunlight. As she does that, she imagines how they live and survive, how they avoid predators, and what it would be like to be one of them. She eventually falls into a whole pit of imaginations that lead from one to the other, until she is as far away from the unusually dry book she's reading as she actually is from the real ocean. A voice interrupts her process, tearing her out of her fantasy and bringing her back to the place that she hates the most. Still quickly slaps the book shut, looking up but pulling her lifted hood down low at the same time. Are you the librarian? asks a voice with an accent. Still looks at his legs and his scuffed black boots recognizing the man as being pilot without looking up at his face. She guessed correctly, that's what all the commotion was about. I won't waive your late fees, she replies, the instinctual response having been imprinted deep into her core after years of the work. I mean, yes, replies Still. I mean, no. She amends, realizing that if she affirms the question, he'll want something from her. No, I'm not. The man lets out a puzzled sound, looking around judging by the shifting of his legs, and then pulls something out from a woven bag. I need your help, he explains. Still pulls down tighter on her hood, hoping that if she does it hard enough, she'll crush herself into the ground and vanish. There is a rustling of paper, which immediately causes her to stop. Her eyes looking up as something flutters next to her. Still looks at the book that isn't hers. She doesn't recognize it at all. It's small, only about the size of a man's palm, but very thick. It's covered in smears and soot, and it looks well ignored and forgotten, like many of the best books in any library. Will you trade? He asks, his accent pulling through as she rips the book from his hands immediately, examining it with the A's of Robin admiring its eggs. She's never seen this one before, it's so unusual. The paper, what kind of paper is this? Her fingers run over the texture of it, and then she turns it over looking at the binding. Such professional work. This was made by a master binder at the minimum. The stitching is so tight and perfect. The printing of the letters. They're so uniform. Still opens it, looking inside at the words and the images she doesn't understand at all. They're in a foreign language. Normal quality vehicle manual. Kestrel. A vehicle manual detailing the specifications and functionality of the JFZ09 Kestrel, as well as its individual component layouts, possible configurations, and basic troubleshooting procedures. Weight, 1.29 kilograms. Value. She flips through the unusually thin pages, looking at the masterfully drawn images and depictions of what she recognizes as the great black bird that sits by the lakeside, showing it from many angles and poses, as well as its insides. This is akin to a Master Dragon Slayer's field manual in her eyes, it is a fantastic item, she never thought she'd ever see anything like this, 
she can spend days reading this, even if she can't understand a single word here. Still lifts her gaze, looking up at the man kneeling next to her. What do you want? She asks, clutching the new book that isn't officially hers yet against her chest with both arms, eyeing him warily and expecting him to recoil as everyone does when they finally see her face outside from between the dark and dim shelves of the library. I need you to write, he replies, his expression not changing even a little as she looks up at him, her cut ears and scarred body clearly visible. He taps the book like this, explains the man. I need. He stops, thinking for a moment. She blinks, watching as he turns his head to the side, thinking about the words for a moment. Instructions, he explains, finding a suitable word and looking back at her. Still drops her gaze immediately as soon as he makes eye contact, hiding below her hood. Instructions for what? Asks the librarian as the man rises to his feet again, bracing himself against the tree as he is apparently injured. War, replies Pilot, not needing long to find this word. The elf sits there clutching the new book, as she thinks for a moment and then nods, not lifting her head. She doesn't really understand what he wants, other than for her to write some texts. She can manage that, it's a good trade, she really wants this book. Okay, agrees the librarian. I accept, pilot, dash, level, 59. Human pilot walks very slowly to the lake, knowing already what he's going to find when he gets there. Honestly. He's surprised that he survived the explosive potions blast. It was so close range that any reasonable fragmentation grenade would have killed him for certain. The potions have quite a kick, he would have expected the same of them. And yet, he's here. Sure, his ribs feel broken, his lungs feel like they've been cooked, his face is red and a little blistered, his hands are severely burned, just the same as his jacket. But honestly, as far as war injuries go, he got off easy. The man eyes the world tree warily as he almost limps his way back to the kestrel. He just doesn't know much about this place, does he? Was it just happenstance that saved him? Or was it some greater force that was on his side? Pilot, says a stern, annoyed, and angry voice. Pilot looks ahead of himself at caretaker, who is standing by the kestrel with arms crossed tightly enough to suffocate him if he got trapped in them. Her foot is tapping the ground, and her eyes are narrowed. No barks the dryad at him. Pilot lifts his hands in surrender. He's not supposed to be out of bed, you're not supposed to be out of bed. She snaps at him, her words aligning with his thoughts. Why are you like this? Asks caretaker, letting go of herself and gesturing toward him. Pilot blinks, shaking his head. Now that he thinks about it, he's sure that this is exactly what she was saying when he first arrived, before he started to understand the language. Sorry caretaker, says Pilot, letting his hand fall onto her shoulder before he limps to the kestrel, crawling underneath it. The man thinks about his words for a while. I needed help, he explains. Caretaker fusses with him, speaking of quite a few things as he ducks down, prying and messing with the kestrel's mounted ordinances. He doesn't understand all of what she says, but a little bit of it comes through. You can just ask me, says the dryad, trying to get under the plane to him. Her antlers donk against the plane's fuselage, and she lets out a frustrated cry, pulling back a second and tilting her head to lean down below next to him under the kestrel. Her glare loses a lot of its potential terrifying potency, given that her head is tilted at a full 90 degree angle. I will, says Pilot, working to release one of the kestrel's guns. He pulls it free after unspinning a few more bolts and opening a few more panels. He holds the curtains and a machine gun in his arms, sets it down on an ammunition canister, and then sets to work on dismounting the other one too. The thing is that this was a bit of a personal project. He had a revelation during the night. He's not sure what it was caused by, if it was the smell of caretaker's hair or the memory of the strange monster he blew to hell, but something made his dreams wild last night. What? asks caretaker, looking away. Pilot shakes his head, returning to his work. He had been staring at her for a moment now. The man dismounts the Kestrel's second machine gun, setting it down next to the other. Give me that, please, says Pilot, formulating his request after a moment of thought. His arm is pointing to a canister full of goblin beads and other monster bits and pieces that have been broken down into raw materials. He uses the old ammunition canisters for this sometimes, 
others he gives to the settlers to melt down into metal for whatever uses they might find for them. Caretaker pulls the box over, opening it. Thank you, says Pilot, holding his hands against the kestrel. Pilot, has used, replace component, medium, replaced, curtains under machine gun, X2. Pilot watches as the kestrel regenerates, repairing itself just like it does when he patches up damage to its body. Except now, one after the other, the plane's mounted machine guns reappear, collecting together out of the glow of condensed light as they manifest together. The man smiles, looking down at the two old guns and then back at the two new ones, the weapons having been doubled, he might come to love magic after all. This is why he needs the librarian. She'll be in charge of creating written documentation for the use and maintenance of weapons, field tactics, and battle plans, anything relating to the art of war. He'll have her write down and file. They'll create a library dedicated to the topic of war, so that when the valley inevitably grows and other refugees finally make their way here, the burden of educating and training them to man the defenses will be reduced. But it's more than that. In war, people die all the time, so he needs documentation on everything. The carpenters who know how to make water wheels and fortifications, he needs those processes mapped out and drawn. The Fletchers and their processes of error making, the Smiths and their methodology of refining ore, the alchemists and their tools used to extract chemicals from raw materials, every precious bit of knowledge that they hold can be lost at any moment during an invasion. They need it all to be preserved, with manpower being so limited, every death is more than the death of an individual. It is the loss of critical knowledge that the war machine needs to run. All of this obscure knowledge that people carry with them about their trades that only someone who has dedicated their life to the specialization of their craft could ever know is as vital to the war effort as every bullet he has to fire. Plus there are so many children left amongst the survivors of the North. The value that the processes of reading and writing will bring to their education is critical. Reading and writing are as important to the war effort of the future as the manufacturing of arms. These two abilities skyrocket effectiveness in and of battlefield. Pilot moves out from under the kestrel, stacking both harvested machine guns together and straining himself to hoist them over his shoulders. This is his next big move. Just like the ammunition could be harvested every day through its automatic regeneration, the plane components can be duplicated as well, as long as he has the raw materials for them. He can imagine it now, a thousand machine guns, a nest on every cliffside a bunker on every hill, a thousand round a minute machine gun in the hands of every man, woman, and child in the valley. Utopia, Pilot lets out a sharp noise, falling to the ground and clutching his chest as something pops, the weight he placed on his shoulders being far too much for his broken and mending body to sustain. Pilot, yells caretaker, and he recognizes the tone immediately, it's been trained into him like a dog hearing a whistle. The tone is hardly one of concern, more, it is one of annoyance. The man opens an eye, fighting down the ache, no, scolds the dryad, planting her hands on her hips and glaring down at him honestly. She sighs, cradling her forehead in her hand as she closes her eyes for a moment, shaking her head. Caretaker bends down and helps him up, fussing as she wipes him off. You're not getting any new pain medicine until tonight, she explains, with a dry expression. The dryad bends down again, grabbing a machine gun with both arms and grunting as she squats back, hoisting it up off the ground and shoving it into his arms. Pilot clutches the curtains under against his chest, watching as caretaker bends down, struggling as she picks up the second one, going through some effort to carry it by herself. I told you to ask me for help, says caretaker, perhaps accidentally, perhaps not ramming into him sideways as she rises back up to her feet, hoisting the heavy machine gun up like a dead log and carrying it in her arms as she looks at him out of the sides of her eyes. Idiot pilot stands there, watching caretaker walk on ahead without him, carrying the heavy machine gun in her arms as he stands there with his. The sun sets on the horizon, casting a warm orange glow over the waters of the great lake, the warm wind blowing the petals of many flowers, her hair and her row ball in the same direction as Pilot stays there by the kestrel, listening to the sound of the hissing coming from the radio behind him as it plays an indiscernible white noise. Caretaker stops, standing there in the near distance, looking back his way as he remains where he is, trying to understand what it is that's happening here. 
there are things that soldiers from the war that never ends simply aren't permitted to feel by the raw laws of the natural order of their world, as they become liabilities on the battlefield. Emotions, sensations, feelings, and connections that go beyond brotherhood, these get in the way of what needs to get done. They cloud the mind, impair judgment, and cause inability during times of crisis. That is, if the person hasn't become numb to them entirely already, with the foundations of such concepts having been erased by artillery fire and chlorine gas. But here it is nonetheless, crawling and creeping inside his chest as he stares at the woman carrying his machine gun. The smell of petroleum-based corrosion inhibitors carrying off of the weapon together with a tinge of her perfume in the warm spring breeze by the water. Pilot catches up walking next to caretaker as the two of them silently return home together, carrying the guns in their arms as they return to the den and below the secret keeping shadow of the world tree. 2. Chapter 28, Face. Pilot, Dash, Level, 59. Human pilot sits in the forest on a stump, working with a series of tools he's had made by the metal workers as he pulls apart one round after the other emptying out the gunpowder into one container, and then throwing the remaining bullet and casing into another. The metal jangles as it lands in a pile of assorted brass. The man picks out another round, repeating the process. This kind of repetitive work is fine for him. It lets him shut off his perceptions and just go through the motions, allowing his thoughts to wander into deeper territories than they ever could while he's preoccupied creating plans or developing some project. He throws the metal into the container, pulling out another round as he works, separating them one after the other. The rustle of the bushes nearby alerts him to an intruder. He doesn't stir, instead just working as they come closer and then simply walk past him. Pilot drops another casing into the canister, lifting his gaze for a moment as the large, swollen brown bear looks back at him over its shoulder. The two of them stare for a moment and then it just keeps walking on into the forest, and he looks back down, tossing the bullet into the bullet canister and staring at the ground for a time. Having decided on something, Pilot rises to his feet, and dusts his hands, he locks the containers, sets them aside, and looks out into the forest. The man opens his map, studies the valley for a moment, and then closes it again. After that, he limps back to the den. Caretaker is gone. She's out in the settlement tending to her wounded bodyguards. He grabs a bag made out of soft bark, throws a few things in it, and slings it over his shoulder before walking purposefully into the forest. There is a light drizzle. Pilot walks through the woods of the World Tree Valley, scanning the area as he follows his instincts, and breaks off toward the west through the woods. The man follows a creek for a time, walking alongside the babbling, crystal clear waters all around him. Nature's song is held quiet by the rain that he walks through. He stops, bending down to look at something. A trail. The valley is an interesting place in terms of survivability. Crash landing in a forest could mean weeks and the months of hardship before one finally makes it back to civilization again. However, this place here is so flush and abundant with everything that it's almost mind-boggling. If the whole world was like this place, the concept of survival wouldn't even exist. Pilot walks through another clump of berry bushes, sagging so heavily with their load that they almost seem to have been flattened. Fish jump out of the creek, chasing after the few sunspots that manage to shine through across the clouds and bounce over the water's surface. Small game like rabbits and birds hardly even bother running. He's sure that if he crept up slowly, he could catch a hare here with his hands. A full ecosystem that is nearly entirely devoid of the concepts of hunger and predation. He can only imagine that any kids who grow up here are messed up in the head. They'll never learn to load a field howitzer, fire a rifle, or throw a grenade. How is someone supposed to be normal by living in a place like this? It's no wonder that caretaker is a bit unusual. Pilot turns his head, looking into the distance. The creek diverts off with a single, small branch that trickles out into the forest by its lonesome, heading down an inclined slope in a tepid, steady fall. He follows that branch a little while longer and then stops. Halfway between the world tree and the western valley entrance, there is a small, rocky outcrop that the water runs into, almost like a cave. The large trees of the forest come together, pressing tightly all around the area and obscuring it. Apart from the channel that led him here, the water runs off a small ledge, 
splashing into a pool below. Pilot looks, staring at what looks like a nest of sorts. Haphazardly strung blankets and fabrics hang over the stones and many branches, creating a soggy roof. An old wooden crate has been dragged here and sits below the overhang. The inside of it is filled with blankets. He can only imagine it being used as a bed, but for a person, it would be very uncomfortable given the square shape of the crate. Still, if one were so inclined and had the right shape, it would be a warm, windproof place to sleep. All around the hideout light broken glass and half-empty bottles that are still partially full of poison concoctions, as well as potions that had been drunk but that had never actually killed their consumer as was intended. He even recognizes his own mushroom poison, and he's sure there's an old vial of chlorine gas there by the crate. The desperate vying for control when a person has none at all can be a grim thing. It can lead to paths and choices that are simply dead ends but are welcomed, as the choice to go there was a choice that was made actively by oneself. Pilot imagines that while her body had been invaded by the hand too and she was well aware of it, she had tried to take control of the situation. However, some things aren't so easily solved. Sometimes on the front, the man who charges the enemy bunker alone in order to knock on death's door ends up not only surviving his attempt but, to his horrific dismay, captures an entire team of enemy prisoners of war and becomes a hero instead of receiving his wish. The water splashes below him, down below the ledge, and Pilot looks down as someone looks up. He stares, locking eyes with someone familiar, his friend and helper, the young alchemist who was possessed by the boss monster, the Hantu, before and during the second invasion. She is unmasked, kneeling down by the water, and washing some clothes. A violent splashing breaks the silence as she scrambles, turning around and running, crawling out of the basin and sprinting to the makeshift shelter, slipping a few times on the wet, muddy ground, but catching herself on all fours as she escapes like a mouse running from a cat. Reaching the shelter, she turns around panting and looking back his way, her hands gripping a glass bottle from the looted supplies. Pilot reaches back into the bag he borrowed from caretaker, pulling out a few things, and holding them in the air for her to see. Even if she survived poisoning herself with actual, little poison, the survival rations he looted from the Kestrel might just finish the job, honestly. An emergency survival ration supplies one adult man with enough caloric content to sustain himself for one full day. A pilot's standard ration comes in several varieties. The emergency ration, however, is always the same. Supplied are a grain and mineral enriched cereal bar, a compressed square of instant, dried, fortified coffee, water purification tablets, a second bar that is some sort of loaf made out of indistinguishable components to give it a high fat and carbohydrate content, and a single square of chocolate instead of a single bullet, which most would prefer. There are also some attention enhancing pharmaceuticals that he pockets himself. The kid doesn't need these, or she'll be washing laundry and chasing fairies for the next 15 hours. The ration was designed to be sparse in protein as the water situation of a downed pilot is uncertain. Consuming protein requires more work from the body in terms of water processing. This is why most emergency rations feature primarily carbohydrates as their core supply of calories, with fat coming in second. In terms of long-term survival, protein is critical. However, the purpose of an emergency ration is to supply one with enough energy to get out of a bad place immediately. Long-term nutrition advice isn't applicable. A fire burns between them as Pilot pulls open the second ration, emptying its contents onto his lap. He takes the cereal bar and the nutrient bar and breaks them apart with his hands, crumbling them back into the packet. Holding it out into the rain, he lets it fill up with water for a minute and then folds the top closed, shaking it vigorously, before setting it down against the hot stones round the fire. One can eat the rations in any manner usually by simply biting into the bars themselves or dumping everything together into this goo mixture, including the chocolate and the coffee. He did that for his. For this second one, however, he has decided to spare her. Instead simply giving her the square of chocolate to eat as is, she sits there across from him on a heap of blankets with crossed legs, her hood back up, and her mask back on, which he understands all too well. That's why he came here prepared. After all, Pilot motions with his outstretched hand to her. Nobody among the survivors seems to know who she is or anything about her at all. She's just some straggler, 
some random person who survived the invasions and got lost in a mess of it all alone. There are many such children among the survivors, but this one is a bit of a unique case. Cautiously, she reaches over, taking it from him. Neither of them have said a word and neither of them will. Pilot turns the rations over against the hot stones, listening as the first one begins to bubble inside the packet. There is a smell that comes from them that isn't good, but that is certainly, to him, nostalgic. The war that never ends takes people in different ways. Sometimes it takes their lives, sometimes their souls, sometimes their limbs or senses, and sometimes it just takes them as a whole concept of a person, muddying what it means to be an individual until there is nothing left but a confused, empty, lightless husk that wanders the horizons alone unable to connect or bond, always searching for a grave that hasn't actually been dug yet. The war that never ends is eternal, spanning far beyond the fires of the battlefield, and everybody gets taken one way or another. The fire crackles between them as they sit there in silence, listening to the rain fall and the creek babble, listening to the bubbling of the indistinct food and the snapping of the burning wood. The girl with the crude, wooden mask and the man with the visage obscuring flight helmet from the kestrel, both of whom are content to sit there quietly and simply be as entities that are separate from the horror that comes from having a face and an identity. There's a silent crack as she bites into the chocolate beneath her mask. 2. Chapter 29, Sweet. Caretaker, Dash, Level, 36. Dryad. This is becoming a problem. Caretaker stumbles, catching herself on the wall as metal jangles down below her feet. Pilot, barks the dryad. Having been on her way to the table, Pilot looks over to her and then down at the curtains under machine gun that was leaned against the wall, but it must have fallen over. There is a growing stack of them there, together with canisters and canisters of ammunition. He didn't know where else to store them, so they've been here for now. This is too much stuff, she argues, hopping over to the table on one leg and then rubbing her sore foot. He walks over, picking up the gun and leaning it back against the wall his eyes turning to the doorway, which is still unsecured, those damn beads, his plan for a command bunker is well underway in design, the world tree is the central feature of the valley and is reachable from all angles, it would only make sense to keep a sizable weapons depot here, so that their logistics teams can make quick deliveries and adjustments based on the situations that develop, pilot returns to his work, for the next invasion, he wants to outfit the walls with machine guns from the kestrel, He's decided that it's time to teach these people here about firearms, there's a festival they're holding tomorrow, but after that, he's going to grab a few of the soldiers and take them to the range, a heavy machine gun like the Kurtzens under is hardly a great beginner's weapon, but he can't train all of them with just his one pistol alone, and the flare gun he loaned out to one of the defenders for the last invasion, as for his survival rifle, it's been repaired, but it's also not enough. The numbers just work out in favor of the machine guns, he'll have a good twenty at least by the next invasion, he'll have them in place four on each wall, and then the remaining ones scattered throughout the valley's internal firing positions, bunkers, and towers. The people have carriages, and he's also considering a mounted gun platform, two machine guns on a cart pulled by one of those giant birds will be formidable, the invasions tend to spawn further off so a mobile weapons platform could be a fantastic tool for softening their numbers before they even get close to the walls. Seeing that he's lost in thought, caretaker sighs and shakes her head, working on her project that she had been fiddling with on the side for days. It'll take her a while, but she thinks that she'll manage to finish by tonight. Pilot, dash, level, 59. Human, it is early in the morning of the next day. Pilot opens the canopy of the kestrel, stopping as he looks inside. The kestrel's interior has been tampered with, namely, someone seems to have woven a padded covering and cushion for the kestrel's hard, metal seat, they're detailed with simple geometry and patterns, hand-stitched into the pseudo-fabric, which stems from the soft bark of the world tree. Pilot blinks, looking at it and then around the area for a second, climbing in and sitting down, it's soft and doesn't slip along the metal, having been firmly fastened, if the engineers who made the plane saw this, they'd have a collective series of cold sweats and then heart attacks, but honestly, he kind of likes it. Pilot has to imagine that caretaker worked on this for a while, lifting his hand, Pilot grabs the canopy and pulls it shut, staring through the window toward the world tree, as the canopy closes, 
a small disturbance catches his eye, a finger-length string of colorful beads hangs freely from the left side of a small metal strap that spans the canopy, he sits there, looking at them and recognizing them as the one and the same make as the colorful beads that hang over the doorway to the den below the world tree. These modifications are definitely a liability for the combat worthiness of the Kestrel. Pilot starts the engine of the plane but he thinks he prefers it this way. The man leans back against the seat, which today doesn't cut into his back or the bottom of his legs as he sinks into the filled fabric cushions. He puts on his helmet, and the smell of oil and burning blood mingles with a soft smell of flowers. Only ever so lightly, Pilot looks around himself in confusion for a moment before he realizes that the smell is coming from the inside of the helmet. Some perfume has been applied to the interior padding. The plane rolls off across the shore of the lake, rising into the air as he begins to fly his rounds, killing any of the rare straggling goblins that remain from the first invasion and then making a pass over the southern cities to see how they're doing. As he flies across the wastelands for a time, he notices that there are a few odd monsters moving around here and there that don't seem to belong to any wave. They seem like wild, migratory creatures, not in groups. There's always only one here and there. It's hardly worth his effort to swoop down and eliminate every single one of them. They'll just have to keep an eye on the situation for now. It is later that day. Pilot sits in the village, working on some detailed plans together with the elf librarian. Children run around the area, playing as they weave through the people working in preparation for the celebration planned for tomorrow night. Laid out on the table is a curtains and a machine gun that he's brought with him. It's stripped apart into its individual pieces. This is the barrel explains Pilot, pointing to the extended, hollow metal tube and watching her write it down next to the drawing she's made. A barrel? asks the librarian, looking up at him, but only enough to stare at his chest, so that her face is always somewhat hidden by the hood she has on. She points over her shoulder to a stockpile of crates and wooden barrels behind them, like that. Pilot nods and thinks for a moment. It is. He taps the table. The same word, explains the man. She nods, returning to her work on creating documentation for him. He wants papers and guides on everything from guns to bomb making, to the art of manning a defensive position in a downhill area when it's raining, to the advanced logistics required in tight military supply chains. They need a full archive of the names of everyone here amongst the survivors, their ages, professions, and capabilities. Society has to be re-established from the ground up. A man claps him on the back and Pilot looks. The librarian quickly turns away, hiding her face. Pilot, barks the bearded soldier, laughing. There is a smell on his breath. It seems that the people have begun fermenting the many fruits of the valley in order to produce alcohol. You're coming tomorrow, right? Pilot nods, affirms the man, recognizing the soldier as one of the senior members of the surviving guard. He was wounded in the defense. I will. The guard laughs clapping him on the back a few times, before starting in on all manner of small talk that he uses to practice his language skills a little more. The librarian simply works quietly, but far more stiffly now. She doesn't seem like the social type. In truth, neither is he, but this is as much a part of his work as flying the Kestrel is. Clear communication and networking are vital. The guardsman departs eventually, leaving the two of them to their work and the elf relaxes a little more after he has gone. Pilot looks at the dwarven woman, one of the last bakers alive, apparently, nodding, pleased. This is perfect. I've never really seen anything like it, she explains, perplexed herself. But damn my soul if it doesn't smell good. Thank you, says Pilot, looking at the creation that she helped him make. This is perfect. The two finish their exchange. Food as a consumer good has little value here in the valley. Berries and fruits are so abundant. The rivers are overflowing with fish, and the forest is full of game. So as an item of trade, it isn't very good. However, what is exceptionally valuable are unusual commodities. Luxury goods have become rarer than ever. Several people have begun looting the northern city, bringing back things of note to trade and barter with. It's fueled a whole new tier of the primitive economy that's forming here. What nobody has, though is what he has. Pilot gives her several sachets of instant coffee and single chocolate ration squares in exchange for her helping him make this. He's never done anything like this before, so this was certainly a learning experience. Pilot stands outside of the world tree den, 
Having climbed up the hill and looking at it for a time, the giant sits there, as imposing as ever, obscuring his sight of the horizon beyond its massive trunk. The man walks onto the den, finding caretaker inside and working on some trinkets and bangles. She's been spending most of her time tending to Storb and Violina, who were messed up pretty badly during the attack. He's not too sure of the logistics of what happened that night to her squad but she seems to be blaming herself for it. He's seen this happen countless times with infantry squads that ran down the wrong lane or sat in the wrong foxhole. High pilot, greets the dryad as he steps inside, smiling at him and then looking back at her work. A second later, she looks back at him, her nose twitching as she smells the air. She gets up, walking over to him. Her eyes closed as she grabs the edge of his jacket and then sniffs it. Her antlers almost goring his face as she moves her head. Something. Starts caretaker. You smell good, she says, looking up at him and opening her eyes again. He shakes his head, pulling out the small, covered dish that he has in his bag. It's. Ah, uh, not me, he explains, thinking, holding it to her. For you. Caretaker blinks as she looks at him, pointing to herself. He nods as she takes the dish and sets it on the table, curiously opening it and looking inside. Her eyes go wide in curious wonder as the scent intensifies and a soft steam floats into the air. Good quality blueberry chocolate cake, a cake made out of pure ingredients and exotic chocolate, which gives it its dark, muddy color. It is moist, dense, and somewhat fudgy. There are several blueberries in the dough as well as on the garnish above. It has been sprinkled with coarse, large flakes of salt. Weight, 0.3 kilograms. Value, he doesn't know if dryads like this kind of stuff but he wasn't sure what else to make her. Flower wreaths, carvings, and things like that aren't really in his avenue, and they seem kind of benign here, in a place so full of flowers and blossoms. She could make something like that herself, and his attempts would be childish at best in comparison to her own. She seems like quite the crafty individual. Pilot stands there, not sure at first if he managed, but her twitching, practically vibrating short doe's tail and curious oohs and ahs as she examines it closely from many sides excitedly seem to indicate that he did well. What he did not expect, however, was how unusably giddy the chocolate seemed to make her as, after she tried it, her eyes essentially dilated, and she fell into the giggles, latching onto his arm for the rest of the night so tightly that his hand went numb a few times throughout it. In the morning, Neither of them really talk about the fact that she had slept in his bunk the same way as on the night after the invasion. Caretaker helps him carry the other machine guns and ammunition out of the den and into another one, in which nobody lives anymore, so that they're out of the way. Tonight is the night of the festival in the settlement, to celebrate their victory. 4. Chapter 30, Hole. Pilot, Dash, Level, 59. Human, It's so 600 hours, 6 in the morning. It's been a while now, since this all began. Pilot sits next to caretaker. Together on the lake, he had been working on the kestrel, and she had joined him to watch, but he decided to put his work aside for a moment, and now the two of them are there, just sitting by the water where he had crash landed all those many weeks ago. Time is a funny thing, a little over a month and a half ago, he and his plane were getting shredded by .50 caliber bullets as his hand pulled the experimental plane's seance drive into activation, together with its self-destruction mechanism. Now, he's here, he's in another world, speaking chunks of a language he doesn't really know, spearheading the defense of a valley inside of which sits a monumentally impossible, and probably magical, tree, with a girl with deer antlers and a tail. Some things are the same as before, but many things are different, the same as before, he doesn't really have a name, but neither does she. He's pilot, and she's caretaker. The same as before, he's a man who gets trapped inside a screaming metal death trap, firing out thousands of rounds of munitions at Tango, but now they're goblins and zombies instead of other humans. The same as before, he is putting his life on the line day in and day out to kill the enemy. Back then, he was doing it because it was his purpose, his calling. It's what he was bred and raised to do. Pilot turns his head, looking at caretaker as she stares out over the lake, fumbling with her fingers as she stares at the horizon and talks and talks. She was my best friend, adds the dryad, nodding, seeming pretty dry and clinical in her tone. She's been explaining her sisters to him, as best as he understands it. Honestly, 
He doesn't understand most of it, but like a man listening to a broken broadcast from command over the radio, he sits there and listens quietly, trying to piece it all together as she goes on. But even if his goal is the same as before, to kill the enemy, now the motivations are slowly changing. Well, no, it's not that they're changing. It's more like there's an amendment being added to the end of them. The war that never ends is inescapable, in this world or the last, but perhaps in the bringing of this reality to this place, he can also safeguard a few rare remnants of what has been left behind in the transition. Caretaker rubs her wet eyes, looking back at him and finding him already having his head turned her way. She apologizes for getting upset. Pilot shakes his head. He's seen people die. Squadmates. Civilians. War doesn't care whose brother you are or whose sister you are, it doesn't care what patch you have sewn onto your shoulder or how deep your bunker is, it'll come to you one way or another, nobody gets out alive. Pilot reaches out, only just barely starting to grab caretaker's shoulder, but she immediately reacts to his most slight touch by explosively turning toward him, leaning in, and shoving her face into his chest crying into him as she mourns now from the dead who rest now in graves over which the men in black boots like himself march on over toward the future days that await those who remain within the battlefield. It would seem that she has been holding this grief inside for a while. Pilot holds caretaker and lets her cry into his dampening shirt, his hands pressing against her back as he turns his head to avoid her antlers a little. He watches as a harpy splashes down into the lake. It's long sharp talons catching a fish, before it swoops back up into the air with its prize. The fish dies so that the harpy might live, the dead and the living in the war that never ends, are much the same. Nails dig into his skin as something makes an ugly noise. Eleven hundred hours, the river babbles on as people laugh and run around. Hammers strike out as carpenters work, and settlers run around in what remains of some of their best clothes. Given that there are hardly any clothes left barring the hodgepodge of things looted from the city, the people find themselves adapting to the circumstances and, instead of wearing anything like casual clothes or traditional festival outfits, have taken a liking to a new look. The girls surrounding caretaker clap excitedly as the dryad holds her hands out, showing them the vibrantly beautiful floral wreath she's made, the dryad gives it to one of them setting it on her head, and then continues teaching them to produce more from grasses and flowers. Hey, like this? Asks a fairy flying next to him, tugging on his sleeve. Pilot looks back, staring at the object in his hands, made out of the soft bark of the world tree, and nods. It's perfect, replies Pilot. We also got the other stuff. Chimes in a second fairy from behind him her wings buzzing as she flies, latching onto his shoulder from behind and looking over it. Fairies don't hold much value to the concept of personal space. They're very excitable in general, just like you said. Pilot nods, listening to her excitedly buzzing wings. Thank you, normal quality explosive powder propellant case, a cylindrical casing made out of soft bark parchment, filled with explosive powder. Weight, 0.1 kilograms. Value. This is just what he needs, not only for tonight but for the future defense of the valley. Or maybe it's a fence? The concept of taking the fight to the enemy sounds appealing to him, but unfortunately for him, the sky itself is a little hard to burn away. As of now, the man eyes the clouds above his head warily, the leaves of the world tree rustle, sounding like the churning of waves along an ocean shoreline. 1600 hours pilot stands on in the forest with the survival rifle aiming down into the distance with the scope, and then firing. There's a crack as the gun splits the silence in the forest, which then returns a moment later. The glass bottle shatters, the bullet breaking it apart as the, the projectile fires into the tree line behind it, a blue streak cutting through the air. Interesting. Pilot looks down at the masked stranger, his young alchemist acquaintance, who looks up his way. The girl nods, holding up her arms as he hands her the lightweight survival weapon. Here, hold it like this, he says, adjusting her posture after she had done her best to mimic him. He lifts it a little higher. Aim it like this, pilot instructs, and then lifts a finger, gesturing for her to pull when she's ready. She shoots. The bottle remains untouched, the blue streak cutting into the forest. So it does work. New ability. Munitions. 
cryothermic ammunition toggle augments your survival rifle to consume the raw materials of a fired round and produce a nice based projectile that freezes anything it strikes like with his pistol whatever firing mode he sets the weapon to will carry over if he hands the weapon to another person that means he can augment the defender's machine guns with magical rounds too this will be a very powerful tool magic plays a big role in this world he'd be a fool to ignore it she fires again wobbling on her feet but managing the kickback surprisingly well another miss she stops lowering the rifle and looks up at him pilot shakes his head just try again he instructs the girl looks back at the glass bottle sitting on the rocks and aims again firing she misses the trunk of the tree that the bullet hit begins to crackle and freeze over the ice crawling up toward a branch above one shot is left in the five shot magazine she takes it missing the bottle again. But the frozen branch of the tree shatters from the impact, very likely upsetting some squirrels and birds. He's just going to not tell caretaker about this, it's for the best. Nice shot, says pilot, nodding to her. She nods back, their trade is complete. She wanted to shoot the gun, and in exchange, he had some alchemical resources made with what the fairies had collected. She's quite talented in chemical manufacturing processes. 1900 hours. The people roar, cheer, and holler as the celebration begins. The sun is starting to crest on the horizon beyond the valley. A bonfire burns in the center of the settlement, and many survivors have set up booths and stalls all around the area to trade and offer the goods that they've made and plundered. Everyone is running around, dressed in colorful scraps of fabric atop their plundered clothes. Anything to add a little more vividness to them. The women and girls have braided their hair, as seems to be the tradition here, and the men have all gone through extravagant processes of shaving and bathing, taking a good few decades off of many of their faces. Even Pilot, who had been content with shaving with his knife by the lake thus far, had been dragged off and away to the chair by a swarm of fairies and guards, where he was soaked up and shaved clean, with his face sharpened up as is evidenced by caretaker standing there now that he's done, curiously running a finger over his skin. So smooth, she says, poking his cheek. Nice hair, replies Pilot, looking over at her. Caretaker has short, shoulder-length hair to begin with, but they made it work by tying it up into two tight braids that wrap around the base of her antlers. She laughs nervously, touching her head. He's not sure as she speaks, but he thinks she's saying that it feels unusual to have it this way. Pilot looks around the area, watching the many people walking around as music starts to play, which surprises him more than he expects, especially as he hears them begin. It's very different from what he's used to hearing from military marching bands all of his life. He holds his arm out for her, and caretaker takes it as the two of them walk around, enjoying the festivities, moving from booth to booth and trying out all sorts of games and foods together. The baker woman, the dwarf, is making quite a name for herself, it seems, and has industrially made hundreds of small cakes and pastries. She must be quite resourceful to organize this much baking with her limited capabilities here in the settlement. Pilot takes note of that. Caretaker runs around, dragging him after her, barely able to contain her excitement as they move from one stand to the other her giddiness getting the best of her again and again as she yanks him around, seemingly desperate to see everything. The dryad and him are stopped many, many times over the night by people who want to talk, who are excited to meet him or her, who want to ask questions, or who want to share drinks and food. All around the settlement, people let loose and let everything drop. Laughter comes from the river as people jump into the waters after the sun sets. Cheers come from the bonfire area as more kegs of fermented fruit alcohol and plundered beer are brought out. Fairies shoot around the festival area, playing games and pulling tricks on people. Gunfire cracks out from a small booth that he had organized. Pellet rifles, small, single-shot weapons that can fire a single metal bead. He had the craftsman who made his Chugonus make them as prototypes for the production of real rifles. Pilot watches, walking by with caretaker on his arm, as the children playing there take turns to shoot out the heart of a goblin, made out of straw. The two of them stop by the medical tent, where Violina and Storb are sitting, but not alone. Ever since the defense of the valley, the two of them have become sort of local heroes. As caretaker told the story to everyone, they saved her life during the invasion. Currently, they're being pampered by several admirers, 
anything from the festival they're missing out on is brought to them by a lute, cries Violina, clearly drunk, holding out a hand to reach for him in her bed. Pilot waves to her from a distance, it looks like they'll make a recovery. Caretaker's healing magic has become quite advanced after the massive level ups she gained after the last invasion. The festival continues on like this for hours and hours. Well into the night, people laugh, drink, eat, and play. This is exactly what the Valley's defenders need. Morale is a key component of any good practice of warfare. It's almost everything. A single man motivated to lift his rifle and aim it toward the heart of the beast is invaluably more important than a thousand men who don't want to do anything of the sort and people will become motivated not just for their lives, but for the regrowing bonds of society that they had lost before. Later, the two of them sit and watch together as many of the women and girls from the city form a long ring of hands around the bonfire, dancing and skipping around it in turns, before letting others come in from the crowd, and they each throw their wreath into the blaze, one after the other. Caretaker and him are watching in fascination until a girl comes and drags Caretaker out to join the dance and she fearfully looks around, trying to escape but unable to as several hands drag her away and lock her into the spiral. Pilot watches in fascination as they continue onward, dancing around the fire, as the band plays their music on a series of strange instruments he doesn't recognize. Even Caretaker looks like she's starting to have fun as she dances around the blaze. It's almost about that time. He should go. He has to get everything ready. Pilot rises to his feet gesturing to caretaker that he has to go but for her to stay here, he wants her to see this, after all, 2300 hours, 10 minutes before midnight, the kestrel roars to life as he switches the ignition on, the machine vibrating as it wakes from its rest at an unusual hour, the payload is secured, he rises up to close the canopy and stops as something catches his ears, hissing, pilot looks back down at the radio and then at the world tree, warily, the man sits down and picks up the receiver. What do you want? He asks, narrowing his eyes. No response comes, apart from the static white noise. He's sure that the voice he heard back then belonged to the world tree, but it had never spoken again ever since the day he was brought here. Shaking his head, he locks the receiver back into place and grabs the canopy. Pilot, calls caretaker's voice from the distance. It would be impossible to hear above the shrieking of the idle kestrel which is why he's almost certain that it came through the radio he had just put away a second ago. He turns his head, watching as a familiar silhouette comes hurrying down the shore, waving her arms to get his attention. She runs to the plane, panting, gasping for air, and covered in sweat. She must have sprinted all this way. Pilot rubs the back of his head. She's going to miss the show now. There's no way to get back to the settlement in time from here. He turns off the Kestrel's engine, letting the plane fall silent again, the propeller spinning itself out. Caretaker? He asks. Pilot jumps down out of the plane. What's wrong? She looks at him and opens her mouth, but then shakes her head, stopping herself. Nothing. The Dryad looks around the area. The hollering of a crowd can be heard coming from across the lake. She stands there with one arm folded over her lower chest and her right hand pulling on a short, loose strand of hair on the back of her head that didn't make it into a braid. Nothing? She ran after him like the valley was on fire for nothing? Maybe she can see the show from here, but it's no good if she's alone. At least in the settlement. She was surrounded by people, but he has to get up in the air himself. There's no way around it, then. Come on, says Pilot, holding out a hand to help her climb up. He nods to the plane. He'll just take her with him. 2300 hours, two minutes before midnight, the Kestrel rises into the air. Ever since his many level ups, the plane has become much more reasonable in its comfort, noise, and smell. He's even been able to make minuscule modifications with his abilities, such as expanding the canopy somewhat, which most certainly affects the aerodynamics. Weren't you having fun? asks Caretaker, looking back at him. New ability, aviation, silver standard. Passive, the interior dynamics of your plane have been modified to reach a more refined, sleek standard. Open panels have been closed, exposed wires have been coated, gaps have been insulated, there is a significant reduction in noise during flight, as well as a risk of spontaneous combustion. New ability, aviation. Dynamic field modifications. Passive, 
allows you to use a considerable amount of raw materials to alter and reconstruct key structural segments of your plane, but they do allow caretaker to sit less precariously, ignoring the issue of her antlers. There is a theoretical possibility that he could make more radical modifications, such as a second seat or outright altering the fuselage itself, to offer more eccentric possibilities. I was, replies Pilot. He thinks for a moment about his sentence, finding the next best equivalent to what he wants to say. He was out here for her, after all. This whole setup he's gone out of his way for was for her. I have work. The dryad leans back against him as they rise into the air, flying above the tree line and then making a line over the lake. The kestrel leaving a trail of disturbed water in its wake as it soars above the surface of the water, starlight glistening beneath it. They fly over the settlement, pilot pulling the air brakes to slow down as much as possible to let caretaker look out of the window and to let everyone below look up at them. He pulls on the throttle, making a loop back around toward the lake again. One minute to midnight, pilot reaches out for the controls but then stops. Instead, he grabs caretaker's hand, she quickly looks back at him in surprise, and he sets it on the switch on the dashboard. Her expression changes, and she looks away from him at the control. Press it, he instructs, nodding to her as she looks back unchly a second time. Caretaker's finger flicks the switch. The night around them bursts to light as many things hiss behind them, like a den of vipers. New ability, aviation, payload, signal flare, active, allows you to release a payload of several multicolored signal flares. Caretaker lets out a series of excited sounds gazing into the window and then at the canopy glass as he makes his pass, flying out at a distance on the other side of the lake. Midnight, fire streaks into the air from the settlement, hissing and spinning as it flies in a relatively uncontrolled pattern toward the general direction of up, with a few turns here and there. First once, then twice, then dozens of times more, like arrows. They shoot into the sky beyond the lights of the glowing flares they dropped, the primitive fireworks that he had made through the cooperation of his alchemist friend and the fairies, exploding into starbursts. Loud cracks carry across the valley as flashes of many colors paint the night, creating radiant displays for only a few seconds each. Caretaker practically has her face smushed against the canopy as he flies across the horizon, the fireworks carrying on. They're actually pretty small, so they were able to make quite a few of them. Magic and alchemy apparently go a long way towards stretching the effects of the explosions. The implications for artillery shells and missiles are astounding, honestly. They circle the lake as the fireworks go on, the night carrying the many hues off far and away, reminding the rest of the dying world that here within the valley of the world tree, something still lives, something still grows. The show continue on. But caretaker leans back from the window, looking at him, perhaps because his hand is still holding the top of hers. Even if the switch for the flares has long since been pressed, the inside of the kestrel is painted by those many shades, greens, and reds, and blues flashing in and out in slow, gentle ebbs, each together accompanied by an abrupt, dull thud that moves throughout midnight like the strike of a heavily beating heart, the likes of which he can feel beneath his palm as her pulse moves into his body. Pilot looks down at her tilted head, staring at him with a mixture of curiosity and severe uncertainty that is only visible in her eyes since her body has frozen entirely as soon as they made eye contact at this angle. He hadn't quite planned it like this, but that's how it goes. No plan has ever survived meeting the enemy. With his free hand, Pilot pulls the throttle back lightly to allow the kestrel to ascend by itself as he looks at caretaker. The smells of her, her perfume and a little bit of smoke from the bonfire fills the cold, dampening its sharpness significantly as they move closer together. Caretaker's free hand is fumbling with something in her pocket, as the two of them are suddenly a breath's distance apart. Pilot, says Caretaker quietly, and he can feel her saying it as their lips meet as he still holds her hand with his right and her body against himself with the other. The plane glides through the night rising higher and higher by itself as the two of them find themselves connected for a time, both of her hands grabbing hold of him as they kiss. And then, as they pull apart, Pilot finds himself somewhat worried, as Caretaker is smiling and crying at the same time, he's not quite sure how to gauge that reaction. After a moment of this, she speaks. Yes, says Caretaker to him, 
perhaps for the first time ever, wiping her eyes with her forearm and then looking back up at him with a glow in her expression. Caretaker opens her fingers, showing what she has to him. It's a single brass bullet casing. It looks like it's from his side arm, if he had to guess. What's she doing with that? Yes. Yells caretaker, wiping her wet eyes clean before grabbing his hand this time and pressing hers firmly against it, so that the old brass is held between the two of their palms as she takes the initiative, returning the two of them to their prior state. Far off in the distance behind them, the valley erupts with fireworks, debauchery, and other such things, while the two of them soar into the clouds together, with only the one jacket to keep their two bodies warm in the lofty heights but finding themselves content to manage as they are. 3. Chapter 31, Another, There sure is a lot to think about these days. Pilot stands on the shore of the lake, holding his hands against the kestrel as he turns his head, looking back at the giant world tree standing there, towering above the valley. Bastard, mutters the man, perhaps just because he feels like it before turning back to the kestrel. Down at his feet is an absolute heap of plundered scrap metal, taken from the bodies of the thousands and thousands of undead, which are stripped of their gear and loot before being tossed into the cauldron on the eastern edge of the valley. One of the abilities he gained from the last invasion was one that allowed him to modify the kestrel's structural frame. He's not really sure how far he can go with this and how safe the results will be. The plane was a highly experimental prototype that was perfectly engineered to sit within a hair's distance of ultimate discomfort for its pilot. The engineers spent months, maybe even years, designing it to be as much of an uncomfortable death trap as is humanly possible. It may even be the pinnacle of anti-human creation itself. Also, the aerodynamics are fiddly. If he does something radical, it will obviously affect the flight mechanics of the plane. The question remains. Then. How far can he go? He's a pilot, not an engineer. One way to find out if he stays small scale, the risk should be minimal. Pilot, has used, dynamic field modifications. The glow leaves his hands and flows into the metal exterior of the kestrel, the plane and the sand beneath it both crunching as things pop, bend, and break, pulling together again as an unseen force flows through the machine, visible only because of its bright, white light. As the shine fades and Pilot lets go of the plane, he finds himself standing in front of the same machine as before, except for the fact that it is a good way longer, the fuselage having increased in length by about the span between two arms. The glass canopy has stretched out too, lengthening itself. Pilot climbs up onto the wing, lifts the canopy, and looks inside the cockpit. The kestrel's interior has lengthened itself to match the exterior. The space behind the pilot's seat has been hollowed out and fitted with a co-pilot's seat. All of the internals, such as the ammunition canisters and self-destruction charges, have been rearranged toward the back. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Kestrel modified, plus co-pilot's seat added, plus secondary. Emergency survival ration, 24 hours, spawns once a day, plus total length increased, plus additional weapon mounted on lower gimbal mount. Curtains under machine gun plus total ammunition capacity increased weight increased fuel efficiency decreased in theory He can modify the plane to be any size. He needs it to be can't he a two-seater long-range bomber a single man fighter with eight guns a ten-man aerial gunship Anything is possible as long as he makes sure the plane can still get up into the air again hell He's already learned that he can duplicate the machine guns from the Kestrel, that means he can duplicate the rest of it too, piece by piece. He can manufacture and modify planes. Of course, teaching people to pilot them is another story entirely, but the schematics of the plan, a long-term development, certainly, run through his mind as he continues to make some minor adjustments to the Kestrel. Co-pilot's seat allows a secondary passenger to sit inside the kestrel behind the pilot through a relay of angled mirrors, they can view the ground below the plane during flight and fire a mounted gun at targets below. Pilot nods, content, and looks behind himself, his young, alchemically talented compatriot came out of the forest a while ago, wearing her usual outfit of an obscuring mask and many hiding layers of fabric, she has been watching him silently ever since, as she often does. He tilts his head to the side, toward the plane he's next to. Want to join? Asks Pilot. She points at herself, staring up at him from down below the wing. Pilot nods, 
bending down to lend her a hand to help climb up. Warily, the young girl holds her arms out straight at her sides. Yeah, fly, confirms Pilot, pointing up at the sky with his free hand. She looks around the shoreline and the forest, then back at him. Why? She asks quietly from beneath her mask, speaking for the first time since the night of the invasion, the single word barely leaving its muffling prison. Pilot thinks for a moment, trying to find the words for his response. It's so tricky. The language has a lot of quirks that he doesn't really understand the nuance of yet. To kill monsters, replies the man after a while, looking back at her. She stands there for a moment with crossed arms, but then, after a second, she warily lifts her gloved hand a little, but not enough to reach him. Pilot bends down further, holding onto the edge of the kestrel with his other hand as he grabs hold of her, hoisting her up onto the wing. The kestrel roars above the ashlands, swaying as Pilot pulls on the throttle and turns the plane onto its side. He lifts his gaze to the mirror, looking at the back of the plane as he flies. His co-pilot is just sitting there quietly, not even screaming or terrified like caretaker was. More, she just sort of sits there, with her face pressed to either the windows at any angle or the array of mirrors, as she watches the world go by. Pilot straightens the kestrel out again, its wings taking a moment to rebalance as he gets used to the new feel of it in the air. Despite the change to the frame being modest in some sense, the flight dynamics have certainly been altered. As a whole, it feels somewhat less snappy, but more streamlined in its lateral movements. Looking down at the ground, he sees some wild tango traveling the wastes. They look like some kind of goblin, but larger, more lanky, and far more muscular. Hobgoblin, a hobgoblin. Hobgoblins are an extremely vicious off-breed of the core goblin species. Being significantly larger in size and exponentially more violent in temperament, Hobgoblins, are more akin to feral animals than their cunning, clever cousins. They are extremely lanky and muscular, with long, grime-covered claws and fangs full of rotting meat. They apply poison with their strikes. Hobgoblins tend to hunt in packs. They won't often bother killing something before they start eating it. Entity, Monster, Rank, D, Element, Poison, Type, Pack Hunter, EXP, 15. Wanna shoot? He asks. In response. He gets no words, but rather only the clicking of metal as something moves and ratchets behind him as the grip of the inbuilt gun is manned. The weapon in the back works a little differently than the guns beneath the wings. The lowest gun is mounted on the bottom of the Kestrel's fuselage in the forward center on a ball mount that can be swiveled from the co-pilot's seat. On the back of his own seat is a small setup with a marked mirror in a sort of pseudo-periscope setup. Attached to a firing handle that strongly resembles the back of a stockless rifle, but there is a grip on each side to allow easier turning of the mount. The man flicks a switch, unlocking the co-pilot's weapon as he flies over the wastes, making another pass at the hobgoblins they've just flown over. He pulls the air brake, slowing down as much as he can, to allow for easier ground targeting. In a way, it's just like they're shooting the rifle together in the woods, except it's very very different but similar, as for the girl, Tango consists of monsters, so this is legitimate and not suspicious, and he won't face a military tribunal, now, says Pilot as they fly overhead, the kestrel shakes, a deep rattle carrying through the metal of the plane all the way up to him and into his bones, even through his cushioned seat, the new machine gun fires a short burst, and the ground below them responds by sending up a plume of ash as the fine dust that makes up the wastelands is thrown into the air by the impact of some 30 to 90 shots. He looks in his mirror as they fly past, looking at Tango. A few of them were shredded, but a few others are alive, and they're scattering in terror, spreading out. However, unfortunately for them, there's nowhere to hide here. Pilot pulls on the stick, making another pass. Good work. He commends, looking at his all of a sudden very excited co-pilot in the mirror. She looks up at him, staring at his reflection. Again, instructs pilot. She focuses back on the mirror, taking off her mask to see better into it as it was obstructing her sight into the viewport, and fires again, this time holding down the trigger long enough to create a serpent across the desert that spans from here to where they fly to the edge of the horizon and somewhere along its streaking path lie the pieces of many monsters. The battle is over, Louisa, has executed, Hobgoblin, X5, plus 75 EXP, plus Tilda, level up, Tilda plus.
Luisa, has leveled up to level 06. New ability, Battle Alchemy. Organic deconstruction passive teaches you the knowledge involved in deconstructing and distilling formerly living tissue into chemical components. 2. Chapter 32, Load. Pilot, Dash, Level, 59. Human. The defense needs to be improved. The walls held up this time, but if he and caretaker hadn't found the Hantu and killed it, they likely wouldn't have survived the third wave. The defenders had run out of ammunition, out of bombs, and spells near the end of the second wave of undead. A good defense cannot rely on him or her, the valley needs to be able to sustain itself, regardless of either of them being here. What if next time, the boss monster is something that hides? What if it is something that only comes after all of its own troops have been destroyed? With the goblins and the undead, he's been lucky enough to find the boss monster and end the invasions early. The valley can't rely on his luck. This is why it needs fortified machine gun bunkers and heavy artillery to start with. Pilot walks along the northern wall, watching as carriages move back and forth between the ruined city and the valley. The people are still plundering it. But now, on his orders, they've begun harvesting significant numbers of the large, impossibly heavy stone bricks, if they can be called such a thing. It takes an elaborate setup with multiple carriages and animals in order to move every single one of them. Each of them is as long as a full-grown man and a third as high. The quarried stone was used in the walls of the northern city, which, to be fair, held up pretty well. It was the rest of the city that gave out, but the walls and towers, perfectly serviceable for the most part. The wooden wall is being reinforced piece by piece with those. He'd like to see the undead press their way past these, but it isn't enough. Hey, big guy, where does this go? asks a voice next to him. Pilot looks at six fairies, who are holding up a curtains and a machine gun all together in the air with a series of small ropes that they've wrapped around it. On the new wall, instructs Pilot, pointing up at the new front section of the wall. Stone masons are at work, creating the new barrier to his specifications. You got it, says another fairy, flying close to him. The fairy who was speaking before shoots him a cold glare. Hey, I was talking to him snaps the entity. Pilot sends them off as they get into a fight with each other. The stone fortification will span out in front of the old wooden wall in an inwardly curved position. Every fifty strides is another bunker that the masons are carving out of the solid stonework, which is being stacked together and bound by using a rudimentary concrete. This concrete is made out of ash from the wastelands and grit and serves to hold everything together just a little more snugly. Each bunker will be outfitted with a machine gun that points out into the exterior territories. This is why the new wall is somewhat inwardly curved. It allows the firing teams to cover each other should any monsters get up close to the wall below any specific gun emplacement. Additionally, the design serves as a funnel. With the gate in the middle, the monsters will have no choice but to head that way. He'd consider closing the north off fully, like the west currently is, or the eastern wall. But they need the ruins of the northern city, it's a little gold mine that is, even in its destroyed and burned state, full of invaluable resources that society simply can't produce here anymore, like tools, glassware, carriages and metals, weapons, and, hell, even just the big stones they're using now for these walls, it's critical for their defense that it remains easily accessible. Pilot looks at the explosive component that was used for the fireworks during the celebration the other night. Many, many thoughts about that evening come to him, as he looks across the settlement for a moment at caretaker for a moment. She's here too, helping the people grow a little garden. Berries, fruits, and roots are all fine, but the people from the city have plundered several barrels of seeds that are still alive and are hoping to plant many exotic vegetables that, quite frankly, may not exist anywhere else in the world anymore. These seeds might be the very last ones of their kind to exist so caretaker was more than eager to help them in their endeavor. Now, they toil with the help of her magic to create a workable patch of land, even if it means clearing out many of the trees in one area. He supposes it hurts her in some way to destroy so much of the forest. But in another way, caretaker is fully on board now with helping these people. He supposes she's grown excited about the concept of the many things that exist outside of the valley. Feeling him watching, she turns her head looking his way. Caretaker quickly smiles, looking back and away somewhere else, rubbing her arm. So how does this work? 
asks a voice from next to him. Pilot looks at Storb, the dark elf. She's barely functional but significantly alive, she shouldn't be out of bed yet. But when Pilot gathered some of the soldiers and metal workers here, she and Violina joined in to watch the demonstration. With fire, replies Pilot, setting the explosive pad into a metal cylinder. Heavy breathing comes from the side as Storb pushes the panting fire sorceress back out of the way to get a better look. He closes the tube off on the bottom and sets inside a small payload. A small, rounded chunk of metal. Pilot rises to his feet, clearing everyone away. Violina, please, he asks, gesturing to a long fuse made out of waxed string that he's holding. Violina lifts her shaking hands, holding them together and aiming toward the cylinder itself. Only the string, barks Storb, grabbing the sorceress wrists. Gods, ow! Howls the woman. Storb, please. She snaps, looking at the dark elf, but seeing her unwaveringly cold expression, she relents and holds out only a single, smoldering finger against the string, it catches a light, with the flame traveling down the fuse until it reaches the explosive pad, there is a destructive crashing as the cylinder fires into the air at an angle, the metal sphere blasting out toward the lake, ripping off the limb of a tree as it violently crashes down again somewhere in the forest. The mortar is a fascinatingly simple weapon, the use of which spans back quite some time. Some sort of payload is dropped into the muscle of a cylindrical mortar tube. While most of the mortars of his time were fired via a propellant charge, that is, via high-pressured gas, the ancient and tried method of just making a significant explosion to send whatever you want to shoot flying works too, as long as the mortar tube itself can handle the intensity of the explosion. Even so, this method is extremely dangerous and will mean each mortar is at more and more risk of catastrophically exploding on its crew with every consecutive shot as the materials weaken. There's no way around trying to develop some sort of gas propellant for the safety of everyone involved, but he thinks the alchemists can help with that. Ideally, after firing, the projectile leaves the tube at a desired angle and then careens back down to the ground, where it explodes. In the old days, the projectiles were round cannonballs that were loaded with a timed internal fuse and then exploded after impact, but eventually, these were upgraded to fin munitions that exploded on impact. He's going to have the spare metal workers and alchemists start immediately on this project. Once it's done, the concept can be scaled and advanced to full-on field artillery cannons. He misses it like the man in the desert misses the sound of rain. Pilot looks around. Everyone seems sufficiently impressed with the concept, except for the birds, who fly in terror into the sky. Even the shy librarian, who was here to document the process for her records and manuals, has taken her eyes off the paper and looks at the destroyed tree and then his way. Everyone except for caretaker, who comes over yelling, fussing, and clutching her hair as she looks at the destroyed tree in distress. Somehow, it seems to be different when he's the one who destroys nature. 1, Chapter 33, 4, 2, 1. Next, Caretaker, Dash, Level, 36. Dryad. Caretaker sits there in her favorite place, looking out over the waters of the lake from up on the ledge of the World Trees Hill, just down the path from the den. It is raining very lightly. But that's not a problem. Sometimes it rains on you. That's just what life is like for an animal that lives out in nature. She smiles to herself for no particular reason, staring out over the valley, the soft wind that moves the rain coming to move her hair and clothes as well. Ever since that night during the celebration, ever since that flight into the night that she and Pilot took together in the Kestrel, things have been different. She's not really sure how to explain it. This is all so strange and she wishes more than anything that she could have her sisters here to talk to her about it and guide her through it all. She's just fumbling her way through life every day by herself in regards to these confusing feelings that she has, and she has no one with whom she can really talk about them. Sure, there are plenty of others from the settlement, like Violina or Storb, but, they're just acquaintances, and she doesn't really feel comfortable opening up to them about something so personal like this. Caretaker supposes that she's just going to have to figure it out herself, but she'll manage. She finds her hands held against her own face, her fingers pressing down on her cheeks, just above her mouth, as she thinks about that night and about how she and Pilot had kissed. He's such a dopey romantic. But then again, 
that would have all never happened if she hadn't run all the way to the lake from the settlement herself because he was being an idiot and wanted to fly off alone when she clearly wanted to spend the whole festival together with him. Honestly, caretaker sighs and shakes her head, looking back out at the valley. She can never quite decide if he's a bit of an unaware fool or not, given how often he overexerts and hurts himself in his perhaps overzealous efforts. Then again, because of those efforts, they're all still alive, the valley is safe, and so is the world tree, maybe that is her job in this, then, maybe he's supposed to be a little self-destructive in his efforts, and maybe she's supposed to be the one he falls down toward when the energy leaves his body, that's how they met, isn't it? He fell to her. Caretaker watches the sky and the clouds, observing the rainfall but not thinking about anything else except how she and he moved through the night together. The dryad does her best to ignore the raging fire she sees in the distance to the north. She hopes he gets back soon. Pilot, dash, level, 59. Human. Vilina laughs, her eyes wide and frantic as the glow of the raging inferno reflects back into her pupils filling the diluted blackness of them with radiating red cinders, her passionate witch's cackle carries through the night like a cold, desperate shriek as she incinerates another section of the forest in the world tree valley. Pilot stands back at a distance, turning his head to look at Storb, the dark elf, she really loves what she does, remarks Storb, not turning her head to meet his gaze. Pilot looks back toward the anarchy unfolding ahead of them, the sorceress. Despite her wounds having not fully healed yet, is practically dancing and spinning around by herself, with everyone having long since found shelter, as she sprays fire out in all directions. One of the valley's strongest features, but also its most hindering, is its dense inner forest. This forest makes traveling between the four entrances a logistical nightmare. Delivering supplies, people, and anything else is a significant problem that they have so far circumvented by traveling around the valley's exterior when possible instead of through it. However, in crisis situations and just in a long term in general, this isn't viable. They need a network of paths and roads. It's quite easy to conceptualize. One road leads to each entrance of the valley, with the northern settlement acting as the main hub. This will allow them to transport goods and materials easier as well as bring his mine into operation. Several men from the settlement have already gone to survey it and have reported back that the project would be viable, once the issue of having to reach the base of the world tree, which is uphill, is circumvented. A further road that leads to the base of the hill below the world tree can fix this, instead of using the existing, natural shaft that he found they'll dig their own at ground level. He doubts he can convince caretaker to let him set up a full-scale or conveyor system from the base of the world tree down to the lake, so this is a good alternative. One of the first things they need to do is clear out the underbrush where the road is going to go. Teams of people with axes are working their way through the forest, cutting down the old growth wood so that it isn't wasted. Vilina moves after them, burning and smoldering away everything that remains after her. A third team moves in and clears out any significant debris. Even just clearing an easily navigable path like this will shoot their productivity up to the sky, and that's before they get into actually paving it and making it easily traversable for carts. Pilot turns his head, looking up toward the world tree as the rain drizzles around them, the droplets not being enough to quench the fire. It's going to be a while still. This isn't the only project they need to work on. Come on, says Pilot, turning to walk to the settlement. Storb turns and goes with him, the two of them leaving the teams to their work. The two of them move down the lane, returning toward the settlement as Storb stops. The dark elf stands there, turning her head to the side, her long, somewhat floppy ears twitching as she listens to some sound coming out of the forest. Pilot stops a few steps ahead of her, looking at the battered and bruised person as she stares out toward the forest her eyes slowly wandering from branch to branch. Wait, hold on, says Storb, walking off a ways and into the woods. Confused, Pilot looks around the area for a moment and then walks after her. The elf limps her way through the thick underbrush, looking back at him and lifting a finger to her mouth, gesturing for him to be quiet. The man looks at her uncertainly as she turns her head back forward, looking out through the underbrush. The water of a creek trickles nearby as birds sing. There, ahead, is a large tree with many low branches, 
A small black bird stands on the ground below its bows and scoots across the ground from side to side in a very strange, oddly smooth locomotion that makes it look more like it's sliding than running back and forth. All the while, it's whistling. The bird freezes, sensing them approaching. The animal looks their way for a moment with beady, round eyes, and then a second later there's an eruption of feathers as it shoots up through the forest canopy. Storb runs out to where it was, pressing through the underbrush that snags the fabric of her garments as she hurries, watching it fly away up toward the sky, toward the light of the blinding sun above, from which she shields her eyes with her hand. He has no idea what her fascination with a bird is, of all things. There are thousands of birds in the valley, singing around them this second. What makes this one special? Pilot walks out after her, examining the clearing to see if he's missed some context for the situation. However, he sees nothing out of the ordinary. The dark elf sighs, holding her hands clenched in front of her chest. The exhalation is deep and long, her shoulders drooping and falling slack to a level they hadn't been at as if she had just released some great tenseness that she had been carrying for a while now. Smiling, the dark elf looks back his way and, likely seeing his confused expression, speaks. Are you religious, pilot? Asks the dark elf, as a shadow drifts down over their heads, disrupting the rays of sunlight for a moment. Pilot looks at her for a moment, opening his mouth to speak but then not finding the words in the language he needs. He stops for a moment before trying again. God does not come to where I live, replies the man, finding the closest approximation to his intent. Many a man has found his faith within the confines of a shelled fox hole. However, just as may have been lost it in the same place, the thing from above falls down, landing on his shoulder. Pilot looks and grabs hold of the oddity. It's just a feather from the escaped blackbird. Having lazily drifted back down from the sky above, he stands there, twirling it in his fingers for a second before lifting his gaze back towards Storb, who stares and watches him, watches the feather with wide eyes. He's not sure what this little excursion was about, but it seems like it was a personal matter for her. Seeing as her eyes are lost in it, Pilot holds out the black feather for her to take. It's not like he wants it. Reaching out, Storb carefully grabs the other end of the feather, looking at him, something having changed in her expression that he doesn't really comprehend. I don't know where you're from, she replies, taking the feather carefully from him and then tenderly running a finger along its edge. She looks back up at him. But I think you've misunderstood, remarks the shield maiden. Storb slowly limps back toward the road and Pilot walks after her. God doesn't ever come to you or to any of us. She explains. With her hurt arm, she holds a branch to the side for him to pass by. With her free, good hand, she holds the feather, not letting it go of it. God comes through you, explains Storb, as Pilot grabs the branch so that she can let go of it. She smiles. He doesn't really know what to do with that or any of this. So he just nods to her, and they return to their work. From what he's gathered, there are a few different religious affiliations among the survivors from the north. While many belong to the flock of the organized faith that was once led by the Holy Church, or what was once such an organization, others follow more individual paths of belief. The population, as a whole is strongly spiritual in one form or another. As long as it isn't causing any internal divisions, he supposes it's fine. The courtroom of the foxhole will sort them all out soon enough, one after the other into those who believe and to those who do not. In the end, all that matters is that they have guns in their hands and that they point them in the right direction. In the settlement, work of a less destructive nature is being undertaken. The stockpile of old growth wood is growing high, with hundreds and hundreds of logs being stacked into rows and piles. Woodworkers come in teams, taking them and processing the wood down into usable planks and materials. Pilot walks ahead, looking around the area but not seeing what he's looking for. I will return, says the man, gesturing for Storb to stay there and walking off alone through the settlement, until he reaches its end. There's no sign of anyone here anymore, outside of the rows of primitive structures. As far as anyone could tell, there was nobody here at all except for the rabbits and the birds. If not for the slight flapping sound as paper moves and heavy breathing, one would think they were entirely alone. Pilot lifts his gaze, looking at the elf he was searching for. She's sitting up on a branch of a tree. Still, says Pilot. The librarian screams in surprise, throwing her book into the air and flailing with her arms. The two of them flying down to the ground from above, 
he manages to catch the elf in both of his arms. The book, however, is hard to catch with his hands full. So instead he kicks his boot behind himself instinctively, striking its edge and sending it flying into the air a second time. Shtil screams more at this than anything else, scrambling out of his grip and over his shoulder to catch it. The librarian manages to stretch herself out as far as she can to save it from falling to the ground. Pilot stands there, looking back over his shoulder at her, his left arm only holding the bottom of her legs. At this point as she lays slung over his back like a drooping sack, Shtil sighs and clutches the book against her chest, her hood and hair dangling downward to the ground behind his back. Having what he needs, Pilot quietly turns to head back to the settlement. Hey, hey! yells the dangling librarian, as he kidnaps her and brings her back toward what is to develop into civilization. The librarian's displeasure is clear to see in her vivid frown as she stands there staring at the ground with the book held against herself, only her mouth is visible. The clinic is being built over here, explains Shtil, whom he has made his generalist for everything regarding paperwork and civil planning. She's honestly the most qualified person out of any of the survivors he's talked to or heard of. Isn't this the main market square? asks Storb, pointing to a general area that is really just a big, muddy field with nothing on it. Isn't this where the shops go? Shtil walks on silently for a time. You would be correct, replies the librarian. If, one, money still existed and, two, we weren't all going to die before it is reinvented, the clinic being on the biggest, most directly accessible node of the township to come makes the most sense. Medical evacuation carriages can be stationed at every valley entrance. In the event of a severe injury during an invasion, they can directly scoop up the wounded and bring them back here to be treated in an organized, professional way. Increasing the survivability of their numbers is key, as they are quite simply limited in terms of total population. Every man who dies is a critical component of their defense that will be missing in the future. So they need to keep as many of them alive and in as good shape as possible. So far, the settlement has been sort of a mixture of crude shelters and old carts and carriages turned into the same. It's time to make this all feel a little more permanent. And over here is where the library is going to come, explains Shtil with a little more pep in her voice, it's not open for the general public. Of course, I think we need to work on some of these details, remarks Storb, the shield maiden. Pilot trudges back up the hill to the world tree, it's so late that it's technically early again, but there's so much to organize and manage, and he has to make sure everything is going according to plan. The next invasion is going to be here soon and that's not including any forward elements, which he isn't going to neglect keeping an eye out for this time. He pushes the beads aside, looking into the den as he takes off his muddy boots. Caretaker is asleep. Quietly, he creeps inside so as not to wake her up and throws off his wet clothes before sitting down on the edge of the bed, rubbing his tired and somewhat cold face. The valley is generally temperate, but out by the lake, especially at night, it can get very cool very quickly. Pilot, says a voice from behind him. He turns his head, looking at her as she scoots to the side, patting the spot next to her. Sorry, he says, apologizing for waking her as he lies down. Caretaker shakes her head, her hands pressed against his chest first as she puts some warmth into him and then pulls herself up, the two of them kissing. I was awake, she replies after they finish. She shakes her head and places it on his shoulder her right arm draped over him. Why? asks Pilot, turning his head to look at her in the dark. Caretaker opens her tired eyes, staring at him for a moment before closing her gaze and nuzzling herself against his side somewhat tighter. I was waiting for you to fall to me. She mumbles a few other things he also doesn't understand. He assumes that they're insults, given the tone. She yawns, her hand touching the side of his face for a while to warm it, but eventually it falls limp sliding slowly down to his shoulder, his hand is wrapped around her back, holding her against himself as he finally closes his own eyes and falls to sleep, not really sure what she, or anyone else today, was really talking about. Zero.